It was one of the rare occasions when Hitler was placed on the defensive, and was followed by a concerted attack by the three British statesmen on the timetable of the proposal, which allowed the Czechs an impossibly short period to evacuate and turn over the Sudetenland. Impracticable and dangerous, it could lead to a European war. During the ensuing deadlock an adjutant entered with a message for the Führer. After glancing at it he handed it to Schmidt, who translated it out loud in English, Benz has just announced over the wireless general mobilization of the Czechoslovak forces. It was Hitler who finally broke the silence. Despite this unheard of provocation, he said in a barely audible voice, I shall of course keep my promise not to proceed against Czechoslovakia during the course of negotiations, at any rate, Mr. Chamberlain, so long as you remain on German soil. This remark, misleading by being softly spoken, was followed by a statement that could not be misinterpreted. The Czech mobilization, he said tersely, settled the whole affair. Chamberlain hastily pointed out that mobilization was a precaution, not necessarily an offensive measure, but the Führer replied that so far as he was concerned mobilization was a clear indication that the Czechs did not intend to cede any territory. Again Chamberlain dissented. The Czechs, he argued, had agreed to the principle of self-determination in the Sudetenland and would not go back on their word. Then why mobilize? persisted Hitler. Germany mobilized first, said the Prime Minister. You call that mobilization? retorted the Führer sarcastically and made another threat. The crisis could not drag on very much longer. He quoted an old German proverb, an end, even with terror, is better than terror without end. The memorandum, he said, represented his last word. In that event, said Chamberlain, there was no purpose in further negotiations. He would go home with a heavy heart, since he saw the final wreck of all his hopes for the peace of Europe. But his conscience was clear, he had done everything possible for peace. Unfortunately, he had not found an echo in Herr Hitler. A walkout was the last thing Hitler wanted and he hastily reassured the British that he would not invade Czechoslovakia during the negotiations. It was as if a thunderstorm had cleared the atmosphere. To please you, Mr. Chamberlain, he said after a short recess, I will make a concession over the matter of the timetable. You are one of the few men for whom I have ever done such a thing. I will agree to October 1st as the date for evacuation. After negotiating a number of other minor alterations, Chamberlain agreed to transmit the memorandum to the Czechs. It was 1.30 in the morning and the meeting adjourned. The Führer thanked the Prime Minister for his work on behalf of peace, assuring him that the Czech problem was the last territorial demand which he had to make in Europe. Chamberlain left with a hearty of Wiedersen, and those who watched him stride out of the hotel could not discern the slightest strain of displeasure on his face. 5. After a few hours of needed sleep, Chamberlain flew back to England and the following day met with the full cabinet. It was necessary he explained, to appreciate people's motives and see how their minds worked if one would understand their actions. Herr Hitler would not deliberately deceive a man whom he respected and with whom he had been in negotiation. Consequently it would be a great tragedy if they lost this opportunity of reaching an understanding with Germany on all points of difference between the two countries. He told of his apprehension as he was flying home up the Thames, imagining a German bomber taking the same course. I asked myself what degree of protection we could afford to the thousands of homes which I saw stretched out below me. And I felt that we are in no position to justify waging a war today in order to prevent a war hereafter. Never had there been such opposition from the cabinet. First Lord of the Admiralty Duff Cooper could place no confidence in the Führer's promises and proposed an immediate general mobilization. Chamberlain urged his colleagues to postpone any such decision and it was agreed to first consult the French, who had already ordered a partial mobilization. When the cabinet met again Sunday morning there was opposition from a new source. I cannot rid my mind of the fact, confessed Foreign Secretary Halifax, that Herr Hitler has given us nothing and that he is dictating terms, just as though he had won a war but without having had to fight. So long as Nazism lasted peace was uncertain.
Lord Hailsham, an earlier supporter of Chamberlain, agreed with Halifax. An argument ensued. Lords Stanhope and Maugham wanted pressure put on the Czechs to accept the Hitler Memorandum while Lord Winterton urged rejection of the proposals on the grounds of morality. In an effort to restore order in his deeply split cabinet, Chamberlain argued that it was wrong to talk of accepting or rejecting Hitler's terms, or even of feeling humiliated. It was up to the Czechs to accept or reject. No sooner had this meeting ended in discord than Chamberlain was subjected to another harrowing experience. Jan Maserik, the Czech ambassador, arrived with a bitter protest. His government, he said, was amazed at the contents of Hitler's memorandum. It was a de facto ultimatum which deprived Czechoslovakia of every safeguard for its national existence. Against these new and cruel demands my government feels bound to make their utmost resistance and we shall do so, God helping. That evening the French delegation was back in London to discuss the situation. Its leader, Daladier, declared that France could not recognize Hitler's right to seize the Sudetenland but would give only a vague response to Chamberlain's question. Would France declare war if Hitler simply imposed on Czechoslovakia a frontier based on strategic considerations? When Chamberlain pressed for a more specific answer Daladier replied that France might try a land offensive, after a period of concentration. This meeting was adjourned for half an hour so that Chamberlain could consult with his cabinet. I am unwilling to leave unexplored any possible chance of avoiding war, he told his colleagues. Therefore I suggest that, basing myself on the personal conversations I have had with Herr Hitler, I should write a personal letter. It would be delivered to the Führer by Chamberlain's closest advisor, Sir Horace Wilson, and would contain a last appeal suggesting a joint commission to determine how to put into effect the proposals already accepted by the Czechs. If the letter fails to secure any response from Herr Hitler, Sir Horace Wilson should be authorized to give a personal message from me to the effect that if this appeal was refused, France would go to war and if that happened, it seemed certain that we should be drawn in. The following morning, September 26, Wilson, who shared some of Hitler's apprehension about Jews, set off for Berlin with the letter. To the Führer listened quietly but with growing restlessness until he heard how shocked the British public had been by the terms of his Godesberg memorandum. Then he burst out, it is no use talking any more. This did not stop Sir Horace, who, despite gestures and exclamations of disgust and impatience from Hitler, insisted that Schmidt continue reading the Chamberlain letter. When the interpreter came to the words the Czechoslovakian government, regard as wholly unacceptable the proposal, Hitler leapt to his feet and started for the door, muttering again that it was useless to keep talking. It was an exceptional scene, recalled the interpreter, especially as Hitler seemed to realize when he reached the door how impossible his behavior was, and returned to his seat like a defiant boy. He barely controlled himself so that Schmidt was able to finish the letter but then let himself go more violently than the interpreter had ever witnessed during a diplomatic interview. Hitler shouted that Germans were being treated like niggers. One wouldn't even treat Turks like that. On the 1st of October I shall have Czechoslovakia where I want her. He exclaimed, and if France and England decided to strike, let them. He didn't care if Fennig. Finally calm was restored and Hitler agreed to negotiate with the Czechs. He insisted, however, that they agree to accept the Goldsberg Memorandum within 48 hours. Come what may, he added, German troops would occupy the Sudetenland on the 1st of October. The fury of the afternoon carried over that evening to the sport palast. Rarely if ever had Hitler spoken with such abandon or venom. His principal target was Benz. It is not so much a question of Czechoslovakia, it is a question of Herr Benz. It was he who was set on destroying the German minority, it was he who was putting his nation at the service of the Bolsheviks. He now holds the decision in his hand. Peace or war? Either he will now accept this offer and at last give Germans their freedom, or we will take this freedom for ourselves. All Germany, a people vastly different from that of 1918, stood united with him. We are determined. Let Herr Benz choose. Hitler sat down. 
Up sprang Goebbels shouting, one thing is sure, 1918 will never be repeated. This brought the Führer to his feet again. Slamming right hand on the rostrum, he roared, ah! Then slumped to his seat, hair plastered to his forehead with sweat, exhausted. The speech brought despair to those hoping for peace. In London workmen dug trenches near Buckingham Palace, air raid posters were pasted up. From Paris, Ambassador Bullitt, a personal friend of Roosevelt's, phoned Washington, I believe the chances are about 95 in a hundred of war beginning midnight Friday. The president, who had also been getting words of appeasement from his ambassador in London, Joseph Kennedy, cabled Hitler an appeal, his second in two days, to continue the negotiations. Chamberlain too issued another appeal to the Fuhrer in the form of a statement to the press. The British, he said, would guarantee that the Czechs kept their promise to evacuate the Sudetenland so long as the Germans abstained from force. His envoy, Wilson, was back in the Reich Chancellor late the next morning with this new proposal, but Hitler refused to discuss it. There were only two possibilities open to the Czechs, accept or refuse the German proposal. And if they choose to refuse I shall smash Czechoslovakia. He threatened to march into the Sudetenland if Benz did not capitulate by 2 p.m. the next day. Sir Horace suddenly rose and read out a short message which Schmidt translated as slowly and emphatically as possible so that Hitler could mark its purport, if France, in fulfillment of her treaty obligations, should become actively involved in hostilities against Germany, the United Kingdom would deem itself obliged to support France. Hitler was furious. If France and England strike, let them do so. It's a matter of complete indifference to me. I am prepared for every eventuality. It is Tuesday today and by next Monday we shall all be at war. Wilson wanted to continue the conversation but Henderson signalled him against doing so. Sir Horace did get one moment alone with the Führer before leaving and reiterated that a catastrophe must be avoided at all costs. I will still try to make those checks sensible, he promised. I would welcome that, said Hitler and repeated emphatically that England could wish for no better friend than he. Despite the fervor of last evening's crowd at the Sport Palast, William Shira, broadcasting from the balcony, had noted in his diary that there was no war fever. The crowd was good-natured, as if it didn't realize what his words meant. This was illustrated again late Wednesday afternoon when a motorized division rolled through Berlin. Rather than cheer, most of those leaving their offices ducked into subways and the few that remained at the curb watched in silence. Captain Weedman also noticed this lack of public enthusiasm and when he walked into the chancellery loudly remarked, it looks like a funeral march out there. S.H.H. whispered an adjutant. He is sitting right here by the window. Hitler pensively watched the procession. Finally someone heard him mutter, I can't wage war with this nation yet. Perhaps it was with this in mind that he sent off a message to Chamberlain, one that, for him, was conciliatory. In England, which was far less ready for war than Germany, the Prime Minister was preparing himself for a broadcast to the nation. Criticism of appeasement was on the rise and he too was assailed with doubts. I am wobbling about all over the place, he remarked just before he walked up to the microphone at 8p.m. The same moment the order for mobilization of the British fleet was issued, and bared some of his apprehension to the public. How horrible, he said, how fantastic, how incredible it is that we should be trying on gas masks here because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. It seems all the more impossible that a quarrel which has already been settled in principle should be the subject of war. He proceeded to prepare the people for more concessions. I am myself a man of peace to the depths of my soul. Armed conflict between nations is a nightmare to me, but if I were convinced that any nation had made up its mind to dominate the world by force, I should feel that it must be resisted. Under such a domination, Life for people who believe in liberty would not be worth living, but war is a fearful thing, and we must be very clear, before we embark on it, that it is really the greatest issues that are at stake. 
Two hours later the Prime Minister's helps were raised by the latest letter from Hitler. After opening with the usual diatribe against the Czechs, it concluded with an oblique suggestion that Chamberlain continue his efforts to bring the government in Prague to reason at the very last hour. To the despairing Chamberlain it seemed the gap was narrowing and he hastily scribbled a draft reply inviting himself to another rendezvous. I feel convinced that we could reach agreement in a week. I cannot believe that you will take the responsibility of starting a world war, which may end civilization, for the sake of a few days delay in settling this long-standing problem. He then composed a personal message to Mussolini telling of this last appeal to the Führer. I trust your excellency will inform the German Chancellor that you are willing to be represented and urge him to agree to my proposal, which will keep all our peoples out of war. And so, with reborn hope, he worked till long after midnight preparing the speech he was to make to Parliament in the morning, the day on which Herr Hitler's ultimatum would expire. That dreaded day, Wednesday, September 28, started in frenzy at the core of the crisis, Berlin. At 8 a.m. French Ambassador François Ponset phoned We Eyes Saka urgently requesting an audience with the Führer so that he could present new suggestions. We Eyes Saka hastened to the Kaiserhof Hotel where his own chief was staying. But Ribbentrop was so annoyed at the prospect of his game being upset, this time from Paris, that a violent scene resulted. It is a monstrous thing, said the subordinate, according to his account that you should want to start a war when the real differences between the two sides are so small and are concerned only with the method by which the Sudetenland should be incorporated. You should leave that to the Führer, exclaimed Ribbentrop, and in this mood the two set off for the Chancellery. At 10 a.m., four hours before Hitler's ultimatum would end, François Ponset telephoned Henderson to report that he feared the worst. His request to see Hitler was still unanswered, apparently the Führer was not receiving ambassadors today. Henderson promised to do what he could. First he phoned Goring to inform him of Hitler's refusal to see François Ponset, who had fresh proposals on which war or peace depended. Goring cut him short. So recently the aggressor in Vienna, he was now playing the role of peacemaker. You need not say a word more, he said. I am going immediately to the Führer. Never had Schmidt seen such hectic activity at the Chancellery. Ministers and generals, with their train of party members, aide de camp, officers and heads of departments, who had hurried round to consult Hitler, were sitting or standing everywhere. Hitler wandered from group to group expounding his views at length but not listening to a word of advice. He had retired to the Winter Garden for privacy when Goring finally arrived to make his appeal for reason. Noticing Neurat in the anteroom, the Reichsmarschall persuaded the former foreign minister to join him, but once in the conference room it was Neurat who carried the burden of argument. Mein Führer, he began, do you wish to start a war under any circumstances? Of course not. Ribbentrop was hovering outside the Winter Garden, hoping to be invited in. Then Goring came out and belligerently strode over to him shouting, Herr von Ribbentrop, if war should break out, I will be the first one to tell the German people that you pushed things to this end. To the edification of the adjutants and aides, these two high officials began exchanging threats and insults. At one point Ribbentrop accused his opponent of fearing combat and Goring roared back that as soon as the Führer said march. He would take off in the leading airplane, on condition that Ribbentrop sat beside him. If the situation had not been so serious, recalled Weedman, it would have been comical to see the two insulted prima donnas clawing at each other as often happens on stage before the final rehearsal. A little after 11 a.m. Ribbentrop was finally admitted into the Winter Garden so that he could be present during the delayed interview with François Bons 8. Flourishing a map. The French ambassador prophesied that an attack on Czechoslovakia would spread throughout Europe. You are naturally confident of winning the war just as we believe that we can defeat you. But why should you take the risk when your essential demands can be met without war? It was apparent that François Ponset's arguments were gradually tilting the balance in favor of peace. No longer did Hitler flare up nor could he answer the Frenchman's logic. All at once an adjutant interrupted. 
Ambassador Atolico was outside with an urgent message from Rome. As soon as Atolico saw the Führer emerge from the Winter Garden he shouted unceremoniously from a distance that he had an urgent message from Mussolini. Il Duce informs you that, whatever you decide, Führer, fascist Italy stands behind you. Catching his breath, he added, Il Duce is, however, of the opinion that it would be wise to accept the British proposal, and begs you to refrain from mobilization. Tell Il Duce that I accept his proposal, said Hitler, then returned to the Winter Garden to inform François Ponce that Mussolini had just asked whether he would accept his counsel, failing, however, to add that he had agreed to do so. The two continued their conversation but Hitler's attention kept wavering. It was obvious that he was still pondering Il Duce's message and before long he got to his feet, indicating the interview was over. François Ponce asked whether he should advise his government that the Führer was inflexible. Distractedly Hitler replied that he would give an answer early in the afternoon. The parade to the Winter Garden continued. A few minutes past noon Henderson made his way through the crowd in the reception room. It is going better, a German friend whispered to him. Only stick to it. In the conference room Hitler listened patiently while Schmidt translated Chamberlain's offer to come to Berlin at once for a conference, he then replied that he must first communicate with Mussolini. Il Duce seconded the idea. He suggested that they all meet in Munich. Hitler agreed and invitations were hastily dispatched to Daladior and Chamberlain. The one to the latter arrived while he was addressing the House of Commons and Queen Mary who was in the gallery with Halifax, Baldwin and other notables. Chamberlain had just announced Hitler's acceptance of Mussolini's suggestion to delay mobilization and during the resultant mutter of approval the Chancellor of the Exchequer passed him a slip of paper. The Prime Minister's face was transformed. In a broken voice he continued, that is not all. I have something further to say to the House yet. I have now been informed by Herr Hitler that he invites me to meet him at Munich tomorrow morning. He has also invited Signor Mussolini and M. Daladia. Some unidentified member shouted, thank God for the Prime Minister. Thereby touching off an unprecedented demonstration of hysterical shouting. Queen Mary, a symbol of self-control, wept without restraint as did the Duchess of Kent and Mrs. Chamberlain. From all sides wrote Sir John Simon in his memoirs, there was impetuous cheering, in which few failed to join, and we adjourned almost at once by common consent. I saw men, some of whom have since spoken slightingly of what Chamberlain was trying to do, cross the floor in tears and with unrestrained emotion grasp him by the hand. One of the few members of Commons not overcome by the moment was Winston Churchill. And what about Czechoslovakia? He was heard to mutter bitterly, does no one think of asking their opinion? With few exceptions the people of the democracies shared the relief. In the streets of Paris, London and New York jubilant crowds read the extras proclaiming the end of the crisis. From Paris, Ambassador Bullet wrote his friend Roosevelt, I am so relieved this evening that I feel like embracing everyone and wish I were in the White House to give you a large kiss on your bald spot and from Washington the President dispatched a two-word cable to Chamberlain, good man. From another President, Benz, the Prime Minister received a longer message, this a plea, I ask Mr. Chamberlain very earnestly for help because it is our real desire to contribute to peace. I beg therefore that nothing may be done in Munich without Czechoslovakia being heard. While most Germans were equally relieved, the anti-Hitler group was dismayed. The news scotched their latest scheme to seize Hitler by force and set up a military regime. When Holder learned of the Munich meeting he could no longer see his way clear to set the putsch apparatus in operation under such circumstances. At 6 p.m. Il Duce's luxurious train left Rome to enthusiastic cheers. He was in an expansive mood, for he was not only being hailed around the world as the savior of peace but had managed to win Hitler's gratitude by supporting him through the crisis. Mussolini also felt he had scored a diplomatic victory over the British and ridiculed them good-naturedly at dinner with Cheno. In a country where animals are adored to the point of making cemeteries and hospitals and houses for them, 
and legacies are bequeathed to parrots, you can be sure that decadence has set in. Besides, other reasons apart, it is also a consequence of the composition of the English people. 4 million surplus women. 4 million women sexually unsatisfied, artificially creating a host of problems in order to excite or appease their senses. Not being able to embrace one man, they embrace humanity. 6. Early the following morning, September 29th, the Führer met Mussolini between Munich and the border. Beyond being a mark of courtesy to an ally, it gave Hitler an opportunity to bring Il Duce up to date on the latest developments. As the two dictators headed for the Bavarian capital in the Führer's train, Hitler revealed that, with the West Wall completed, he feared no attack from that quarter. If England and France were foolish enough to make an assault, the war would be over before the enemy could complete mobilization. I have no need to mobilize. The German army stands ready and asks only to be allowed to realize my aims. The other two conferees were Munich bound by air. Chamberlain left Heston in a slight train after telling journalists, When I was a little boy, I used to repeat, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. This is what I am doing. When I come back I hope I may be able to say, as Hotspur says in Henry IV, out of this nettle, danger, we pluck this flower, safety. To the shouts of long live Daladia. And long live peace. The French Premier boarded his plane at Le Baguet. It took off in a milky fog. At 11.15 am the twin-motored plane set down at Munich's airport. François Ponsate watched Daladia descend, brow deeply furrowed with wrinkles. He had left a tense, fearful city and was surprised to find the Germans exuberant. They greeted him as a hero with enthusiastic hails. Chamberlain landed a few minutes before noon and he too got a joyous reception on his trip to the Regina Palace Hotel. He was there only for minutes before taking off in an open car for the newly built Führer Bau where the conference would take place. In the complex of National Socialist buildings clustered around the Königsplatz, it was a compact but monumental stone structure with a spacious central hall, 65 feet high and 100 feet wide, from which two impressive stone staircases curved up to the conference room. Chamberlain and his two colleagues, all in black suits, arrived first. Next came Mussolini, advancing with lively step, his chest thrown out, completely at ease, and patronizing, as if he were the host. The last to arrive was the Führer. The hard, strange look in his eyes impressed Daladia. The conferees and their aides congregated around a buffet set up in a salon, shaking hands courteously but coldly as they surveyed each other. Hitler did his best to be affable but his brows were furrowed with concern since most of his guests spoke no German and he was unable to communicate with them freely. At last the stilted buffet was over and Hitler led the way into a large rectangular room overlooking the Königsplatz. It was an impressive room with leather-covered walls, a profusion of green plants and paintings and a huge marble fireplace over which hung the imposing portrait of Bismarck by Lenbuck. Hastily prepared and poorly organized, the conference began in confusion and became increasingly muddled. With no chairman, no agenda or agreed procedure. It splintered into a series of involved individual discussions. At one point Hitler became so restive at Chamberlain's nagging concern over the matter of compensating the checks for property in the Sudetenland that he shouted, Our time is too valuable to be wasted on such trivialities. Mussolini brought some degree of order into the proceedings by submitting a written proposal for the solution of the Sudeten question which he presented as his own even though the Germans had drafted it. By then it was 3 p.m. and there was a recess for lunch. The proceedings were even more chaotic after the bolted meal. Often three or four would talk at once, making Schmidt's task almost impossible. He would have to insist that the preceding translation be heard first and, to friends watching in amusement through glass doors, he looked like a schoolmaster trying to keep an unruly class in order. To complicate matters, outsiders began to invade the room. One by one Goring, Francois Ponset, Henderson, Atolico and Weiss Sacker wandered in with legal clerks, secretaries and adjutants. 
they all crowded around the principals, who were grouped in a semicircle before the huge fireplace, until it looked like a high-stake game of chance. Il Duce had taken command of the proceedings. The other three principals could speak only their own language, while he held forth in all four. Although his English was laborious, his French Italianate, and his German questionable, he took over as interpreter general, a dictatorial but amiable director of an undisciplined chorus. He would ask Hitler a question in German, get the answer and then summarize the meaning rather than the exact words for the French and English delegations. That was my great day, he later told SS Captain Eugen Dolman, whom he had brought along as an interpreter. All eyes were on me, not on Mr. Daladia or Mr. Chamberlain. It was an occasion worthy of the Caesars, do you remember? As the evening approached the atmosphere in the room grew thicker. Finally the British introduced their own proposal, generally acceptable except on the plebiscite in the Sudetenland and an international guarantee of Czechoslovakia's new borders. At the height of this prolonged but not particularly caustic discussion Dolman was summoned from the room, a mysterious veiled woman demanded his presence. In the guardroom he found the wife of Ambassador Atolico, who demanded that he immediately and without delay ask Herr Hitler how the conference was going. She explained that she had promised the Madonna in the Pilgrim's Church at Loito to bring back a fat golden candle if the conference went well and world peace was preserved. Her train was leaving in half an hour. Dolman said he could not possibly accost the Führer but would ask Il Duce or Cheno. They would not do, she instructed him to find out from Himmler, who knew everything. Left with no alternative, Dolman finally located the Reichsführer. His initial surprise gave way to amusement. He authorized me to announce that peace was assured. Agreement did seem assured but there were still a number of points to clarify. It was already 8 p.m. and Hitler was becoming impatient. He had arranged an elaborate banquet to conclude the conference and the food was getting cold. He suggested they adjourn for dinner since the discussion would probably go on for several hours more. The British and French turned down the invitation on the grounds that they had to telephone their governments but Schmidt felt it was because they were in no mood to attend a banquet. They had secured peace, but at the price of a serious loss of prestige. The British hurried off to the Hotel Regina, while the French returned to the Four Seasons where they had food sent up to their rooms. In the meantime the Germans and Italians were celebrating a victory at the Führer Bau with champagne and a variety of delicacies. It was a few minutes past ten by the time the four principals and their advisers were again seated at the fireplace. After extensive redrafting and tedious delays that continued until past midnight, agreement was finally reached. Actually the whole thing was a cut and dried affair, Goring later told an American psychologist. Neither Chamberlain nor Daladia was the least bit interested in sacrificing or risking anything to save Czechoslovakia. That was clear as day to me. The fate of Czechoslovakia was essentially sealed in three hours. Then they argued for hours more about the word guarantee. Chamberlain kept hedging. Daladia hardly paid any attention at all. He just sat there like this. Goring slumped down and assumed a bored expression. All he did was not approval from time to time. Not the slightest objection to anything. I was simply amazed at how easily the thing was managed by Hitler. After all, they knew that Skoda, etc., had munition plants in the Sudetenland, and Czechoslovakia would be at our mercy. When he suggested that certain armaments which were across the Sudeten border should be brought into the Sudeten territory as soon as we take it over, I thought there would be an explosion. But no, not a peep. We got everything we wanted, just like that. He snapped his fingers. At 1.30 a.m. an acceptable document was ceremoniously placed on a mahogany table next to a huge, elaborate inkwell. The pact provided for a four-stage evacuation of the Sudetenland to begin on October 1st. An international commission would determine which districts were to hold plebiscites and make final determination of the borders. Hitler appeared satisfied. The first to sign, he found the pretentious sink well empty and a substitute had to be hastily provided. The last to arrive, 
the Führer was the first to leave and William Shira was struck by the light of victory in Hitler's eyes as he strutted down the broad steps of the Führerbau. It was some time before Chamberlain and Dalladier left and it was their painful duty to inform the two Czech representatives, anxiously waiting off stage throughout the long day, of the fate of their country. They were brought to Chamberlain's room at the Regina about 2.15 am the atmosphere was oppressive as the Czechs waited for sentence to be passed. Chamberlain made a long introductory speech, then, as Dalladier was handing over a copy of the agreement, he began yawning. One of the Czechs was in tears. Believe me, Francois Ponsate consoled him, all this is not final. It is but one moment in a story which has just begun and which will soon bring up the issue again. Dalady awakened to the cheers of a delirious and vocal crowd outside his hotel. They sang songs and called for dear little Dalady or until he came out to the balcony. Later in the morning Chamberlain was given an ovation by the Munchenners as he drove in an open car to Hitler's apartment for a final informal talk. The Prime Minister had come on a personal mission of vital import. He had composed a short statement hopefully to be signed by himself and Hitler. It went far beyond the documents promulgated at the Führer Bar and expressed a determination never to go to war with one another again. If he signs it, he told his parliamentary secretary at breakfast, and sticks to it that will be fine, but if he breaks it that will convince the Americans of the kind of man he is. When Hitler heard a translation of the memorandum, he exclaimed, ah, ah, and without ado the two affixed their signatures. Chamberlain handed over one copy and kept another, convinced that Hitler was as enthusiastic as he. But Schmidt had the feeling that he had agreed to the wording with a certain reluctance and signed it only to please Chamberlain. Hitler, it seemed, made a practice of spreading conflicting impressions. Once alone with his valet, he exulted that the Prime Minister, an old man, had travelled all the way just to see him. I gave him a noseful. He won't be visiting me again soon. Yet a moment later he gave Major Gerard Engel, his army adjutant, the impression that he liked the old gentleman and wanted to continue negotiations with him. Hitler assured Engel that he himself was not considering taking any steps that would be potentially dangerous. First gains had to be digested. The solution to the Polish question would not run away. It was 5.38 p.m. when Chamberlain's plane touched down at Heston. He stood in the open doorway, smiling as he waved the document he and Hitler had signed. I've got it! He shouted at Halifax. I've got it! With the roar of the crowd in his ears, Chamberlain read a letter from the king asking him to come straight to Buckingham Palace, so that I can express to you personally my most heartfelt congratulations on the success of your visit to Munich. On the trip from airport to palace he was given a hero's welcome, rare in the history of England. The streets, as he described in a private letter, were lined from one end to the other with people of every class, shouting themselves hoarse, leaping on the running board, banging on the windows, and thrusting their hands into the car to be shaken. It seemed that all England wanted to congratulate and thank him. No conqueror returning from a victory on the battlefield commented the London Times, had come adorned with nobler laurels. He was engulfed in front of 10 Downing Street and when the screaming throng refused to disperse he came to an open window. The cheering intensified, finally turning into a raucous rendition of For He's a Jolly Good Fellow. Chamberlain stood beaming at the window, the same one at which Disraeli had announced peace with honor on returning from the Berlin Congress of 1878. This is the second time in our history, he said, that there has come back from Germany to Downing Street peace with honor. I believe it is peace for our time. The weeks of crisis were at last over and the English, with few exceptions, were unrestrained in their joy but there was no celebration in Prague when the new premier, General Jan Sirovi, announced over the radio that his government had been forced to accept the Munich diktat since they had been deserted and stood alone. It was a choice, he said, between a reduction of our territory and the death of the nation. 7. Mussolini also received an ovation, perhaps the greatest, in his own opinion, of the entire twenty years of fascism. 
At every station and grade crossing multitudes awaited his train, many on their knees, to acclaim him. He was given a Caesar's welcome in Rome as his open car traveled down the Via Nazionale, passing under a triumphal arch of leaves and branches. Upon entering the Palazzo Venezia the mob in the piazza began chanting Deuce. Deuce. The spontaneous roar, when he at last appeared on the balcony, indicated that perhaps never before had he enjoyed such popularity. Still, through the world Chamberlain was the most honored of those who met at Munich. His lean figure and hawk nose had become a household symbol of peace. Former Crown Prince Wilhelm sent him a secret letter of thanks for saving the peace, and the ex-Kaiser wrote Queen Mary with indelible pencil that he had not the slightest doubt that the Prime Minister was inspired by heaven and guided by God in averting a most fearful catastrophe. Most Germans shared the sentiment and awoke on the 1st of October with the prayer that no incident impede the march of their troops into the Sudetenland. The Führer's train arrived at the Czech border before dawn and Reichenau, the first of the generals to pledge allegiance to Hitler, reported with words that astounded Wiedmann, Mein Führer, the army today is making the greatest sacrifice that soldiers can make to their supreme commander, namely to march into enemy territory without firing a shot. Wiedmann could not believe that a German general could make such a ridiculous remark. Then another general chimed in, yes, Mein Führer, I was with my old regiment this morning. The men were weeping for being forbidden to attack the Czech bunkers. And all along, said Hitler, those defeatists tried to tell me that my politics would lead to war. This, delivered in a sharp tone, alarmed Weidmann, who stood directly behind him. Whom did he mean by defeatists? At Czechers the tension and exhaustion of the past hours were just catching up with Chamberlain. I came nearer the to a nervous breakdown than I have ever been in my life, he confessed in a letter. I have pulled myself together, for there is a fresh ordeal to go through in the house. It came on Monday, October 3rd. By then the high emotion had worn off for many and relief for deliverance from war was being replaced by humiliation. Duff Cooper opened the debate over Munich in the Commons by tendering his resignation from the cabinet. A European war would follow the invasion of Czechoslovakia, he said. The Prime Minister has believed in addressing Herr Hitler through the language of sweet reasonableness. I have believed that he was more open to the language of the mailed fist. Obviously tired and irritable, Chamberlain rose to reply that the agreement he had signed with Hitler in the Führer's flat was extremely significant. There was sincerity and goodwill on both sides and it would be extremely difficult for Hitler to take back the emphatic declarations he had made. He was applauded but without enthusiasm, for a feeling of guilt pervaded the house. The debate continued for three days with the denunciations climaxed by an eloquent damnation from Churchill. All is over, he said. Silent, mournful, abandoned, broken Czechoslovakia recedes into the darkness. He did not begrudge the loyal, brave people of Britain their natural and spontaneous outburst of joy and relief on learning of the pact. But they should know the truth. They should know that there has been gross neglect and deficiency in our defenses. They should know that we have sustained a great defeat without a war, the consequences of which will travel far with us. And do not suppose that this is the end. This is only the beginning of the reckoning. Chamberlain and his co appeasers had sought a new revisionist settlement in East Central Europe which Hitler would underwrite. But now it was obvious that the Fuhrer's program ran counter to this and no accommodation had ever been possible. Already Chamberlain and his umbrella were becoming the symbol of pusillanimity, and such was his concern that he sought help from Adolf Hitler. He dispatched a secret message wondering if the Fuhrer, who was to make a speech at the Sport Palast that evening, could give the Prime Minister some support in forming public opinion in Britain. Hitler obliged, launching a blistering attack on Chamberlain's detractors in the house. But aid and comfort from such a dubious source were not necessary. The following day, October 6, the House of Commons hastily approved Chamberlain's policy by which war was averted in the recent crisis. The vote was 366 to 144 with some 35 dissidents, including Cooper, Eden and Churchill, abstaining. 
the attack of those three had far greater effect in Berlin where every word launched at Chamberlain was taken as a personal insult by Hitler. He had come out of the funeral bow after signing the pact pleased, so agreed his adjutants and aides, convinced that the Czech problem was solved once and for all, and he intended to keep his part of the bargain. The chorus of condemnation in England changed all that. There were already whispers in the Wilhelmstrasse that Ribbentrop and Himmler were taking advantage of Hitler's annoyance to persuade him that Germany had not fully exploited the Western democracy's fear of war at Munich and that England only negotiated to gain time so she could strike later when better armed. Aware of this discontent, François Ponce did his best to calm Hitler down by suggesting he sign an agreement with France similar to the one concluded with Chamberlain. I wished to flash before his eyes the possibility of further agreements, economic and financial, which might lead to a future organization in Europe, I hoped to direct his mind toward prospects and in directions other than those of violence. But Hitler was convinced, or allowed himself to be convinced, that he had been deceived by perfidious Salbian. On October 9 he publicly displayed these feelings in a bitter speech at Saarbrücken comparing the British attitude to that of a governess. He went on to attack that malevolent trio of Churchill, Cooper and Eden, far surpassing the acidity of the sport palast speech. The effects of his diatribe were felt three days later when the International Commission selected to implement the Munich Agreement voted unanimously to dispense with plebiscites. Its members had already bowed to German demands that the 1910 census be used in determining those districts to be ceded to the Reich and it was becoming increasingly obvious that the original pact was being contorted to strip Czechoslovakia of her last defensive line of fortifications. François Ponsate made a final appeal for reason to Hitler in mid-October. The occasion was his farewell to the Führer, he was being transferred to Rome. Hitler had always liked him and showed his appreciation for seven years' service in Berlin by inviting the French ambassador to his mile-high mountain tea house atop the Kahlstein. Built under the direction of the indefatigable Bormann at a reported cost of 30 million marks, it was a remarkable engineering feat. Equally so was the five-mile winding asphalt road from the Berg off which had been blasted out of the side of the mountain at the cost of several lives. François Ponsate was driven up this road to an underground passage dug into the peak. At the end of the corridor he was escorted into a copper-lined elevator, its shaft hacked out of solid rock. After a ride of about 400 feet, François Ponsate found himself in a gallery of Roman pillars. Beyond was an immense glass-tin circular hall. Great logs were burning in a huge open fireplace. On all sides extended such an immense panorama of mountains that it gave the Frenchman a sensation of being suspended in space. The entire view, bathed in the autumn twilight, was grandiose, almost hallucinating. In this fantastic setting, which was already palling on Hitler after several visits because of its grandiosity, Ambassador and Führer held their last interview. Pale and drawn, the latter confirmed his disappointment with the aftermath of the Munich Agreement. The crisis was far from over, in fact, threatened to worsen if the situation did not improve. Great Britain, he complained, was sonorous with threats and calls to arms. The ambassador pointed out that a reaction was inevitable after the excess of joy following the preservation of peace. Furthermore, Hitler's own harsh speech at Saarbrücken had spread the impression that the sacrifice of Czechoslovakia had only increased Germany's appetite and thereby strengthened the position of the adversaries of the Munich Pact. Hitler protested. It was the British who had started the present trouble. Nor had he uttered a word against France. As he went on to defend his treatment of the Czechs, François Ponsate interrupted, urging him not to linger over the past. The future was more important. The democracies and the totalitarian states must now demonstrate that they could live side by side in peace and gradually lead Europe towards more normal and enduring conditions. Hitler objected neither to the interruption nor to the concept. He was quite prepared, he said, to do this. As they descended the mountain François Ponce to reviewed the conversation. I know that he is changeable, dissembling, full of contradictions, uncertain, 
he reported to Paris. The same man with the debonair aspect, with a real fondness for the beauties of nature, who discussed reasonable ideas on European politics around the tea table, is also capable of the worst frenzies, of the wildest exaltations, and the most delirious ambitions. There are days when, standing before the globe of the world, he will overthrow nations, continents, geography and history, like a demi-urge stricken with madness. At other moments, he dreams of being the hero of an everlasting peace, in which he would devote himself to the erection of the most magnificent monuments. These apparent conflicts within the Führer were leading many foreigners to conclude that he was simply insane. One was Sigmund Freud, now safely established in London. You cannot tell what a madman will do, he told an American admirer. You know he is an Austrian and lived for years in great misery. When Hitler took over that country it seemed to go to his head. A former disciple had a far different theory and that October Inderich expounded it to H. R. Knickerbocker, who had just come from Prague. Hitler belongs in the category of the truly mystic medicine man, said Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, who had spent hours discussing the Führer with Ernst Hanfstengel immediately after the latter's escape from Germany. His body does not suggest strength. The outstanding characteristic of his physiognomy is its dreamy look. I was especially struck by that when I saw pictures taken of him in the Czechoslovakian crisis, there was in his eyes the look of a seer. This prompted Knickerbocker to ask why Hitler made nearly every German fall down and worship him, yet made little impression on foreigners. He is the first man to tell every German what he has been thinking and feeling all along in his unconscious about German fate especially since the defeat in the world war, and the one characteristic which colors every German soul is the typically German inferiority complex. The complex of the younger brother, of the one who is always a bit late to the feast. Hitler's power is not political, it is magic. Hitler's secret was that he allowed himself to be moved by his own unconscious. He was like a man who listens intently to whispered suggestions from a mysterious voice and then acts upon them. In our case, even if occasionally our unconscious does reach us through dreams, we have too much rationality, too much cerebrum to obey it, but Hitler listens and obeys. The true leader is always led. Hitler sang a purely Teutonic song which rang true to Germans and they chose him as their representative. He was the demagogue appealing to the primitive an echo from their own tribal past. Jung predicted that England and France would not honor their new guarantee to the Czechs. No nation keeps its word. A nation is a big, blind worm, following what? Fate perhaps. A nation has no honor, it has no word to keep. Therefore, why expect Hitler to keep his word? Because Hitler is the nation. Won by 1943 his accumulated royalties with E. of Erlag would amount to 5,525,811 rm to the party he left all his personal possessions, the Berghoff, his furniture and his pictures. To Eva Braun and his two sisters he left the same amount, 12,000 marks a year for life. Alois was granted a lump sum of 60,000 marks and there were further bequests to relatives in Spittal. Frau Winter and his valets. He also ordered the party to worthily take care of my adjutants Bruckner and Weidman for life. Two in 1968 Wilson told journalist Colin Cross that he could understand Hitler's feelings on the Jews and put the question, have you ever met a Jew you liked? Part 6. To the very brink of boldness. Chapter 18. Crystal Night November 1938 March 1939. 1. The path of anti-Semitism in Hitler's Germany was tortuous. The first Jewish restrictions in 1933 were so inconclusive that it seemed as if the Führer were deliberately compromising his principles. Could this be an attempt to solve the Jewish question by rational means acceptable to those Germans who wanted Jews controlled but not persecuted? There followed a period of struggle between the racial radicals in the party and moderates in the government and civil service which came to a climax during the summer of 1935. At this time the Tata took the offensive, objecting openly to the continuing mistreatment of Jews on the grounds that it was bad for business. 
the unlawful activity against Jews must end, Rai Bank President Shaq told a small, influential group including Interior Minister Frick, Finance Minister Schwerin von Krosig, Justice Minister Gertner and Education Minister Rust. Otherwise, he warned, he could not complete his task of economic rearmament. For example, the Jewish agent of Alliance Insurance in Egypt had been so harried that he resigned, leaving the market to the English. Many Jewish importers were cancelling large orders and it was ridiculous to imagine that it was possible for a nation to succeed economically without Jewish business. Schacht had no objection to the public display of signs such as Jews not wanted, since these could even be found in the United States, but he bitterly opposed those put up by Stray Eicher proclaiming, whoever buys from a Jew is a traitor to the people. It was unanimously agreed by the group that wild single actions must cease so that the Jewish question could be solved legally. The first steps in the direction of legalization were taken a few weeks later at Nuremberg by the Führer himself, when he proclaimed the law for the protection of German blood and honor, legalizing a number of repressive measures which were promptly justified by the official Catholic Klerfsblatt as indisputable safeguards for the qualitative makeup of the German people. Even Stray Eicher seemed to be satisfied now that the matter was being solved piece by piece in the best German legal tradition. We don't smash any windows and we don't smash juice, he boasted. Whoever engages in a single action of that kind is an enemy of the state, a provocateur, or even a Jew. Were the Nuremberg laws an attempt by Hitler to solve the Jewish question by less harsh acceptable methods? Or was he merely biding his time before effecting his dream of extermination? In either case solution of the problem, for the time being at least, had been taken from the party and turned over to the law. This resulted in growing resentment among the more radical Nazi racists. Held in restraint during Hitler's ensuing expansion program, they finally broke out three years later, in 1938, with the destruction of synagogues in Munich, Nuremberg and Dortmund. A wave of Jew baiting swept the nation. The entire Kurfürst Tendarm, wrote Bella from, a diplomatic correspondent from Berlin, was plastered with scrawls and cartoons. Jew was smeared all over the doors, windows, and walls in waterproof colors. It grew worse as we came to the part of town where poor little Jewish retail shops were to be found. The Tsar had created havoc. Everywhere were revolting and bloodthirsty pictures of Jews beheaded, hanged, tortured, and maimed, accompanied by obscene inscriptions. Windows were smashed, and loot from the miserable little shops was strewn over the pavement and floating in the gutter. The tide of anti-Semitism was given impetus on November 7, 1938, when a young Jew, Herschel Greinspan, shot a minor German Foreign Office official in Paris. Greinspan whose parents had been deported from Germany to Poland, had gone to the embassy to assassinate the ambassador only to be sidetracked by Councillor Ernst von Rat. Himself an enemy of anti-Semitism, Rat was being investigated by the Gestapo but it was he who took the bullets intended for his superior. Being a Jew is not a crime, sobbed Grinz's pant to the police. I am not a dog. I have a right to live and the Jewish people have a right to exist on this earth. Wherever I have been I have been chased like an animal. On the afternoon of November 9 Rath died. The news reached Hitler at the Munich town hall where he was attending a meeting of party leaders. He left the room with his escort, conferred briefly with Goebbels before boarding his special train. Goebbels returned to the meeting to announce that Rath's murder had inspired anti-Jewish riots in the districts of Kirchhessen and Magdeburg and Halt. The Führer, he said, had decided that if the riots spread spontaneously throughout Germany they were not to be discouraged. The party leaders took this to mean that they were to organize demonstrations while making it appear that they had nothing to do with them. But Sarchi Flutz either misunderstood Goebbels or refused to believe Hitler had given such a command. After assembling all Grupp and Führer present, he ordered them not to participate in any actions against the Jews. While these Tsar officials were transmitting Lutz's instructions, which in some cases were ignored, the party leaders were telephoning conflicting orders to the provinces. 
At first the SS did not participate in the ransacking of shops and burning of synagogues. Upon learning that Goebbels had ordered a pogrom, Himmler directed his men to prevent excessive looting, then dictated a file memorandum. The order was given by the propaganda directorate, and I suspect that Goebbels, in his craving for power, which I noticed a long time ago, and also in his empty-headedness started this action just at the time when the foreign political situation is very grave. His castigation may have been only for the record. Hours earlier Himmler himself had violently attacked the Jews in a secret speech to his SS generals. The Jews, he said, were bent on destroying Germany and so had to be driven from the Reich with unexampled ruthlessness. If Germany did not win this all-out battle against Jewry, there won't be a single refuge for a true Teuton left, everybody will be starved and butchered. If Himmler objected to the terrorism sweeping the country, his chief assistant did everything he could to capitalize on it. Soon after midnight Heydrich sent urgent teletypes to all headquarters and stations of the SD and police, enjoining them to cooperate with the party and SS leaders in organizing the demonstrations. Finally, as many Jews, particularly rich ones, were to be arrested as can be accommodated in existing prisons. For the time being, only healthy men, not too old, are to be arrested. Upon their arrest, the appropriate concentration camps should be contacted immediately in order to confine them in these camps as fast as possible. It was a night of despair for the Jews in Germany, with the police standing by as witnesses of the destruction and beatings. One policeman was found by the deputy police chief of Berlin weeping in front of a looted shoe shop. It had been his duty to enforce order and yet, in violation of all his ideals, he had done nothing. By official count 814 shops, 171 homes were destroyed, and 191 synagogues put to the torch. 36 Jews were killed and another 36 seriously injured. But the figures, Heydrich himself admitted, must have been exceeded considerably. Otto Tolisus cabled the New York Times that he had just witnessed a wave of destruction unparalleled in Germany since the Thirty Years' War. Beginning systematically in the early morning hours in almost every town and city in the country, the wrecking, looting and burning continued all day. Huge but mostly silent crowds looked on and the police confined themselves to regulating traffic and making wholesale arrests of Jews for their own protection. The reaction from abroad was immediate and the acts of brutality were given an unforgettable name, inspired by the multitude of smashed windows, Crystal Night. On all sides Germany was assailed as a barbarous nation. Many Germans agreed and other party officials beside Himmler joined in the condemnation of Goebbels. Frau Funk, wife of the Minister of Economics, overheard her husband cursing him over the phone, Are you crazy, Goebbels? To make such a mess of things. One has to be ashamed to be a German. We are losing our whole prestige abroad. I am trying, day and night, to conserve the national wealth, and you throw it willy-nilly out of the window. If this thing does not stop immediately, you can have the whole filthy mess. Goring complained directly to the Fuhrer that such events made it impossible for him to carry out his mission. I was making every effort, in connection with the four-year plan, he later testified, to concentrate the entire economic field to the utmost. I had, in the course of speeches to the nation, been asking for every old toothpaste tube, every rusty nail, every bit of scrap material to be collected and utilized. It would not be tolerated that a man who was not responsible for these things should upset my difficult economic tasks by destroying so many things of economic value on the one hand and by causing so much disturbance in economic life on the other hand. Then Hitler, according to Goring's account, made some apologies for Goebbels, but on the whole he agreed that such events were not to take place and must not be allowed to take place. Hitler was already giving the impression that he knew nothing of Crystal Knight and added his own complaints. It is terrible, he told Frau Drust. They have destroyed everything for me like elephants in a china shop. And much worse. I had the great hope that I was about to come to an understanding with France. And now that. But Fritz Hess, 
summoned to Munich from London for a special press conference, claimed he overheard otherwise from Hitler's own lips the very night Crystal Knight was set into motion. At dinner the Führer was boasting how he had bluffed the English and French at Munich when an adjutant whispered something to Goebbels. He turned and muttered to Hitler. At first Hess couldn't hear what was said, but when the others at the table lapsed into silence it became clear that the propaganda minister was explaining a mass attack which he and the Tsar were going to launch against the Jewish shops and synagogues in a few hours. There was no doubting the Führer's approval, recalled Hess. Hitler squealed with delight and slapped his thigh in his enthusiasm. 1. The following day Hess called on Ribbentrop, who was still irritated at not being invited to the previous day's press conference. First, he labeled the Munich conference a piece of first-class stupidity. All it meant was that it postponed hostility for a year, when the English would be much stronger. Believe me, it would have been much better if war had come now. We hold all the military trumps. Who knows what will happen in a year. But the worst was that the Führer imagined he had called the English bluff. For years I've tried to make it clear to him that he must be careful of the English because they are dangerous. But he won't believe it. Instead he fools about and makes bombastic speeches. You heard him yourself yesterday. As for that little beast, Goebbels, have you heard what his gangs have done everywhere? These imbeciles have smashed up the Jewish shops, which have long been Aryan property and Nihau. They've spoiled my game for me. 2. Despite Hitler's protestations to moderates, the pogrom continued and by November 12 an estimated 20,000 Jews had been shipped to concentration camps. That day Goring, who had objected to the destruction of property on economic grounds, called a meeting of the Council of Ministers to determine who would have to pay for it. He began by announcing that this conference was of decisive importance and his next words had a significance his listeners could not fathom at the time. I have received a letter from Bormann sent me by order of the Führer, asking that the Jewish question be now, once and for all, treated in its entirety and settled in some way. Yesterday the Führer telephoned me to point out again that decisive measures must be undertaken in a coordinated manner. Inspired by this directive, the conferees agreed that the Jews themselves would have to pay for the damage in the form of a billion mark fine. I certainly would not like to be a Jew in Germany, remarked Goring and brought the four-hour meeting to a close with a grim forecast, if in the near future the German Reich should come into conflict with foreign powers. It goes without saying that we in Germany should first come to a showdown with the Jews. Furthermore, the Führer was about to suggest to those foreign powers so concerned over the plight of German Jews that they be deported to the island of Madagascar. He explained it to me November 9, concluded Goring. He wants to say to the other countries, why are you always talking about the Jews? Take them. While this plan for the complete elimination of Jews from the Reich economy was getting underway, other Germans, including many party leaders, were privately expressing deep concern at the excesses of Crystal Knight. The bureaucrats and party leaders, aware that such violent actions always get out of hand, protested that a pogrom was too costly and accomplished almost nothing in the battle against Jews. Others were repelled by the inhumanity of such actions but did little more than grumble cautiously. Gerhard Hauptmann, for instance, complained to a friend that Hitler had ruined Germany. This scum will bring war to the whole world, this miserable brown comedian, this Nazi hangman is rushing us into a world of war, into destruction. Then why didn't Hauptmann emigrate in protest like man and Zweig? Because I'm a coward replied the famous playwright, do you understand? I'm a coward. Those safe from reprisals were heaping abuse on Hitler. Almost every newspaper and radio commentator in the United States responded to Crystal Knight with outrage. From Washington, Ambassador Dijkhoff wrote the Foreign Office that he hoped the storm at present sweeping across the United States will subside again in the foreseeable future and we shall be able to work again. Until Crystal Knight. He reported, most Americans ignored the anti-German propaganda but now even German Americans were incensed. What particularly strikes me is the fact that, 
with few exceptions, the respectable patriotic circles, which are thoroughly anti-communist and, for the greater part, anti-Semitic in their outlook, also begin to turn away from us. The fact that the Jewish newspapers write still more excitedly than before is not surprising, but that men like Dewey, Hoover, Hearst, and many others who have hitherto maintained a cooperative reserve and have even, to some extent, expressed sympathy toward Germany, are now publicly adopting so violent and bitter an attitude against her is a serious matter. In the general atmosphere of hate, the idea of boycotting German goods has received new fuel, and trade negotiations cannot be considered at the moment. National outrage was climaxed by a rare denunciation from President Roosevelt. At a news conference on November 15 he read a prepared statement to the reporters. The news from Germany, he said, had deeply shocked American public opinion. I myself could scarcely believe that such things could occur in 20th century civilization. With a view to gaining a first-hand picture of the situation in Germany I have asked the Secretary of State to order our ambassador in Berlin to return at once for report and consultation. But official condemnation did not extend beyond the verbal and the United States continued its trade relations with the Third Reich. Perhaps the protests from abroad had some effect on Hitler. A week after Crystal Knight he supported the civil service, which sought to protect in the part Jew that part which is German, rather than the party which looked on the part Jew as a carrier of the Jewish influence. His support came in the form of the first regulation to the Reich citizenship law which separated so-called non-Aryans into definite categories. A Jew was defined as anyone descended from at least three Jewish grandparents, or an individual with two Jewish grandparents who also belonged to the Jewish religious community or was married to a Jew. Then came a curious category, the mislenge, half-breeds, those descended from only one Jewish grandparent, or those with two Jewish grandparents who neither practiced the Jewish religion nor were married to a Jew. In practice this split non-Aryans into two distinct groups with the mislenge no longer subject to repressive measures. With one bureaucratic stroke Hitler made it possible for a substantial portion of the hated enemy to escape his wrath. Was his resolve to exterminate Jews truly weakening or, again, was he merely waiting for a more suitable time to act decisively? Or was this a conscious or even unconscious attempt to save himself, since there was still the possibility that one of his own grandfathers was Jewish? The Mislange regulation also saved Jesus, who by Hitler's argument, being the son of God, had but two Jewish grandparents, neither did he practice the Jewish religion, nor was he married to a Jew. 2. From his youth Hitler had held cynical views of the democracies and their leaders' ability to speak one way while acting another. Consequently he was not as concerned about the vocal protests from the West throughout the latter part of 1938 as were many of his most faithful followers. Rudolf Hess, for one, was extremely downcast. On December 23 he spent two hours with the Bruckmans, early supporters of the Führer, and told how he had implored Hitler in vain to stop the pogrom. While Hitler must have been aware of the defection of these old adherents, he remained in such good spirits that he let himself be persuaded to wear tails for the New Year's Eve celebration at the Berghof. My sister, Ilse Braun wrote in her diary, had been at great pains to persuade him to dress with a minimum of good taste. Look at Mussolini, she would say, he has a new uniform. And you, with those postman's caps. He kissed Ilse's hand, remarking that the Braun sisters were all beauties. When he looked at me, beads of sweat formed between my breasts, and I did not have the courage to say Danksken, though I had promised myself to make a great speech. After accepting formal congratulations from the guests and his staff, the Führer participated in an ancient Teutonic ceremony. Molten lead was poured into a small basin of water and the shape it assumed supposedly determined the future. Hitler did not seem satisfied with his results, for afterwards he sat down in an armchair, gazing dejectedly at the fire, and hardly spoke for the rest of the evening. Eva was extremely worried about him. His dark mood was intensified a few days later by a revolt of bankers against his vast rearmament program. 
the reckless expenditures of the Reich, read a memorandum composed by Helmich Act, president of the Reichsbank, and signed by every governor of the bank, represents a most serious threat to the currency. The tremendous increase in such expenditures foils every attempt to draw up a regular budget, it is driving the finances of the country to the brink of ruin despite a great tightening of the tax screw, and by the same token it undermines the Reichsbank and the currency. The stability of the currency, warned Schacht, could not be stabilized in the face of such an inflationary expenditure policy and the time has come now to call a halt. Schacht knew that Hitler would be infuriated because the declaration in effect called for the end of military adventures. He told Schwerin von Krossig what he had done, adding that he expected to be fired. He had already lost his post as Minister of Economics to Wall the Funk, whose powers were promptly annexed by Goring as chief of the four-year plan. The finance minister said that if Schacht went he would ask for his own dismissal, then composed a similar memorandum and sent it to the Führer. Days passed but nothing happened. Finally at midnight of January 19, 1939, Schacht's phone rang. He was ordered to report to the Führer the following morning at nine. It was an unusual hour for an interview since Hitler rarely went to bed before three in the morning. According to Schacht, the Führer said, without preamble, I have called you in order to hand you your dismissal as president of the Reichsbank. Schacht took the piece of paper extended to him. You don't fit into the National Socialist picture, continued Hitler then waited for some comment. Schacht remained silent until Hitler reprimanded him for condemning Crystal Knight at a Christmas party of bank office boys. If I had known that you approved of those happenings, Schacht finally said, I might have kept silent. This reply seemed to take Hitler's breath away. In any case, he said indignantly, I'm too much upset to talk to you anymore now. Both men agreed that Schacht should take a long trip abroad and he left for India soon thereafter. Hitler was relieved to be rid of him. When it is a question of a bit of sharp practice, Hitler later told his inner circle, Schacht is a pearl beyond all price. But whenever he was called upon to show strength of character, he always failed. Soon after Schacht's dismissal Captain Weidmann was summoned to the Winter Garden. For the past months Hitler had been treating him with increasing coolness and Weidmann guessed he too was going to be fired. Ever since Crystal Knight the Führer had seemed to inhabit an imaginary world which had nothing in common with reality and whenever Weidmann attempted to discuss any defect in the system Hitler ignored him. I have no use for people in high places and in my closest circle who do not agree with my politics, Hitler curtly told Weidmann. I hereby discharge you as my personal adjutant and appoint you Consul General in San Francisco. You can accept or refuse this new position. Without hesitation Weidman accepted, adding that he hoped he wouldn't have to take a cut in salary. At this, Hitler's tone became milder. I will always keep an open ear for your financial welfare. Thus, after four years close association, the two war comrades parted without bitterness. The exit of Schacht and Weidmann signaled a return to grace of Joseph Goebbels, who had fallen from favor due to his sexual adventures. Every woman inflames my very blood, he wrote in his twenties. I pace back and forth like a wolf. Nor had marriage to Magda restrained him. At the same time he kept his numerous affairs under control, never compromising himself publicly. That is, until he fell in love with Czech actress Lida Barova in the summer of the Olympics. Magda imagined it was one of his usual flirtations but finally lost her patience in 1938 and demanded a divorce. Hitler had shown remarkable tolerance to homosexuality but was distressed by the party leaders who abandoned mates who had helped in the rise to power. He demanded that Goebbels give up the actress. At first he refused offering to resign from his ministry and become an ambassador to Japan or some such distant country. Finally he succumbed to pressure and renounced his great love. No sooner had Barova returned to Czechoslovakia under advice from the police than Hitler summoned the entire Goebbels family to the Berghof. Pictures of the couple and three of their children at the entrance to the Kalstein Tea House were published as public proof that all was well with the household.
This stage reconciliation took place only a few weeks before Crystal Knight and the anguish of losing leader Barova, along with a desire to rehabilitate himself with people like Himmler and Rosenberg who felt that the scandal had dealt the severest kind of blow to the moral status of the party might have caused him to act so recklessly that November night. The reinstatement of Goebbels coincided with Hitler's new approach to the Jewish question. On his most recent trip to her atelier in Munich, Frau Trust had urged Hitler to reinstate a Jewish composer, Arthur Peichler, to the School of Music in Augsburg. Why shouldn't Jews be judged individually? She argued. The few she knew were not only experts in their field but valuable human beings. Those are your personal experiences, said Hitler after some thought. If I'd had similar ones, then I never would have taken my path. But I had much different experiences like those in Vienna. He must place the fate of the German people above all else. The Jew lives and serves his own law but never that of the people or the nation where he has become a citizen. He does not belong to the German people and can therefore be among us only as a guest but not as it was during the period between 1918 to 1933 when he took all the top positions in art, culture, and the press, as well as in trade and the banks. It is my responsibility to see that our nation's future once more has a healthy and strong foundation based on national characteristics. I have made it my life work to build a safe existence and future for the German people and especially the German worker. This was all a prelude to refusing her request on principle. Curiously, on his next visit to Munich he reversed himself and agreed to reinstate Professor Peichler. Just as the false accusations of troop movements on the Czech borders early in 1938 had roused Hitler to premature action, so the storm of protests from abroad over Crystal Knight may have hardened his resentment toward Jews and prompted him to look for new ways of dealing with them. An indication of this complete loss of objectivity came on January 21, 1939 when he told Czech Foreign Minister Kvokovsky that no German guarantee would be given to a state which did not eliminate its Jews. Our own kindness was nothing but weakness and we regret it, he said. This vermin must be destroyed. The Jews are our sworn enemies and at the end of this year there will not be a Jew left in Germany. They were not going to get away with what they had done in November 1918. The day of reckoning has come. A few days later a foreign ministry circular on the Jewish question as a factor in foreign policy was dispatched to all diplomatic missions and consulates. The ultimate aim of Germany's Jewish policy, it said, is the emigration of all Jews living on German territories. Since the advent of National Socialism only slightly more than 100,000 Jews had legally or illegally left Germany to find homes in new host countries. Even this modest influx of Jews from Germany had already aroused the resistance of the native populations of America, France, Holland and Norway. Despite the moral denunciation of Germany, the Western nations were hermetically sealing their own boundaries against Hitler's Jews. This groundswell of anti-Semitism confirmed the validity of shipping out Jews en masse, and the goal of the new German policy, concluded the circular will be an international solution of the Jewish question in the future, not dictated by false sympathy for the Jewish religious minority which has been expelled, but by the mature realization by all peoples of the danger which the Jews represent for the racial preservation of the nations. On January 29 Hitler proclaimed his abrupt change in tactics even more explicitly. In a speech to the Reichstag on the sixth anniversary of the Nazi rise to power he declared war on world Jewry. Significantly, hours earlier he had ordered the Navy to begin building a mighty submarine fleet to be completed within five years. England, America and France, he charged, were continually being stirred up to hatred of Germany and the German people by Jewish and non-Jewish agitators, when all he wanted was peace and quiet. These lying attempts to bring about a war could not in the slightest influence Germany's manner of settling her Jewish problem, he said and for the first time since his rise to power he publicly lifted the veil on his ultimate plan, in the course of my life I have often been a prophet, and have usually been ridiculed for it. I will once more be a prophet, 
if the international Jewish financiers in and outside Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevization of the earth, and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. He was crying out to the Jews the paranoic warning, Stop, before you force me to kill you. 3. In the past year Hitler had destroyed one sovereign state, reduced and paralyzed another and, in the process, humbled the West. 1939 promised even greater political conquests. On January 1 Mussolini finally made up his mind to accept the German offer of the past autumn and transform the anti comintern pact from a propaganda front to a full-fledged military alliance. During this month, wrote Chen o in his diary, he plans to prepare the acceptance of his views by public opinion, about which he doesn't give a damn. The reason, Mussolini feared war with the West was now inevitable. In his New Year's message Hitler announced that the German government had but one wish. That in the coming year, too, we may succeed in contributing to the German pacification of the world. The next step in his peaceful program of pacification was the complete control of Czechoslovakia. For some time he had regretted the Munich Pact since it had become apparent he could have annexed the entire country without reprisals. Now he would have to find some acceptable excuse to march in and liquidate what was left. In February he ordered Goebbels to launch a massive propaganda campaign against the Czech government, it was still terrorizing its ethnic German citizens, concentrating troops along the Sudeten borders, conspiring with the Soviets and grossly mistreating its Slovak population. The last accusation proved to be the most fruitful for radical Slovak nationalists eagerly rose to the bait and began increasing their demands for complete independence. It was an explosive situation that needed but a single misstep from some inexperienced Czech in high places to set off another crisis, and give Hitler the excuse he needed. In London the spirit of anti-appeasement was reinforced by a fallacious report from Eric Court of the German Foreign Office. He secretly informed a British official that Hitler was planning to bomb London in the near future. It was a deliberate attempt by the anti-Hitler group in Germany to push England into a war with the Reich and was only the first of other false alarms to be planted by court and other foreign office men in the plot, Chamberlain took the bombing scare seriously enough to call a special cabinet meeting and, although no Nazi planes appeared, the temperature of suspicion was raised. Ambassador Henderson was brought from Berlin to report on possible Hitler military action and he did his utmost to convince permanent Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs Cadogan that the Germans were not even contemplating any immediate wild adventure and that their compass is pointing towards peace. The astute Cadogan was not so sanguine. He suggested that Hitler's intentions were strictly dishonorable yet he too was hesitant to believe reports that Hitler was about to engulf Czechoslovakia. Henderson returned to his post in Berlin where he continued to send back optimistic assessments. Rumors of Nazi adventures in the Ukraine or in Holland were dying down, he reported. Although it is suggested in some quarters that this calm may only be a prelude to another storm, I am not inclined to take that pessimistic view at present. Yet the very next night even he was concerned by Hitler's actions at the annual banquet for the diplomatic corps. The apparent friendliness which he had shown at the motor exhibition was notably absent at this dinner, Henderson wrote in his memoirs. He kept his eyes fixed over my right shoulder and confined his remarks to general subjects, while stressing the point that it was not Britain's business to interfere with Germany in Central Europe. Although the Führer's attitude left Henderson with a feeling of vague uneasiness, he did not bother to mention it in his next report to London. Evidence of German intrigue was soon forthcoming. On March 6 British Ambassador Newton reported from Prague that relations between the Czechs and Slovaks seemed to be heading for a crisis. Matters had come to a head over a demand for financial assistance on the part of the Slovaks. What role, if any, Germany is playing in the dispute is a matter for conjecture but it may be noted that the Slovak Minister of Commerce and Minister of Transport visited Berlin last week accompanied by experts. For some reason this telegram was delayed 48 hours and by that time Henderson had recovered from his vague uneasiness. 
On March 9 he wrote Halifax a long letter, expressing conviction that both Hitler and the German people longed for peace. Hitler himself fought in the World War and his dislike of bloodshed, or any way of dead Germans, is intense. Although Nazi extremists might be tempted to urge continued aggression, Hitler's inclination as a demagogue would be to please the majority rather than the fanatical minority. That is one reason why, since I can find no justification for the theory that he is mad or even verging on madness, I am of the opinion that he is not thinking today in terms of war. 4. That evening the president of Czechoslovakia, Emil Hacker, who once admitted he understood very little about politics, finally committed the blunder Hitler was waiting for, he dismissed the Slovak government from office and ordered troops to prepare to move into the Slovakian district. The next day, Friday, Hacker declared martial law. Hitler reacted with rapidity. He cancelled his trip to Vienna to take part in the celebration of the Anschluss so that he could prepare for his next invasion. The slight but nagging fear that the Soviets might rush to Prague's aid was relieved almost immediately. Even as Hacker was resorting to martial law, Stalin told the 18th Party Congress that they must be cautious and not allow the West to use the USSR to pull its own chestnuts out of the fire. It was in line with Soviet policy to proclaim publicly that they were Czechoslovakia's only faithful ally while risking nothing. The excuse for inaction was that their pact with the Czechs required them to provide aid only after France had acted. On Saturday, his favorite day for a coup, Hitler went into action, improvising with customary agility. First he instructed General Kiitel to draft an ultimatum demanding that the Czechs submit to the military occupation of Moravia and Bohemia without resistance, then issue disruptive orders to agents in Czech and Slovak territory. At the same time Henderson was telephoning Halifax to proceed circumspectly. He doubted whether Herr Hitler has yet taken any decision and I consider it therefore highly desirable that nothing should be said or published abroad during the weekend which will excite him to precipitate action. Nothing was needed. That evening Hitler's two puppet leaders in Austria, accompanied by five German generals, drove across the Danube to break into a meeting of the new Slovak cabinet at their seat of government, Bratislava. The members were told to proclaim the independence of Slovakia but the new prime minister stalled for time by announcing that he would first have to discuss the situation with the Prague government. His predecessor, Joseph Tizo, a Roman Catholic priest who was a friar tuck in the flesh, had been placed in a monastery under house arrest, but he now dramatically re-entered the scene. The corpulent Monsignor Tizo, when I get worked up I eat half a pound of ham and that soothes my nerves, escaped from his prison and demanded that a meeting of the new Slovak cabinet be held early Sunday morning, March 12. At this secret convocation Tizer revealed that he had received an invitation to see Hitler in Berlin. He had accepted, he said, under threat of occupation by German and Hungarian troops. At exactly 7.40 p.m., March 13, Tizer was ushered into Hitler's office by Ribbentrop, the Führer, looking stem and implacable, was flanked by his two top military men, Braukic and Kiitel. Orders had already been issued to the army and air force to stand by for a possible invasion of Czechoslovakia at six o'clock on the morning of the 15th. Czechoslovakia, said Hitler accusingly, owes it only to Germany that she has not been mutilated further. Nor did the Czechs appreciate the great self-control exhibited by the Germans. He raised his voice, either in anger or a show of it, and asked what kind of a game they were playing. He assumed the Slovaks wanted independence and that was why he had prevented Hungary from seizing their territory. He wanted one question cleared up in a very short time. He accented each of these words, then put the question directly to Tizo, did Slovakia want to lead an independent existence or not? Tomorrow at midday, he said. I shall begin military action against the Czechs, which will be carried out by General von Braukic. He pointed to his commander-in-chief. Germany does not intend to take Slovakia into her Lebensraum, and that is why you must either immediately proclaim the independence of Slovakia or I will disinterest myself in her fate. To make your choice I give you until tomorrow midday, 
when the Czechs will be crushed by the German steamroller. Tizer hesitated briefly, then telephoned the Slovak cabinet in Bratislava and said in German that he was speaking from the Führer's office. He requested them to convene the Slovak parliament for the following morning. Once he was sure his stupefied listeners understood the message, Tizer rang off. He arrived in Bratislava in time to read to the assembled deputies a Slovak declaration of independence drafted by Ribbentrop. Opposition to the proclamation collapsed and a new Slovakia, independent in name only, was born. That afternoon in London, Chamberlain stoutly parried angry questions in the House of Commons over the government's failure to stand up to Hitler. What about Britain's guarantee to Czechoslovakia? asked one critic. That guarantee, he retorted, referred only to unprovoked attack. No such aggression, he said, has taken place. While Chamberlain was making excuses in Parliament, Hitler acted and, as usual, made it appear as if he were only reacting. His tool in the final step of the drama was President Hacker of Czechoslovakia. Harried and confused by the events of the past few days, Hacker now urgently requested an interview with the Führer, a case of the fly seeking an invitation to the spider's net. After keeping Hacker in suspense for hours, Hitler finally agreed to see him. Already psychologically crushed, the president of Czechoslovakia, accompanied by his daughter and his foreign minister, boarded a train for Berlin. He could not fly because of a weak heart. As he was leaving Prague a British newsman who had often seen Hitler at close quarters arrived. Sefton Delmer noticed that the habitués of cafés on Wenceslas Square were stolidly sipping their coffee unaware of what was going on. Suddenly, at dusk, troops of white-stockinged Sudeten Germans, six abreast, marched through the square, carrying Nazi banners and shouting, Sig Heil! Sig Heil! They were followed by fascist collaborators waving the Czech trickler. At first the crowds obeyed the demands to salute the Nazi banners. But once the factories closed and the workers flooded into the square there was a different spirit. They refused to make way for the marchers and fighting erupted. The police supported the demonstrators, who continued to march about shouting, Ein Reich, Ein Volk, Ein Führer. If a Prague was symbolically German, the important Czech industrial town of Moravska Ostrava on the Polish border was already that in fact. Elite troops of Hitler's own bodyguard division occupied this area soon after dark to safeguard its modern steel mill from Polish seizure. In Berlin Hitler and his guests were assembling in the drawing room of the Chancellery to see a movie, A Hopeless Case. Next to the Führer sat General Key Eitel on hand to issue, if necessary, executive orders to begin the invasion. At 10.40 pm the train from Prague pulled into Anhalt station but it was not until an hour after midnight that Hacker was summoned by the Führer. He had waited that long, so he told Key Eitel, to give the old gentleman a chance to rest and recover from the tiring trip but the delay only increased Hacker's anxiety and by the time he and Foreign Minister Kvukovsky passed by an SS guard of honor and entered Hitler's study his face was flushed with agitation. Hacker made a personal appeal by assuring the Führer that he had never mixed in politics. In a sad exhibition of abasement, he threw himself on Hitler's mercy. He was convinced that the destiny of Czechoslovakia lay in the Führer's hands, read the official German minutes of the meeting, and he believed it was in safe keeping in such hands. Even this servility could not stem the vitriol stored up in Hitler. After repeating the alleged wrongs perpetrated by Masaryk and Benz, he charged that under the surface the Benz spirit lived in the new Czechoslovakia. Frail little hacker was a pitiable figure as he cringed under this attack. Abruptly Hitler, either from compassion or a need to change tactics, hastened to add that he did not mean to imply any distrust of Hacker, and he had come to the conclusion that this journey by the president, despite his advanced years, might be of great benefit to this country because it was only a matter of hours now before Germany intervened. Both Hacker and his foreign minister sat as if turned to stone until Hitler again gave them a glimmer of help by insisting that he harbored no enmity against any nation and remained convinced of Hacker's loyalty. But this was extinguished by a declaration that the Benz tendencies still flourished. 
The die had been cast on Sunday, said Hitler. The order for the invasion by the German troops and for the incorporation of Czechoslovakia into the German Reich had already been given. The two Czechs sat stupefied. Hitler announced that his army would enter their country from all sides at 6 a.m. while the Luftwaffe occupied all Czech airfields. Threat was again followed by promise. Hacker could serve Czechoslovakia by a simple decision. He would have to act quickly, or at 6 o'clock German troops and planes would go into action. I would have irremediably lost face if I'd had to put this threat into execution, Hitler recalled several years later for at the hour mentioned fog was so thick over our airfields that none of our aircraft could have made it sortie. He suggested that Hacker and his foreign minister withdraw to discuss privately what should be done, but to Hitler's relief Hacker said, the position is quite clear. He admitted that resistance would be folly yet how could he possibly restrain the nation in less than four hours? Hitler replied that it had to be done somehow then added hopefully that he saw dawning the possibility of a long period of peace between the two peoples. If the decision was to resist, he concluded sharply, he saw the annihilation of Czechoslovakia. With these ominous words, Hitler ended the interview. As the two dejected Czechs were escorted to an adjoining room, Ribbentrop attempted to place a telephone call to Prague. The line was out of order and Schmidt was asked to try again. As the interpreter was dialing he heard Goring exclaim from the adjoining room that Hacker had fainted. A call went out for Dr. Morrill, who had been kept on duty in case the ailing Czech president needed him. If anything happens to Hacker, thought Schmidt, the whole world will say tomorrow that he was murdered in the chancellery. Just then the line to Prague was opened. Schmidt went for Hacker and to his surprise found him recovered thanks to Dr. Morrill's vitamin injection. Hacker came to the phone and, after informing his cabinet what had happened, advised capitulation. In the meantime Schmidt was making a fair copy of a brief official communique which had been composed beforehand. It stated that the president of Czechoslovakia confidently laid the fate of the Czech people and country in the hands of the Führer of the German Reich. It was, in reality, a document of surrender and Hacker asked for another of Moral's injections. This revived him so much that he refused to sign it despite urgings of Ribbentrop and Goring. These two, according to the official French report, then proceeded to hound the two Czechs pitilessly. They literally hunted Dr. Hacker and Mr. Kvokovsky round the table on which the documents were lying, thrusting them continually before them, pushing pens into their hands incessantly repeating that if they continued in their refusal, half of Prague would lie in ruins from bombing within two hours, and this would only be the beginning. Hundreds of bombers were waiting the order to take off, and they would receive that order at six in the morning if the signatures were not forthcoming. 3. At last Hacker gave in and, face still flushed, signed the document at 3.55 am with trembling hand. He turned to Dr. Morrill and thanked him for his ministrations. The moment the pen dropped from Hacker's nerveless fingers the Führer rushed from the conference room to his office where his two middle-aged secretaries were waiting. His face was transfigured, recalled Christa Schroeder, as he exclaimed, Children, quickly, give me a kiss. Quickly. Schroeder and Wolf bust him on both cheeks. Hacker has just signed. He said in exultation. It is the greatest triumph of my life. I shall go down in history as the great German. Late as it was, Hitler stayed up to savor the triumph. I was sorry for the old gentleman, he confided to Hoffman, and other intimates. But sentimentality, in the circumstances, would have been out of place and might well have jeopardized success. Dr. Morrill interrupted to remark that but for him the communique might not have been signed. Thank God, he said, that I was on the spot and in time with my injections. You go to hell with your damn injections! exclaimed Hitler. You made the old gentleman so lively that for a moment I feared he would refuse to sign. The celebration was briefly interrupted by Key Eitel, who reported that executive orders for the invasion of Czechoslovakia had been issued with the proviso not to open fire unless there were signs of resistance and even then there would be attempts to negotiate before resorting to force of arms. 
he asked Hitler's permission to retire and was instructed to report back in a few hours so he could accompany the Führer to the special train which would take them to the Czech border. 5. At dawn on March 15 two disheveled men, ashy pale with fear, appeared at the American legation in Prague to ask for asylum. They revealed they had been Czech spies in Germany and were known to the local Gestapo. Their faces were twitching and their lips trembling when I sent them away, recalled George Kennan. A little later he had to follow instructions and turn two German fugitives from Hitler into the snow-swept street where they were no more than hunted animals. Next came a Jewish acquaintance who had to be told he could stay only until he could calm his nerves. He paced wretchedly up and down in the anteroom, through the long morning hours. In London, Lord Halifax first learned of the invasion from his ambassador in Prague. Several hours later Henderson phoned from Berlin advising his chief to postpone the visit of the President of the Board of Trade to Germany. It does not appear to me possible to prevent Germany from restoring order but I would nevertheless deprecate visits at this juncture of any British cabinet minister. Within the hour Henderson was on the phone again reading off the agreement signed by Hitler and Hacker, and at 11 a.m. he was dictating the text of a Hitler proclamation just issued to the German people, since Sunday, it read, wild excesses against Germans had taken place in many Czech villages, and from hour to hour the appeals from victims and persecuted had increased. The shell-shocked Henderson at least realized that it was the final shipwreck of his mission to Berlin. Do you wonder that I regard Berlin as a soul scarifying job? He hurriedly scrawled to Halifax in an informal letter. Hitler has gone straight off the deep end again. Hitler slept during most of the train trip from Berlin, not wakening until about noon on that memorable Ides of March. I must be the first in Prague, he told his valet as he dressed. The closer they came to the frontier the more excited he became. At mid-afternoon his party disembarked near the frontier and transferred to a ten-vehicle motor convoy. Hitler sat in the first car next to the driver, Kempke, as the column set off slowly in the blinding snowstorm. They passed through the open barriers of both customs stations and before long came upon German marching columns struggling in the drifts and ice. Kempke turned off the main road onto winding lanes and muddy by-roads and it was dusk before they reached Prague. No one took notice of the convoy as it approached Radskin Palace. The party was billeted in the castle and someone was sent into town to get cold Prague ham, rolls, butter, cheese, fruit and pilsner beer. It was the first time Key Eitel ever saw Hitler drink beer. The reaction to Germany's latest aggression was immediate and vehement. In response to public indignation, both the French and British governments gave military guarantees to Poland, Romania, Greece and Turkey and at the same time inaugurated political and military talks with the Soviets. Outrage extended to Hitler's own ally and that evening Chen O caustically wrote in his diary that the invasion of Czechoslovakia had destroyed the state established at Munich. The Führer had already sent Prince Philip von Hess to Rome with a letter of explanation. He hoped that Mussolini would understand and look at the latest move in the right light. Although Il Duce grumbled to Chen O, the Italians will laugh at me, every time Hitler takes another state, he sends me a message, he decided that now, more than ever, it was essential to ally himself with a winner. We cannot change our policy now, he said, after all, we are not political whores. At the same time submission to his junior partner was humiliating. Never before had Chen O seen his father-in-law in such distress. Hitler was oblivious to criticism from home or abroad and his complacency seemed justified on March 16. As he surveyed his latest conquest from the walls of the Castle of the Kings of Bohemia, the swastika flying from its battlements, he savored the pleasure of possessing an ancient city with so many historical memories to Teutons. In front of the city hall 27 leaders of the Protestant uprising against the Habsburgs had been beheaded in 1621, and in the Republic Platz Kaiser Wilhelm, Bismarck and Moltke had resided during the Prussian-Austrian War at the famous Hotel Zumblenstern. The magnificent structures of Prague, a number designed by German architects, owed much in his opinion to Teutonic culture. Only Germans built such bridges 
towers and buildings. An aide interrupted Hitler's reverie to inform him that neither France nor Britain had mobilized. I knew it, he said and made a prediction, in 14 days no one will talk about it anymore. Of more interest to him was the report that pro-Nazi checks were already coursing through Prague's streets marking Jewish shops in large colored letters, Jid or Jude. The factual dissolution of Czechoslovakia came later in the day when Monsignor Tizo sent a telegram to Berlin asserting Slovak independence and requesting German protection. Without delay Hitler's troops moved into Slovakia. The provinces of Ruthenu also asked to be absorbed into his orbit, but Hitler was more interested in appeasing the Hungarians, whose troops he allowed to swarm over the border and seize Ruthenian territory all the way to the Polish frontier. After a mere 20 years of independence all of Czechoslovakia was again in bondage. Although they had stopped short of mobilization, the British were infuriated. I can well understand Herr Hitler's taste for bloodless victories, Halifax warned the German ambassador, but one of these days he will find himself up against something that will not be bloodless. For some time he as well as the outspoken Cadogan had objected to aspects of Chamberlain's appeasement policy yet had supported him out of loyalty. But the moment had come to take a stand. The foreign secretary went to Chamberlain and made it clear that the nation, the party and the House of Commons demanded that Hitler's aggressions be condemned publicly and positively. Chamberlain heeded this advice. On the 18th Ambassador Henderson was temporarily recalled from Berlin and that night, the eve of his 70th birthday, the Prime Minister made a speech at Birmingham which changed the course of British foreign policy. He warned that it would be a great mistake to suppose that Great Britain, despite its detestation of war, has so lost its fibre that it will not take part to the uttermost of its power in resisting such a challenge if it were made. It was hardly an inspiring call to arms but, coming from this symbol of conciliation, it aroused the audience to enthusiasm, for it did mean the virtual end of appeasement. It also revealed that Hitler had made his first serious miscalculation. Czechoslovakia was his by threat of force but in time it would inevitably have fallen peaceably into his orbit, and by breaking an international agreement, freely entered into by his own government, he had completely reversed official and public opinion in both France and England. No longer would Chamberlain and his followers take Hitler at his word. He had broken the rules of the game, and not for a good enough cause. How, then, had the Fuhrer come to make such an obvious blunder? First, he had not expected his move to provoke such a violent reaction. Hadn't the West accepted the same excuses for restoring law and order in Austria? Hadn't they been satisfied with just as specious arguments at Munich? He had been convinced he must seize the territory Germany needed to guarantee the future of the Teutonic race while he still had his physical vigor and Germany's military strength was still superior to that of its enemies. When he marched into Czechoslovakia he was not certain where he would strike next or against whom, only that he must have Bohemia and Moravia before launching, or threatening to launch, any further military action. And so in Hitler's eyes he had committed no blunder only sustained a public relations setback. What concerned him was the next step. 1 Johannes Poppitz, the Prussian Minister of Finance, got a similar account from Goring. When Poppitz remarked that those responsible for Crystal Knight should be punished, the Reichsmarschall replied blandly, My dear Poppitz, do you wish to punish the Führer? 2 In reply to post-war claims that Goebbels had nothing to do with Crystal Knight, his personal adviser, Leopold Gutterer, signed an affidavit to the effect that Goebbels admitted his involvement at a small party in 1942. Influential circles of the National Socialist economic leadership, Goebbels reportedly said, took the emphatic standpoint that one could not remove the Jews from the economic life of Germany to any greater extent than had been done to date. Therefore, we decided, good. Then we will mobilize the streets and in that way solve the problem within 24 hours. 3 Goring admitted at Nuremberg that he had told Hacker, I should be sorry if I had to bomb beautiful Prague. But he hadn't intended doing it since resistance could always be broken more easily without such bombing. But a point like that might, 
I thought, serve as an argument and accelerate the whole matter. Chapter 19 The Fox and the Bear January to August 24, 1939 1. On the day Hitler announced the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia from Radskin Castle, the British Foreign Office was warned by the Romanian ambassador that secret sources indicated Hitler would take over Romania and Hungary within the next few months. Those hastily reconstructing foreign policy in London were led further astray by an alarming note from their own ambassador in Paris. It was filled with errors since Sir Eric Phipps typed it himself for the sake of secrecy. Hitler's personal wish, he wrote, backed by Goering, Himmler, Ribbentrop, Goebbels and Reichenau, is to make war on Great Britain before June or July. The information had probably been planted by the German anti-Hitler faction in their continuing effort to start a shooting conflict. The Führer, in fact, had no desire to fight England, and the proposed domination of both Romania and Hungary was still only in the economic sphere. His sights were set on a solution of Germany's festering differences with Poland, which had been created after the World War by the Allies primarily to contain German aggression. Not only had the Rhine lost most of the provinces of West Prussia and Posen but a corridor was cut to the Baltic along the Vistula River to give landlocked Poland an outlet to the sea. Danzig, at the end of this corridor, was made a free city so it could serve Poland as a seaport. Nothing aroused patriotic Germans more than this so-called Polish corridor which isolated their province of East Prussia from the rest of the fatherland. And the focal point of resentment lay in Danzig, which was populated almost exclusively by Germans. Surprisingly, the most nationalistic of Germans devoted little space to the Polish question in Mein Kampf and his early speeches. It was not that Hitler entertained friendly feelings for the Poles a non-Aryan inferior people according to his standards, but that he was obsessed by the Soviet Union, the only country large enough to meet Germany's needs for living space. From the beginning of his regime Hitler had minimized the Polish question and in 1934 signed a ten-year non-aggression pact with Warsaw. Publicly he made a show of German-Polish friendship and at Munich, it will be remembered graciously invited the Poles to join in the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia. This they did with relish, not realizing that the guests at such banquets usually pay the bill in the end. It was presented a month after Munich when Ambassador Joseph Lipsky was invited to have lunch with Ribbentrop at the Grand Hotel in Berchtesgaden. At last the time had come, said Ribbentrop, to settle their differences. He proposed, and his manner was friendly that Poland return Danzig and allow Germany to construct its own corridor linking East Prussia with the rest of the Reich. In return Germany would let Poland use Danzig as a free port, guarantee her existing borders and extend their pact. Ribbentrop further suggested that the two countries cooperate on the emigration of Jews from Poland and establish a joint policy towards Russia on the basis of the anti cominton pact. Since many influential Poles shared Hitler's fear of Red Russia and hatred of Jews, the prospects of a peaceful settlement seemed hopeful. But the Polish Foreign Minister, Colonel Joseph Beck, kept avoiding Hitler's invitations to Germany while doing his best to strengthen links with Russia. Late in 1938 a joint statement of Russo-Polish friendship was issued and trade talks were initiated. This double game could not be played indefinitely with a man such as Hitler and at last Beck was forced to accept his hospitality. Early in January 1939 he came to the Berghof. If he feared being browbeaten like Shusnik, Tizo and Hacker, he was pleasantly surprised. There were no threats, only inducements as Hitler hinted of possible liquidation of Czechoslovakia with further benefits to Poland. This approach failed. As diplomatically as possible Beck refused even to consider the return of Danzig. Several weeks later Ribbentrop journeyed to Warsaw so he could repeat the German offer.
he was treated to a round of dancing, theater and hunting along with an endless supply of caviar and green vodka but at the conference table he got nothing but more Polish charm. It was rumored at the Wilhelmstrasse that Hitler, offended at Beck's continued refusal to accept what he considered a most generous offer, shouted that the only way to deal with the Poles was by threat. This tactic, used so successfully against Austria and Czechoslovakia, was implemented that March. Ribbentrop warned Warsaw that Polish outrages against the German minority were becoming intolerable. This pronouncement was followed by a press campaign with Goring's newspaper, Die Zeitung, charging that German women and children were being molested in Polish streets while German houses and shops were smeared with tar. Far from intimidated, Beck summoned the German ambassador on Tuesday and made his own threat. Any attempt to change the status quo of Danzig would be regarded as an act of aggression against Poland. You want to negotiate at the point of a bayonet? exclaimed the German ambassador. That is your own method, said Beck. This and other indications of Polish pluck were rewarded by a startling offer of military assistance from London in case of Nazi aggression. Beck accepted without hesitation and on the last day of March Chamberlain, looking gaunt and ill, walked into the House of Commons and dropped wearily into his chair. A few minutes later he rose and began reading a statement slowly and quietly, head lowered as if he could barely make out the words. In the event of any action, which clearly threatens Polish independence, he said, and which the Polish government accordingly considers it vital to resist with their national forces, his majesty's government would feel themselves bound at once to lend the Polish government all support in their power. The Poles, he added, had been assured to this effect, and the French had authorized him to announce that they joined Britain in these assurances. As he sat down there was spontaneous cheering, the first genuine display of approval since his return from Munich. The unconditional offer was the first material proof that Chamberlain had indeed abandoned appeasement. At last England was united and committed. The following day, April 1, the Führer responded to this unanimity with a satirical speech. What right, he asked, had the English to interfere with Germany's right to live? If today a British statesman demands that every problem in the realm of vital German rights must first be discussed in England, then I could demand just as well that every British problem must first be discussed with us. Certainly, this Englishman might give me the answer that Palestine is no affair of the Germans. We do not want to have anything to do with Palestine. However, just as we Germans have no business in Palestine, so England has no business in Germany's living space. And if England maintained that the Germans had no right to do this or that, what right had the English to shoot down Arabs in Palestine who were only standing up for their homeland? He turned from sarcasm to threat. The German Reich, he said, is in no sense prepared to tolerate intimidation permanently, or even a policy of encirclement. This was relatively mild and it must have taken willpower to control his feelings so well. Privately he seethed, and, upon receiving confirmation of the British guarantee to the Poles that afternoon from Admiral Canaries, he flared up. Features distorted by rage, he stormed about the room, hammering his fists on the marble table and spewing curses. I'll cook them a stew they'll choke on. Could he have been thinking of a pact with Stalin? Perhaps Hitler's remarkable poise during the speech that evening came from the conviction that he was speaking from strength. Madrid had fallen to Franco, and the civil war in Spain had just officially ended. In addition, England's attention was being diverted that very day by fresh rumors of Italian pressure on Albania, a diversion that fitted neatly into Hitler's plan. He summoned Kiaitel and told him the Polish problem imperatively demanded a solution. What a tragedy it was! he said, that sly old Marshal Pilsudski, with whom he had signed the non-aggression pact, had died so prematurely. But the same might happen to himself at any time. That was why he would have to try as soon as possible to resolve this intolerable position for Germany's future whereby East Prussia was geographically cut off from the rest of the Reich, he could not postpone this job until later, or bequeath it to his successor. He was sure, he added, 
that Britain would turn her back on Poland once she saw Germany's determination. And so, as a result of his failure to realize that Britain had jettisoned appeasement in fact as well as in words, Hitler issued a war directive on April 3rd marked most secret and delivered by hand to senior commanders only. Since the situation on Germany's eastern frontier has become intolerable, and all political possibilities of peaceful settlement have been exhausted, it began, I have decided upon a solution by force. The attack on Poland, Operation White, would begin on the 1st of September. The responsibility for opening hostilities on the Western Front would be left to England and France. If these nations attacked Germany in retaliation, the way Macht was to conserve its strength in this quarter as much as possible. The right to order offensive operations is reserved absolutely in me. So was decision regarding any air attack on London. This indicated that he did not take seriously the Anglo-French pledge to support Poland. The Allies might, at worst, declare war but it would only be to save face and if the Germans restrained themselves from responding offensively a deal could be worked out. On such miscalculations are the fates of nations decided. This directive was countersigned by Key Eitel who, together with all the commanders he consulted, opposed any conflict with Poland. All agreed that Germany was not yet ready for war. Hitler's charge that political possibilities of a peaceful settlement with Poland had been exhausted was not without foundation. Not only was Colonel Beck avoiding discussions with Hitler but he had just arrived in Dover to consummate the pact with the British. He was welcomed warmly by officials and public alike. Beck enjoyed the lavish entertainment, particularly an intimate lunch with the King and Queen, but being aloof, secretive and suspicious, he embarked on the formal talks in a less receptive mood. He objected strenuously when Chamberlain, having swallowed his own suspicions of Russia, suggested that they both join the Soviets in an anti-Hitler front. Fearing a Russian attack far more than one from the Nazis, Beck refused to do anything to precipitate a war with Hitler. On this point he would not budge in the temporary mutual assistance pact with the British which he signed April 6 excluded any Soviet participation. Most nations operate their foreign policy on the pragmatic proposition that at least two irons in the fire are better than one. The Soviet Union, no exception, was negotiating simultaneously with England and Germany. This urgent need for allies stemmed in part from the dangerous weakening of the Red Army brought about two years earlier by Stalin's bloody purge, inspired, incidentally, by Hitler's elimination of the Rom Circle, of Marshal Tukhachevsky and other top military leaders. One, although it was not generally known, Germany had been secretly strengthening the Red Army for almost two decades. Both Germany and the Soviet Union had been excluded from the negotiations leading to the Versailles Treaty and, since outcast nations are often drawn together by shared grievances, they covertly began an extensive military collaboration. Its chief architect was the commander of the tiny post-war German army, General Hans von Siecht. Late in 1920 he created an administrative organization within the Defense Ministry with offices in Berlin and Moscow. Before long the Junkers Corporation was granted concessions for the manufacture of airplane motors in a suburb of Moscow while Bursal, a joint stock company, began manufacturing poison gases in Samara province. More significantly, German technical experts were helping the Russians establish three ammunition plants while a staff of 60 German military and civilian instructors trained a squadron of the Red Air Force composed solely of Germans. Similarly, German tank officers were being trained by German experts at a so-called heavy vehicle experimental and test station near Kazan. This mutually profitable secret arrangement developed, it will be recalled, into a political rapprochement which was formalized on Easter Sunday, 1922, by the Treaty of Rapallo. It was an effective alliance against the Versailles powers, giving assurance to the Soviets that Germany would not join in any international consortium to exploit their economy while freeing the Germans from threat of complete encirclement. But the rise of Hitler marked a turning point in Soviet-German relations which, by 1938, were practically at an end.
The tide again changed dramatically when the Munich Pact was signed by France and England without consulting the Soviets. Ignored by the West, the Soviet Union once more looked to Germany. Early in 1939 it accepted a Hitler overture to discuss a new trade treaty by inviting one of Ribbentrop's aides to Moscow, and a few days later Stalin gave credence to a sensational story in the London News Chronicle that he was signing a non-aggression pact with the Nazis. In a speech to the 18th Congress of the Communist Party he declared that the Soviet Union was not going to be drawn by the West into any war with Germany. We are in favor of peace and consolidation of our business relations with all countries. German newspapers seized upon the all as a further overture to the Reich, and Soviet newspapers responded by congratulating them for their discernment. Within a month Peter Klist, Ribbentrop's expert for Poland and the Baltic states, was instructed to improve his personal relations with the people at the Soviet embassy in Berlin. Klist wondered if this was a prelude to another dramatic change in foreign policy and it was with mixed feelings, a few days later, that he accompanied a German specialist in East European economic affairs to the Soviet embassy in its stately quarters on Unter den Linden. They had been invited to tea by Georgius Tukhov, the mild, ascetic-looking Soviet charged affair. It was obviously an unusual occasion, no other Russian was present. After chatting about French impressionism, Astakhov suggested they get down to business. It was absurd, he said, for Germany and the Soviet Union to fight each other over ideological subtleties. Why not establish a common policy? Klist remarked that ideological subtleties had become important realities but Astakhov waved this aside with a movement of his hand. Stalin and Hitler, he said, were men who created those realities and never let themselves be dominated by them. Klist left the embassy in a thoughtful mood. Obviously Estakhov was passing along a signal from the Kremlin to Ribbentrop. But to Klist's surprise Ribbentrop, who had ordered him to make the initial overture, now told him to avoid further contact with Estakhov. I do not think the Führer would wish that conversation to be continued. Stalin took the next step. On April 17 Soviet Ambassador Alexei Mirakulov called on Ribbentrop's chief subordinate, Baron von Weizsäcker. It was the Russians' first visit in ten months and the excuse for coming was a matter ordinarily handled at a lower echelon. Toward the end of their conversation Miracle of asked what Weizsäcker thought of Russian-German relations. His reply was, Germany always desired mutually satisfactory commercial relations with Russia. Ambassador Miracle of Sansa was an unmistakable signal for rapprochement. There existed for Russia no reason why she should not live with Germany on a normal footing. And from normal, the relations might become better and better. In the meantime the Soviets continued to woo the other side. But Chamberlain did not want to be rushed into closer diplomatic relations with Russia. He could not believe that she had the same aims and objects as Britain had, let alone any sympathy with democracy. The Prime Minister was convinced that a Russian alliance would divide Balkan resistance to Germany. And so, while playing hard to get with the Soviets, he buttressed the guarantee of assistance to Poland by offering another to Romania. On April 19 Romania's Foreign Minister, Grigoria Gafenku, called at the Reich Chancellery and received a first-hand impression of Hitler's reaction to this proposed guarantee. At first mention of England, he sprang from his chair and paced the room. Why, he shouted, couldn't the English see that he only wished to reach an agreement with them? If England wanted war she could have it. And it will be a war of unimaginable destructiveness, he warned. How can the English picture a modern war when they can't even put two fully equipped divisions in the field? The next day, April 20th, was Hitler's 50th birthday and perhaps his recent show of anger was an indication of impatience. Time was fleeting and he believed he had only a few more years of good health to accomplish his mission. The 1939 birthday was celebrated as usual by a major military parade. This magnificent spectacle, with all three branches of the Wehrmacht as well as the Waffen, armed, SS represented, was designed as a warning to enemies. At Hitler's express request the latest medium artillery, heavy tank guns, 
anti-aircraft guns and air force searchlight units were displayed. Overhead roared a menacing cloud of fighter and bomber squadrons. The attending foreign diplomats were suitably impressed by this greatest military display in German history, nor did they miss the significance of the guest of honor at Hitler's side, President Hacker of Czechoslovakia. Although numerous Germans were appalled by the demonstration, the majority felt a surge of pride to see such armed might. The 50th birthday was also an excuse to subject the public to another flood of propaganda in praise of Hitler. For a multitude of worshippers he was Germany's savior, the Führer is the only man in our century who has possessed the strength to take into his hand the thunderbolt of God and fashion it anew for mankind. For others he was more than Messiah, God himself, my children look upon the Führer as he who gives orders for everything, arranges everything. To them the Führer is the creator of the world. School children were taught to give homage in song. Adolf Hitler is our savior, our hero. He is the noblest being in the whole wide world. For Hitler we live. For Hitler we die. Our Hitler is our Lord. Who rules a brave new world. Hitler himself even forbade the use of the term Third Reich and complained to his inner circle of the growth of this cult worship, which in some instances went to ludicrous lengths. During a recent study course arranged by the party, a lady lecturer had told in all seriousness of her experience with a talking dog. When asked who is Adolf Hitler, the dog replied, Mein Führer. The lecturer was interrupted by an indignant Nazi who shouted that it was abominable taste to relate such a ridiculous story. The lecturer, on the verge of tears, replied, this clever animal knows that Adolf Hitler has caused laws to be passed against vivisection and the Jews' ritual slaughter of animals, and out of gratitude this small canine brain recognized Adolf Hitler as his Führer. If the church looked upon Hitler as neither the Messiah nor a God, it nevertheless honored him on his 50th anniversary. Special votive masses were celebrated in every German church to implore God's blessing upon Führer and people, and the Bishop of Mainz called upon Catholics in his diocese to pray specifically for the Führer and Chancellor, the Inspirer, Enlarger and Protector of the Reich. The Pope did not fail to send his congratulations. These honors did nothing to temper the anger Hitler had revealed to the Romanian ambassador nor was his resentment solely directed at England. Hitler was outraged by the recent appearance in the United States of an unauthorized condensed version of Mein Kampf which included passages omitted from the authorized American edition as well as editorial comments by Alan Cranston calling attention to Hitler's distortions. Printed in tabloid form and priced at 10 cents, half a million copies were sold in 10 days. On the cover was printed, not one cent of royalty to Adolf Hitler. To this affront was followed by another from President Roosevelt in the form of a joint message to Hitler and Mussolini, who had just invaded Albania, appealing for assurances against further aggressions. You have repeatedly asserted that you and the German people have no desire for war, Roosevelt told Hitler. If this is true there need be no war. Ruffled, Hitler delivered his answer on April 28. Never before had a speech such a large audience for it was broadcast not only throughout Germany and parts of Europe but carried by the major networks in the United States, an incredible contrast to the days in Vienna when Hitler would lecture to whoever would listen, if only the trees. Then his auditors often ignored or ridiculed him. Now the world trembled. The immense audience inspired him. William Shira, for one, never had heard the Führer speak so eloquently. He opened with a brilliant defense of his foreign policy that turned into a denunciation of Britain's new foreign policy which, he charged, thereby removed the basis for their naval treaty of 1935. This unexpected abrogation of a treaty he himself had so eagerly sought was followed by an equally devastating attack on Poland and cancellation of the Polish-German non-aggression pact since it had been unilaterally infringed by the Poles. Having torn up two treaties, Hitler proceeded to welcome new negotiations so long as they were on equal terms. No one, he said, would be happier than I at the prospect. It was a remarkable display of mental gymnastics soon surpassed by an assault on Roosevelt which, 
for the German audience, at least, was a masterpiece of irony and sarcasm. This was the Hitler of the early years, the beer hall entertainer and debater. He took up the president's message point by point, demolishing each one like a schoolmaster. His heavy sarcasm fell upon delighted ears in the Reichstag and with each riposte the laughter and applause grew louder. The presiding officer, Goring, led the uproar, his sides shaking. Three, when the Fuhrer at last came to the president's request for assurance that Germany would launch no more aggression, his answer was a sardonic counterattack that brought still heartier laughs, yet failed to respond to the question, was he going to invade Poland? The speech was designed more to satisfy Hitler's people than to persuade his enemies. What he needed was time to bring the Polish question to a favorable conclusion and, feeling that his address had accomplished its purpose, he went into virtual seclusion at his semi-official vacation residence, the Berghof. He refused to make a single attempt to approach Poland during the ensuing hot summer but to Russia he was readily available. The tentative offer of friendship so slyly advanced to Klistover teacups was developing into true romance. Shortly after the explosive Reichstag speech a seemingly innocuous item appeared on the back page of Soviet newspapers, Maxim Litvinov had been succeeded by V. M. Molotov. It was sensational news and nowhere was it more appreciated than in the German embassy. That evening the German charge telegraphed the Wilhelm stress that the foreign commissariat was giving no explanations but the dismissal appeared to be the result of differences of opinion between Stalin and Litvinov, whose wife, Ivy, was English. He himself symbolized collective security against the Axis, and his exit meant that Stalin was abandoning this line. The replacement of the Jewish Litvinov by a Gentile further indicated that Stalin, already distrustful of Britain's tentative overtures, was opening the door wider to his fellow anti-Semite in Berlin. The embarrassing fact that Molotov had a Jewish wife was kept from Hitler, not only by the Russians but by his own diplomats. The news of Litvinov's replacement by Molotov struck the Führer like a cannonball. Beyond their common violent hatred and fear of Jews, he had long grudgingly admired Stalin's ruthless methods. Even so Hitler was not yet convinced that collaboration with the Soviets was wise. On May 10 he summoned an expert on Russian affairs to Berchtesgaden to determine whether Stalin was prepared for a genuine understanding with Germany. Gustav Hilger, economic attaché at the German embassy in Moscow, with two decades experience in Russia was somewhat taken aback by such a query. He was tempted to give Hitler a resume of German-Soviet relations since 1933, and to remind him how often the Soviet government, during the first years of his rule, had expressed the desire of maintaining the old friendly relationship but restrained himself, merely reminding Hitler of Stalin's declaration to the party congress exactly two months ago that there was no reason for war with Germany. To Hilger's surprise neither Hitler nor Ribbentrop could remember the substance of Stalin's remarks. Hitler listened to Hilger's lengthy thesis that the Soviet Union was no military threat since she needed peace to build up her economy, but remarked as soon as Hilger left that he was a bit of a Russian himself now and might have succumbed to Soviet propaganda. But if he is right then I must not fall in with Stalin's peace overtures. I must interrupt the internal consolidation of that giant as quickly as possible. He ordered Ribbentrop to mark time with the Soviets. On his part, Stalin ordered Ostakhov to resume trade talks with the Germans. On May 20 Molotov inserted himself into the negotiations by inviting Ambassador von der Schulenberg to the Kremlin. The usually dour Molotov was a genial host but beneath the veneer of amiability lay a flint-like obduracy and once serious discussion got underway he complained that Hitler's apparent reluctance to conclude a new economic agreement gave the Soviets the impression that the Germans were not in earnest and were only playing at negotiating for political reasons. For the present, at least, the Führer was more concerned with strengthening his ties with Mussolini. Upset as he was by Il Duce's surprise invasion of Albania, Hitler had wanted a diversion, not the real thing, he had been negotiating ever since then for a more binding Axis treaty. This was signed with considerable ceremony in Berlin on May 22. 
dubbed the Pact of Steel, it bound Italy's destiny inextricably to Germany's. To Hitler the agreement was a diplomatic triumph, pledging as it did each party to support the other in case of war with all its military forces on land, on sea, and in the air. Incredibly Mussolini had been so anxious to please Hitler that he had not had his cabinet or his political and legal experts check the text, which did not even include a clause specifying that it was in effect only in case of attack by an enemy. Il Duce had carelessly placed the fate of Italy in his partner's hands. It was almost as if Hitler had received a license to risk war and the next day a confident Führer gathered the senior Wehrmacht officers in his study at the Chancellery. The solution of Germany's economic problems, he explained, had somehow become inextricably tied to her differences with Poland. Danzig is not the subject of the dispute at all. It is a question of expanding our Lebensraum in the east and of securing our food supplies, of the settlement of the Baltic problems. Therefore Poland, which would always side with Germany's enemies despite treaties of friendship, must be destroyed. We cannot expect a repetition of the Czech affair, he warned. There will be war. Our task is to isolate Poland. He reserved to himself the right to give the final order to attack since battle with Poland would be successful only if the West stayed on the sidelines. If this is impossible, then it will be better to attack in the West and settle Poland at the same time. The contradiction puzzled his listeners and, while most were staggered by Hitler's words, faithful Ki Itel convinced himself that the Führer was only trying to show his commanders that their misgivings were unfounded and that war would not really break out. This despite Hitler's next words, a bald prediction of a life and death war against England and France. The idea that we can get off cheaply is dangerous, there is no such possibility. We must bomb our boats, and it is no longer a question of justice or injustice but of life or death for 80 million human beings. The basic aim was to force England to her knees. We shall not be forced into a war, he said, but we shall not be able to avoid one. This was not the irrational ranting of a man possessed by the will to conquer but an admission that Germany could not continue as a great nation without war. Only the limitless resources of the East could save the Reich, and the alternative, accommodation with the West entailed unacceptable risks. If he exposed to the world that he had been bluffing and shirked the test of war, German prestige and power would deflate like a leaky balloon. With the possible exception of Key Eitel and Redda, the other listeners filed out of the Winter Garden in shock. As for the Führer, he set out for his refuge on the Ober Salzburg in high spirits, stopping off at Augsburg to see a local production of Lothingrin. Even as he relaxed at the Berghof, Hitler kept exploring the possibilities of a deal in the East. Although he had ordered Schellenberg to sit tight he began fretting about the English negotiations in Moscow. What if they concluded a treaty with the Bolsheviks before he did? If so, what would Stalin do if Germany invaded Poland? He had to know and on May 26 Rebentrop dictated instructions for Schulenberg to inform Molotov that Germany's former policy of hostility to the Comintern was to be abandoned if Hitler could be assured that the Soviets had, in fact, renounced their aggressive struggle against Germany as indicated by Stalin's recent speech. If so, then the time had come to envisage the tranquilization and normalization of German-Russian foreign political relations. Hitler was willing to postpone the dream of Lebensraum. He instructed Schulenberg to convince Molotov that the Germans had no intention at all of expanding into the Ukraine. The Russians also should not fear the recent Pact of Steel, which was aimed exclusively at the Anglo-French combination. Schulenberg was further enjoined to assure Molotov that, should Hitler find it necessary to use military force against Poland, the Soviet Union would not suffer. Furthermore, a pact with Germany was far more practical than one with perfidious Albion, which only wanted someone else to do her dirty work, as usual. The offer was tempting, for behind the diplomatic language was an obvious invitation to divide up Poland. And the argument that England and France could not, or would not, come to Poland's aid in time was one to appeal to a pragmatist like Stalin. This offer was made so spontaneously that the Wilhelmstrasse was thrown into a mild panic. 
First Ribbentrop hastily informed the Japanese ambassador of Hitler's proposal, then urged him to wire Tokyo for concurrence. While General Oshima's critics at home looked upon him as Hitler's toady, he could, if the occasion demanded, be extremely intransigent. He refused even to send such a telegram, arguing that any Axis accord with the Soviet Union, whose troops and tanks were battling the Japanese on the Manchurian Outer Mongolian border in a bitter if undeclared war, would destroy all chances of bringing Japan into the three power pact with Germany and Italy that Hitler desired and the Japanese had kept sidestepping. Disconcerted, Ribbentrop telephoned Ambassador Atolico for his opinion, not, he said, as ambassador but as expert on Russian affairs. Atolico agreed with Oshima that any Axis approach to the Kremlin would only make it easier for the Russians to sell more dearly its own goods in Paris and London. The harried Ribbentrop must have discussed the matter by phone with Hitler in Berchtesgaden and received new instructions. That evening another telegram went to Moscow cancelling the offer to the Russians. Ambassador von der Schulenberg should make no move without further orders. Concluding that he had approached the Russians on too high a level, Hitler ordered Weiz Sacker to sound out a stickoff. He did so on the last day of May and the tone and content of their talk was so reassuring that the Führer authorized a message to Schulenberg later that same day instructing him to undertake definite negotiations with the Soviet Union. On the heels of this message came another suggesting that economic talks with the Russians also be resumed. But Stalin's suspicions exceeded Hitler's and when nothing substantive had been achieved by the end of June the latter reluctantly ordered suspension of negotiations. The honeymoon that each side seemed so eager to consummate was off. 2. Stalin's western suitors were no nearer to a treaty than Hitler. In London Lord Halifax was reaching the end of his patience with the Kremlin's reluctance to get down to business. Saying no to everything, he complained to Ambassador Maisky, was not his idea of negotiation since it had a striking resemblance to Nazi methods of dealing with international questions. The Soviet answer was a tart article in Pravda on June 29 with this headline, British and French governments do not want a treaty on the basis of equality for the USSR. What actually lay behind Soviet hesitation was a lively suspicion that the British aimed to get Russia embroiled in a war with Hitler while reducing their own military contribution to a minimum. The Japanese ambassador in London, equally skeptical, reported to Tokyo his impression that the English were playing their usual double game, using the Soviet treaty negotiations as a threat against Hitler while utilizing a German-oriented peace plan against Stalin. In the meantime Hitler remained at the Berghof much of the summer, removing himself from the diplomatic scene and making no important announcements. Perhaps this silence was born of his own uncertainty, perhaps it was in line with his conviction that most problems solved themselves if left alone. In any case, he could have done nothing more calculated to confuse his opponents. It was a season for passivity. He listened patiently to a written warning from Mussolini delivered in person by one of his generals. War was inevitable, said Il Duce, but added that their two countries needed peace. It is from 1943 onwards that a war effort will have the greatest prospects of victory. Hitler did not deign to argue as the general read-on of Mussolini's reluctance to anticipate a European war. The Führer's own intent was to localize the war by isolating Poland and he needed no advice from an Italian about how to do it. To his adjutants he appeared markedly relaxed. He left his mountain fastness in mid-July for a brief stay in Munich where he attended a special performance of Tannhauser at the State Opera House. This production boasted a new feature added for the personal benefit of the artist Bohemian Hitler, two nude girls one posing as Europa was tried a bull and the other depicting Leda with her swan. A week later he was at Bayreuth enjoying the year's Wagner festival which, besides the ring, included stirring performances of Tristan and Parsifal. He had invited his old school friend Kubizek to attend every performance but did not see him until August 3rd, the day after the final performance of Gotted and the Rung. That afternoon an SS officer escorted Kubizek to House Wachfried. 
Hitler grasped his old friend's right hand in both of his, and Kubizek could hardly speak. Kubizek hesitatingly brought out a large bundle of postcards with the Führer's picture and wondered if they could be autographed for friends back in Austria. Hitler put on his reading glasses, he was careful to remove them for photographers, and obligingly began signing cards as Kubizek methodically blotted each signature. Afterward Hitler led him into the garden to Wagner's tomb. I am happy, he said, that we have met once more on this spot which always was the most venerable spot for us both. This episode was one of the rare evidences of Hitler's private life, which had become overshadowed by his responsibilities as Führer. He had little time for Eva Braun, and it was not until the beginning of 1939 that she was moved into quarters in the Chancellery. She slept in Hindenburg's former bedroom, whose main decoration was a large picture of Bismarck, and there were standing orders from the Führer never to open the window curtains. This bleak room, along with an adjoining boudoir, led directly to Hitler's library, but she was required to enter his suite through the servant's entrance. Although they lived as husband and wife, the two went through an elaborate charade to persuade the staff that they were merely good friends. In the morning she would address him as mein Führer, and this form of address became such a habit that she used it, so she confessed to her best friend, even in private. The circle privy to their secret was beginning to widen, however, because of at least one ridiculous slip in security. Just before his dismissal, Captain Weedman went to the Führer's room one morning to deliver an emergency message and to his surprise saw outside the door Eva's petite Viennese shoes next to Hitler's boots, left to be shinned as if it were a hotel. I could not help recalling La Fontaine's fable, he wrote in his memoirs, and I burst out laughing as I went downstairs. When important guests arrived at either the Chancellery or at Berchtesgaden, where Eva's pleasant apartment adjoined the Führer's, she was confined to quarters and this was hard to endure. She longed to meet Admiral Horthy, President Hoover, King Carol of Romania, the Aga Khan and other notables and yet was forced to stay in her room like a child. She was particularly disturbed, she confided to friends, when Hitler refused her pleas to meet the Duchess of Windsor since the two women, she thought, had so much in common. She did console herself with the thrill of knowing that the great of the world were coming from all over the world to honor her lover. This knowledge made her backstreet existence endurable. Moreover, anything was better than the earlier days of loneliness and doubt which had led to two attempted suicides. On the political front Ribbentrop authorized resumption of talks with the Stockhoff on the day Hitler was enjoying Tristan at Bayreuth. Although the results delighted the foreign minister, Peter Clist warned him not to let Stalin see that Germany was in a hurry and, above all, not to negotiate any special offers merely to conclude a pact. They should wait and probably within six months reach an agreement that would satisfy both parties. Ribbentrop laughed. They could sign a pact within a fortnight. He ignored Clist's advice to be patient and, in his eagerness to complete a treaty that would checkmate England, instructed Schulenberg to meet Molotov again and propose serious political talks. At this meeting on August 3, the German ambassador got the impression, so he reported, that the Soviets were determined to sign with England and France if they fulfill all Soviet wishes. This was certainly the impression Molotov hoped to make. Both he and Stalin had noted the eagerness in the Wilhelmsterus and were tempting the Germans while leading on the British. By this time Hitler had become even more impatient than Ribbentrop. His campaign deadline against Poland was less than a month off and he needed assurance from Stalin that the Red Army would not intervene. At this point he either forced the issue or was blessed by luck. The day after Schulenberg's inconclusive talk with Molotov a crisis in Poland arose. Danzig Nazis informed the Polish customs officials that they could no longer carry out their normal duties. Poland responded with an irate demand to withdraw the order, whereupon the president of the Senate of the Free City of Danzig indignantly denied that any such order had been issued and charged that Poland was only looking for a pretext to threaten Danzig. If it was indeed a case of the tail wagging the dog, the latter quickly took command on August 9. 
Berlin warned Warsaw that any repetition of the ultimatum to Danzig would lead to greater tension in the relationship between Germany and Poland. The tempest in the teapot grew into a serious crisis with Poland's retort that she would consider any possible German intervention and aggression. The controlled German press was already in full cry. Poland. Look out. Warned one headline. Warsaw threatens bombardment of Danzig, unbelievable agitation of Polish megalomania. Blared another. While Goebbels shouted, the Foreign Office waged its campaign in a lower key with Julius Schnur, Ribbentrop's economic expert, assuring Estokhov that German interests in Poland were really quite limited. They do not at all need to collide with Soviet interests of any kind, he said, but we must know those interests. From his mountain retreat Hitler became personally involved by sending his private plane to Danzig for Karl Burkhardt, the League of Nations High Commissioner for the Free City. Burkhardt arrived at the Ober Salzburg on August 11 and was driven up to the tea house on the Kahlstein. Hitler was occupied by a different matter. Perhaps something enormously important will happen soon, he remarked to Speer as they rode up in the elevator to the main room. Almost as though speaking to himself, he mentioned something about sending Goring on a mission. But if need be I would even go myself. I am staking everything on this card. He was referring to a treaty with Stalin but by the time Burkhardt walked in he had worked himself into an excess of rage over Poland. If the slightest thing happens without warning, he exclaimed, I will pounce on the Poles like lightning with all the power of mechanized forces which they don't even dream of. He shouted at the top of his voice, Do you understand me? Very well, Monsieur Chancellor, I quite realize that means a general war. A look of pain and fury came over Hitler's face. Very well, he said, if I am forced into this conflict, I prefer to do it today rather than tomorrow. I will not conduct it like Wilhelm II, who always had scruples of conscience before waging total warfare. I will fight relentlessly to the bitter end. He calmed down as if he had let off sufficient steam and quietly assured his guest that he had no desire to fight Britain and France. I have no romantic aspiration, he said pleasantly, no appetite for domination. Above all I seek nothing in the West. Neither today nor tomorrow. But he had to have a free hand in the East. I must obtain a sufficient quantity of wheat for my country. He also needed a colony outside of Europe for timber. That was as far as his ambitions extended. Once and for all, he said somberly, it is necessary that you realize that I am ready to negotiate and discuss all these matters. He reaffirmed that, given freedom in the East, he would happily conclude a pact with the British and guarantee all their possessions. This promise was obviously meant to be transmitted to London, as was the threat that followed. Everything that I have in mind is directed against Russia, if the West is too stupid and blind to understand this then I will be forced to come to terms with the Russians, to crush the West and then after its defeat, turn with all my forces against the Soviet Union. I need the Ukraine so they can't starve us out as in the last war. 3. What Burkhardt did not know was that the British had recently made a secret offer to Hitler through one of Chamberlain's top advisers. In a private conversation at his house in West Kensington, Sir Horace Wilson assured Fritz Hess, Ribbentrop's undercover representative, that the Prime Minister would be prepared to offer the Führer a defensive alliance for 25 years that could include economic advantages for the Reich and the return of German colonies by stages in due course. In return Hitler must promise to take no more aggressive action in Europe. Hess was not sure he had heard right and asked Sir Horace to explain again in detail. He did. If I were Hitler, said the astounded Hess, I would accept your proposition. But whether he will do so, no one can tell. Hess transmitted the offer to the Foreign Office and before long was on a special plane bound for the Reich with a typewritten sheet provided by Wilson summarizing the proposals. While impressed, Ribbentrop wondered how he could convince Hitler that they should be taken seriously. Did Hess really think the British would go to war on Hitler's side in case the Soviets attacked Germany? Would they break off their conversations in Moscow before negotiating with Germany? Hess believed they would. 
when Hitler first heard the proposals, so an eyewitness informed Hess, he was transported with joy. It's the greatest news I've had for a long time. He exclaimed and began romancing like a child. The dream of his life, an alliance with mighty England, was coming true. But almost immediately he had misgivings and accused Wilson of laying a trap to save the Poles from a well-deserved thrashing. What does Hitler want? Hess asked his informant, Wall the Huel, Ribbentrop's liaison man at the Chancellery. The answer was, the Führer had his heart set on forcing the Poles to capitulate. That week Ribbentrop asked Hess if he was completely convinced that England would go to war over Danzig. All of his sources, he answered, indicated that Chamberlain could not act otherwise. Any invasion of Polish territory would result in war. The Führer doesn't believe this at all! exclaimed Ribbentrop. Some donkeys told him that the English would only bluff and a German counter bluff would drive them to their knees. Puzzled by the contradiction between Ribbentrop's personal convictions and his public posture, Hess asked if he really thought the English were bluffing. The foreign minister asserted that he had warned the Führer that the English were not soft and degenerate and would fight if they believed the balance of power in Europe depended on it or their empire was seriously threatened. Two days later Ribbentrop told Hess that he had transmitted all of the latter's arguments to Hitler. But he remained convinced that if the English were really ready to plunge into war over such a trivial matter as Danzig, then war with England was absolutely inevitable. Ribbentrop promised to speak again to Hitler and marveled at the surprisingly calm way the Führer considered Hess's alternatives. Still, Hitler was consumed by fear that it was merely a maneuver to trick him. What guarantee was there that the English would keep their word? The Führer, Ribbentrop reported, would only consider solid guarantees. This hardened attitude was reflected in Ribbentrop's own diplomatic posture upon meeting Mussolini's son-in-law on August 11 in Salzburg. Chen O had come with emphatic instructions from Mussolini to insist upon postponement of any invasion of Poland. The matter must be solved by conference. Ribbentrop, as well as his Führer, had resented Il Duce's sending an emissary instead of coming himself. Besides both despised Chen O for the drinking bouts and sexual escapades he reportedly indulged in whenever he visited the Reich. Ribbentrop dutifully mouthed his master's thoughts at the meeting with Chen O. Perhaps the foreign minister had even come to share them. At any rate, he acted like a carbon copy of Hitler as he peremptorily brushed aside all of Chen O's eloquent pleas for a peaceful solution. Finally Chen O asked what Ribbentrop wanted, the corridor or Danzig? Not that anymore, was the answer. We want war. The coolness between Chen O and Ribbentrop spread to their secretaries and scarcely a word was exchanged during lunch. At one point Chen O, pale and shaken, whispered to a compatriot, we are almost at blows. Surprisingly Chen O, who had allowed himself to be bullied by Ribbentrop, stood up to the Führer the following day at the Berghof. During lunch Chen O poked fun at the floral decorations, which interpreter Dolman guessed had been arranged by Eva Braun, and once serious discussions began, he countered Hitler's arguments with energy and wit. He warned that a war with Poland could not be confined to that country since this time the West would surely declare war. In the most explicit terms, Chen O pointed out that Italy was not prepared for a general war, in fact, didn't have sufficient material to remain in combat for more than a few months. All affability, Hitler suggested they postpone further talk until morning and drive up to his retreat on Kahlstein Mountain while there was still good light. Chen O complied with obvious lack of enthusiasm and, as Hitler drew him to a window and expatiated on the scenic grandeur that lay outside, shivered uncomfortably. He then proceeded to drink cup after cup of hot tea which he disliked. The trip to the mountaintop left Chen O disconsolate and that evening he telephoned his father-in-law, the position is serious. By morning Chen O was a beaten man. At the second talk with Hitler he said not a word of Italy's inability to take part in the war. His brilliant debating power had suddenly deserted him, and to Schmidt's amazement, he folded up like a jackknife. 
Gone was the cool decisiveness and statesmanship of yesterday as he listened apathetically to the Führer's assurance that England and France would never go to war on Poland's account. You have been proved right so often before when we others held the opposite view, said Chen o, that I think it very possible that this time, too, you see things more clearly than we do. A few hours later a dispirited Chen o was airbound for home. I returned to Rome, he wrote in his diary, completely disgusted with the Germans, with their leader, and their way of doing things. Now they have dragged us into an adventure which we have not wanted and which might compromise the regime and the country as a whole. Soon after Chen O's departure Hess was ordered to meet Ribbentrop at a hotel in Salzburg. After staring silently at a writing table for ten minutes the foreign minister finally looked up somberly at Hess. I have just come from the Führer, he said. He is, unfortunately, not in a position to discuss Chamberlain's offer. He was referring to Wilson's proposals. He has quite different intentions. Chamberlain's offer will not be discarded. We shall return to it when the time has come. He instructed Hess to fly back to London at once and keep his ears open. The few remains to play a very dangerous game. I do not know whether it will succeed or not. In any case, we don't want a war with England. Give us a signal in good time if the danger becomes acute. The supreme confidence exuded by Hitler to Chen O was largely play acting. He was deeply concerned at Stalin's reluctance to come to an agreement. This anxiety was aggravated by a report that a British French delegation had recently arrived in Moscow and was about to conclude successful negotiations with the Soviets. In truth, the Russians were in no mood to negotiate, concerned as they were that the Allies were toying with them. First the Anglo-French delegation had taken six days to arrive by slow cargo passenger ship and train when they could have made it in a single day. Next the British senior officer had come without proper credentials, and when the talks finally got underway it seemed that the British were not at all serious, a Soviet offer to provide 136 divisions for a common defense against the Nazis was matched by a British proposal to provide one mechanized and five infantry divisions. Not knowing all this, the Führer ordered Ribbentrop to put more pressure on the Kremlin, and a conference between Molotov and Schulenberg was hastily arranged. On the evening of August 15 the foreign commissar listened attentively to everything the German ambassador had to say but could give no quick answer. First, he said, an understanding must be reached on several points. Would the Germans, for example, be willing to influence Japan to take a different attitude toward the Soviets? Would the Germans conclude a pact of non-aggression? If so, under what conditions? Hitler was too impatient for deliberations. He ordered Ribbentrop to reach an understanding at once with Molotov, and thereby let his adversary set the pace of events. Stalin took immediate advantage. Through Molotov he replied that before any political pacts could be signed their economic agreements must be concluded. Ribbentrop responded with a further plea to Schulenburg for haste, pointing out that the first stage of the economic agreements had just been completed. His instructions became almost hysterical. The next conversation with Molotov, he said, should be conducted by pressing emphatically for a rapid realization of my trip and by opposing appropriately any possible new Russian objections. In this connection you must keep in mind the decisive fact that an early outbreak of open German-Polish conflict is probable and that we therefore have the greatest interest in my having my visit to Moscow take place immediately. Stalin realized that every hour of delay was painful to Hitler, perhaps his agents had learned of Hitler's September 1st deadline and so ordered Molotov to procrastinate as usual at his next meeting with Schulenberg on August 19. The foreign commissar consequently argued tediously over every point despite his guests' repeated and emphatic pleas for action. But half an hour after Schulenberg departed the Soviets surprisingly reversed their tactics. Molotov invited the German back to the Kremlin. He arrived late that afternoon and it was immediately apparent that Molotov had good news. After apologizing for inconveniencing Schulenberg, the foreign commissar said he had just been authorized to hand over a draft of a non-aggression pact and to receive Herr von Ribbentrop in Moscow. 
He did not explain, naturally, that the Anglo-French Soviet military talks in Moscow had reached such an impasse that Stalin had lost all patience with the West. Perhaps he had intended to join with Hitler all along and only used the Anglo-French talks as a maneuver to get better conditions from Hitler. Even so the Russians proceeded deliberately. Molotov told Sulenberg he could not receive Ribbentrop until a week after the signing of their economic agreement. If that took place today, the date would be August 26th, if tomorrow, the 27th. Hitler must have read Sulenberg's report with mixed feelings, delight at the probability of concluding the treaty and exasperation at Stalin's insistence on first signing their economic agreement. It was little better than blackmail but Hitler felt there was no alternative. The trade agreement was rushed through and signed in Berlin two hours after midnight. It granted the Soviet Union a merchandise credit of 200 million Reichsmarks, at the reasonable interest of 5%, to be used to finance Soviet orders of machine tools and industrial installations. Armaments in the broader sense, such as optical supplies and armor plate, were to be supplied in proportionately smaller amounts. The credit would be liquidated by Soviet raw materials. Outmaneuvered by Stalin, just as he had outmaneuvered the Austrians and Czechs, Hitler could not possibly wait the week that Molotov proposed. He composed a personal message to Stalin which was dispatched from Berlin at 4.35 p.m., August 20. In it Hitler sincerely welcomed the signing of the new German-Soviet commercial agreement as a first step in the reordering of German-Soviet relations. He also accepted the Soviet draft of the non-aggression pact although there were a few questions connected with it which should be clarified as soon as possible. Then he got down to the crux of the matter, speed in concluding this pact, he said, was of the utmost importance since tension between Germany and Poland was becoming intolerable. A crisis might arise any day. Two hours after Schulenberg delivered the message to the Kremlin, he was summoned back for a personal reply from Stalin himself, I thank you for the letter, it began. He hoped the pact would mark a decided turn in their political relations. The people of our countries need peaceful relations with each other. He agreed to see Ribbentrop on August 23rd. Throughout the 20th Hitler had been silently pacing up and down the Great Hall in the Berghof waiting anxiously for news from Moscow. The expression on his face kept anyone from disturbing him. In expectation he had already sent the pocket battleship Graf Spee to a waiting position in the Atlantic. Twenty-one new boats were in offensive positions around the British Isles. At dinner, according to Speer, Hitler was handed a telegram. After reading it. His face flushed a deep red and he stared vacantly out the window. All at once he slammed both fists on the table, making the glasses rattle. I have them! He exclaimed in a voice choked with emotion. I have them! He slumped back and, since no one dared to ask any questions, the meal resumed in silence. After coffee a euphoric Hitler told his guests that Germany was concluding a non-aggression pact with Russia. Here, read this he said. A telegram from Stalin. Hoffman recalled that the Führer was so delighted he slapped his knee, something the photographer had never seen him do before. There was great to do as Cannenberg, the majordomo, brought out champagne. Glasses were clinked and the entourage drank a toast to the great diplomatic coup. Presently Hitler led everyone to the little movie theater in the basement to see a film of Stalin reviewing a massive Red Army parade. How lucky, remarked the Führer, that such military might was now neutralized. Hoffman worried about repercussions among the faithful National Socialists who had been fighting the Reds for decades. The party will be just as astounded as the rest of the world, Hitler purportedly replied, but my party members know and trust me, they know I will never depart from my basic principles and they will realize that the ultimate aim of this last gamble is to remove the eastern danger and thus to facilitate, under my leadership, of course, a swifter unification of Europe. On the face of it, Stalin and Hitler were most unlikely allies. What could they possibly have in common? In fact, there were a number of similarities. One admired Peter the Great while the other saw himself as the heir of Frederick the Great. 
both were advocates of ruthless force and operated under ideologies that were not essentially different. Communists and Nazis alike were self-righteous and dogmatic, both were totalitarian and both believed that the end justified the means, sanctifying injustice, as it were, in the name of the state and progress. Hitler had long admired Stalin, regarding him as one of the extraordinary figures in world history, and once shocked a group of intimates by asserting that he and the Soviet leader had much in common since both had risen from the lower classes, and when one listener protested comparison with a former bank robber, he replied, if Stalin did commit a bank robbery, it was not to fill his own pockets but to help his party and movement. You cannot consider that bank robbery. Nor did the Führer look upon Stalin as a true communist. In actual fact, he identifies himself with the Russia of the Tsars, and he has merely resurrected the tradition of banslavism. Perhaps Hitler was unconsciously speaking of himself and Germany, for him Bolshevism is only a means, a disguise designed to trick the Germanic and Latin peoples. Both Stalin and Hitler felt sure they could use each other. Both dictators were wrong but in that hectic summer of 1939 there was not a major nation in the world which was not operating under some misconception. Europe was a cauldron of distrusts, deceit and double dealing. Even as Ribbentrop prepared to leave for Moscow, Stalin had not completely abandoned the hope of an Anglo-French-Soviet military alliance against Hitler. And while the English were doing their half-hearted best to consummate this agreement, they were secretly inviting Goring to England. On all sides nation was dealing behind the back of nation, each mouth in platitudes of sincerity or uttering threats. 4. The apparent winner was Hitler. He wakened on the morning of August 22 full of confidence. After Ribbentrop had left the Berg off with final instructions for his mission to Moscow, the Führer summoned his senior commanders and their chiefs of staff for a special meeting in the spacious reception hall. It was a lecture, not a conference, with Hitler sitting behind a large desk doing all the talking. I have called you together to give you a picture of the political situation in order that you may have insight into the various elements on which I have based my decision to act, and in order to strengthen your confidence. The conflict with Poland, he said, was bound to come sooner or later and there were a number of reasons why it was best to act promptly. First of all two personal factors, my own personality and that of Mussolini. Essentially all depends on me, on my existence, because of my political talents. Probably no one will ever again have the confidence of the German people as I have. There will probably never again be a man with more authority than I have. My life is, therefore, a factor of great value. But I can be eliminated at any time by a criminal or an idiot. The second personal factor was Il Duce. If something happened to him, Italy's loyalty to their alliance would be questionable. On the other hand there was no outstanding personality in either England or France. Our enemies have men who are below average. No personalities. No master, no men of action. Furthermore, the political situation was favorable, with rivalry in the Mediterranean and tension in the Orient. All these fortunate circumstances would no longer prevail in two or three years. No one knows how long I shall live. Therefore conflict is better now. Then he became specific. Relations with Poland, he said, had become unbearable. We are facing the alternative to strike or to be destroyed with certainty sooner or later. What could the West do? Either attack from the Maginot Line or blockade the Reich. The first was improbable and the second would be ineffective since now the Soviets would supply Germany with grain, cattle, coal, lead and zinc. I am only afraid that in the last minute some Schwinhund will produce a plan of mediation. The commanders, led by Goring, clapped enthusiastically. For mein Fuhrer, said the Reichsmarschall, the way Macht will do its duty. Despite their applause, Goring and the other military commanders were unanimously against war since all were convinced that Germany was not yet properly prepared to wage one. There was only a six weeks supply of ammunition as well as alarming shortages of steel, oil and other important materials. 
Hitler was as aware of all this as his generals but envisaged a different type of warfare, the Blitzkrieg, a sudden all-out attack of such force and intensity that victory would be assured quickly. The concept was strategic as well as tactical. The dehumanizing years of trench combat in the Great War, not to mention the deprivations of those on the home front, were still searing memories to Hitler. He had vowed that the misery of a long conflict would never again be visited on Germany. That is why he geared the way Macht to armament in breadth rather than in depth. He had purposely organized Germany's economy for a relatively high production of ready armaments but not to wage long-range war with mass productive powers. His goal was to produce armaments quickly, not to increase Germany's armament producing plant or to retool her armament producing machinery. A series of blitzkrieg attacks, sustained by short, intensive bursts of production, would permit Hitler to act as if Germany were stronger than she actually was by avoiding the massive production for conventional war that would have meant economic ruin. His was a poor man's philosophy that could only succeed with audacity. Already he had achieved a series of cheap victories by risking a conflict that his more affluent enemies were eager to avoid at almost any cost. Blitzkrieg not only appealed to his gambling instinct but was perfectly suited to his position of dictator. A democracy could hardly have sustained the necessary bursts of economic effort, the concentration on turning out tanks, for instance, followed by an abrupt concentration on civilian items. What would have brought down a democracy did not apply to the National Socialist state with the peculiar weaknesses and strengths of its economy. By choosing Blitzkrieg, Hitler confounded some of his own generals, whose theories were still rooted in the past. They did not realize, as he did, that Germany was far readier for combat than England and France. It was a gamble but he figured he could achieve victory over Poland so rapidly that he would never even have to cross swords with England or France. The odds were that they would then see the futility of retaliation. Somehow he had to neutralize the West, whether by threat or force of arms, so that by 1943 he could achieve his true aim, conquest of Russia. With eyes open, Adolf Hitler was prepared to meet his destiny. On the morning of August 22 not one of the military men listening to Hitler's blueprint for invasion uttered a word of criticism, nor was there any protest from the field commanders, who were brought in after lunch for their inspirational message. The Führer exhorted them to have no mercy. Might is right, he said and announced that the invasion would likely begin at dawn on Saturday, August 26. Early that evening Ribbentrop and his party took off for Moscow in two condors. There was a general feeling of extreme tension. Nobody, recalled Peter Klist, could guarantee that the Soviets would not spring on us an Anglo-French agreement, all neatly tied up, when we arrived in Moscow. Nor could anyone predict whether Ribbentrop would be forced into their long, soul-destroying negotiations habitually conducted by the Russians. The news of Ribbentrop's trip took Japanese Ambassador Oshima by complete surprise and at midnight he made a special trip to Weizsäcker's home in Berlin to express his displeasure. Ordinarily a man of poise, Oshima's face was rigid and grey. How, he asked, could such a turnabout be explained to Tokyo? Early the next afternoon, August 23rd, Henderson handed over Chamberlain's letter to the Führer, it declared categorically that Britain was determined to fulfill its promises to Poland. At the same time Chamberlain made another plea for peace. Why couldn't there be a truce so that Germany and Poland could discuss their problems directly? At this moment, he concluded, I confess I can see no other way to avoid a catastrophe that will involve Europe in war. Hitler replied excitably in violent language and Henderson expressed the hope that a solution might be found if their two nations cooperated. Hitler curtly retorted that this should have been done before. This brought a protest that the British government had given guarantees and must honor them. Then honor them, snapped the Führer. If you have given a blank check you must also meet it. Henderson stoutly defended the British position but insisted on doing it in German, a language whose subtleties he had not yet mastered. Hitler brushed aside his arguments and began to threaten. The slightest attempt by Poland to make any further move against the Germans or Danzig, he said, 
would mean immediate intervention. Furthermore, mobilization in the West would be answered by German mobilization. Is that a threat? asked Henderson. No, a protective measure. In vain Henderson tried to assure Hitler that Chamberlain had always championed Germany. I too believed that until this spring, said Hitler almost sadly. Thereupon Henderson blurted out that he personally had never believed in an Anglo-French-Russian pact. He preferred that Germany rather than England should have a treaty with Russia. Hitler's answer was ominous. Make no mistake, he said, it will be a long treaty. Henderson was not content to let this subject alone. He argued that the Führer knew as well as he did that the Russians always made difficulties. In any case he was convinced that Chamberlain had not changed in his attitude to Germany. I must judge by deeds in this matter, said Hitler and resumed recriminations. This brought a threat from Henderson that any direct action by Germany would mean war, which in turn touched off another display of almost hysterical violence. In such a war, exclaimed Hitler, Germany had nothing to lose and Great Britain much. He had no desire for war but would not shrink from it and his people were much more behind him than last September. He abruptly ended the conversation by stating that a written reply to Chamberlain would be handed over to Henderson in the afternoon. We Sacker, a silent witness to this uneven duel, was as convinced as Henderson of Hitler's genuine agitation. But no sooner had the door closed behind the Englishman than the Führer slapped himself on the thigh, it was becoming a habit, and laughed. Chamberlain won't survive that conversation, he said triumphantly. His cabinet will fall this evening. While waiting for the Führer's written answer, Henderson returned to Salzburg where he telephoned his subordinates in Berlin instructing them to inform London that Hitler was entirely uncompromising and unsatisfactory but I cannot say anything further until I have received his written reply. A little later came a summons to return to the Berghof. This time Hitler, according to Henderson's report, had recovered his calm and never raised his voice once. But he was no less obdurate, charging that England was determined to destroy and exterminate Germany. Henderson protested that war between their two countries would only benefit the lesser races of the world. To this Hitler replied that it was England who was fighting for the lesser races whereas he was only fighting for Germany and this time the Germans would battle to the last man. It would have been different in 1914 if he had been Chancellor then. At the next instance of Polish provocation, he continued, I shall act. He repeated his threat of the morning but this time without histrionics. The questions of Danzig and the corridor will be settled one way or another. Please take note of this. Believe me, last year, on October 2nd, I would have marched either way. I give you my word of honor on that. That afternoon the two German condors landed at Moscow airport where Ribbentrop was pleased to see the swastika flying side by side with the hammer and sickle. After the foreign minister reviewed an honor guard of the Soviet Air Force, he was driven to his quarters, the former Austrian embassy. Was this Tartar irony? Count von der Schulenberg informed him that he was expected in the Kremlin at 6 p.m. but couldn't say whether it would be Molotov or Stalin who would negotiate with him odd Moscow customs, thought Ribbentrop to himself. After Schulenberg and Hilger had made their reports, both advised Ribbentrop to allow himself plenty of time and not give the impression of being in a hurry. Interrupting with an impatient movement of the hand, he enjoined the ambassador to inform the Russians that he had to be back in Berlin within 24 hours. So saying, he hastily had a snack before heading for the Kremlin. At 6 p.m. Ribbentrop was facing Stalin. He was affable, good-natured. Molotov was impassive. Ribbentrop spoke first, expressing his nation's desire to establish German-Soviet relations on a new footing. He understood from Stalin's March speech that he felt the same. Stalin turned to Molotov. Did he want to speak first? The foreign commissar dutifully replied that it was Stalin's prerogative to reply. He did in a manner which Ribbentrop had never encountered before. For years, said Stalin concisely, we have poured pails of manure at one another. That should not stop us from coming to an understanding. 
this was the drift of my speech in March, the meaning of which you have understood perfectly. With a notebook opened in front of him for reference, he continued without pause to practical matters, the spheres of influence in the countries between Germany and the USSR were defined, with Finland, most of the Baltic states and Bessarabia in the Russian orbit, in the event of war between Germany and Poland they would meet at a definite line of demarcation. It was obvious that Stalin had come to the room to do business, not dally, and by the end of three hours he and Ribbentrop had agreed upon everything except two Baltic ports which Stalin insisted on having in his sphere. Ribbentrop said he would have to check with the Führer first and the talks were adjourned so he could do so. Hitler was as eager to do business as Stalin. Within an hour a phone call from the Wilhelmsteras brought this laconic reply, answer is yes. Agreed. In the meantime Ribbentrop sat down to another quick meal at his quarters, bubbling over with enthusiasm for Stalin and Molotov. The foreign minister was in high spirits as he drove back to the Kremlin with the favorable answer from Hitler, this time with a larger retinue, which included two photographers. Secret police rushed out of the darkness as the German cars slowly moved into the mysterious inner city and proceeded past the largest cannon of its time, so huge that no one had ever dared fire it, past little wooden houses and cathedrals. Finally the procession reached a modern administration building where Stalin was waiting. In short order, final agreement on the non-aggression pact was reached. It was a concise, clear contract. Each party was to desist from any aggressive action against the other and lend no support to any power attacking the other. The treaty was to last for ten years and continue for another five unless renounced by either party a year prior to its expiration. It was a conventional agreement, but not so its secret protocol, which carved up Eastern Europe. Equally extraordinary was Stalin's willingness to be photographed at the signing of the documents. He entered into the spirit and stage managed the best known picture of the signing. He beckoned to Ribbentrop's SS adjutant, Richard Schulz, to join the group but this young man couldn't imagine Stalin meant him. Finally Stalin took the extremely tall Schulz by the arm and placed him next to Ribbentrop. Perhaps Stalin wanted to add youthful appeal to the picture, perhaps he knew that Schulz's younger brother was Hitler's SS ordnance officer. Toast followed toast but the most noteworthy was one from Stalin that was never revealed to the Russian people, I know how much the German nation loves its Führer, he said. I should therefore like to drink to his health. One of the most important treaties in world history had been completed and signed without argument in a few hours, proof that both Hitler and Stalin wanted the agreement, that both knew exactly what they would give to get what they wanted, and that both wished the deed done swiftly. To Hitler the pact was his triumph, not Stalin's. He had apparently forgotten his own prediction in Mein Kampf that any German-Russian alliance would inevitably bring a war which would cause the end of Germany. He had since changed his mind, so he confided to Bormann several years later, and hoped an entente with the Soviets would be honestly sincere if not unreservedly friendly. He imagined after so many years of power that Stalin, the realist, would have shed the nebulous Marxist ideology, retaining it only as a poison for external use. The brutal manner in which he treated the Jewish intelligentsia encouraged such a belief. In a spirit of implacable realism on both sides we could have created a situation in which a durable entente would have been possible. An entente, in short, watched over by an eager lion with a finger on the trigger. Upon learning the treaty was signed, Hitler jumped up from the dinner table, exclaiming, we've won. Although he had waived the opportunity to seize all of Poland, the argument had neutralized Russia. Now he was free to proceed against Poland. Without the Soviet Union on their side, neither England nor France would do more than mouth threats. In addition he was assured of getting from the East all those raw materials he might be deprived of by a possible British blockade. He was paying Stalin to do exactly what he would undoubtedly have done without a pact. The economy of the Soviet Union as well as its military efficiency was still in such disarray after the purges that Stalin could not even think of fighting the Reich. In fact he had never seriously sought a protective alliance against Hitler. 
what he and his associates in the Kremlin desired above all was neutrality, the pact with Germany not only gave this but fulfilled their aim of provoking war among the capitalist powers. To Stalin, Nazi Germany was just another capitalist enemy. At about 3 a.m., August 24, Hitler led his entourage on to the Berghof Terrace. The sky on the north and northwestern horizon blazed with the colors of the rainbow. Across the valley, a startling red glow from these northern lights was cast on the Unterberg, a mountain of legend. The last act of Gotterdam Arung, recalled Speer, could not have been more effectively staged. The same red light bathed our faces and our hands. Hitler abruptly turned to his Luftwaffe adjutant, below. Looks like a great deal of blood, he said. This time we won't bring it off without violence. One afterward Heydrich boasted that this emasculation of the Red Army was his work. Upon receiving information that the Tukhakevsky clique was plotting to eliminate Stalin, Heydrich fed it back to Stalin, through President Benz, along with forged supportive papers. Before long a Soviet representative was in Berlin negotiating with Heydrich for the incriminating papers. He was paid three million rubles in bills that must have been marked, whenever a German agent tried to spend one in Russia he was arrested. Marked money was not the only piece of Russian trickery. It was Stalin himself who had leaked the original material to the unsuspecting Heydrich, Tukhakevsky had become too powerful and was a threat to Stalin's dictatorship. Two of the Führer's agents promptly sued on the grounds that his copyright had been violated. The court decided in favor of Hitler, ordering the publishers to cease and desist from printing and distributing any more copies of the Cranston version. It was a beautiful example of democracy in action, said Cranston, now United States Senator from California, in 1974. He admitted that legally Hitler was right and he was wrong. But those 500,000 copies we sold helped awaken a great many Americans to how wrong Hitler was in those monstrous policies of his that were soon to plunge us into world war. 3. When Goring was shown a movie of this speech at the Nuremberg trials he again laughed uncontrollably. For according to one colorful account which stretches all credulity, Goring jumped on the table and danced around triumphantly like a savage which would indeed have been a sight to behold. Chapter 20 A Calamity Without Parallel in History August 24 to September 3, 1939 1. The world awakened Thursday morning, August 24, to headlines proclaiming a treaty that was a traumatic shock not only to ordinary citizens but to diplomats. I anticipate an ultimatum to Poland, Henderson reported from Berlin. Whether 11th hour attempt of Polish government to re-establish contact will avail, I much doubt. But I regard it as last hope, if any, of peace, if there is a last hope. The Polish people were extremely upset by the German-Soviet pact despite attempts by their newspapers to belittle it as a sign of German weakness. The government itself expressed supreme confidence that British and French assistance would turn the tide in case of war with Hitler. French communists seemed to be torn between loyalty to their own country and Mother Russia. Confusion was even greater among their American colleagues. At first the daily worker ignored the treaty as if waiting for instructions from Moscow. Finally Earl Browder, the party leader, announced that it had weakened Hitler. With nary a qua most extreme left-wing progressives obediently accepted a new party line. The agreement with Hitler had been consummated so that Russia could prepare herself for the eventual battle against fascism. President Roosevelt's response was to send another of his moral telegrams to Hitler urging him to refrain from any positive act of hostility for a reasonable and stipulated period but, like its predecessor, it was filed and forgotten. In Moscow Stalin was congratulating himself. Convinced that the British would compromise in the face of political reality, he imagined that the spheres of influence he had been granted would fall to him bloodlessly, by negotiation. Hitler's other allies were not so sanguine. The Italians, while admitting that Hitler had struck a master blow, were uneasy and the Japanese feared that the alliance would encourage Stalin to increase pressure on Manchuria. Prime Minister Hiram Numa 
whose cabinet had already held more than 70 meetings in a futile effort to reach agreement on a concordat with Germany and Italy, was so embarrassed and dismayed that he announced, the cabinet herewith resigns because of complicated and inscrutable situations recently arising in Europe. The German public was generally pleased and relieved, the threat of encirclement, a war on two fronts, had miraculously evaporated thanks to the Führer. Those who found the pact the hardest to swallow were his staunchest followers but most of them quickly convinced themselves that the chief knew exactly what he was doing. Hitler flew up to Berlin to greet the returning hero, Ribbentrop, and he spent the evening in the Chancellery listening to his foreign minister rhapsodize over the masters of the Kremlin, who made him feel as if he were among old party comrades. Further, a picture of Tsar Nicholas in the Winter Palace had convinced Ribbentrop that they could do business with Russia since it indicated that the communists themselves revered a Tsar who worked for the people. While Hitler took all this in with some interest, he was much more enthralled by the pictures Hoffman had taken. Hitler, it seemed, had requested a close-up of the Soviet leader to see if his earlobes were ingrown and Jewish, or separate and Aryan. One profile view in particular was most reassuring. His new brother-in-arms, according to the earlobe test, was no Jew. But Hitler shook his head disapprovingly at the photographs of the final ceremonies. Everyone showed Stalin with a cigarette. The signing of the pact is a solemn act which one does not approach with a cigarette dangling from one's lips, he said and instructed the photographer to paint out the cigarettes before releasing the pictures to the press. The Führer also interrogated at length the ordnance officer who had accompanied Ribbentrop. He reported that Stalin, before inviting his guests to sit down at the celebration dinner, had carefully inspected the table to see that everything was in order. This reminded Fräulein Schroeder of the Führer himself and the secretary imprudently remarked on the similarity. Hitler did not appreciate the analogy. My servants in my house, he said with some irritation, are always perfect. The following day, Friday, August 25th, was a crucial and crowded one. It began with a letter to Mussolini, explaining with some embarrassment what had taken place in Moscow. After giving assurances that the treaty only strengthened the Axis, Hitler trusted that Il Duce would understand why he had been forced to take such a drastic step. Hitler's next act was to ask Schmidt to translate the key passages of the speech Chamberlain had made in Commons the previous day. He listened intently to the Prime Minister's admission that the Moscow Pact had come as a surprise of a very unpleasant character, but that the Germans were laboring under a dangerous illusion if they believed that the British and French would no longer fulfill their obligations to Poland. These words, recalled Schmidt, made Hitler pensive, but he said nothing. Perhaps this confirmed a nagging uncertainty. The assault on Poland was scheduled to start early next morning but he was in such doubt that just before noon he instructed the high command to postpone the issuance of the executive order to attack for one hour, until three that afternoon. Then he summoned the British ambassador to the chancellery. Henderson arrived at 1.30 pm to find the Führer in a conciliatory mood. He was now prepared to make a move toward England which should be as decisive as the move towards Russia which had led to the recent agreement. His conscience, Hitler said, compelled him to make this final effort to secure good relations. But this was his last attempt. To Henderson he appeared to be calm and normal. But he did lose his temper as soon as he began enumerating the charges against the Poles, such as firing on civilian aircraft. These conditions, he shouted, must cease. The Danzig problem and the corridor must be solved without further delay. The only result of Chamberlain's last speech could be a bloody and unpredictable war between Germany and England. But this time Germany would not have to fight on two fronts. Russia and Germany will never again take up arms against each other. When Henderson kept repeating stolidly that England could not go back on her word to Poland, Hitler's threatening posture reverted to one of reasonableness. Once the Polish question was solved, he was prepared and determined to approach Britain again with a large comprehensive offer, he would, for instance, accept the British Empire and pledge himself personally to its continued existence. 
but if the British rejected his proposal, he concluded ominously, there will be war. And this was his last offer. Half an hour later, at exactly 3.02 p.m., he confirmed the order to attack Poland at dawn. On the surface his gamble appeared to have been motivated by mere opportunism. Admittedly a cunning virtuoso of day-to-day -day politics, his foreign policy did have a basic thrust, a step-by-step -step play to gain domination over continental Europe that was closely allied to his radical anti-Semitic program. In Rome his ambassador, accompanied by Chen o, was just entering the Palazzo Venezia with the text of the unusual letter written earlier in the day. At 3.20 Ambassador Hans Georg von Mackensen handed over the document to Il Duce. The pact had mightily impressed Mussolini, who, like all politicians, appreciated a brilliant coup. Yet he was realistic enough to face the fact that his own army, which had performed so feebly in Albania, was not endowed with sufficient morale, training or skill to wage a genuine war. He did not say so to Mackensen, only mouthed protestations of agreeability, he was in complete accord with the Moscow Pact while remaining an unswerving anti-communist, and stood behind the Führer come what may, this he emphasized expressly, unconditionally and with all his resources. No sooner had Mackensen left the room than Il Duce either changed his mind or had it changed for him. According to Chen o, it was he who convinced Mussolini to compose an answer to Hitler, admitting frankly that Italy was not ready for war and could only participate if Germany immediately delivered sufficient military supplies and raw materials to resist the attack which the French and English would predominantly direct against us. At the same time the Italian ambassador in Berlin was explaining to the Führer that Il Duce's answer was on its way. While Hitler was waiting for the next visitor, French ambassador Colondra, an aide brought in a news report from England which Schmidt glimpsed over his employer's shoulder. England and Poland had just concluded a pact of mutual assistance in London. Visibly concerned, the Führer brooded in silence. For months the signing of this agreement had been delayed for one reason or another. That it should take place on this of all days, a few hours after he had made his last offer to England, was no coincidence. This guarantee of military aid, even though it could never be implemented, might give the Poles such a false sense of security that they would refuse to negotiate with Germany. At 5.30 pm Colondra was finally escorted into the office. After exhibiting rage over Polish provocations, Hitler expressed regret over a possible war between Germany and France. I had the impression at times, recalled Schmidt, that he was mechanically repeating what he said to Henderson, and that his thoughts were elsewhere. It was obvious that he was in a hurry to bring the interview to an end. He half rose to his feet in a gesture of dismissal but the elegant Colondra would not be put off without a retort. He spoke with forcible words that Schmidt would never forget, in a situation as critical as this, Herr Reichskanzler, misunderstandings are the most dangerous things of all. Therefore, to make the matter quite clear, I give you my word of honor as a French officer that the French army will fight by the side of Poland if that country should be attacked. Then he assured Hitler that his government was prepared to do everything for the maintenance of peace right up to the last. Why then, exclaimed Hitler angrily, did you give Poland a blank check to act as she pleased? Before the Frenchman could reply, the Führer leapt to his feet for another tirade against the Poles. It is painful for me to have to go to war against France, but the decision does not depend on me. With a wave of the hand he dismissed the ambassador. A minute later, at 6 p.m., Atolico entered. He bore with him the text of Mussolini's letter, which had been dictated over the phone by Chen o. The announcement that Italy was not prepared for war, on the heels of the British-Polish Pact and Colondra's crystal-clear declaration of France's intentions, hit the funeral like a bombshell. To him it was the completely unexpected defection of an ally. But he controlled himself, dismissing Il Duce's envoy with the curt comment that he would send an immediate reply. As Atolico went out the door Schmidt heard Hitler mutter, the Italians are behaving just as they did in 1914. The waiting room was a pit of rumor and count rumor as scraps of information were passed around. War seemed inevitable. We eyes Saka, for instance, 
saw only a 2% possibility of preventing a world war in which Italy would leave Germany in the lurch. Inside his office Hitler was telling General Key I tell, stop everything at once. Get Braukic immediately. I need time for negotiations. Key I tell rushed out into the ante room. The order to advance must be delayed again, he excitedly told his aide. The news spread that the threat of war had been averted at the last minute. The Führer was returning to negotiation. There was general relief except from Hitler's chief adjutant, Rudolf Schmundt, who was glum. Don't celebrate too soon, he told Wallemont. This is only a postponement. Major Engel shared Schmundt's deep concern. Never before had the army adjutant seen the Chancellor in such total confusion. The Führer was even arguing bitterly with Huell, whose opinion he usually respected. Hitler bet that if war started with Poland the English would surely not join in. Mein Führer, asserted Huell, do not underestimate the British. When they see there is no other alternative, they stubbornly go their own way. Hitler was too angry to argue and turned away. Goring was also convinced that the English were not merely mouth in words of warning and was surreptitiously negotiating for peace. A man of action, he had already initiated discussions with England without consulting Ribbentrop, whom he distrusted. It was not as daring as it appeared, for he intended keeping his Führer informed of any developments. His desire for peace was hardly altruistic. Being a freebooter with the touch of the gangster, his prime aim in life was to enjoy the fruits of the plunder he was amassing thanks to his privileged position. War could bring an end to his sybaritic existence. On the other hand, Hitler was driven by principle, warped though it was, and could not be bribed. He might compromise but only if it brought him closer to his long-range goal. Realizing all this, Goring carried on his devious policy of peace with caution. As unofficial go-between in this intrigue he selected a wealthy Swedish businessman named Berger Dahlerus. He had a German wife as well as interests in the Reich and so shared Goring's desire to prevent war between Germany and England. Furthermore, he was in a position to do something about it, for he had influential English friends who were willing to work clandestinely on the project. Earlier that month Dalaris had arranged a secret meeting between Goring and seven Englishmen in a house conveniently close to the Danish border. Here it was that the Reichsmarschall first expounded his views and hopes for peace to the foreign businessmen. Little was done except talk until the historic military conference at the Berghof two weeks later. This spurred Goring to telephone Dalaris in Stockholm and urge him to come as soon as possible. The situation he guardedly revealed, had worsened and the chances of a peaceful solution were rapidly diminishing. Goring persuaded Dalaris to fly at once to England with an unofficial message to the Chamberlain government, urging that negotiations between Germany and England take place as soon as possible. And so on that eventful morning of August 25 Dalaris had flown to London by ordinary passenger plane but it was not until early evening that he was ushered into the office of Lord Halifax. The Foreign Secretary was in an optimistic mood and, since Hitler, it will be recalled, had just called off the invasion, it did not appear that the services of a neutral would be of further use. Dalaris was not so optimistic and telephoned Goring for his opinion. The Reichsmarschall's reply was alarming. He feared that war might break out at any moment. Dalaris repeated these words to Halifax the next morning and offered to deliver to Goring, the only German in his opinion who could prevent war, a personal message from Halifax confirming England's genuine desire to reach a peaceful settlement. Lord Halifax excused himself so he could discuss the matter with Chamberlain. In half an hour he returned with the Prime Minister's approval. The letter was written and Dalaris was rushed to Croydon Airdrome. In Berlin Ambassador Atolico was on his way to the Chancellery with another message from Mussolini. It contained an imposing list of the material Italy would need if she participated in a war, 6 million tons of coal, 7 million tons of petroleum, 2 million tons of steel and a million tons of lumber. Since Atolico was opposed to war, he deliberately made Mussolini's terms impossible to fulfill. To Ribbentrop's icy query as to when this vast amount of material was to be delivered, Atolico answered, 
Why, at once, before hostilities begin? It was an unreasonable demand. Surprising, considering the strain he must have been under, was Hitler's calm reply, which was relayed to Mussolini by telephone at 3.08 pm. He could meet Italy's requirements in most areas, he said, but regretted it was impossible to deliver before the outbreak of war for technical reasons. In these circumstances, Duce, I understand your position, and would only ask you to try to achieve the pinning down of Anglo-French forces by active propaganda and suitable military demonstrations such as you have already proposed to me. In the light of his pact with Stalin, he concluded, he did not shrink from solving the Eastern question even at the risk of complications in the West. It was no idle threat. The Wehrmacht was now prepared to attack on September 1 and was only waiting for the Führer's final confirmation. An oppressive heat lay over Berlin that Saturday afternoon. Despite the headlines in the papers, in corridor many German farmhouses in flames. Polish soldiers pushed to edge of German border exclamation mark many Berliners were enjoying themselves at the surrounding lakes. The less fortunate were more concerned by the temperature than by politics. At 6.42 p.m. Atolico got another call from Rome. It was Chen O with another urgent message for the Führer. In it Mussolini apologetically explained that Atolico had misunderstood the delivery date. He didn't expect the raw materials for a year. He regretted not being more helpful at such a crucial time and then, unexpectedly, made a plea for peace. A satisfactory political solution, he said, was still possible. When Hitler read these words he concluded that his ally was abandoning him. Somehow he controlled his feelings and sent off another conciliatory reply. I respect the reasons and motives which led you to take this decision, he said and tried to infuse his partner with his own optimism. Disappointed and exhausted, the Führer retired earlier than usual, only to be awakened soon after midnight. Goring had to see him at once on urgent business. The Swedish go-between he had mentioned the other day was back with an interesting letter from Lord Halifax. It was about 12.30 a.m. August 27, when Dalaris was ushered into the Führer's study. Hitler waited solemnly, staring fixedly at the neutral who was striving for peace. Goring stood beside him, looking pleased with himself. After a brief friendly greeting, Hitler launched into a lecture on Germany's desire to reach an understanding with the English, which degenerated into an excited diatribe. After describing his latest proposals to Henderson, he exclaimed, This is my last magnanimous offer to England. His face stiffened and his gesticulations became very peculiar as he boasted of the Reich's superior armed might. Dalaris pointed out that England and France also had greatly improved their armed forces and were in good position to blockade Germany. Without answering, Hitler paced up and down, then suddenly stopped in his tracks, stared and began talking again, Dalaris recalled, this time as if in a trance. If there should be a war, then I will build U-boats, build U-boats, build U-boats, build U-boats, U-boats, U-boats. It was like a stuck record. His voice became more and more indistinct. Abruptly he was orating as if to a huge audience, but still repeating himself. I will build airplanes, build airplanes, airplanes and I will destroy my enemies. In consternation, Dalaris turned to see how Goring was reacting. But the Reichsmarschall appeared not at all perturbed. Dalaris was horrified. So this was the man whose actions could influence the entire world. War doesn't frighten me, continued Hitler, encirclement of Germany is an impossibility, my people admire and follow me faithfully. He would spur them to superhuman efforts. His eyes went glassy. If there should be no butter, I shall be the first to stop eating butter, eating butter. There was a pause. If the enemy can hold out for several years, he finally said, I with my power over the German people, can hold out one year longer. Thereby I know that I am superior to all the others. All at once he asked why it was that the English continually refused to come to an agreement with him. Dalaris hesitated to answer honestly but finally said that the trouble was founded on England's lack of confidence in Hitler. At this the Führer struck his breast. Idiots! 
he exclaimed. Have I ever told a lie in my life? He continued to pace, again stopped. Dalarus, he said, had heard his side. He must return to England at once and tell it to the Chamberlain government. I do not think Henderson understood me, and I really want to bring about an understanding. Dalarus protested that he was a private citizen and could go only if the British government requested it. First he must have a clear definition of the vital points on which agreement could be reached. For example, what exactly was Hitler's proposed corridor to Danzig? Hitler smiled. Well, he said, turning to Goring, Henderson never asked about that. The Reichsmarschall tore a page out of an atlas and began outlining with a red pencil the territory Germany wanted. This led to a clarifying discussion of the main points in Hitler's offer to Henderson, Germany wanted a treaty with Britain that would eliminate all disputes of a political or economic nature, England was to help Germany get Danzig and the corridor, in return Germany would guarantee Poland's boundaries and let her have a corridor to Gdynia, the German minority in Poland would be protected, and, finally, Germany would give military aid whenever the British Empire came under attack. Dalarus ingenuously took Goring at face value and was inclined to think the best of Hitler. Moreover, he had no training in diplomacy. In his favor were a sincere desire for peace, courage and admirable persistence. As soon as he returned to his hotel he put in a long-distance call to an English friend. Before long he had assurance that the British government would welcome him as a messenger. At eight that peaceful Sunday morning he boarded a German plane at Templehof. As it headed at low level for London he wondered if he was merely a pawn in a game of intrigue. He was fairly sure that Goring was honestly working for a peaceful settlement. But was Hitler? Hitler treated that Sabbath as a weekday. Having cancelled the imminent celebration in Nuremberg which bore the inappropriate title Party Day of Peace, he introduced a wartime measure of food and clothes rationing. Then the armed forces were placed on a semi-emergency basis with all naval, army and air attaches ordered to remain in Berlin until further notice. Under the pall of this martial atmosphere Peter Clist of Ribbentrop's office was secretly approached by two important Polish diplomats with a mediation proposal. They hinted that Foreign Minister Beck was being forced to act belligerently toward Germany only to satisfy a rabid group of Polish patriots. What Beck needed was time to calm things down. Kliss dutifully reported this to Ribbentrop and was soon explaining the details to Hitler himself. He listened with barely concealed impatience and then announced peremptorily that if Beck could not even assert himself in Poland there was no help for him. Furthermore, Kliss was to cease making any more semi-official contacts with the Poles. He gave this order with some acrimony adding that Hen von Ribbentrop should have issued such an order long ago. As Klist walked thoughtfully out of the chancellery he was certain that the decision had at last been reached, and it was war. That sultry Sunday Hitler also took time to answer a plea for peace from Premier Daladia, doing so as one veteran to another. As an old frontline soldier, he wrote, I know, as you do, the horrors of war. There was no longer any need for dispute since the return of the Tsar had ended all further German claims on France. The mischief maker was England, which had unleashed a savage press campaign against Germany instead of persuading the Poles to be reasonable. He begged Daladier, a patriotic Frenchman, to put himself in Hitler's place. What if some French city, say Marseille, were prevented from professing allegiance to France as a result of defeat in battle? What if Frenchmen living in that area were persecuted, beaten, bestially murdered? I cannot in any circumstances imagine, Monsieur d'Aladia, that Germany would fight against you on these grounds. Hitler agreed with everything d'Aladia had written in his letter and again called on their common experiences as frontline soldiers to understand that it was impossible for a nation of honor to renounce nearly two million of its people and see them ill-treated on its own frontiers. Danzig and the corridor must, in all honor, return to Germany. A little afternoon a German plane landed at Croydon. Berger Dalarus stepped out. The place seemed dead since civilian air traffic between England and the continent had come to a standstill. 
He was driven to the foreign office past air raid wardens patrolling streets where shop windows were pasted over with strips of paper, then taken through back alleys to 10 Downing Street. Chamberlain, Halifax and Cadogan were waiting. They were grave but perfectly calm. As Dalaris told about the long meeting with Hitler he sensed an air of skepticism. His report differed from that of Henderson on several points and Chamberlain asked if he was absolutely certain he'd understood what Hitler said. Dalaris, whose command of German was superior to Henderson's, replied that any misinterpretation was out of the question. Throughout this conversation Chamberlain's remarks were colored by distrust of Hitler, he asked what impression the Führer had made on Dalaris. The answer, I shouldn't like to have him as a partner in my business brought the only smile of the day from the Prime Minister. Since the British doubted his interpretation of Hitler's demands, Dalaris suggested that they allow him to return to Berlin with their reactions. Chamberlain hesitated. Ambassador Henderson, presently in London, was scheduled to fly back to Berlin that day with their answer to Hitler's proposals. Dalaris suggested that the ambassador wait a day. Then he could let the British know exactly how Hitler felt before they made an official reply based only on Henderson's assessment. He suggested phoning Goring so he could ask point blank if the German government would agree to Henderson waiting a full day. Do you intend to phone from the Foreign Office? asked Chamberlain. Dalaris didn't Chamberlain agreed. In a few minutes the go-between was in Cadogan's room hearing Goring say that he could not possibly give an immediate answer without conferring with the Führer. Half an hour later Dalaris again phoned. This time Goring announced that Hitler accepted the plan on the condition that it was genuine. Cadogan insisted that Dalaris fly back to Berlin secretly, so the plane which had brought him to England was transferred from Croydon to a smaller field, Heston. It was 11 p.m. by the time Dalaris arrived at Goring's Berlin residence. After assuring the Reichsmarschall of his personal conviction that both the English government and her people truly wanted peace and were acting in good faith, Dalaris outlined the British response to the Hitler proposals. Goring rubbed his nose. The British reply, he said, was hardly satisfactory and the whole situation was highly precarious. He would have to confer with Hitler alone. Dalaris nervously paced the floor of his hotel room as he waited for the answer. Finally at 1.30 a.m. Goring telephoned. Hitler, he said in a robust voice, did respect England's views and welcomed her desire to reach a peaceful agreement. He also respected England's decision to honor her guarantee of Poland's boundaries as well as her insistence on an international guarantee in this matter of five great powers. Dalaris was particularly relieved by his last concession since it surely meant that Hitler had shelved any other plans he might have had for Poland. 2. Often amateur diplomats merely confuse matters, but this time Dalaris had succeeded in breaking a lock jam. By 9 p.m. when Henderson's plane landed at the Berlin airport matters had progressed substantially. The ambassador had returned to his post armed with an official version of the offer Dalaris had delivered unofficially. It also contained a clause stating that Beck had just agreed to enter at once into direct discussions with Germany. The streets of the capital were pitch dark from the blackout and the few people abroad reminded Henderson of apparitions. The exertions of the past months had left the ambassador exhausted. He had recently undergone an operation for cancer only to discover his was a terminal case. But he kept his condition private and never complained about the pressure of work. No sooner had Henderson begun a hurried meal at the embassy than word came from the chancellery, Hitler wanted to see him without delay. Fortified by half a bottle of champagne, Henderson drove out of the embassy driveway. A considerable crowd was waiting at the gate in absolute silence but, as far as he could see, with no hostility. As Hitler read the German translation of the British note he registered no emotion even though it ended with the mixed expression of promise and threat that had become the Führer's own trademark, a just settlement of the questions between Germany and Poland could open the way to world peace failure to reach it would bring Germany and Great Britain into conflict and might well plunge the whole world into war. Such an outcome would be a calamity without parallel in history.
Hitler passed the note to Ribbentrop without comment, amazing Schmidt with such a calm reaction. Henderson's next move was even more surprising. He took the offensive for the first time in memory and did more talking than Hitler. Ordinarily this would have caused an eruption but Hitler sat calmly, occasionally staring out at the dark garden where his famed predecessor, Bismarck, had so often strolled. In the meantime Henderson was proclaiming that England's word was her bond and she had never and would never break it. In the old days Germany's word also had the same value and he quoted Field Marshal von Blücher's exhortation to his troops when hurrying to support Wellington at Waterloo, forward, my children, forward, I had given my word to my brother Wellington, and you cannot wish me to break it. Things were quite a bit different 125 years ago, commented Hitler but with no asperity and then insisted that while he was quite ready to settle his differences with Poland on a reasonable basis the Poles were continuing their violence against Germans. Such acts seemed to be a matter of indifference to the British. Henderson, perhaps it was the Champagne, somehow took this as a personal insult, heatedly replying that he had done everything in his power to prevent war and bloodshed. Herr Hitler, he said must choose between friendship with England and excessive demands on Poland. The choice between war and peace was his. Still retaining his calm, Hitler replied that this was not a correct picture of the situation. His alternatives were either to defend the rights of the German people or to abandon them at the cost of an agreement with England. And there could be no choice, his duty was to defend the rights of all Germans. At the end of this extraordinary colloquy Hitler again expressed a desire for agreement with England. It left Henderson with some optimism. He was also cheered by Schmidt's parting remark, you were quite marvelous. But there was pessimism at the Chancellery. The Führer, Engel wrote in his diary, is exceptionally irritated, bitter and sharp, and he made it clear to his adjutants that he would not take advice from the military on the question of peace or war. He simply could not understand a German soldier who feared war. Frederick the Great would turn in his grave if he saw today's generals. All he wanted was liquidation of the unjust conditions of the Poles, not war with the Western Allies. If they were stupid enough to take part that was their fault and they would have to be destroyed. The air of depression and anxiety in the Winter Garden heightened as Hitler composed an answer to the British and this turned to alarm when the noon papers reported in glaring headlines that at least six German nationals had been murdered in Poland. Whether this report was true or not, Hitler himself believed it and was incensed. And so by the time Henderson reappeared early that evening there was a feeling in the waiting rooms and corridors of the Chancellery that little less than a miracle could prevent war. The ambassador was still hoping for the best hand, as on the day before wore a red carnation, his private signal to insiders that he still had hope. Once Henderson entered Hitler's study and was handed a copy of the German reply, however, he sensed an attitude more uncompromising than last night. With the Führer and Ribbentrop earing him closely, he began reading the German note. It started reasonably. Germany readily consented to the proposed mediation by the British. Hitler was pleased to receive a Polish emissary in Berlin with full powers to negotiate. But the next words were completely unacceptable. The German government calculated that this delegate will arrive on Wednesday, 30th of August, 1939. It sounds like an ultimatum, protested Henderson. The Poles are given barely 24 hours to make their plans. Supported by Ribbentrop, the few heatedly denied the charge. The time is short, he explained, because there is the danger that fresh provocation may result in the outbreak of fighting. Henderson was not impressed. He still could not accept such a time limit. It was the diktat of Bad Godesberg all over again. Hitler argued that he was being pressed by his general staff. My soldiers, he said, are asking me yes or no. The way Macht was ready to strike and its commanders were complaining that a week had been lost already. Another week might bring them into the rainy season. But the ambassador would not budge and Hitler at last lost his temper. He angrily made a countercharge, neither Henderson nor his government cared a row of pins how many Germans were being slaughtered in Poland. 
Henderson shouted back that he would not listen to such language from Hitler or anybody else. It seemed the ambassador had also lost his temper, but he explained in his report that this was a trick, the time he had come to play Herr Hitler at his own game. Glaring into his opponent's eyes, at the top of his voice he bellowed that if Hitler wanted war he could have it. England was every bit as resolute as Germany and would in fact hold out a little bit longer than Germany could. The Führer took this new departure in British diplomacy with relative grace and, once the clamour subsided, asserted his constant desire to win Britain's friendship, his respect for the empire, and his liking for Englishmen in general. But genuine as Hitler's expression of admiration for the English appeared to be, it was still apparent to Henderson that their two countries had reached an impasse. As he was leaving the Chancellery he was filled with the gloomiest of forebodings. In the farewell to his German escort. Henderson glumly expressed the fear that he would never again wear a red carnation in Germany. Later that evening Goring summoned Dahlerus to his residence and revealed a secret, Hitler was working on a gross zu geiges and spot, magnanimous offer, to Poland. It was going to be presented the next morning and would include a lasting and just solution of the corridor by a plebiscite. Once more Goring tore a page out of an atlas and hastily sketched with a green pencil the territory that would be settled by plebiscite, then he outlined in red the area Hitler regarded as pure Polish. Goring urged Dahlerus to fly immediately to London so he could once more stress Germany's determination to negotiate and hint confidentially that Hitler was going to present the Poles with an offer so generous they would be bound to accept. The next morning was one of reaffirmation for Chamberlain. The most pressing matter on his agenda was Hitler's invitation to the Poles. The Prime Minister's Foreign Secretary was convinced that it was of course unreasonable to expect that we can produce a Polish representative in Berlin today nor should the Germans expect it, and his ambassador in Warsaw telephoned that he saw little chance of inducing the Poles to send back or any other representative to Berlin immediately. They would certainly sooner fight and perish rather than submit to such humiliation especially after the examples of Czechoslovakia, Lithuania and Austria. Chamberlain himself was now so determined to resist Hitler that he never even asked the Poles if they would submit and by the time Dahlerus was back at 10 Downing Street negotiation seemed impossible. Chamberlain, Wilson and Cadogan listened to the Swede but their reaction to Hitler's magnanimous offer was that it was all talk and only a trick to gain time. Why not phone Goring and find out if the offer had actually been typed up? Suggested Dahlerus. In a few minutes he was talking to the Reichsmarschall, who assured him that the note to Poland was not only finished but its terms were more generous than he had predicted. Encouraged, Dahlerus did his utmost to allay British distrust going over the terms of the offer with the help of the map Goring had marked up. While the terms seemed reasonable, the British were still disturbed by Hitler's insistence that a Polish delegate present himself in Berlin on the 30th, that very day. Beyond the time limit, Chamberlain and his colleagues opposed the place, Berlin. Look what had happened to Tizo and Hacker. Dahlerus phoned Goring again this time with the suggestion that the negotiations with Poland take place out of Berlin, preferably in a neutral territory. Nonsense, 
was the annoyed reply, the negotiations must take place in Berlin where Hitler had his headquarters, and anyhow I can see no reason why the Poles should find it difficult to send emissaries to Berlin. Despite the rebuff, as well as their own continuing distrust, the British decided to at least keep the door to peace open. Dalaris was urged to fly back to Berlin and reassure Hitler that England remained willing to negotiate. Further, as evidence of good faith, Halifax telegraphed Warsaw cautioning the Poles not to fire on troublemakers from their German minority and to stop inflammatory radio propaganda. The Polish response was to order a general mobilization. Hitler was indignant, for his foreign office had spent the day drafting an offer to Poland so generous that his objective interpreter, Schmidt, could scarcely believe his eyes. Besides suggesting a plebiscite in the corridor under an international commission, it gave the Poles an international road and railway through territory which would become German. It was a real League of Nations proposal, recalled Schmidt. I felt I was back in Geneva. Despite his wrath at the Polish mobilization, Hitler instructed Braukic and Kiitel to postpone the invasion of Poland another 24 hours. This, he said, was the final postponement. Unless his demands were accepted by Warsaw the attack was to begin at 4.30 am September 1. By nightfall there was still no word from Warsaw and the news from London was inconclusive. The British were considering Hitler's latest note with all urgency and would send a reply later in the day. In the meantime they advised Colonel Beck to negotiate with the Germans without delay. It was an ironic request after their own long delay. Perhaps the British irresolution was aroused, if not occasioned, by secret revelations earlier in the day from a German civilian in close contact with the Wehrmacht. Ewald von Klistschmann's in revealed to the British military attaché a number of German military secrets along with an assurance that Hitler had recently suffered a nervous breakdown and the general staff planned to take advantage of this to stage a military coup. It was 10 p.m. Berlin time before Henderson finally got permission to present the reply to the Germans. He phoned Ribbentrop proposing they meet at midnight. This happened to be the deadline for the Polish representative to arrive in Berlin and Ribbentrop thought it was deliberate. It was done in all innocence, more time was needed to decipher the London message, but it set an unwholesome atmosphere of suspicion for the interview. After Henderson suggested the Germans follow normal procedure by transmitting their proposals through the Polish embassy in Berlin, Ribbentrop leapt to his feet. That's out of the question after what has happened. He shouted, the last vestige of self-control gone. We demand that a negotiator empowered by his government with full authority should come here to Berlin. Henderson's face grew red. London had warned him to keep calm this time and his hands trembled as he read the official answer to Hitler's last memorandum. Ribbentrop fumed as if listening under duress. Undoubtedly he knew its contents since most telephone calls at the British Embassy, particularly the overseas line to London, were being monitored by a German intelligence agency known as the Research Office. The note itself, while conciliatory in tone, offered little more than the previous phone messages of the day. That's an unheard of suggestion. Ribbentrop angrily interrupted at the suggestion that no aggressive military action take place during the negotiations. Crossing his arms belligerently, he glared at Henderson. Have you anything more to say? Perhaps he was paying the ambassador back for yesterday's shouting match with the Fuhrer. The Englishman responded to this rudeness by remarking that His Majesty's government had information the Germans were committing acts of sabotage in Poland. This time Ribbentrop was truly enraged. That's a damned lie of the Polish government. He shouted. I can only tell you, Herr Henderson, that the position is damned serious. Henderson half rose in his seat and shouted in return, you have just said damned. He wagged an admonitory finger like an outraged schoolmaster. That's no word for a statesman to use in so grave a situation. Ribbentrop looked as if a glass of cold water had been thrown in his face. For a split second he was the picture of shock and indignation. To be reprimanded by an arrogant Englishman. He jumped to his feet. What did you say? 
Henderson was also on his feet and the two men glared at each other like fighting cocks. According to diplomatic convention, recalled Schmidt, I too should have risen, but to be frank I did not quite know how an interpreter should behave when speakers passed from words to deeds, and I really feared they might do so now. He kept his seat, pretending to be writing in his notebook. When he heard heavy breathing above, he feared the German foreign minister was about to throw His Majesty's ambassador bodily through the doorway. Over the years as interpreter he had rather enjoyed grotesque situations but this one was extremely painful. He heard more heavy breathing to right and left but finally Ribbentrop and then Henderson sat down. Cautiously the interpreter raised his head. All clear. The storm was over. The conversation continued in relative calm for a few minutes. Then Ribbentrop took a paper out of his pocket. It was Hitler's offer to Poland which had so surprised Schmidt. Ribbentrop began reading the 16 points in German. Henderson had difficulty in understanding them, he later complained, because Ribbentrop garbled through the document at top speed and he asked for the text so he could transmit it to his government. It was such normal diplomatic procedure that Schmidt wondered why the ambassador bothered asking at all and he could scarcely believe what he heard next. No said Ribbentrop quietly, with an uneasy smile, I cannot hand you those proposals. He couldn't explain that the Führer had expressly forbidden him to let the document out of his hand. Henderson, also unable to believe his ears, repeated his request. Once more Ribbentrop refused, this time emotionally slapping the document on the table. It is out of date, anyhow, he said, as the Polish envoy has not appeared. Watching in agitation, Schmidt suddenly realized that Hitler was playing a game, he feared that if the British passed on the proposals to the Poles they might accept them. It was a mortal sin for an interpreter to make a comment but he did stare fixedly and invitingly at Henderson, silently willing him to ask for an English translation. Ribbentrop could hardly refuse such a request and Schmidt was determined to translate with such deliberation that the ambassador could copy every word in longhand. But Henderson did not understand the signal and all the interpreter could do was make a thick red mark in his notebook, a personal notation meaning that the die was cast for war. Thus ended the stormy interview which, according to Ribbentrop, was conducted with discourtesy by Henderson and with coolness by himself. Despite the late hour, the foreign minister reported immediately to Hitler at the Chancellery and suggested that Henderson be given the German proposals in writing. The Führer refused. 3. Early the next morning Henderson telephoned the secretary of the Polish embassy, warning him that he had information from an unquestionably accurate source that there would be war if Poland did not undertake to do something within two or three hours. Every word was taken down by Hitler's wiretappers. So was Henderson's message to London 15 minutes later repeating the same information with the comment that while it might be a bluff there was an equal possibility it was not. Although the Germans were still not privy to all the British ciphers, Henderson's indiscreet use of the telephone was making their task easier. The security in the British Embassy in Rome, incidentally, was even slacker. Lord Perth's safe was regularly burgled each week by a professional thief in the employ of Italian intelligence authorities. Besides copying confidential material that revealed all British diplomatic codes and ciphers, the thief one night appropriated Lady Perth's tiara for himself. But even this loss brought no improvement in the embassy security measures. Fortunately for England, Mussolini was not yet turning over foreign codes and ciphers to his ally. The last day of August was a frantic one for men of goodwill. Dalaris got permission from Henderson to telephone London and a little afternoon was telling Sir Horace Wilson that Hitler's proposals were extremely liberal. According to Goring, he said, the Führer had put forward such terms with the sole intention of showing the British how anxious he was to secure a friendly settlement with the English. As Dalaris was speaking, Wilson heard a German voice repeating the words. Realizing the phone was tapped, he instructed Dalaris to give his information to Henderson, but the amateur diplomat did not get the hint. Nor did he stop when Wilson warned that he should not get ahead of the clock. 
Finally Wilson told Dalaras in plain language to shut up and, when he did not, slammed down the receiver. While the professional and amateur diplomats were grasping for a peaceful solution, the program for war proceeded relentlessly. That noon Hitler issued the second order for invasion, driven to this extremity, according to A.I. Burnt, his liaison man with DNB, by a gross lie. Burnt thought the reported number of German nationals killed by Poles too small and simply added a naught. At first Hitler refused to believe such a large figure but, when Burnt replied that it may have been somewhat exaggerated but something monstrous must have happened to give rise to such stories, Hitler shouted, they'll pay for this. Now no one will stop me from teaching these fellows a lesson they'll never forget. I will not have my Germans butchered like cattle. At this point the Führer went to the phone and, in Bert's presence, ordered Key Eitel to issue directive number one for the conduct of the war. Already prepared, its opening words were tailored to fit the moment, since the situation on Germany's eastern frontier has become intolerable and all political possibilities of peaceful settlement have been exhausted, I have decided upon a solution by force. The attack on Poland was definitely set for the following day, Friday, the 1st of September, and no action would be taken in the West. The directive was hand carried to all senior commanders, who transmitted, with the greatest possible secrecy, special orders to field commanders. At 4 p.m. the executive order to begin the invasion was confirmed, troops and equipment began moving up to forward positions near the frontier. Simultaneously special orders were transmitted to a secret German unit on the Polish border by the chief of the SS security service. Reinhard Heydrich had concocted a diabolical scheme, Operation Himmela, to give Hitler a perfect excuse for launching his attack. SD detachments disguised as Polish soldiers and guerrillas would create incidents along the border the night before the invasion. In exactly four hours they were to attack a forestry station, destroy a German customs building and, most important, briefly occupy the German radio station at Gliwitz. After shouting anti-German slogans into the microphone the Poles would retreat, leaving behind a number of dead bodies as proof that a fight had taken place. The bodies presented no problem. Heydrich had already selected the victims, they were called canned goods from concentration camps. In Berlin Ambassador Lipsky, after a five and a half hour delay, was finally escorted into Ribbentrop's office at 6.30 p.m. fatigued and nervous, Lipsky read a brief communication stating that his government was favorably considering British proposals for direct negotiations between Germany and Poland and would make a formal reply on the subject within the next few hours. He added pointedly that he had been trying to make this declaration since 1 p.m. Have you come as an emissary empowered to negotiate? asked Ribbentrop coolly, to which Lipsky replied that he merely had instructions for the time being to transmit the message he had just read. Ribbentrop protested that he had expected Lipsky to come as a fully empowered delegate. Have you authority to negotiate with us now on the German proposals? He persisted. Lipsky did not. Well, then there is no point to our continuing the conversation. So ended one of the briefest interviews in Schmidt's experience. Lipsky never asked to see Hitler's 16-point proposal and even if Ribbentrop had volunteered it he was not authorized to receive it. He was following his orders not to enter into any concrete negotiations. The Poles were apparently so confident they could whip the Germans, with help from their allies, that they were not interested in discussing Hitler's offer nor were England and France extending themselves to persuade the Poles to negotiate. When Lipsky arrived back at his embassy he attempted to phone Warsaw. The line was dead. The Germans had cut communications. There was no more they needed to know. At the Chancellery Adolf Hitler was conversing with Italian ambassador at Olico, who had arrived at 7 p.m. once again at Olico urged peace. Would Hitler agree to Il Duce acting as last-minute mediator? We must first await the course of events, said the Führer. These now marched on schedule. At exactly 8 p.m. Heydrich's fake Polish attack on the radio station at Gliwitz took place. An hour later all German stations cancelled regular programs so that an official statement could be read. 
The 16-point offer was repeated word for word and even unfriendly foreign correspondents were impressed by its reasonableness. The Poles never for a moment considered accepting the German proposal. Instead of sending a hurried request to resume negotiations that might possibly have thrown Hitler's plot off balance, they retaliated aggressively with their own broadcast at 11 p.m. It charged that the German broadcast clearly exposed Hitler's aims. Words can no longer veil the aggressive plans of the new Huns. Germany is aiming at the domination of Europe and is cancelling the rights of nations with as yet unprecedented cynicism. This impudent proposal shows clearly how necessary were the military orders, mobilization, given by the Polish government. Ribbentrop went to the Chancellery to see how the Fuhrer reacted to the Polish broadcast. Nothing else can be done, said Hitler. Things are now in motion. He was noticeably composed. After weeks of worry and doubt, the course for the future was at last set. He went to bed assured that England and France would not take action. Perhaps the greatest assurance that night to Hitler, he had recently told his military that the treaty with Stalin had been a pact with Satan to drive out the devil, was a brief message from Moscow that the Supreme Soviet had finally ratified the treaty with Germany after a brilliant speech by Molotov. To Hitler the invasion of Poland was not war, only a coup to seize what was rightfully Germany's. It was a localized action which both England and France, after making face-saving gestures, would surely accept as a fait accompli. Time and again his adjutants had heard him say at the dinner table, the English will leave the Poles in the lurch as they did the Czechs. Although intercepts from his own research office clearly indicated it was probable that both England and France would intervene in the event of a German-Polish war, Hitler could not bring himself to believe this since. According to his personal adjutant, Schaub, it disturbed the formation of his intuition. He preferred to put more credence in a personal conviction that neither Britain nor France would act. England is bluffing. He recently had told his court photographer, then added with a rare impish grin, and so am I. Goring was in his private train when word came that Hitler had made the final decision for war. Beside himself with anger, he got Ribbentrop on the phone. Now you've got your damned war. It's all you're doing. He shouted and slammed down the receiver. It was ironic. Perhaps no one had warned the Führer more often than Ribbentrop that England would surely fight if pushed to the limit. 4. At 4.45 Friday morning, September 1st, the German cruiser Schleswig Holstein, in Danzig Harbor on a courtesy visit began shelling the little peninsula where Poland maintained a military depot and 88 soldiers. Simultaneously artillery fire crashed along the Polish-German border, followed by a massive surge eastward of German infantry and tanks. There was no formal declaration of war but within the hour Hitler broadcast a proclamation to his troops. He had no other choice, he said, than to meet force with force. In Rome il Duce was outwardly calm. A few hours earlier, spurred by his own fear and a deluge of cautionary advice, he had come to a wise but embarrassing decision, Italy would remain neutral. He personally telephoned Atolico and urged him to beg the Führer to send him a telegram releasing him from the obligation of their alliance. Hitler quickly composed an answer that hid his anger. I am convinced that we can carry out the task imposed upon us with the military forces of Germany he said and thanked Mussolini for everything he could do in the future for the common cause of fascism and national socialism. He signed the note at 9.40 a.m., then headed for the Kroll Opera House to address the Reichstag. The onlookers were surprised to see Hitler step briskly onto the stage in a tailored field grey uniform. It looked like military dress but was merely the party uniform in a new color. The audience listened intently as, in a low, raucous voice, he hammered out his case against Poland, point by point, all the time working himself into a state of indignation. He also regretted that the Western powers thought their interests were involved. I have repeatedly offered England our friendship, and if necessary closest cooperation. Love, however, is not a one-sided affair, but must be responded to by the other side. Eva Braun, in the audience turned to her sister and whispered, this means war, Ilse, and he'll leave.
what will become of me? Perhaps because of its extemporaneous nature, the speech was not one of the Führer's best efforts and Helmut Sunderman, along with others in the Dietrich office, was frantically correcting the grammar and removing the redundancies so a presentable version could be submitted to the press. Hitler went on to promise that he would never wage war against women and children and then announced that Polish soldiers had fired the first shots in German territory and Wehrmacht troops were only returning the fire. Who fights with poison, he threatened, will be fought with poison. Who disregards the rules of human warfare can only expect us to take the same steps. I will carry on this fight, no matter against whom until the safety of the Reich and its rights are secured exclamation mark dot from this moment, my whole life shall belong more than ever to my people. I now want to be nothing but the first soldier of the German Reich. Therefore, I have once again put on that uniform which was always so sacred to and dear to me. I shall not take it off until after the victory, or I shall not live to see the end. The audience cheered and in the fanatical excitement it went unnoticed that Eva Braun had covered her face and was weeping. If something happens to him, she finally told her sister, I will die too. Hitler was announcing that if anything should happen to him Goring would be his successor. If the Reichsmarschall fell Hess would take over. It was a unilateral decision, perhaps made on the spur of the moment, and indicated that there was really no longer a German government. The Führer was Germany. In startling contrast to the wild cheers of Sig Heil in the Opera House, the streets outside were almost deathly quiet. The few people abroad were serious as if oppressed with concern for the future. There were no signs of the jubilation as on that august day, 25 years before, when the Kaiser announced his war. Today there was no eager young Adolf Hitler in the streets, eyes alight with exultation. In 1914 the majority of Europeans had found relief in war. We must never forget, wrote D. H. Lawrence of the war which he had vigorously opposed, that mankind lives by a twofold motive, the motive of peace and increase, and the motive of contest and martial triumph. As soon as the appetite for martial adventure and triumph in conflict is satisfied, the appetite for peace and increase manifests itself and vice versa. It seems a law of life. Between the armistice and today there had been little peace or increase. This generation had no immediate past of dull daily life, no desire for adventure or escape. Aware that the last war had settled nothing, these Germans knew from experience that war was long, tragic and inglorious, that it might radically alter their lives for the worse. As Eva Braun dejectedly left the opera house with Dr. Brandt, he tried to cheer her up. Don't worry, Fräulein Braun, he said. The Führer told me that there will be peace again in three weeks' time. She managed to force a smile. Henderson telegraphed London that immediately after the speech Hitler had returned to the Chancellery and told his generals that his policy had broken down and that guns alone could now speak. Herr Hitler broke down and left the room without completing the speech. It could have been true. Early that afternoon Goring summoned Dalaris to the Chancellery. Hitler wished to see him. The Führer thanked Dalaris for all his efforts, then blamed England that they had been in vain. There was now no longer any hope of an agreement. A moment later he interrupted a Goring irrelevancy to say he was determined to crush Polish resistance and annihilate Poland as a nation. If England still wanted to talk, however, he was willing to meet her halfway. Abruptly he began to shout and gesticulate. Goring averted his head in embarrassment. If England wants to fight for a year, I shall fight two years. Hitler cut himself short but after a moment's pause bellowed even louder, as his arms milled about wildly. If England wants to fight for three years, I shall fight for three years. He clenched his fist and shouted, and if it is necessary, I will fight ten years. From a crouch he smashed his fist down so low it almost touched the floor. When Hitler emerged into the anteroom a little later, however, he appeared to be in a state of joyful excitement. He exclaimed to Ribbentrop and two of his adjutants that the progress of his troops was beyond his wildest hopes. 
the entire campaign would be over before the West had time to draw up notes of protest. At this point Otto Abitz, a French expert, offered his unsought opinion that France would declare war. Turning to Ribbentrop, Hitler raised his hands in mock terror. Please spare me the verdicts of your experts, he said and heaped sarcasm on German diplomats who received the highest salaries, possessed the most modern means of communication, yet always came up with the wrong answer. They had predicted war over conscription, the Rhineland, the annexation of Austria, the Sudeten crisis and the occupation of Prague. His military attaches were just as bad. Either their wits have been so dulled by their fatiguing breakfast duty that they are unable to get a better overall picture of the situation in their countries than I can get from Berlin, or my policy does not suit them and they falsify the true position in their reports in order to put obstacles in my path. You must understand, Ribbentrop, that I have at last decided to do without the opinions of people who have misinformed me on a dozen occasions, or even lied to me and I shall rely on my own judgment, which has in all these cases given me better counsel than the competent experts. In London, Polish Ambassador Edward Ratchinsky had already taken it upon himself to call on Lord Halifax at 10 Downing Street and say, on his own responsibility, that his government considered the invasion a case of aggression under Article 1 of the Anglo-Polish Treaty of Mutual Assistance. I have very little doubt about it, said Halifax. As the two men emerged into the hall, ministers were already arriving for an emergency cabinet meeting. Sir John Simon, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, grasped Ratchinsky's hand. We can shake hands now, he said. We are all in the same boat. Britain is not in the habit of deserting her friends. Minutes later Chamberlain was suggesting to his cabinet that Hitler be given a final warning. Unless hostilities ceased, England would fulfill her obligations to Poland. The message, he warned, should be worded cautiously, not as an ultimatum. Otherwise the Germans might immediately attack British ships. The world was shocked by the sudden attack even though it was expected. There was no condemnation from the Vatican, which had been secretly exerting pressure on the Polish government, through Cardinal Lond, to negotiate with Hitler. President Roosevelt's first action was a plea that both belligerents promise not to bomb civilians or unfortified cities. It was a vow that Hitler had already publicly made and Roosevelt's statement only annoyed him. His irritation escalated to indignation when his charge in Washington reported that the deputy of the press chief in the U.S. State Department had told the DNB representative, We only pity you people, your government already stands convicted. They are condemned from one end of the earth to the other, for this bloodbath, if it now comes to war between Britain, France and Germany, will have been absolutely unnecessary. The whole manner of conducting negotiations was as stupid as it could possibly be. Hitler blamed American hostility on the Jewish-controlled press and the Jews around President Rosenfeld. He retaliated by prohibiting all German Jews, as enemies of the state from henceforth going outdoors after 8 p.m. in the winter and 9 p.m. in the summer. Before long all Jewish radios would be confiscated. Late that afternoon the British message to Germany was finally dispatched to Henderson, who was instructed to take it at once, in the company of his French colleague, to Ribbentrop. He should explain that it was a warning, not an ultimatum, but for his own information, and incidentally that of Hitler's wiretappers, that if the German reply was unsatisfactory the next stage would be either an ultimatum with a time limit or an immediate declaration of war. Henderson and Kalonder arrived at the Wilhelmstrasse just before 9.30 pm but Ribbentrop refused to meet them together. First he saw the British ambassador, receiving him with pointed courtesy. Ribbentrop remarked that it was Poland which had provoked Germany and began arguing, though not raucously. This time they did not stand nose to nose but conducted themselves correctly. No sooner had Henderson left than Colander entered with an almost identical note from France. Ribbentrop repeated that it was Poland's fault, not Germany's, but promised to pass on the message to Hitler. In London Chamberlain was telling the Commons about the note sent to Hitler. England's only quarrel with the German people, he said, 
was that they allowed themselves to be governed by a Nazi government. As long as that government exists and pursues the methods it has so persistently followed during the last two years, there will be no peace in Europe. We shall merely pass from one crisis to another, and see one country after another attacked by methods which have now become familiar to us in their sickening technique. We are resolved that these methods must come to an end. There were cheers from all benches. 5. Despite indications that Hitler would resent further attempts at mediation from Rome, Mussolini decided to make a final effort and the next morning suggested a big power conference to settle the dispute. But the Führer was not enthusiastic while both France and England were reluctant. There is only one chance, Fritz Hess in London phoned Hewell of the Wilhelm stress, namely that we immediately move out of Poland and offer reparation payment for damages. If Hitler does that there is probably one chance in a million of avoiding the catastrophe. Within two hours Hewell called back. A deep voice broke in, Ribbentrops. You know who is speaking? he said but asked not to be mentioned by name. Please go immediately to your confidant, you know who I mean, he was referring to Sir Horace Wilson and tell him this, the Führer is prepared to move out of Poland and to offer reparation damages provided that we receive Danzig and Road through the corridor, if England will act as mediator in the German-Polish conflict. You are empowered by the Führer to submit this proposal to the British cabinet and initiate negotiations immediately. Hess was flabbergasted. Had a spectre of things to come finally dawned on the Führer at the last moment? Or was it just a charade to see how far the British would compromise with the sword of war dangling overhead? Hess asked Ribbentrop to repeat the offer. He did, adding, so there will be no misunderstanding. Point out again that you are acting on the express instructions of Hitler and that this is no private action of mine. Hess phoned 10 Downing Street. He was informed that Wilson would not be available for some time. A few minutes later, at exactly 7.44 p.m., Chamberlain walked into the House of Commons to make his statement. We waited there exactly like a court awaiting the verdict of the jury, recalled Harold Nicholson. But from the beginning the Prime Minister's speech was a letdown. His voice betrayed some emotion as if he were sickening for a cold. He is a strange man. We expected one of his dramatic speeches. But none came. After assuring his listeners that His Majesty's government was bound to take action unless Hitler withdrew his forces from Poland, Chamberlain astounded them by asserting an agreement to do so would return matters to pre-invasion status, that is to say. The way would be open to discussions between the German and Polish governments of the matters at issue between them, on the understanding that the settlement arrived at was one that safeguarded the vital interests of Poland and was secured by an international guarantee. In other words, Chamberlain still hesitated. Later, according to Ambassador Kennedy, he said that the Americans and the world Jews had forced him into the war, there were indignant cries of speak for England, Arthur. As acting Labour leader Arthur Greenwood sprang to his feet. I wonder, he said, how long we are prepared to vacillate at a time when Britain and all that Britain stands for, and human civilization, are in peril. A mutiny of the MPs was in the air, many demanding that an ultimatum to Hitler be issued at once without the French. But Chamberlain insisted on acting in concert. At 9.50 pm he phoned Daladior and proposed a compromise. Daladier hedged, his cabinet insisted on giving Hitler until noon tomorrow to withdraw from Poland. Almost at the moment they hung up, Hess arrived at 10 Downing Street to see Wilson. Sir Horace was visibly impressed by Hitler's new proposal to quit Poland but was reluctant to present it to the cabinet. The situation, he said, had changed drastically since their last meeting, Roosevelt had secretly promised to help Chamberlain if he declared war and Russia certainly would not fight on Germany's side. Hess persisted. I see in this offer, he said, the last and only chance to avoid war and also a sign that Hitler recognizes he has made a mistake. Otherwise I would not have this proposal in my hands. Sir Horace could not believe that Hitler had changed his mind. Would he make a public apology for his acts of violence? If so, there might still be a chance. Such a suggestion, said Hess, 
was a psychological error. In Hitler's eyes at least, the responsibility for the present crisis was not solely his. This brought an unusually loud rejoinder from Wilson. Hitler and Hitler alone was responsible for the situation. If this proposal fails merely because Hitler won't apologize, said Hess in desperation, then the world will believe that Chamberlain wanted the war, inasmuch as he had the chance of avoiding it. Wilson thought this over. All right, he said, repeat your suggestion again, perhaps I can transmit it to the cabinet. After Hess did so, Sir Horace paced up and down, hands behind his back. There was a knock at the door. A servant handed Wilson a slip of paper. After reading it twice he held it over the flame of a candle, paced anew. Finally he turned to Hess. I cannot forward your suggestion to the cabinet, he said. The note undoubtedly was that Chamberlain had just decided to act even if it had to be without France. At 11.30 p.m. the cabinet met once more in emergency session. Chamberlain said he wanted to make a statement to the British people the following noon. I therefore suggest, he said, that Sir Neville Henderson should be instructed to see Herr von Ribbentrop at 9 a.m. tomorrow, and to say that unless a reply is received by 12 noon a state of war will exist between England and Germany as from that hour. It was possible, he added, that this decision might spur the French to act earlier but he doubted it. Simon protested that the noon ultimatum would not give Chamberlain time to make his statement to the people, it should be 11 a.m. There was general agreement and the meeting ended. Then came a loud clap of thunder and through the window could be seen a flash of lightning. The Führer, according to his valet, spent that evening at the Chancellery quietly discussing the Polish campaign. But upon reading Hesse's report of the futile meeting with Wilson, it arrived two hours after midnight, he purportedly lost his temper and began blaming Ribbentrop for Italy's refusal to take part in the war. Nor was the harried foreign minister's day yet over. At about 4 a.m. the British embassy telephoned to say that Henderson wished to give Ribbentrop an important communication at 9 a.m. It was obviously a disagreeable message and might even contain an ultimatum. Ribbentrop didn't feel like facing this. He turned to Schmidt, who happened to be on hand, and told him to receive Henderson in his place. 6. Sunday, September 3rd, dawn clear and balmy. It was a lovely day and ordinarily Berliners would be streaming out to the nearby woods and lakes to enjoy the holiday. Today they were depressed and confused to find themselves at the threshold of a major war. Of all mornings, this was the one that Schmidt, in bed only a few hours, overslept. Rushing by taxi to the foreign office, he saw Henderson enter the building and himself raced into a side entrance. He was standing, somewhat breathless, in Ribbentrop's office as the hour of nine struck and Henderson was announced. The ambassador shook hands but declined Schmidt's invitation to sit down. I regret that on the instructions of my government, he said with deep emotion, I have to hand you an ultimatum for the German government. He read out the statement, which called for war unless Germany gave assurances that all troops would be withdrawn from Poland by 11 o'clock, British summer time. Henderson extended the document. I am sincerely sorry, he said, that I must hand such a document to you in particular as you have always been most anxious to help. While Henderson would not be remembered for astuteness, retaining as he did naive conception of the Führer to the end, he had succeeded in outzouting him and staring down Ribbentrop on successive evenings, feats worthy of some applause. In a few minutes Schmidt was at the Chancellery. He made his way with some difficulty through the crowd gathered outside of the Führer's office. To anxious questions on his mission, he said cryptically, classroom dismissed. Hitler was at his desk, Ribbentrop stood by the window. Both turned expectantly as Schmidt entered. He slowly translated the British ultimatum. At last Hitler turned to Ribbentrop and abruptly said, What now? I assume, said Ribbentrop quietly, that the French will hand in a similar ultimatum within the hour. Schmidt was engulfed in the anteroom by eager questions but once he revealed that England was declaring war in two hours there was complete silence. Finally Goring said, if we lose this war, 
then God have mercy on us. Everywhere Schmidt saw grave faces. Even the usually ebullient Goebbels stood in a corner, downcast and self-absorbed. One man refused to give up hope. Dalaris located Goring at his private train. Why didn't the Reichsmarschall fly to London and negotiate with the British? Goring was persuaded to telephone Hitler. Surprisingly, he reported, the Führer liked the idea, but first wanted British concurrence. Dalaris telephoned the counselor at the British embassy, who replied that the Germans must first answer the ultimatum. Undeterred, Dalaris phoned the Foreign Office in London. He got the same answer. Still he persisted. He somehow persuaded Goring to ring up Hitler again and suggest sending a conciliatory official reply to the British. Dalaris waited outside the train, nervously pacing up and down, while Goring talked with the Führer. Finally Goring stepped out of the train, seating himself at a large collapsible table in a stand of beech trees. He muttered that a plane was standing by to take him to England. But Dalaris concluded from the disappointed look on his face that he had been refused by the Führer, but the Swede was not perspicacious. At Nuremberg he dolefully admitted that he had been misled in general by both Hitler and Goring, and could have been taken in by Goring's play-acting. The extent of Dalaris' naivete was revealed in his own recorded reaction to the moment, my blood boiled as I saw the hopelessness of this powerful man and I could not understand why, knowing what he did, he did not jump into his car, drive to the chancellery and tell them what he really thought, always supposing he really meant all the things he had been telling me for the past two months. So ended the stout, if amateurish, efforts of Dalaris to prevent war. At 11.15 am Ambassador Henderson received a message to call upon Ribbentrop, Within 15 minutes he was handed Germany's reply to the ultimatum, a flat refusal. Henderson looked up from the statement and remarked that it would be left to history to judge where the blame really lay. Ribbentrop replied that nobody had striven harder for peace and good relations with England than Herr Hitler had done, and wished Henderson well personally. At noon loudspeakers in the streets of Berlin blared out the news of war with England to shocked listeners. London, where it was NAM, was hot and summery and Chamberlain was stealing himself for his broadcast to the people. Fifteen minutes later he announced that England was at war. The British government, he said, had done everything possible to establish peace and had a clear conscience. Now may God bless you all and may he defend the right. Even as he was speaking, Calandre handed over to Ribbentrop France's ultimatum, and was told that France would therefore be the aggressor. But it was England that bore the brunt of Hitler's resentment. He who so readily perceived British weakness had completely failed to judge British strength. His localized war was turning into a general conflagration because of this miscalculation. It was an impasse born of his first crucial mistake, the decision to seize all of Czechoslovakia. If he had not done so and had waited for that country to fall in his lap, it is doubtful that the English would have reacted so positively to his demands on Poland. What Hitler had refused to accept, even though he may have guessed as much, was that an Englishman will go so far but not one inch farther. Despite information to the contrary by Hess and intelligence reports, Hitler had been misled by his own distorted picture of British character. It was with unprecedented embarrassment, therefore, that he informed Admiral Reda of the Western ultimatum. There was little doubt that the occupants of the Kremlin were surprised by the British declaration. The news of war, reported the Moscow correspondent of the London Daily Telegraph, astonished the Russians. They expected a compromise. Curiously the Soviets showed so little inclination to join the attack on Poland that Ribbentrop invited them to do so in a telegram dispatched early that evening to Ambassador von der Schulenberg. In our estimation, explained Ribbentrop, this would be not only a relief for us, but also be in the sense of the Moscow agreements, and in the Soviet interest as well. Hitler was already preparing to leave the Chancellery with his entourage to board a special train bound for the fighting front. Nine minutes before it left Berlin, the Führer sent off a message to the ally who had failed to support him in his greatest crisis. 
Unlike the telegram to Moscow, this one to Mussolini was sent in the clear and was replete with dramatic phrases. He was aware, said Hitler, that this was a struggle of life and death but he had chosen to wage war with deliberation, and his faith remained as firm as a rock. As the Führer's train pulled out of the station at exactly 9 p.m. he did not show the confidence of this letter. One secretary, Gerda Duranowski, noticed he was very quiet, pale and thoughtful, never before had she seen him like that. And another, Christa Schroeder, overheard him say to Hess, now, all my work crumbles. I wrote my book for nothing. But to his valet he seemed the epitome of assurance, there was, he said, nothing to worry about in the West, Britain and France would break their teeth on the West Wall. As the train headed east Hitler called Lynch to the dining salon and ordered an even more Spartan diet from that day on. You will see to it, he said, that I have only what the ordinary people of Germany can have. It is my duty to set an example. Part 7 By Force of ARMS Chapter 21 Victory in the West September 3, 1939 June 25, 1940 1. The invasion of Poland proceeded rapidly. Polish cavalrymen, carrying long lances, were no match for German tanks. In a concentrated land and air attack, the defenders were overwhelmed. Harried from the air by fighter planes, bombers and screeching stukas, the Polish ground forces were quickly dispersed by a million and a half men supported by heavy self-propelled guns and tanks. It was this incredible mass of panzers in particular which wreaked havoc. They burst through defenses and ravaged the rear. The Blitzkrieg was almost as terrifying to foreign observers as the victims, for it presaged a frightening turning point in the art of warfare. By morning of September 5 the Polish air force was destroyed, the battle for the corridor ended. Two days later most of Poland's 35 divisions were either routed or surrounded. Hitler closely followed the action in his special train designating it as Führer headquarters even though Jodl's operations staff remained in Berlin. Once he had donned a uniform his way of life changed drastically. Assuming the old role of frontline soldier, he imposed on Führer headquarters an austere simplicity. His new motto was, frontline troops must be assured that their leader shares their privations. Every morning, after dictating orders of the date to Fräulein Schroeder, he set out for the battlefield with pistol and dog's eyed whip. He rode in an open vehicle, weather permitting, so the troops would recognize him while his valet and adjutant tossed out packs of cigarettes. To the wonder of his entourage, he began devoting himself tirelessly to the most minute details of operations. He spent hours, for example, personally inspecting kitchens and mess halls, tyrannically imposing the enlisted man's diet on officers. This aspect of the new regiment soon ended but in all matters of the battlefield he continued to have unflagging interest, that is, with one significant exception. Wenchman tasked him to speak to the first train load of wounded he could not do so. The sight of their suffering, he confessed, would be intolerable. As the one-sided campaign drew to a close an unexpected visitor appeared at Führer headquarters. Fritz Hess had come to report that the German official delegation in London had been given a friendly farewell not only by their high ranking British friends but by the population. A crowd outside the embassy had shouted, See you at Christmas. Hess had also come to Poland out of personal concern, he understood he was in disfavor because of his persistence in seeking peace. But Huell, who presently enjoyed Hitler's complete confidence, assured him that the Führer had sincerely sought negotiations with the British. What provoked him into invading Poland were the reports of atrocities inflicted on German nationals. Hess could not believe that the order to invade had come in a moment of rage. Yes, this was without a doubt the cause, insisted Huell. And he soon regretted that he had given way to his temper. That was why he had permitted Hess to negotiate with Sir Horace Wilson after the invasion. Yes, Hitler would have just liked to say, everybody about face, march, march. My God, exclaimed Hess bitterly, couldn't anyone make it clear to him that although a dictator can order, about face, march, march, 
It is impossible in a parliamentary nation to cancel a decision for war made after long and thoughtful preparation? How can he imagine such a thing? I always warned that there was a war party in England and that the collapse of Chamberlain's foreign policy would certainly bring victory to this war party. Didn't anyone read this report? After a silence the disconcerted Hewell admitted that the Führer had a rather strange concept of the workings of a democracy. He snorted at me when I tried to explain to him your report on the statements Chamberlain made in the House of Commons. He simply did not want to believe it. Don't be afraid though. In the meantime he has realized your report was correct. But for heaven's sake don't make use of this. Nothing irritates the Führer more than people who were right when he was wrong. What concerned Hitler more than England, for there was no action at all on the Western Front, was the reluctance of the Soviet Union to join in the attack on Poland. Apparently Stalin wanted to wait until the last possible moment so as to minimize Red Army losses. It was not until 2 a.m., September 17, that the German ambassador in Moscow was personally informed by Stalin that the Red Army would cross the Polish frontier in several hours. At 4 a.m. local time the Red Army crossed the long eastern frontier of Poland. At one point men of the Polish frontier corps saw a horde of horse-drawn carts filled with soldiers coming through the morning mist. Don't shoot, shouted the Red Army men, we've come to help you against the Germans. The defenders were so confused, white flags were attached to the leading Russian vehicles, that the Soviets passed through in many places without receiving a shot. It was the end of eastern Poland. Ribbentrop was not awakened until 8 a.m. and when he learned that Schmidt had let him sleep three hours he shouted angrily, the German and Russian armies are rushing toward each other, there may be clashes, and all because you were too slack to waken me. The interpreter tried to calm him by reminding him that a demarcation line had been set up. But the foreign minister, his face lathered, continued to rage as he brandished to razor, you have meddled with the course of world history. You have not enough experience for that. What really infuriated Ribbentrop, who was up front with a skeleton staff, was that the delay allowed Goebbels and not his own office to issue the news to foreign journalists in Berlin. The only contest now was between the victors. Before the first day of Russian participation ended the two allies were angling over the text of the joint communique which would attempt to justify the conquest of Poland. Stalin objected to the German draft, it presented the facts all too frankly, then wrote out in his own hand a new version. No sooner had Hitler bowed to this revision than Stalin presented another far more important one an out-and-out partition of the spoils which would deprive the Poles of even the semblance of independence. On the face of it the Russian proposal was advantageous to Germany but Hitler's suspicion was such that it was four days before Ribbentrop was empowered to endorse it. The foreign minister arrived in the Russian capital at 5.50 p.m., September 27, to negotiate the new treaty. It seemed to have been timed auspiciously since Warsaw had just capitulated to German arms. That was, until Ribbentrop received a warning from Berlin of imminent Soviet attacks on Estonia and Latvia. It was, therefore, with apprehension that Ribbentrop set out for the Kremlin later that evening. He already was sure that Stalin was going to make him a tempting offer but feared the price might be too high. At 10 p.m. the conference began. As expected, Stalin formally offered all Polish territory east of the Vistula, which included most of Poland's populated areas. In return, all he wanted was the third Baltic state, Lithuania. After the three-hour meeting ended, Ribbentrop sent off a message by telephone to the Führer. Stalin's proposal, he reported, had one very attractive feature, namely that, with control of the bulk of their population the Polish national problem might be dealt with as Germany saw fit. Shrewd Stalin knew his Hitler. Beyond a need for continuing good relations with the Soviets, the Führer could not resist the opportunity of controlling this breeding ground of Jews. He authorized Ribbentrop to sign the treaty and presented Stalin with the last of the Baltic states. It was a heavy price to pay for keeping his rear in the East free while he dealt with the West. On the surface it looked like another instance of opportunism, 
sacrificing the future for the present. But Hitler was so convinced of the weakness of the Red Army that he must have felt he could easily take back by force what he had given away on paper. During the next day's final negotiations the Soviets insisted that Ribbentrop telephone the Fuhrer for definite approval of all angles of the treaty. Hitler affirmed the agreement although Ribbentrop sensed that it was with some misgivings. I want to establish quite firm and close relations, he said and when Ribbentrop reported these words Stalin replied laconically, Hitler knows his business. Stalin beamed upon Molotov and Ribbentrop as they signed the pact at 5 a.m. on the 29th, but Ribbentrop's remark that Russians and Germans must never again fight brought an embarrassing silence. Finally Stalin replied, this ought to be the case. The coolness of the tone and the unusual phrasing impelled Ribbentrop to ask the interpreter for confirmation. A second Stalin remark was equally vague when Ribbentrop wondered whether the Soviets were willing to go beyond the friendship agreement and conclude an alliance for the coming battles with the West. The answer was, I shall never allow Germany to become weak. The words were uttered so spontaneously that Ribbentrop concluded they must have expressed Stalin's conviction. He returned to Berlin still puzzling over the two remarks. Hitler was even more concerned interpreting Stalin's words to mean that the chasm between their philosophies was too wide for bridging and that a dispute was bound to arise. Only then did the Führer explain that he had made the Lithuanian concession to prove to Stalin his intention of settling questions with his eastern neighbor for good and of establishing real confidence from the start. Taking these words at face value as he had those of Stalin, Ribbentrop remained convinced that Hitler really sought a permanent understanding with the Soviets. While Stalin was digesting the three Baltic states and eastern Poland, Hitler was transforming the rest of that nation into a massive killing ground. He had already ordered Jews from the Rhine massed in specific Polish cities having good rail connections. Object, final solution, which will take some time as Heydrich explained to SS commanders on September 21. He was talking of the extermination of the Jews, already an open secret among many high-ranking party officials. These grisly preparations were augmented by a house cleaning of Polish intelligentsia, clergy and nobility by five murder squads known as Einsatzgruppen, special groups. Hitler's hatred of Poles was of relatively recent origin. He was convinced that during the past few years numerous atrocities had been inflicted on the German minority in Poland. Tens of thousands were carried off, mistreated, and murdered in the most gruesome manner, he told a partisan crowd in Danzig on September 19. Sadistic beasts vented their perverted instincts, and this democratic, religious world looked on without even a whimper. But, he added, Almighty God has now blessed our weapons. Now he was getting his revenge. By mid-autumn 3,500 intelligentsia, whom Hitler considered carriers of Polish nationalism, were liquidated. It is only in this manner, he explained, that we can acquire the vital territory which we need. After all, who today remembers the extermination of the Armenians? This terror was accompanied by the ruthless expulsion of 1,200,000 ordinary Poles from their ancestral homes so that Germans from the Baltic and outlying portions of Poland could be properly housed. In the ensuing bitter months more Poles lost their lives in the resettlement from exposure to zero weather than those on the execution list. 2. Even as the SS carried out Hitler's radical program in the East, he turned his attention to the West. One with the better part of Poland his. He sought to end the war with France and England, one way or the other. First he launched a peace offensive in press and radio. Hitler will again reach an understanding with the English, Huell assured Fritz Hess, and wants to make it as easy as possible for them. The Führer, he said, was also prepared to let Hess resume his sub Rosa negotiations with Sir Horace Wilson so long as Germany was guaranteed an absolutely free hand in the East. Hitler could not agree, for instance, to refrain from attacking Russia. Hess was puzzled and if it had not been anyone as close to Hitler as Huell he would have dismissed such a fantastic idea. Why then, he asked, did the few remake a pact with Stalin if he intended to attack the Soviet Union? 
Kewell explained that Hitler had made the deal for one reason, to keep the English neutral. Since it had failed to do so, he was already thinking of breaking it. Stalin's greed for territory had exasperated the Fuhrer, who had given up the Baltic only with a bleeding heart. Hess protested that this completely contradicted Ribbentrop's assessment. In Hitler's eyes, was Huell's surprising reply, Ribbentrop plays no role at all. Hitler looked upon him merely as a sort of secretary. That was why the Fuhrer had been playing the English game through unofficial channels like Hess, Goring and Dalarus. Later that September he encouraged the last to make another trip to London. The British can have peace if they want it, said Hitler, but they will have to hurry. But while he talked peace to Dalarus he was privately determined to make war. Within hours he was telling the commanders of the army, navy and air force of his decision to launch an early attack in the west since the Franco-British army is not yet prepared. He set the date, November 12th. Colonel Wallamont noticed that everyone, including Goring, was clearly entirely taken aback. The Fuhrer occasionally glanced at a small piece of paper as he gave the background of his decision and outlined the broad directives for operations. He did not, for example, intend to use the Schlieffen Plan of 1914 but would attack through Belgium and Luxembourg in approximately a west-northwest direction so as to gain the Channel ports. No one spoke a word in protest and as soon as Hitler finished speaking he tossed his notes into the fire. Dalarus, granted free transit by both sides, was back in London on September 28. He talked to Kadog and that morning for more than two hours but the latter predictably was not at all impressed. He really hadn't much to say, Kadog and wrote in his diary. He's like a wasp at a picnic, one can't beat him off. He's brought very little from Berlin. Dalarus was no more successful with Chamberlain and Halifax, but Hitler was not daunted. On October 6 he made a public appeal for peace at the Kroll Opera House. Why should this war in the West be fought? For restoration of Poland? Poland of the Versailles Treaty will never rise again. The establishment of the Polish state, he said, was a problem to be solved by Russia and Germany, not the West. What other reason was there for war? Admittedly there were numerous problems of great importance which had to be solved sooner or later. Was it not more sensible to do so at the conference table before millions of men were uselessly killed and billions of riches destroyed? Courtship was followed by dire prediction. Destiny will decide who is right. One thing only is certain. In the course of world history there have never been two victors, but very often only vanquished. He prayed that God might show the Third Reich and all other nations the correct course. If, however, the opinions of Messrs. Churchill and followers should prevail, this statement will have been my last. Then we shall fight. There will never be another November 1918 in German history. Almost certainly Hitler had no intention of accepting a permanent peace with two great powers capable of threatening the Reich's security. A temporary one, however, might enable him to divide France from England and so vanquish them separately. That was why he could speak so sincerely. Throughout Germany there was a feeling of widespread relief over the Führer's plea for peace and even premature celebrations of joy, only slightly dampened by Daladier's quick answer the following day. France, he declared, would never lay down arms until assured of a real peace and general security. But as the days passed without word from London hope grew in Berlin. The Führer, however, was preparing for the worst. On October 9 he issued Directive No. 6 for the conduct of war, which outlined an invasion through Luxembourg, Belgium and Holland. The next morning at 11, seven of his military commanders reported to the Chancellery. Before presenting the new directive Hitler read out a memorandum of his own composition which indicated that he was a student of military and political history. Germany and the West, he said, had been enemies since the dissolution of the First German Reich in 1648 and this struggle would have to be fought out one way or the other. But he had no objection to ending the war immediately, so long as the gains in Poland were accepted. His listeners were not asked for comment nor did they volunteer any. They were called upon only to endorse the German war aim, 
the destruction of the power and ability of the Western powers ever again to be able to oppose the state consolidation and further development of the German people in Europe. He acknowledged the objections to haste in launching the attack. But time was on the enemy's side. Because of the Russian treaty and the great victory in Poland, Germany was at last in position, for the first time in many years, to make war on a single front. With the East secured, the Wehrmacht could throw all its forces against England and France. It was a situation that could terminate abruptly. By Ho Treaty or Pact can a lasting neutrality of Soviet Russia be ensured with certainty. The greatest safeguard against any Soviet attack lay in a prompt demonstration of German strength. Furthermore, hope of Italian support depended primarily on how long Mussolini remained alive. The situation in Rome could change in a flash. So could the neutrality of Belgium, Holland and the United States. Time was working against Germany in many ways. At present she enjoyed military superiority but England and France were closing the gap since their war industries could call upon the resources of most of the world. A long war presented great dangers. The Rye had limited supplies of food and raw materials, and the fount of war production, the Ruhr, was dangerously vulnerable to air attack and long-range artillery. He proceeded to purely military matters. They must avoid the trench warfare of 1914-18. The attack, he said, would depend on the new tank and air tactics developed in Poland. Panzers would lead the breakthrough. He urged his commanders to improvise, improvise, and illustrated how they could prevent fronts from becoming stable by massed drives through identified weakly held positions. It was a brilliant display but almost every one of his commanders remained convinced that the Wehrmacht was not yet prepared or suitably supplied for war with the West. Yet there was not a single objection, not even after the Führer's announcement that the start of the attack could not begin too early. It is to take place in all circumstances, if at all possible, this autumn. 2. In London, Chamberlain was still pondering an answer to Hitler's latest peace offer. As he walked into the cabinet meeting on the day the Führer's invasion directive was issued, he was perturbed by the first enthusiastic American reaction to Hitler's very attractive series of proposals. He was clear in his own mind that the Hitler speech offered no real advance toward a reasonable peace and he told the cabinet that their reply should be stiff. The ministers agreed but it was decided to hold up the answer two days. On the morning of October 11 it was rumored in Berlin that the Chamberlain government had fallen and an armistice was imminent. The old women in the capital's vegetable markets, reported an assistant correspondent on the New York Herald Tribune, threw cabbages in the air and wrecked their own stands in sheer joy. A holiday spirit spread through the city until Berlin Radio denied the report. The following afternoon, after a week's delay, Chamberlain finally answered Hitler, he announced in Commons that the German proposals were hereby rejected as vague and uncertain. If Hitler wanted peace, acts, not words alone must be forthcoming, he must supply convincing proof that he truly sought peace. Applause from the House was moderate. In Berlin a circular from the press department of the Foreign Ministry was immediately telegraphed, in the clear, to all foreign stations. It denounced the Prime Minister's reply as an outrageous affront. To Hitler the rejection was disappointing but not unexpected. He summoned Goring and the two men responsible for Luftwaffe production, Field Marshal Erhard Milch and Colonel General Ernst Jude. My attempts to make peace with the West have failed, he said. The war continues. Now we can and must manufacture the bombs. 3. As word spread of Hitler's decision to attack the West, various resistance groups inside Germany concocted plans for coups d'etat and assassinations. Some wanted to execute the Führer, others simply to kidnap him and set up either a military junta or a democratic regime. Lists of ministers were drawn up, peace feelers were extended to the United States and other neutrals. The most serious group of conspirators came from the OKW itself and its leading spirit was an impetuous cavalry officer, Colonel Hans Oster. As chief assistant to Admiral Canaries in the Abwehr, the intelligence service, this impatient, 
often imprudent man could not have been in a more strategic position. Moreover, he had connections with every faction in the Wehrmacht, private individuals like Schacht, the foreign ministry, and even the SS. Oster found a valuable recruit in a Munich lawyer, Joseph Muller, who had detested Hitler for years. Muller, a devout Catholic, made a clandestine trip to Rome early that October with the connivance of Oster, his object to discover if the British were prepared to make peace with an anti-Nazi regime. He met Pius XII and found him willing to act as intermediary. The Pope's secretary sounded out the British minister and was informed that Great Britain was not averse to making a soft peace with an anti-Hitler Germany. Muller was empowered to take this information orally back to Germany but begged for something in writing that would prove to the Abwehr and military commanders that this peace proposal was authorized by the Holy Father himself. Surprisingly, the Vatican agreed and a letter was written by the Pope's private secretary outlining the main basis for peace with England. The Oster group was cheered. Of all their attempts to make contact with the West, this was the most promising. Perhaps the Pope's promise of participation would at last induce Braukic to take an active part in the conspiracy. But the army commander-in-chief was not impressed. He was convinced that the German people were all for Hitler. General Halder proved to be almost as timid, but under pressure from Oster and others he finally agreed to help carry out a putsch. All at once it appeared as if the leading officers were willing to take action. The conspirators were even assured that Braukic himself was prepared to join them if Hitler refused to call off the invasion. A showdown between army chief and Führer was set for Sunday, November 5th, the day the troops were scheduled to move to attack positions on the Western Front. Braukic appeared as scheduled at the Chancellery. After presenting a memorandum, he elaborated on the main arguments against the invasion. It would be impossible, he said, to mount such a massive offensive in the autumn or spring rains. It rains on the enemy too, replied Hitler curtly. In desperation, Braukic argued that the Polish campaign indicated that the fighting spirit of the German infantrymen was far below that of the World War. There were even signs of insubordination similar to those in 1918. Hitler had been listening politely, if coolly. This remark enraged him. In what units have there been any cases of lack of discipline? He demanded. What happened? Where? Braukic had deliberately exaggerated to deter Hitler and he shrank before such fury. What action has been taken by the army commander? Demanded the Führer. How many death sentences have been carried out? He turned his vitriol on the army. It had never been loyal or had confidence in his genius and had consistently sabotaged rearmament by deliberate slow-down methods. The army, in fact, was afraid to fight. Suddenly Hitler spun around and marched out of the room. Braukic was still in a state of shock when he staggered into army headquarters at Zossen, 18 miles away, and stammered out an incoherent account of what had taken place. Almost simultaneously a telephone call from the Chancellery reaffirmed November 12 as the date for invasion. An exact hour was set, 7.15 a.m. General Halder requested written confirmation and got it immediately by messenger. The army conspirators now had the necessary documentary evidence to overthrow Hitler. But there was no call for revolt, no signal for assassination. Instead they furtively burned all incriminating papers. Colonel Oster alone did not panic, through Count Albrecht von Bernstorff, whose father had been ambassador to Washington during the Great War. He warned the Belgian and Netherlands legations to expect an attack at dawn on November 12. Sunday's storm in the Chancellery was followed by anti-climax. The Luftwaffe needed five consecutive days of good weather to destroy the French Air Force and the meteorological report on Tuesday the 7th was so unpromising that Hitler postponed Day Day. Although Hitler knew nothing of the military plot, Goring had warned him against Braukic and Halder, my Führer, get rid of these birds of ill omen. A more definite admonition came from the Swiss astrologer, Karl Ernst Kraft hired by Himmler's secret intelligence service as an astral advisor. He had recently submitted a paper indicating that Hitler would be in danger of assassination between November 7 and 10, 
but the document was hastily filed since astrological speculation concerning the Führer was verboten. When Hitler came to Munich on the morning of November 8 to attend the annual reunion of the old fighters, Frau Trust, the architect, also sounded a note of warning. She asked why he was so lax about security measures, coming as he did to her studio with only one or two bodyguards. He replied that a man must have faith in providence, then slapped his trouser pocket. See, I always carry a pistol but even that would be useless. If my end is decided, only this will protect me. He put hand over heart. One must listen to an inner voice and believe in one's fate. And I believe very deeply that destiny has selected me for the German nation. So long as I am needed by the people, so long as I am responsible for the life of the Reich, I shall live. He pictured himself as another Christ. And when I am no longer needed, after my mission is accomplished, then I shall be called away. Even though the talk switched to architecture, Frau Trust noticed Hitler's uneasiness. I must change the schedule today, he suddenly said and muttered something about checking with Schaub. But he did nothing, being so occupied with other matters. He visited Unity Mitford who had shot herself in the temple and was recuperating in a Munich clinic. Three by this time she had regained consciousness and when she asked to go home Hitler promised to send her by special train to Switzerland as soon as she was strong enough to travel. He spent much of the afternoon on a speech he had just decided to make that evening at the Burger Keller. It would be another attack on England, designed primarily for German ears. The main room of the vast beer hall was already gaily decorated with banners and flags and by late afternoon the microphones were in place and tested. At dusk a small, pale man with a high forehead and clear bright eyes entered carrying a box. He was a skilled artisan named Georg Elzer and he had recently been discharged from Dachau concentration camp where he had been held as a communist sympathizer. His goal was peace and he had come here to kill Hitler. In the box was a timing device connected to sticks of dynamite. As waiters and party officials made the final preparations for the meeting Elsa inconspicuously walked up to the gallery and hid behind the pillar rising from the back of the festooned speaker's platform. Several days earlier he had cut the wooden paneling of the pillar with a special saw, he was a cabinet maker as well as a mechanic fixed several hinges and replaced the piece of wood as a little door. At last the lights of the hall were extinguished, the doors closed. Elsa waited another half hour, then placed the bomb in the pillar and set it to detonate at about 11.20 pm the Führer would start speaking at 10 pm and the explosion would come midway in the speech.4. At his apartment on the Prince Regent and Blatz, Hitler summoned his young ordnance officer, Max Wansch. Would it be possible, he asked, to leave Munich earlier than planned? Wansch assured him it would be no problem, there were always two trains at the Führer's disposal as a security precaution. The young man immediately made arrangements to use the early one. The Führer was greeted at the Burger Keller with such wild acclaim that he did not begin speaking until ten minutes past ten. His audience reveled in the insults and jibes he heaped upon the English. It took little in fact, to draw applause and there were so many interruptions that Wunsch, seated in the front row, feared the Führer would miss the early train. At 11.07 pm Hitler unexpectedly brought his tirade to a hurried conclusion. A few yards away, inside the pillar, Elsa's clock was ticking. In 13 minutes the bomb was supposed to explode. Ordinarily Hitler spent considerable time after a speech chatting with the comrades of the Putsch but tonight, without shaking hands, he rushed out of the building accompanied by Hess and several adjutants and into the car waiting outside. Kempke headed directly for the railroad station. Before they arrived, exactly eight minutes after Hitler left the Burger Braukeller, Wunsch heard a distant explosion. He wondered what it was. If Hitler heard the noise he did not think it worth mentioning. In the hubbub that followed the explosion, the shrieking of sirens from police cars and ambulances, a rumor started that the war was over. It might have been if Hitler had been standing on the platform. He surely would have died. The bomb killed seven and wounded sixty-three, 
including Eva Braun's father, who had gained admission thanks to a special low-numbered membership card, though he was actually party member number 5,021,670. His daughter, accompanied by her best friend, Herta Schneider, arrived at the station just as the Führer's train was leaving. Aboard they found an air of carefree gaiety. No one knew of the explosion and almost everyone was drinking. The lone teetotaler, Hitler, was animated but it was Goebbels who enlivened the conversation with his caustic quit. At Nuremberg the propaganda chief left the train to send several messages and gather the latest news. When he returned to the Führer's compartment he told of the bomb in a trembling voice. Hitler thought it was a joke until he noticed Goebbels' pale face. His own became a grim mask. Finally in a voice hoarse with emotion he exclaimed, Now I am completely content. The fact that I left the Burger Brau Ukeller earlier than usual is a corroboration of Providence's intention to let me reach my goal. First he demanded information on the wounded and charged Schaub with the task of doing everything possible for them, then he began to hypothesize out loud on possible conspirators. He concluded that the bombing must have been planned by two known British intelligence agents. Captain S. Payne Best and Major R. Stevens were privately negotiating with one of Heydrich's secret agents who was posing as an OKW captain in the anti-Nazi conspiracy. Acting immediately on Hitler's conjecture, Himmler detrained and telephoned in order to kidnap the two Britons in Holland. The following afternoon Stevens and Best were trapped in Venlo and brought across the border to Germany for questioning. Hours later the real bomber was arrested at the Swiss border and returned to Munich. Under glaring arc lights in an interrogation room at Gestapo headquarters Elzer admitted he had planted the bomb. No, he had no accomplices. He had done it to end the war. He described in detail how he had cut the panel and come back to set the clock. Upon reading the Gestapo report Hitler angrily scrawled on it, what did he had conducted this interrogation? It was ridiculous, he thought, to imagine that Elsa was a lone wolf. Wasn't it obvious that this was a wide conspiracy involving his worst enemies, the English, the Jews, the Freemasons and Otto Strasser? Himmler personally tried to beat the truth out of the prisoner. According to one witness, he cursed wildly as he drove his boots hard into the body of the handcuffed Elza. Despite the kicks and a beating with a whip or some similar instrument, the little cabinet maker stubbornly held to his testimony. Even under hypnosis, Elza repeated his story. This convinced Heydrich that Elza had no accomplice, but the Fuhrer bitterly reproached him for failing to find the real criminals. Five. The official version of the plot was bizarre. Elsa was a communist deviationist who had been persuaded by the national socialist deviationist, Otto Strasser, to become the tool of the British Secret Service. To this main plot propagandists added subplots. One pamphlet claimed that the English agents not only set off the bomb in Munich but were responsible for the political murders and mysterious deaths of such notable figures as Lord Kitchener. Archduke Franz Ferdinand and King Alexander of Yugoslavia. Besides inciting hatred for England, the attempted assassination was exploited to bolster the Führer's popularity. Messages of congratulation on his narrow escape arrived from Germans on every level of society. The Catholic press throughout the Reich biasly declared that it was the miraculous working of Providence which had protected the Führer. Cardinal Fall Haber sent a telegram and instructed that at Dumbisung in the Cathedral of Munich, to thank Divine Providence in the name of the Archdiocese for the Führer's fortunate escape. The Pope, who had yet to explicitly condemn Germany's liquidation of Poland, sent his special personal congratulations. But Hitler doubted his sincerity. He would much rather have seen the plot succeed, he told a group at dinner and when Frank protested that Pius XII had always been a good friend of Germany, added that's possible but he's no friend of mine. Hitler gave thanks to his own inner voice as well as to Providence for quitting the beer hall ahead of time. He told Hoffman, I had the most extraordinary feeling and I don't myself know how or why, but I felt compelled to leave the cellar just as quickly as I could. Foreign observers, however, had other theories. 
Most of us think it smells of another Reichstag fire, wrote Shira in his diary. 4. Twelve days after the bombing Hitler issued War Directive No. 8. The land invasion would be conducted as planned but he forbade bombardment of centers of population in Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg without compelling military necessity. This was more pragmatic than humanitarian and revealed Hitler's ultimate goal. His real intent in attacking the West was to secure his rear for the assault on Russia, not to conquer territory in Europe or destroy England, which might later be inveigled into condoning his drive to the East. A few days later he called a special conference, this time inviting not only his commanders-in-chief but those who would lead the attack. The meeting took place in the Chancellery at noon, November 23, and began on a low key. The purpose of this conference, he explained, is to give you an idea of the world of my thoughts, which governs me in the face of future events, and to tell you my decisions. Next he revealed what all his listeners should have already known, that the military with its proud tradition had degenerated into a subservient weapon of a one-man dictatorship. I have doubted for a long time whether I should strike in the east and then in the west, he said. Basically I did not organize the armed forces in order not to strike. The decision to strike was always in me. Sooner or later I wanted to solve the problem. It was an open declaration of mastery but there was not a murmur of dissent. It would have defied understanding, so Goring testified later, if any of those present had protested. The supreme commander had decided and therefore there was nothing left for a soldier to discuss, and that applies to a field marshal as well as to the ordinary soldier. Hitler went on to say, in all modesty, that he was irreplaceable. The fate of the Reich depends only on me. I shall deal accordingly. He admitted that his entire plan was a gamble, yet somehow made his admission aggressive. I have to choose between victory or destruction, he said. I choose victory. It was a historical choice, to be compared with the momentous decision of Frederick the Great before the First Silesian War. I have decided to live my life so that I can stand unashamed if I have to die. Remarkably, he ended with a grim prophecy of his own fate. I shall stand or fall in this struggle. I shall never survive the defeat of my people. These were truthful words. For Hitler there was only black or white, only complete victory or Gottedemerung. That afternoon Hitler read Braukitsch and Halder a personal lecture on the defeatism of the Army High Command. Stricken, the former offered his resignation. But Hitler refused to accept it, reminding him that a general had to fulfill his duty and obligation just like every other soldier. It had been a harrowing day for the military, one described with eloquent brevity in Halder's diary, a day of crisis. Both he and Braukitsch had been so thoroughly cowed by Hitler's threat to annihilate everyone who stood in his way that they made frantic efforts to disassociate themselves from the resistance. Exactly one week later it was Stalin's turn to startle the world. On November 30 he invaded Finland, which had repelled a communist rebellion in 1918 with the help of German troops. It was an embarrassment for Hitler, not only because of the extremely friendly relations between Germans and Finns but also because it weakened the already tenuous bonds with Mussolini. The Italians, from the first opponents of the Russo-German Pact, were as indignant over the unprovoked Soviet invasion of Finland as the West. The official organ of the papacy, Osservato Romano, which had followed the Pope's lead in failing to condemn fascist or Nazi incursions, now joined him in excoriating the Soviet attack as a calculated act of aggression. So much pressure was exerted on Mussolini from church and civilian sources that, for the first time, wrote Chen o, he desired German defeat. In fact, on December 26 he authorized his son-in-law to inform the representatives of Belgium and Holland that they were about to be invaded by Hitler.6. For a week Mussolini was in a turmoil, vacillating between fear that his ally might succeed and hope that he would. On New Year's Eve he considered entering the war on Hitler's side but when signs multiplied that Germany was on the point of invading the West he sat down and in the role of big brother wrote his junior partner a letter of advice. 
Never had Il Duce spoken out so boldly and his own frankness concerned him so that it was not until January 5, 1940, that he finally gave Chen a permission to send it off. He urged Hitler to refrain from invading the West. Both sides would lose such a war. Now that you have secured your eastern frontiers and created the greater Reich of 90 million inhabitants, is it worthwhile to risk all, including the regime? and sacrifice the flower of German generations in order to hasten the fall of a fruit which must of necessity fall and be harvested by us, who represent the new forces of Europe. The big democracies carry within themselves the seeds of their decadence. He then criticized the treaty with Russia in a manner that he must have known would provoke the Fuhrer. I feel that you cannot abandon the anti-Semitic and anti-Bolshevist banner which you have been flying for twenty years and for which so many of your comrades have died, you cannot renounce your gospel, in which the German people have blindly believed. Four months ago the Soviet Union was world enemy number one, how could she now be friend number one? The day when we shall have demolished Bolshevism we shall have kept faith with our two revolutions. Atolico delivered this unique letter by hand on the afternoon of January 8. The Führer, understandably, was in no mood to answer and put it aside. This was the high point of Mussolini's effort to free himself from domination by his ally but, having asserted himself, he experienced an almost immediate predictable reaction and began slipping back into his servile role. 5. Neither Hitler nor Mussolini knew that the British were seriously considering declaring war on the USSR over the Finnish invasion, thanks in large part to the pressure exerted by church groups and the Cliveden set, which argued that the real enemy was Red Russia, not Germany. After all, Hitler's demands on Poland were reasonable and only his manner was obnoxious. In the meantime the shooting war against Hitler had diminished to one in name only. On a train trip skirting the French frontier, the crew told William Chira that not a shot had been fired on this front since the war began. Then he saw for himself that both sides seemed to be observing an unofficial armistice. For that matter one blast from a French 75 could have liquidated our train. The Germans were hauling up guns and supplies on the railroad line, but the French did not disturb them. Queer kind of war. So queer. In fact, that when a former First Lord of the Admiralty suggested that the RAF bomb the timber areas of southwestern Germany, the British Air Minister, Sir Kingsley Wood, replied, Oh, you can't do that. That's private property. You'll be asking me to bomb the Ruhr next. Hitler's main offensive weapon in these unsettled days was Goebbels, brought back to full favor by the outbreak of war. The force of his propaganda campaign was directed against the French. His purpose was to divide them from the British. Goebbels visited the West Wall in the bitter rain and snow so he could determine firsthand what the Poilu a few hundred yards away in the Maginot Line was experiencing. He concluded that the average French soldier was so weary, miserable and bored that he would be a ready victim of his concerns and prejudices. Goebbels knew, recalled his secretary, Werner Norman, that the average little French soldier only wanted a good bed, a woman, a warm room, his garden and peace of mind. He worried about the Jews, the English and, above all, this ridiculous war. The propaganda minister, therefore, instructed German soldiers to shout friendly greetings across no man's land and engage the French in brotherly conversation. Propaganda teams blasted information and news over loudspeakers aimed at proving that France and Germany were really not enemies. At night sentimental French songs were broadcast to the Maginot Line and before signing off the announcer would say something like, Good night, dear enemy, we don't like this war any more than you do. Who is responsible? Not you or I and so why shoot each other? Another day has ended and we will all have a good night's sleep. The final touch would be a recorded lullaby. In the daytime the French troops were showered with leaflets showing a shivering Poilu at the front in one picture and his wife in bed with an English soldier in another. The French civilians were approached differently. They were bombarded with broadcasts over secret transmitters illustrating the corruption of their government, the profiteering of Jews and the terrifying might of Hitler's army and air force. 
One particularly effective leaflet was a German version of the prophecies of Nostradamus which foretold the conquest of France by the Third Reich. At home Goebbels ordered Germans to harden themselves for the coming battle. Their very existence was at stake since the enemy was determined to annihilate Germany for good. In mid-December he forbade newspapers to print a word about peace. In line with this point of view any sentimental note in connection with Christmas must be avoided in the press and on the radio. Only one day would be celebrated, December 24th. To unite front and homeland. The theme of 1939's radio Christmas program would be, Soldiers Christmas, People's Christmas. The British soldiers in France were not at all concerned by Goebbels' propaganda. The war, in fact, had turned into a contest of lame jokes. British civilians were as bored as their troops and referred to it as the Sitzkrieg or Phony War. More and more members of Parliament dozed as Chamberlain read off his weekly reports. Hitler was waiting for a stretch of five clear days to turn a joke into grim battle. His own air chief was in a quandary. Goring had to give the impression of being eager while privately praying for a continuation of the bad weather since he feared his Luftwaffe was not yet ready for combat. He attended the daily weather conferences, pestering chief meteorologist Diesing for additional information. Hitler also pressed Diesing for longer range forecasts but he stubbornly refused. Mein Führer, he replied, I will gladly be bold and predict weather for three days, but not foolhardy not five days. In desperation Goring hired a rainmaker, Herschfler, for 100,000 marks. It is not clear whether the field marshal ordered him to bring five clear days or to continue the bad weather but it would not have made any difference since Schfler's only equipment turned out to be a defunct commercial radio set. On the other hand, Milch was helping for good weather since he agreed with Hitler that time was on the side of the enemy. Despite its deficiencies, the Luftwaffe still enjoyed air superiority, an advantage that was steadily decreasing with the flow of planes to both England and France from the United States. On January 10, 1940, the impatient Führer fixed another specific date for invasion, a week later at exactly 15 minutes before sunrise. Fate intervened before the day was over. A light Luftwaffe plane strayed across the frontier, crash landing in Belgium. Of all of the German planes in the sky that day, this was the most important. It carried an unauthorized passenger, Major Helmut Trainberger, who had a briefcase filled with the operation plans for the airborne attack on Belgium. While Rainberger was burning the papers he was seized by Belgian soldiers, but he reported optimistically to Luftwaffe headquarters through the German embassy in Brussels that he had succeeded in burning the plans to insignificant fragments the size of the palm of his hand. Goring, in a state of consternation, experimented by burning a similar packet of papers. The results were so inconclusive that his wife suggested using clairvoyance, not unusual advice to a man who utilized a rainmaker. The team of clairvoyants unanimously agreed that not a scrap of the documents remained. Their report may have relieved Goring but not Hitler. He cancelled the invasion order on the assumption that the plans had been revealed to the enemy. He, not the clairvoyants, was correct. Enough fragments had remained for the Belgians to learn of the invasion. This information was passed on to London where it was received with considerable suspicion. Halifax, for instance, told the cabinet, I doubt very much whether the documents are genuine. The general staff agreed, obviously the papers had been planted. They were engrossed in their own offensive, the landing of an expeditionary force in Norway. The very concept of such a coup de main appealed to Churchill, the new first lord of the Admiralty, and, despite his sad experience in a similar venture in the Great War, he pressed the issue until the cabinet was won over. Hitler was also preparing to seize Norway. He had not even considered such action, after all, these were Nordic peoples who could be counted on to remain neutral as they had in 1914, until his ally, Stalin, upset calculations by invading Finland. This, Hitler feared, might give the Allies an excuse to move into Norway, thus outflanking Germany from the north. 
he authorized a study of a possible invasion but it was given low priority. Then, late in February, alarming reports of an imminent British landing in Scandinavia turned the Führer into an ardent advocate, out of concern that a British foothold in Norway would close off the Baltic and bottle up all his submarines. Equally foreboding was the economic threat. More than half of Germany's iron ore came from Norway and Sweden, an end to this supply would cripple her war production. On March 1, 1940, therefore, Hitler issued a directive for the simultaneous occupation of Denmark and Norway. It was to have the character of a peaceful occupation, designed to protect by force of arms the neutrality of the northern countries, but resistance would be broken by all means available. Hitler became so concerned by the time element that within two days he decided to launch his attack, the most daring and most important undertaking in the history of warfare before invading the West. It would begin on March 15. In the meantime he had been attempting to shore up deteriorating relations with his two allies. Those with Russia, in particular, had entered a disturbing phase. Negotiations for a trade agreement had started soon after the conquest of Poland. A visit of a 37-man German economic delegation to Moscow was followed by an even larger Soviet mission to Berlin, which brought a list of industrial and military orders totaling more than one and a half billion Reichsmarks. The Germans were dismayed since most of the orders were for machinery and armaments essential to their own war production. The result was a bitter and lengthy wrangle finally brought to a head by Stalin himself. He querulously declared that if Germany did not give way the treaty would not be concluded. Hitler could not permit this, and early in February Ribbentrop was instructed to send a personal letter to Stalin urging him to re-examine the German position. Apparently Stalin, whose hard-headed negotiations had already wrung concessions from the Germans, realized he had pushed his ally to the limit. Two months earlier his archenemy, Trotsky, had observed, before the hour of Hitler's defeat strikes, many, very many in Europe will be wiped out. Stalin does not want to be among them and so he is wary of detaching himself from Hitler too early, in one of his lightning changes, Stalin called for an end of bickering. He agreed to accept German deliveries over a period of 27 months while promising delivery of raw materials over a period of 18 months. With all difficulties removed, the trade pact was signed three days later. The German delegation was delighted. The agreement, reported the chairman, means a wide open door to the East for us. Hitler was pleased as well as relieved. He had become even more fascinated by his counterpart in the Kremlin. Stalin was the only world leader he wanted to know intimately and he interrogated envoys from Russia at length for the most trivial details about his ally. Often, recalled Christa Schroeder, he would interrupt to exclaim enthusiastically, that Stalin is a brute, but really you must admit he's an extraordinary fellow. It was almost as if he were talking about himself. The solution of this Russian problem was accompanied by the termination of another when the Finns were forced to accept harsh Soviet peace terms that marched to end their brief, bloody war. Greatly relieved at being freed from the embarrassment of having to give moral support to such an unpopular cause, Hitler turned to more productive arenas. One of these was Italy. He had just made a step in this direction by finally answering Mussolini's letter of unwelcome advice. Hitler vindicated all his actions in minute detail, taking time out to rhapsodize about Italy, using as many italicized words as a schoolgirl writing of her latest crush. Naturally a letter delayed so long could only be delivered by a prestigious messenger. And so the following day, March 9, Foreign Minister von Ribbentrop left Berlin with a large retinue, advisors, secretaries, barbers, a doctor, a gymnastics teacher and a masseur. At their first meeting Il Duce gave a guarded answer to Ribbentrop's question, would Italy participate in the war? He intended, he said, to intervene in the conflict and to fight a war parallel to that of Germany. But he must be free to choose the date. Ribbentrop attempted in vain to tie Mussolini down more definitely but he would merely agree to see Hitler. The following Monday, March 18, the two dictators met at the Brenner Pass in a snowstorm. The session was cordial with Hitler dominating the conversation. 
but he spoke quietly and made few gestures. He had come, he said, simply to explain the situation so Il Duce could make his own decision. To Schmidt's surprise, Mussolini used his few minutes of talk to reassert emphatically his intention of coming into the war. It was merely a matter of choosing the best moment, he said. The two men departed in an aura of eternal trust and friendship. But Hitler instructed Schmidt not to submit a copy of the interview to the Italians. One never knows who may read this document on the Italian side, and what allied diplomats may be told. For his part, Il Duce seemed to belie his recent vow to join the war. On the return trip to Rome he pointed out the train window to the thick fall of snowflakes with the remark that he would need snow as far south as Etna to turn Italians into a race of warriors. Although irritated that the Führer had done almost all the talking, he was now convinced his ally was not preparing to launch any land offensive. 6. Recently the Skirarks had come upon the Führer in the Chancellery Library reading a book with the help of glasses.7 He hurriedly put them away, Hoffman was forbidden to take pictures when he wore them, and rubbed his eyes. You see, he confessed, I need glasses. I am getting old and that is why I prefer to wage war at fifty rather than sixty. He ruffled the pages of his book, a picture album containing photographs of London. How gratifying not to find any baroque buildings, he murmured, then snapped the book shut. I must not look at this sort of thing anymore. He was determined that Germany should be first in Norway and on April 2 ordered the invasion to begin at 5.15 am a week later. The anti-Hitler conspirators were just as determined to hamstring the invasion. To do so they needed Halder. He had recently promised to help but was wavering and, to bring him to action, he was shown Muller's memorandum summarizing the Pope's participation in secret peace negotiations with the English. The chief of the army general staff was impressed but reduced to tears. His conscience, he sobbed, would not permit him to act. The failure of this plot failed to discourage the redoubtable Colonel Oster. He decided to stop Hitler by personal action and early in April secretly informed the Dutch military attaché that Norway was about to be invaded. But the information was forwarded to a member of the Norwegian legation in Berlin who did not think it worth relaying to Oslo. The British also failed to believe similar reports that Hitler was doing what they themselves planned to do a day or so later. Remarkably, an aura of overconfidence had enveloped 10 Downing Street. On Sunday morning, April 7, five German naval groups put to sea destined for six Norwegian cities. At three of these ports, Narvik, Trondheim and Stavanger, waited German merchant ships with combat troops hidden in their holds. British ships were laying mines in Norwegian waters below Narvik in preparation for their own invasion and HMS Glowworm sighted two German destroyers. It was assumed in London that these ships were part of a limited force intent on capturing Narvik. Not until Monday morning did the cabinet learn that enemy warships were also approaching at least three other Norwegian ports. The ministers were aghast but it was too late to thwart Hitler. Early Tuesday morning the Germans struck. By 8 a.m. Narvik was seized by two battalions of special mountain troops under the command of Brigadier General Eduard Dietl an intimate of the Führer since the Beer Hall Putsch. Before noon four other important ports fell but the raiders were delayed long enough by defenders in the ancient fortress of Oskarburg to allow the royal family, the government and members of parliament to escape from Oslo by special train while 23 trucks were carting off the gold of the Bank of Norway and the secret papers of the Foreign Office. In Denmark the Germans met little resistance their plan working as it had been laid out on paper. For some reason the Danish navy never opened fire and the land troops only managed to inflict 20 casualties on the invaders. It was all over by mid-morning. The king capitulated, ordering all resistance to cease. He assured the chief of staff of the German task force that he would do everything possible to keep peace and order in the country. Then he turned complimentary. You Germans, he said have done the incredible again. One must admit that it is magnificent work. By the end of the day it appeared as if Hitler had scored a complete triumph in Norway as well, until the British Navy unexpectedly appeared.
On Wednesday morning five destroyers broke into Narvik Harbor to sink two destroyers and all but one cargo ship. Three days later the Warspite returned with a flotilla of destroyers and sank the rest of the German vessels. This news so agitated Hitler that he told Braukic it didn't look as though they could possibly hold Narvik. By April 17 his vexation was apparent. He railed at everyone in sight. While Braukic, Kiitel and Halder held their tongues, Chief of Operations Jodl Bruce Klee announced that there was but one thing to do, concentrate, hold on and do not give up. To the consternation of the onlookers, he and Hitler began arguing as if they were equals. Finally, in a temper, the chief of operations stormed out of the room, slamming the door. Hitler said not a word. Tight-lipped, he left by another door but that night he signed an order to die at hold on as long as possible. The 19th brought a new crisis. From his hideout on the rugged northern coast of Norway, King Haakon VII, the sole monarch of the century elected to the throne by popular vote, steadfastly refused to name a government headed by Vidkun Quisling, the leader of a Norwegian fascist party and a disciple of Rosenberg. By this time the British had finally landed two brigades of 13,000 men in Arvik and Trondheim. As their attack gained momentum more British arrived, and by the end of the week the Germans were in desperate straits. But Milch came to the rescue by taking personal command of the Luftwaffe attack. He sent two huge seaplanes loaded with mountain troops to Narvik, then supervised dive bombing strikes that weakened the British and Norwegian resistance in central Norway. By April 28 the British ordered evacuation of the bulk of their troops. The following day King Haken and members of his government were transferred by British cruiser to Tromsø, a city far above the Arctic Circle, where a provisional capital was established. Most of Norway was now under German control except for Narvik where Dietl's 6,000 men still gallantly held off 20,000 Allied troops. On the last day of April Jodl informed Hitler that communications had finally been established overland between Oslo and Trondheim. At lunch Hitler, beside himself with joy, admitted his error and thanked Jodl for his contributions to the victory. The Führer also showed his gratitude to Dietl and Milch with promotions. He was unstinting in his praise of the latter, remarking at one conference how Milch had taken over the Luftwaffe in Norway when it appeared that all was lost. And why? He asked rhetorically, conveniently forgetting his own argument with Jodl. Because there was a man like me, who just did not know the word impossible. With the northern flank secure. Hitler again devoted his energy to the invasion of the West. He had never liked the original plan of attack, an unimaginative version of that used in the World War, an attack through northern France and Belgium to the Channel ports. Its objective was not only to smash the French army but, by occupying the Channel coast, to cut the British off from their ally while establishing submarine and air bases for attacks on the British Isles. This is just the old Schlieffen plan, he objected to Key Eitel and Jodl, with a strong right flank along the Atlantic coast, you won't get away with an operation like that twice running. Even if it succeeded, it violated his principle of blitzkrieg warfare and he had vowed never to allow this generation to suffer what he had in Flanders. He envisioned a daring thrust farther south through the Ardennes with a sudden armoured breakthrough at Sedan and a sweep to the Channel. The main force would then swing to the north, in a reversal of the Schlieffen plan, for a drive into the rear of the retreating Anglo-French army. Night after night his adjutants would see him poring over a specially constructed relief map to make sure that the Sedan was, after all, the correct place to penetrate. Independently, perhaps the most brilliant strategist of the Wehrmacht, Colonel General Fritz Erich von Manstein, had devised a similar offensive. He presented it to Braukic, who rejected it on the grounds that it was too risky. But the Führer heard talk of Manstein's risky proposal and asked him for the details. To Manstein's surprise, Hitler was delighted with what he heard. It not only reinforced his own convictions but contained a number of improvements to his own plan. The Supreme Command liked Hitler's revised version no more than they had Manstein's. To a man they opposed it but the Führer overrode all objections. 
deriding opponents as Schlieffen worshippers, embalmed in a petrified strategy. They should have read more Karl May. The Hitler-Manstein offensive was formally adopted in late February and by the time the battle for Norway was ended there were 136 German divisions ready for action along the Western Front. They waited only for a stretch of good weather. On May Day Hitler set the invasion for the 5th but 48 hours later, after another unfavorable meteorological report, he postponed X Day until the 7th, and then the 8th. Goring was pleading for still more time when alarming news arrived from Holland, cancellation of furloughs, evacuations and roadblocks. Agitated, Hitler agreed to another postponement until Friday, May 10, but added, not a day longer. The sustained effort at the front to keep two million men at the point of attack, he said, was becoming increasingly difficult. By now he was determined to strike without waiting for the five-day favorable weather prerequisite which had already cost three months. He was gambling on the tool that had proved so valuable in the past. His intuition, that is, a suspension of logic born of impatience. On Thursday morning a corps commander near Arkin reported heavy fog in his area. This was followed by a prediction that the fog would lift and the 10th would be a good day. Hitler ordered his special train prepared for departure from a small station outside of Berlin and went through elaborate measures to keep his own inner circle in the dark as to its destination and purpose. Outwardly calm during the tedious train trip, he was gnawed with worry that evening as the deadline for confirmation of the attack order approached. The train stopped near Hanover for a final weather report. This time Chief Meteorologist D. Singh who later got a gold watch as a reward, predicted good weather for the 10th. Hitler confirmed the order to attack at dawn, then retired earlier than usual. But he could not get to sleep. Despite the report he kept worrying about the weather. A great apparel to success came from his own intelligence service. Of the few Hitler had entrusted with the final details of the invasion, one was Admiral Canaries and whatever he knew was passed on to his impetuous deputy, Colonel Oster. Earlier that evening Oster had reported to his old friend the Dutch military attaché, over the dinner table, that Hitler had issued the final attack order. After the meal Oster stopped off at OKW headquarters in the Bendlesteris and got information that there would be no last-minute postponement. The swine has gone to the Western Front, he told the Dutch attaché, who first informed a Belgian colleague, then phoned the Hague in code, tomorrow, at dawn. Hold tight. At 4.25 am on the 10th the Führer's train reached its destination, Asgurgen, a town near the Holland-Belgian borders. Under a canopy of stars, the party was driven to the Führer's new headquarters, Felsnest, Rocky Nest. Dawn was breaking as they settled into the bunker installation which had been blasted out of a wooded mountain top. Checking his watch, Hitler got an unwelcome surprise, I was filled with rage. Dawn had come 15 minutes earlier than he had been told it would. 25 miles to the west his troops were charging across the Belgian, Holland and Luxembourg borders. The air was darkened with his Luftwaffe. 2,500 aircraft had been gathered for the attack, far outnumbering those the Allies could send up. 
wave after wave of German planes swept westward to devastate more than 70 enemy airfields. Airborne troops captured key points in Holland while glider forces swooped down prepared to capture Belgian fortresses by surprise. The Führer was particularly interested in the attack on Fort Ebenemal. He had personally briefed the commanders and non-coms involved in this glider operation, using a scale model for the purpose, and he awaited reports feverishly. By noon of the 11th, this supposedly impregnable fortress, along with a bridge over the Meuse, was in German hands. On hearing this Hitler literally hugged himself with joy. Later came even more meaningful information, the enemy was striking back. When the news came that the enemy was advancing along the whole front, Hitler recalled, I could have wept for joy, they'd fallen into the trap. It had been a clever piece of work to attack Liege. We had to make them believe we were remaining faithful to the old Schlieffen plan. 7. On May 10 England and France were caught by surprise, their general staffs not heeding the warnings from Brussels and The Hague or their own intelligence experts. Eight pale and somber, Chamberlain wanted to stay on as Prime Minister but he was persuaded to step down. King George VI accepted his resignation regretfully and suggested that Halifax succeed him. But it was obvious that Winston Churchill alone had the confidence of the nation and at 6 p.m. His Majesty summoned him to the palace. Churchill had once paid a grudging compliment to the Führer in a letter to the Times, I have always said that I hoped if Great Britain were beaten in a war we should find a Hitler who would lead us back to our rightful place among nations. These words had not mollified the Führer, who continued to look upon Churchill as his worst enemy the tool of those English Jews who had scotched an Anglo-German alliance. It was a profound hatred contrasting strangely with his admiration for Stalin, and Churchill's elevation to Prime Minister was galling news. As Hitler's troops and tanks advanced into Holland and Belgium, Goebbels prepared his staff for the next step in the propaganda war. The minister, read the secret staff meeting of May 11th, formulates the principle for the immediate future that anything in enemy reports that is not correct or even anything that could be dangerous to us must immediately be denied. There is no need at all to examine whether the report is factually correct or not, the decisive point is merely whether the enemy's assertions could in any way be damaging to us. More important, the French and English must be told again and again that it was they who had declared war. It was their war which was now bursting upon them. On no account must we allow ourselves to be maneuvered once more into the role of aggressor. The drive into western Belgium gained the most impressive victories. This, of course, was part of Hitler's plan to divert attention from the main attack through the hills of the Ardennes. By May 13 these troops had crossed the Meuse at several points to approach Sedan where Hitler hoped to break through the weak link in the Maginot Line. Despite the steady advance in the north, Hitler was disturbed by the stubborn defense put up by the outnumbered Dutch troops and, on the morning of the 14th, issued a directive to break this resistance speedily. Detachments of the Luftwaffe were sent from the Belgian area to facilitate the rapid conquest of Fortress Holland. Within hours the Luftwaffe dropped 98 tons of high explosives on Rotterdam. The intent was to eliminate Dutch resistance at the bridges over the Neumas but the bombs slammed into the center of the city, killing 814 civilians. The facts were grossly misrepresented by the democratic press, which listed the death toll as between 25,000 and 30,000. Nor did Western newspapers reveal that the tacit agreement between the two sides to limit bombing to military targets had been first violated by the British. Three days earlier, over strenuous French objections, 35 Royal Air Force bombers had attacked an industrial city in the Rhineland, killing four civilians, including an English woman. This raid on the night of 11th May, although in itself trivial, was an epoch-making event, commented F. J. P. Veal, an English jurist, since it was the first deliberate breach of the fundamental rule of civilized warfare that hostilities must only be waged against the enemy combatant forces. Despite Hitler's frightful retaliation in Holland, he resisted proposals to bomb London itself. He was not willing to go that far, as yet. 
The tragedy of Rotterdam ended Dutch resistance, the commander-in-chief of the Dutch forces ordering his men to lay down arms a few hours later. That same day German tanks burst through the French 9th and 2nd armies at Sedan. Supported by screaming Stuco dive bombers, three long columns of panzers rattled and rumbled toward the English Channel. Churchill was wakened the next morning by a telephone call from Paris. We have been defeated! exclaimed Premier Renaud. We are beaten! Churchill could not believe it, nor could his generals, who had misread the armoured conquest of Poland as a simple manoeuvre against an inept, primitive defence. The terror that seized France was aggravated by Goebbels. The task of the secret transmitter, from now on, he told his staff on May 17, is to use every means to create a mood of panic in France. It must further utter an urgent warning against the dangers of a fifth column, which undoubtedly includes all German refugees. It should point out that, in the present situation, even the Jews from Germany are nothing but German agents. That morning Hitler motored forward to Barstone in the heart of the Ardennes. All the world hearkens. He declared triumphantly. He had come to the headquarters of Army Group A, commanded by General Gerd von Rundstedt, to discuss progress of the main drive to the channel and was in such an expansive mood that he stayed for lunch and later walked among the men exuding success. Back in the homeland. It was the rare German who did not share his exultation. Most of those who had once feared Hitler was traveling too fast and too dangerously had become true believers in his infallibility. For industrialists, including Alfred Krupp, grew so excited as they listened to the radio reports of the drive through Holland that they began poking their fingers at a map of northeastern Europe, jabbering, this one here is yours, that one there is ours, we shall have that man arrested he has two factories. One industrialist left the hubbub to phone a subordinate to get Weimacht permission for two of the group to visit Holland at once. By the morning of May 19 several armoured divisions were within 50 miles of the channel and one, the second, rolled into Abwehr at the mouth of the Somme the following evening. The trap was sprung and inside the giant net were the Belgians, the entire British expeditionary force and three French armies. Hitler was so surprised when Braukitsch telephoned him of the capture of Abville that his voice choked with emotion. He praised everyone. Jodl wrote in his diary that the Führer went into raptures. Talks in words of appreciation of the German army and its leadership. Busies himself with the peace treaty which shall express this theme, return of territory robbed over the last 400 years from the German people, and of other values. Things were turning out exactly as he had dreamed. Within three days the tanks of Army Group A had wheeled north, closing on the channel ports of Calais and Dunkirk, whose capture would cut off the British from a sea retreat to England. Goring slammed his big hand on a table when he heard the report. This is a special job for the Luftwaffe. He exclaimed. I must speak to the Führer at once. Get a line through by phone. In moments he was assuring Hitler unconditionally that the Luftwaffe by itself could annihilate the trapped remnants of the enemy. All he asked was withdrawal of German tanks and ground troops so that they wouldn't be hit by friendly bombs. Having resumed his feud with both the Wehrmacht and Army High Commands, Hitler might have seen this as an opportunity to strengthen his hold on the military. He gave Goring consent to finish off the enemy from the air. Overhearing this, Jodl sarcastically remarked to an adjutant, there goes Goring shooting off his big mouth again. Then dutifully began making the necessary arrangements over the phone with Goring's chief of staff. We have done it. Goring exulted to Milch on his return to Air Force headquarters. The Luftwaffe is to wipe out the British on the beaches. I have managed to talk the Führer around to halting the army. Milch did not share his enthusiasm and objected that their bombs would sink too deeply into the sand before exploding. Besides, the Luftwaffe was not strong enough for such an operation. Leave it to me, it's not your business, said Goring and returned to his boasting. The army always wants to act like gentlemen. They round up the British as prisoners with as little harm to them as possible. But the Führer wants to teach them a lesson they won't easily forget. The following morning, 
May 24, Hitler visited Rundstedt and his staff at Group A's forward headquarters. In high spirits, the Führer predicted that the war would be over in six weeks. Then the way would be free for an agreement with the English. All he wanted from them was their acknowledgement of Germany's position on the continent. When they got down to tactics, General von Rundstedt did not oppose the use of planes to reduce the entrapped enemy at Dunkirk. He proposed that tanks be halted at the canal below the besieged city. Hitler agreed with his observation that this army should be saved for operations against the French. At 12.45 pm the halt order was issued to the 4th Army in the Führer's name. That evening four Panzer divisions were stopped at the AA Canal. The tank crews were astounded. No fire was coming from the opposite shore. Beyond they could make out the peaceful spires of Dunkirk. Had operations gone crazy? The division commanders were even more amazed. They knew they could take Dunkirk with little trouble since the British were still heavily engaged near Lille. Why weren't they allowed to seize the last escape port to England? Army Chief of Staff Halder was contemptuous. Our left wing, consisting of armor and motorized forces, he wrote in his diary, will thus be stopped in its tracks on the direct order of the Führer. Finishing off the encircled army is to be left to the Luftwaffe. Halder was convinced, with some reason, that Goring was merely looking for personal glory and had won over the Führer by arguing that if the army generals got the victory Hitler's own prestige at home would be damaged beyond repair. The ground commanders reiterated their request to move into Dunkirk with tanks and infantry, but Hitler would not listen. It was only on May 26, after reports of heavy shipping in the Channel, was it possible the British were preparing to evacuate their forces? that he grudgingly authorized an advance on Dunkirk from the west. But that same day Goring assured him that the Luftwaffe had destroyed Dunkirk harbor. Only fish bait will reach the other side. I hope the Tommies are good swimmers. As the English and Allied troops fell back into the cul-de-sac, a crazy quilt fleet of almost 900 vessels began leaving dozens of English ports. There were warships and sailboats launches and strange-looking Dutch craft, manned by career officers, fishermen, tugboat operators, expert amateur seamen and Sunday sailors who had never before ventured beyond the three-mile limit. This was Operation Dynamo, a mission to evacuate 45,000 men in two days. But this modest estimate had not taken into consideration Hitler's low opinion of democracy in action. He was completely surprised by a sporting operation carried out gallantly and effectively by a pickup group of amateurs and professionals. By the 30th of May, 126,606 men were back in England, and more were coming every hour. Hitler's commanders were no more perceptive. That day Halder wrote in his diary that the encircled enemy was disintegrating. Admittedly some were fleeing across the channel on anything that floats. But he described this disparagingly as another Le debacle, a reference to Zola's novel about the French route in the Franco Prussian War. By midday, however, the German High Command finally realized the extent of the evacuation and massive bombing attacks were mounted. But fog came to the rescue of the British. Not only was Dunkirk itself enshrouded, but all the Luftwaffe fields were blanketed by low clouds which grounded their 3,000 bombers. In the meantime the Stukas of the 8th Air Corps were doing surprisingly little damage to the flotilla of small vessels, and those bombs dropped on the beaches dug so deeply before exploding that casualties were low. Equally surprising was the performance of a new British fighter plane, the Spitfire, which ravaged Goring's fighter squadrons, and once the weather cleared enough for bombers to get into the air, they too were picked off by the deadly little Spitfires. Oddly, the continuing evacuation did not seem to perturb Hitler. It was almost as though it was no concern of his. While Braukic and Halder frantically looked for ways to stop the steady flow to England, the Führer responded haltingly, almost lackadaisically. It was the commanders who waved their arms at conferences these days, not he. In striking contrast to the Narvik crisis, he pounded no tables, made no threats called for no frantic measure to stop the exodus to England. 
he let his subordinates carry the burden of decision. The thin perimeter of the Dunkirk defense line held until June 4 but by then 338,226 British and Allied troops had been ferried to England to fight another day. Now speculation arose on both sides of the channel regarding Hitler's strange behavior. Why had he given Goring the license to bomb the encircled army to teach them a lesson, then apparently assisted in their escape by not acting forcefully? His own words only confused matters. He told his naval adjutant that he had expected the Beth would fight to the last man as they had done in his war, and hoped to contain them until they ran out of ammunition, thus gaining for himself a mass of prisoners for use in peace negotiations. Yet when this strategy failed, if it had been his strategy, and almost no British were captured, he showed no signs of rage or even petulance. A variation on this theme was his remark to Lynch as they surveyed the pockmarked beaches of Dunkirk, strewn with books, photographs, shoes, rifles, bicycles and other possessions, it is always good to let a broken army return home to show the civilian population what a beating they have had. He also told Borman that he had purposely spared the English. Churchill, he complained, was quite unable to appreciate the sporting spirit of which I had given proof by refraining from creating an irreparable breach between the British and ourselves. The military men, including all the adjutants, smiled at those who believed the Führer had been motivated by political or humanitarian considerations. That Hitler purposely let the British escape, belongs to the realm of fables, commented Putkama. Others equally close to Hitler were sure he had been moved to pity by his affection for the English. The blood of every single Englishman is too valuable to be shed, he told Frau Drust. Our two people belong together, racially and traditionally, this is and always has been my aim even if our generals can't grasp it. Competent foreign observers gave some credence to this theory. Francois Ponset, for instance was convinced that Hitler never really wanted to war with the English, only to neutralize them. He had given witness to this recently by sending Unity Mitford home via Zurich in a special train. He deeply regretted her fate, he told Engel. She lost her nerve, just when, for the first time, I could really have used her. It was a hostile England to which she returned, her brother-in-law, Sir Oswald Mosley together with other leaders of the British Union of Fascists, were jailed without trial three days after Hitler invaded Belgium to prevent his propaganda for peace. Mosley had already admonished his black shirts to remain steadfast and loyal to their native land. His attitude was, I will fight to the last day to keep England and Germany friends and prevent war, but the moment war is declared I will fight for my country. Lady Diana Mosley soon followed her husband into prison on the order of her relative, the Prime Minister, while she was still nursing her eleven-week-old son. The authorities gave her permission to take the baby into Holloway prison, but not his nineteen-month-old brother. One child to a mother was the rule, and she decided to take neither so that they would not be separated. It was fortunate since her cell, its floor swimming in water, had no bed, only a thin mattress. When Mosley became gravely ill three years later, he and his wife were finally released. Public uproar ensued which was derided by George Bernard Shaw. I think this Mosley panic shameful, he told a girl reporter. What sort of people are they who can be frightened out of their wits by a single man? Even if Mosley were in rude health, it was high time to release him with apologies for having let him frighten us into scrapping the habeas corpus sacked. We are still afraid to let Mosley defend himself and we have produced the ridiculous situation in which we may buy Hitler's Mein Kampf in any bookshop in Britain, but may not buy ten lines written by Mosley. The whole affair has become too silly for words. Good evening. Unity Mitford arrived home, the bullet still in her head. Sad and depressed, she was unable to feed herself. She died eight years later when the bullet moved on its own. Eight. Hitler left Felsenist on the eve of the fall of Dunkirk with instructions to preserve the entire area as a national monument. Every room in the complex was to be kept intact, every nameplate to remain on its door. 
Führer headquarters was moved to the small Belgian village of Brule de Pesch, near the border of France. By the time Hitler arrived the place was deserted, every inhabitant evacuated. A special garden had been laid out along with gravel paths but the cement of the Führer bunker was still wet. He gave this peaceful scene a warlike name, Wolfsluked, Wolfsgorge, after his own nickname of early party days. By this time King Leopold had not only surrendered Belgium but refused to go into exile. I have decided to stay, he told his Prime Minister. The cause of the Allies is lost. This seemed certain on June 5 when 143 German divisions turned on the remnants of the French army, 65 divisions. The defenders had few tanks and almost no air cover and the way Macht swept forward on a 400-mile front. In Paris Renaud made a desperate impossible plea to Roosevelt for clouds of planes, then packed his bags. It was an auspicious moment to enter the war on Hitler's side and Mussolini expressed his desire to join the lists. But his ally urged him to wait until the Luftwaffe wiped out the French air force. Il Duce could only restrain himself until June 10 before declaring war, and the supremely confident tone of his explanatory letter to Hitler brought this burst of sarcasm, I have quite often in the past wondered about his naivete, the Führer told his military staff. The whole letter is proof that in the future I must be much more careful with the Italians in political matters. Evidently Mussolini thinks of this as a walk in Passo Romano. The Italians would get a rude surprise. First they were too cowardly to take part, now they are in a hurry so that they can share in the spoils. At dawn 32 Italian divisions attacked six French divisions in the south, but with such a lack of drive that any advance had to be measured in feet. By this time both ends of the French line in the north had crumbled and on the morning of the 14th German troops began entering Paris. It was one of the few times in the history of modern warfare that the commander of an operation reached the objective before his troops. General von Bock, chief of Army Group B, had flown ahead in his liaison plane, arriving at the Arc de Triomphe just in time to take the salute of the first combat troops. It was a parade, not a battle, and Bock took time off to visit the tomb of Napoleon before having lunch at the Ritz and doing a little shopping. At Wolf's Gorge, Goring was trying to persuade Hitler to avenge the British bombing of residential areas in Germany. As they conversed in the village square, Colonel Warlemont overheard Goring announce that he could not tolerate these British atrocities any longer and wanted to give them back ten bombs for every one of theirs. But Hitler could not be swayed. He said, so Warlemont recalled, he thought it quite possible that the British government was so shaken by Dunkirk that it had temporarily lost its head alternatively that the reason for the attacks on the civilian population was that the British bombers had inaccurate bomb sites and were flown by untrained crews. In any case he thought we should wait before taking countermeasures. The Führer was in a negotiating mood. Capitalizing on the excitement of the fall of Paris, he made a statement to the West by means of a unique interview with Karl von Wigand of the Hearst Press. He asserted that he had had no intention of attacking the beautiful French capital so long as it remained an open city, then vehemently denied it had been his aim or intention to destroy the British Empire. And all he asked from the United States was a regional Monroe Doctrine, America for Americans, Europe for Europeans. While German troops continued to advance, the Italians in the south seemed to be marching in place. Fortunately for Il Duce, events in the north soon precluded the necessity for any action at all in the south. By evening of the 16th Germans were pouring through the haphazard French defences almost at will. Late the next morning, as Hitler was discussing the situation with his military advisers at Wolfsgorge, word came that the French wanted an armistice. Throwing dignity to the winds. He slapped his thigh and jerked up a knee in a spontaneous spasm of ecstasy. Nine, he was literally shaken by frantic exuberance. Recalled Fräulein Schroeder. The staff gaped in wonder, but Key Eitel rose to the moment. Mein Führer, he said ponderously, you are the greatest Felter, field commander, of all time. Although the British were stricken by the French capitulation, 
Churchill revived their courage with talk of England's finest hour. And from the British Broadcasting Corporation came another voice of resistance, this beamed to France. The flame of French resistance cannot go out, proclaimed General Charles de Gaulle from Studio B2. It will not go out. France, he said, had lost only a battle. She has not lost the war. Neither man noted that it was June 18th, the 125th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, a contest ultimately decided by Blücher's German troops. At noon Hitler met with Mussolini in the Führerbau, scene of the latter's personal trim for the historic Munich Conference of 1938. This time the Italian dictator was noticeably subdued. His own declaration of war had been a military fraud, a diplomatic gamble. Hitler had achieved victory without help and would, of course, have the last word today. Both Cheno and Mussolini were startled to find Hitler in a peace-loving, magnanimous mood. Hitler made many reservations on the desirability of demolishing the British Empire, which he considers, even today, to be an important factor in world equilibrium, then, in the face of Mussolini's objections, stoutly supported Ribbentrop's proposal of lenient peace terms to the French. Hitler is now the gambler who has made a big scoop and would like to get up from the table, risking nothing more, Chen wrote in his diary. Today he speaks with a reserve and perspicacity which, after such a victory, are really astonishing. I cannot be accused of excessive tenderness toward him, but today I truly admire him. The two dictators took time off to autograph souvenir postcards of their meeting. On one such card Mussolini scratched in his bold, upright hand, men make history. Underneath, in his much softer script, Hitler wrote, history makes men. Mussolini left for Rome in dejection. In truth, wrote Chen O that evening, the Duce fears that the hour of peace is growing near and sees fading once again that unattainable dream of his life glory on the field of battle. Two days later, on the first day of summer, Hitler motored to the same woods near Kumpken where the Kaiser's representative had surrendered. It was a vindictive as well as historic choice. Thus stood the famous wooden railroad dining car used on that occasion, hoisted from its museum through a torn out wall to the original site. At exactly 3.15 pm the few remote arcade arrived. Hitler walked toward the car with springy step, face grave, manner solemn. He stopped at a granite block which read. Here on the 11th of November 1918 succumbed the criminal pride of the German Empire, vanquished by the free people which IT tried to enslave. William Shire was watching through binoculars to catch Hitler's expression. I have seen that face many times at the great moments of his life. But today, it is a fire with scorn, anger, hate, revenge, triumph. He was muttering, so recalled Lynch, something that sounded like we will destroy everything that can remind the world of that shameful day in 1918. A long plain table had been set up in the old railroad car with half a dozen chairs on each side for the two delegations. At the head stood Schmidt where he would be able to hear both groups. After the Führer seated himself next to his interpreter, Goring, Reda, Braukich, Ribbentrop and Hess took their places. Several minutes later General Charles Huntsiger led in the French delegation, an admiral, an air force general, and a former ambassador, their faces still showing the shock of learning at the last moment where the negotiations would take place. Hitler and his associates rose. Not a word was spoken. Both delegations bowed and sat down. First key I tell read out the preamble to the armistice conditions, which had been composed by Hitler. The French and the Germans stared at each other, thought Schmidt, like wax figures as key I tell spoke the Führer's words, Germany did not intend that the conditions should cast any aspersion on so courageous an enemy. The aim of the German demands is to prevent resumption of hostilities to give Germany security for the further conduct of the war against England which she has no choice but to continue, and also to create the conditions for a new peace which will repair the injustice inflicted by force on the German Reich. It seemed as though Hitler addressed England rather than France, offering them an honorable peace too if they chose. 
This became more evident in the stipulations which included German renouncement of any intent to challenge Britain's sea power. He solemnly swore he would not take over the French war fleet for his own use in the war or, indeed, use any French naval equipment, for a possible crossing of the Channel. Hitler had included this promise against advice from his own navy to make good the heavy losses in the Norway campaign with French ships, a proposal he curtly rejected out of both fear and hope. He feared seizure of the French fleet would harden English determination to fight since it would challenge their supremacy of the seas, he hoped his appeasement would lead to peace with a tacit gentleman's agreement that Britannia should continue to rule the waves while Germania turned east for Lebensraum. Once Schmidt finished reading the French text, Hitler got to his feet. So did the others. After more polite bows, the Führer left with most of his followers. Key Eitel and Schmidt stayed behind and were joined directly by Jodl and several other German officers. After the French had re-examined the terms, they insisted upon transmitting them to their government at Bordeaux. Absolutely impossible, said Key Eitel. You must sign at once. But the French stubbornly demanded the same courtesy extended to the German delegation in 1918 and in a few minutes Huntsiger was talking to General Weygand the French commander-in-chief. I am telephoning from the coach he paused, from the coach you know. He reported that the conditions were hard but not dishonorable. Even so, Huntsiger felt they were merciless, far worse than the conditions France had forced on Germany in the previous war, and the negotiations continued without resolution until dusk. They resumed the following morning, June 22, dragging on into late afternoon. By 6 p.m. Kiaitel lost all patience and sent Schmidt to the French with an ultimatum, if we cannot reach an agreement within an hour, the negotiations will be broken off, and the delegation will be conducted back to the French lines. There was no alternative. At 6.50 p.m., after more telephone conversations with Bordeaux, General Huntsiger signed the Armistice Treaty. After the ceremony Kiaitel asked him to stay a moment. When they were alone the two generals looked at each other silently and Schmidt noticed both had tears in their eyes. Controlling his emotion, Key Eitel congratulated the Frenchman for having represented his country's interests with such dignity, then held out his hand. Huntsiger shook it. All these events were being radioed back to Germany as they occurred and as soon as the proud but downcast Huntsiger stepped down from the old dining car, there was a brisk recorded rendition of then we strike, then we strike, then we strike at England. That must have stirred German hearts. It was the Goebbels' touch. He had music for all occasions, but his choice this time was provoking to his Führer, who had been trying to give the opposite impression in the treaty. Back at Wolfsgorge Hitler was planning a sightseeing tour of Paris. He had summoned a sculptor and his two favorite architects. Speer and Giesler, to go along as guides. Paris has always fascinated me, he told Arno Brecker, whose heroic classical works were also admired by Stalin. Hitler admitted that it had long been one of his most ardent wishes to visit the City of Light. It was a metropolis of art and that was why he insisted on seeing it first with his artists. He was sure they would find inspiration for the rebuilding of important German cities. I am interested in actually seeing the buildings with which I am theoretically familiar. It was pitch dark when the party, which included Key Eitel and Bormann and several adjutants, arrived at a meadow outside Bruni de Pesch and climbed into a plane piloted by Bohr, but by the time they reached Lubegat the sun was up. June 23rd was going to be a bright, hot day. Hitler climbed into the first open car of a motor column seating himself as usual beside the driver. Behind him sat the rest of the party. As they headed for the first stop, the opera, the streets of the city were deserted except for an occasional gendarme who would dutifully greet the Führer with a smart salute. Brecker had spent his most decisive years in Paris and was shocked to see the almost complete absence of life. Hitler's features slowly relaxed as he took in the architectural wonders of the opera which he had admired since his early days in Vienna. He was as familiar with the building as with his own chancellery and his eyes shone with excitement. This is the most beautiful theatre in the world. 
he called out to his entourage. He inspected the boxes and noted that one room was missing. The white-haired attendant who had been accompanying them with stiff pride announced coolly that it had been eliminated years ago. There, you see how well I know my way about, said Hitler with the pride of a schoolboy. After a stop at the Eiffel Tower they visited Napoleon's tomb. Here Hitler placed cap over heart, bowed and gazed for some time down into the deep round crypt. He was very moved. Finally he turned to Giesler and said quietly, you will build my tomb. Ten he lapsed into pensive silence, then instructed Bormann to transfer the bones of young Napoleon from Vienna to his father's side. The three-hour tour ended on the heights of Montmartre, the mecca of art students. Perhaps it reminded Hitler of his own student days. Lost in thought for some moments, he finally turned to Giesler, Brecker and Speer. Now your work begins, he said. The rebuilding of cities and monuments was entrusted to them. Bormann, he said, help me with this. Take care of my artists. Hitler again surveyed the city which stretched below. I thank fate to have seen this city whose magic atmosphere has always fascinated me, he said. That was why he had ordered his troops to bypass Paris and to avoid combat in its vicinity. So that picture below us would be preserved for the future. But the few Parisians who saw him that morning were reduced to panic. As his cavalcade came upon a group of boisterous market women the fattest pointed in terror at Hitler. Her shriek of it's him. It's him. Spread pandemonium. The next day Hitler instructed Speer to draw up a decree in his name to resume full-scale work on the Berlin buildings. Wasn't Paris beautiful? He said. But Berlin must be made more beautiful. Hitler also took Brecker aside and began rhapsodizing on what they had seen the previous morning. I love Paris, it has been a place of artistic importance since the 19th century, just as you do. And like you, I would have studied here if fate had not pushed me into politics since my ambitions before the World War were in the field of art. The armistice was scheduled to go into effect an hour and thirty-five minutes past midnight and there was an atmosphere of jollity as they sat down to a late dinner at a table lit by candles. The sky darkened, thunder rumbled in the distance. Just before midnight an aide reported enemy planes approaching. The lights were extinguished and they sat in pitch darkness, faces periodically lit up by flashes of lightning. Champagne glasses were passed around. There was an unearthly silence as watches were checked. At 1.35 a.m. came the startling brassy cry of a bugle. Someone whispered to Brecker that it was the traditional signal for weapons at rest. Someone else, overcome by emotion, blew his nose. Key Itel stood and in the darkness made a short speech. He raised his glass and called for three hocks to the Führer, their supreme commander. Everyone rose and clinked glasses while Hitler sat somewhat uneasily, he didn't like such displays but was bowing to the tradition of the Wehrmacht. He brought glass to mouth as a courtesy but did not drink, then slumped, head bowed, a man alone in this jubilant company. At last he said almost inaudibly, it was a great responsibility, and left the room. One since the SS comprised a number of sections, each with different duties and characteristics, each should be judged separately. See Glossary. The Waffen, armed, SS, for instance, was purely a military aggregation of elitists, and its members' allegiance was to the Reich and Hitler, not Himmler. They fought better than army troops, being better motivated and more democratically organized. There was little differentiation between officers and enlisted men. In the Wehrmacht the men were forbidden to keep their footlockers open so as to prevent stealing, but the Waffen SS considered themselves a band of brothers and it was forbidden to lock them. Any stealing was punished by the men themselves, and a thief was cashiered on their recommendation. Many myths about the Waffen SS still persist. It's notorious to two, for example, had no sinister symbolism. It was merely a man's blood type in case he was wounded and needed a battlefield transfusion. Himmler, whom the band of brothers regarded as an outsider, was not tattooed. 
To about this same time he also issued an order legalizing euthanasia for those patients deemed incurable. Perhaps he was thinking of his mother suffering from cancer but more likely it was an opportunity to get rid of the mentally ill, the elderly non-productive and those groups he regarded as racially harmful. 3. If it comes to war, Unity Mitford told her sister Diana at the Bayreuth festival, I shall kill myself. She did not care to live, she said, if the two countries she loved took up arms against each other. After the radio blared out the news of England's declaration of war she walked into the English gardens, and tried to kill herself with a small pistol. She was taken to a clinic in the Nuschbaumstrasse where, at Hitler's orders, she was treated by a distinguished surgeon, Professor Magnus. He decided it was too dangerous to extract the bullet still lodged in her temple. News of the suicide attempt was suppressed, Unity's parents were informed discreetly through the German minister in Bern. For there had already been a number of attempts to assassinate Hitler. One he knew nothing about was plotted by a disillusioned SS guard who, about 1929, planted a bomb under the podium just before a speech in the Sport Palast. During the speech the malcontented SS man had a sudden urge to go to the toilet, by chance someone locked him in the men's room and he was unable to set off the bomb. It was the joke of the century, recalled a friend of the would-be assassin. The history of the world might have been changed if he hadn't had to go to the bathroom. 5. Perhaps that is why Himmler saw to it that Elsa was not brought to public trial and executed. Instead he was installed as a privileged prisoner in a concentration camp, Elsa alone could confirm that the SD had, in fact, found the one and only criminal. Later Elsa smuggled a letter to Captain Best, a fellow prisoner. In it he swore that he had been summoned to the office of the Commandant of Dachau in October 1939 where two men, presumably Heydrich agents, persuaded him to plant a bomb in the Bergerbräuchelle. It was to explode as soon as Hitler left the building and kill a group of traitors who were plotting against the Führer. Elsa agreed and was released from the concentration camp to install the bomb. At Berlin Gestapo headquarters he was told by the same two agents that he was going to be used as a prosecution witness at a trial of the English agents. He would testify that Otto Strasser had introduced him to Best and Stevens, who paid him to plant the bomb. But Best and Stevens were never tried and survived five years in various concentration camps. 6. The Belgian ambassador in Rome rashly transmitted this warning to Brussels by telegram. The message was intercepted and deciphered by the Germans. 7. Hitler's secretaries used a special large print typewriter so he could read in public without glasses. 8. In 1938 MI6, the British Secret Intelligence Service, had bought the secret of a German cipher machine, called Enigma, from a Polish mathematician for £10,000, a British passport and a residence permit in France for himself and his wife. He had memorized diagrams of the main parts of the machine and created a replica in an apartment on the left bank in Paris. A working model of Enigma was successfully completed and installed in Bletchley Park, a Victorian mansion 40 miles north of London. By the time England declared war in 1939 the machine, codenamed Ultra, was operational, and its first major contribution was to warn the British general staff of Hitler's plan to invade the West. 9. The Western newsreel version turned this brief moment into an extended scene. According to Lawrence Stallings, the film was doctored by John Grierson, the documentary producer then serving as propagandist in the Canadian Army. By looping the frames, a technique subsequently used in TV cat food commercials, Grierson transformed Hitler's gesture into a ludicrous series of gay pirouettes. Hitler's official cameraman, Walter Frentz, filmed the scene, he asserts that there were only eight frames, and provided them to the author. Ten later he gave Giesler explicit instructions. His tomb was to be extremely simple and it would be placed in Munich. Here I was truly born, he said. Here I started my movement and here is my heart. Chapter 22 Efton victors by victory are undone, Dryden, June to October 28, 1940. 1. 
That summer Hitler made it evident he was more interested in negotiating than in fighting. In France his weapons were persuasion and the projection of himself as the magnanimous victor who offered the French a share in the fruits of a united and prosperous fascist Europe, a hegemony designed not only for moral regeneration but as a bulwark against godless Bolshevism. One of the first acts in this campaign was a demand that his troops act like liberators, not conquerors. I do not wish my soldiers to behave in France the way the French behaved in the Rhineland after the First War. He told Hoffman that anyone found looting would be shot on the spot. I want to come to a real understanding with France. Consequently troops who entered Paris did not swagger around the city demanding homage and free food. They conscientiously paid for every purchase and enjoyed the late June sun outside the cafes of the Champs-Élysées side by side with Frenchmen. It was an embarrassed, often silent and indifferent companionship but fear was leaving Parisians who had expected their women to be raped and their shops and banks to be sacked. By now it was common knowledge that the Wehrmacht was actually assisting those refugees trekking back to the capital, and there was some acceptance of the placard plastered all over the city showing a child in the arms of a friendly German with the admonition, Frenchman. Trust the German soldier. Hitler would have been proud of his troops. They were neat, quiet and ingratiating, courteous to women but not too gallant, and respectful to their mates. They stood bareheaded at the tomb of the unknown soldier, armed only with cameras. They acted more like a horde of tourists brought in at special holiday rates than the fearsome creatures who had just humiliated the French armies. It was astute public relations, part of a program designed to turn France into a working and productive vassal. Hitler himself was playing the tourist with a special group including his adjutants and his World War sergeant, Maximan. For two days this light-hearted group was guided by the Führer around the old battlefields of the conflict that had helped lead to this one. It was a sentimental journey with Hitler enjoying every moment. He pointed out the fields of Flanders that had formerly been a hellish morass, the old trenches that had been kept as memorials and attractions for sightseers. Instead of surveying the scenes in quiet solemnity, the Führer talked interminably, explaining the minutest detail of what had happened here and over there. As he drove through Lille, which he had memorialized in watercolor, a woman looking out of the window recognized him. The devil! She gasped. Amused at first, he vowed he would erase that image from the minds of the conquered. The sentimental junket ended on June 26 and he turned his mind to the unpleasant task ahead, subjugation of the English. It was a chore not to be relished, he reiterated to his adjutants. War with England was a war of brothers and the destruction of their empire would, in truth, be cause for German distress. That was why, he confided to Huell, he was reluctant to invade England. I do not want to conquer her, he said, I want to come to terms with her, I want to force her to accept my friendship and to drive out the whole Jewish rabble that is agitating against me. Hitler still had no definite plan for the invasion of the British Isles. Victory in the West, in fact, had come so quickly that there was not a single landing craft or barge ready for launching across the channel. He seemed to be waiting instead for England to sue for peace. But such expectations were rudely jolted on July 3rd by the surprise Royal Navy bombardment of the French fleet lying at anchor in the Algerian port of Mers el Kebba. Within 13 minutes the battleship Britannia was sunk with the loss of 977 men, and three other vessels, including the Dunkirk, were badly damaged with heavy losses in life. The rest of the fleet escaped. The victors paid a heavy price for their fear that Hitler might possibly use these warships in her invasion of England. With British evacuation from Dunkirk still a bitter memory to most Frenchmen, this attack, particularly after Admiral Darlan's sincere vows to deny Hitler their ships, roused deep animosity throughout France. Perfidious Albion became a café phrase. The shelling also confirmed the convictions of those who felt that collaboration with Hitler was France's only salvation. Recently the country itself had been physically divided by the armistice terms into two zones, occupied France in the north and Vichy France in the south under a regime headed by Marshal Pitain. 
the bombardment made more difficult his task of preventing Deputy Premier Lovell from leading France into an ever closer collaboration with Hitler while simplifying for Jean Giraudoux and other fascist intellectuals the effort to seek new converts. Alfred Farbelus in his quasi diary wrote, in one day England killed more French sailors than Germany did during the whole war. The British blunder at Mers el Keba, he predicted, was hastening Hitler's one Europe. It also wakened the Führer from his complacent dream of a quick settlement with England while emphasizing his own inability to either control the French fleet or checkmate the Royal Navy. He who was practically land-bound was stunned by the shocking mobility of sea power. The explosive naval action reinforced his earlier fear that even if the British fleet did not thwart an invasion of England it would enable her rulers to set up headquarters in Canada or Australia and rule the seas from there. He hovered in an agony of indecision between negotiation and force. I must not give up, he told Putkumer. The English will eventually see it my way. But when Braukic and Halder flew to the Berg off on July 13 he readily approved their plan to invade England, yet moments later protested that he had no desire to fight his English brothers. He had no desire to dismantle the empire, bloodshed would only draw the jackals eager to share in the spoils. Why was England still so unwilling to make peace? He asked and answered, so Hall wrote in his diary, that England still has some hopes of action on the part of Russia. Three days after, he issued a specific invasion directive designed to eliminate the English homeland as a base for the prosecution of the war against Germany and, if necessary, to occupy it completely. The operation was given an imaginative code name, Sea Lion. No sooner had Hitler approved it than he decided to make a peace proposal of his own. The Führer is going to make a very magnanimous peace offer to England, Ribbentrop told Schmidt. When lawyer George hears of it, he will probably want to fall on an X. When it came on July 19, it began with the derisive attack on Churchill, continued with a threat that any battle between their two countries would surely end in the annihilation of England, and concluded with a vague proposal, I can see no reason why this war should continue. The first English reply to Hitler's bleak offer came from someone who knew him well. Sefton Delmer, now working for BBC, was on the air within the hour. Herr Hitler, he said in his most deferential German, you have on occasion in the past consulted me as to the mood of the British public. So permit me to render your excellency this little service once again tonight. Let me tell you what we here in Britain think of this appeal of yours to what you are pleased to call our reason and common sense. Herr Führer and Reichskanzler, we hurl it right back to you, right in your evil-smelling teeth. Shira heard this at the Berlin studio while waiting to make his own broadcast to America and observed its effect on the officials there. Can you make it out? One shouted to Shira. Can you understand those British fools? To turn down peace now? They're crazy. President Roosevelt too was unimpressed by Hitler's offer. Later that evening, in a radio address from the White House accepting the nomination for the presidency, he declared there was only one way to deal with a totalitarian country, by resistance, not appeasement. Never, reported Ambassador Dijkhoff to Berlin, had Roosevelt's complicity in the outbreak and prolongation of this war come out so clearly as in this speech. England is to be prevented from changing her course. English resistance is to be strengthened and the war is to be continued. 1. Still no official rejection came from London and when Hitler summoned his commanders to Berlin for a conference on Sunday, July 21, he seemed more puzzled than bellicose. England's situation is hopeless, he said. The war has been won by us. A reversal of the prospects of success is impossible. He speculated on the chances of a new cabinet under Lloyd George before lapsing into grim conjecture. Suddenly the musing ended. He called for a speedy ending of the war and suggested that Sea Lion was the most effective way to do so. But his assurance, or show of it, almost immediately began to dissipate. He warned that invasion across the channel commanded by the enemy was no one-way trip as in Norway. There could be no element of surprise. How could they solve the problem of logistics supply? He went on and on, pointing out grave problems that Admiral Redder, 
who was taking diligent notes, silently seconded. Complete air superiority was essential and first wave landings must be completed by mid-September before worsening weather prevented the Luftwaffe from full participation. He turned to Reda. When could the Navy give him a clear picture on technical preparations? When would they complete emplacement of coastal artillery? To what extent could they protect the bridging of the channel? The discomfited admiral was thinking of other problems. They would have to transport most of the troops in river and canal barges which were still to be hauled from the Reich. And how could this enfeebled fleet of combat vessels hold off the Royal Navy? After the Norway losses there were only 48 U-boats, one heavy cruiser, four destroyers and three torpedo boats fit for action. With some embarrassment Redder replied that he hoped to have an answer on technical details in a few days but how could he commence practical preparations until air superiority was a fact? Braukic responded to his pessimism with a positive expression of faith. He liked Sea Lion. Goring's deputy said the Luftwaffe was only waiting for the word to start a massive air offensive, without comment, Hitler instructed Redder to submit his report as soon as possible. If a preparations cannot be completed with certainty by the beginning of September, it is necessary to consider other plans. The burden of Sea Lion was on the Navy. When they were alone, Hitler told Braukic, Stalin is flirting with England to keep England at war and tie us down, to gain time for taking what he wants and what cannot be taken if peace breaks out. While admitting that there were at present no signs of Soviet activity against the Reich, he conceded that the Russians posed a problem that had to be dealt with. We must begin thinking about them. An Englishman gifted with foresight had recently perceived that Hitler's true goal was Lebensraum at the expense of the Soviet Union. When one compares his utterances of a year or so ago with those made fifteen years earlier, wrote George Orwell in a review of the English edition of Mein Kampf, a thing that strikes one is the rigidity of his mind the way in which his worldview doesn't develop. It is the fixed vision of monomaniac and not likely to be much affected by the temporary maneuvers of power politics. Probably, in Hitler's mind, the Russo-German pact represents no more than an alteration of timetable. The plan laid down in Mein Kampf was to smash Russia first, with the implied intention of smashing England afterwards. Now, as it has turned out, England has got to be dealt with first because Russia was the more easily bribed of the two but Russia's turn will come when England is out of the picture, that, no doubt, is how Hitler sees it. Although Hitler had achieved an astounding military victory in the West it had not brought him the political stability he needed to begin his holy war against Russia. His blows against England had merely made this stubborn nation more stubborn and his attempts to placate the Vichy French into joining his crusade were being thwarted by a reluctant compliance that stopped short of active assistance. These failures notwithstanding, he was still confident he could prevent the conflict from becoming a world war, still so sure England was on the verge of surrender that he ordered an immediate intensification of the propaganda war against England. One of Goebbels' first acts was to broadcast over the secret transmitter system those Nostradamus prophecies which had already come to pass and ending with the one foretelling the destruction of London in 1940. Modem interpretations of Nostradamus were supplied by Kraft, the astrologer who had predicted the Beer Hall bombing. During this season of misgivings Hitler took time off for another reunion with his old friend Kubizek to whom he had sent tickets to the 1940 Wagner festival. During the first interval of Gotterdam rung on July 23rd the two met in the drawing room. After greeting Kubizek warmly Hitler complained that the war had checked his rebuilding program. I still have so infinitely much to do. Who else is there to do it? And here I have to stand by and watch the war robbing me of my best years. We are growing older, Kubizek not many more years, and it will be too late to do what remains to be done. Today's personal encounter with Kibizek was a rare intrusion in Hitler's growing public responsibilities. Paradoxically, his relationship with Eva Braun had become more conjugal. Rather than separating them, the war brought them closer together since he could now spend much more time at the Berghof.
Gone were the elaborate attempts to convince everyone that they were merely friends, the staff and servants treated her with the greatest respect, among themselves referring to her as Chefin, wife of the chief. She addressed Hitler openly with the familiar do and he replied in kind, sometimes calling her Kapel, a Viennese diminutive meaning little thing. In front of close friends he would even occasionally stroke her hand or give some other sign of overt affection. According to intimates, their sexual relations were normal, keeping in mind that Hitler was almost fifty and completely absorbed in work. At last the accepted mistress of the bear Goff, Eva had gained in self-assurance and elegance. Difficult though her life might be, the conviction that she no longer had rivals was solace enough for her. That summer Hitler decided that the time had come for Lebensraumen to destroy Bolshevism. He instructed the military to make preparations in this direction and on July 29, 1940, Jodl journeyed to the Bad Reichenhall Railroad Station to discuss the matter with Colonel Warlemont, chief of OKW's planning section, in his special train. Warlemont and his three senior officers thought the unusual visit might mean promotion or some award. To their mystification, Jodl checked to see that all doors and windows of the dining car were closed and then abruptly announced in a quiet, dry voice that Hitler had decided to rid the world once and for all of the danger of Bolshevism. A surprise attack was to be launched on the Soviet Union as soon as possible, May 1941. The effect of Jodl's words was electric, recalled Warlemont, who at the time grasped his chair because he could not believe his own ears. That's impossible. Burst out a colonel named Losberg. How could Hitler fight Russia before England was defeated? Jodl gave a curious answer, the Führer is afraid that the mood of the people after a victory over England would hardly permit him to embark on a new war against Russia. A chorus of protests erupted. This was the two-front war which had defeated Germany in the First World War. And why this sudden change after the Moscow Pact? Hadn't Stalin kept his promise to deliver raw materials and food punctually and fully? Jodl tersely answered every objection, a collision with Bolshevism was inevitable, it was better to attack now at the peak of German armed strength. The answers did not convince Warlemont but Jodl, who had presented similar protests to Hitler, cut short the debate. Gentlemen, he said, it is not a question for discussion but a decision of the Führer, he ordered Warlemont to prepare planning papers under the code name Build Up East. On the last day of July the Führer summoned his commanders to the Berghof for a conference that purported to concern Sea Lion but would lead in the opposite direction. Admiral Redder spoke first. Preparations were in full swing, materiel had been brought up according to plan and the conversion of barges would be finished by the end of August. On the other hand, the merchant shipping situation was unfavorable due to losses sustained in Norway and from mines, and while mine sweeping had commenced it was hampered by Allied air superiority. Therefore, he concluded, it would be better to postpone the invasion until the following May. Hitler protested. Waiting that long, he said, would enable England to improve her army and stockpile considerable supplies from America, and perhaps even Russia. How can we bridge the gap until May? He asked and set the operation for September 15. No sooner had he made this categorical decision than he diluted it. That is, he added, if a concentrated week-long bombing attack on southern England could damage the RAF, the Royal Navy and key harbors. Otherwise it is postponed until May 1941. If this was a decision it was the kind of half-hearted one that pleased Redder. It gave him top priority to prepare Sea Lion while shifting the burden of responsibility onto the Luftwaffe. More important, it gave Hitler the option of turning the war from west to east, and once the two navy men, Redder and Putkamer, left the room, he began belittling Sea Lion's chances. Our little navy, he sighed, only 15% of that of the enemy. Moreover, the channel was far more formidable than it appeared on a map as any voyager on that treacherous body of water in foul weather could testify. It was almost as though he had dismissed the invasion of England. Russia needs only to hint to England that she does not wish to see Germany too strong and the English, like a drowning man, 
will regain hope that things will be entirely different in six to eight months. But if Russia is smashed, England's last help is extinguished. Then Germany will be the master of Europe and the Balkans. This time his musings came to a resolute conclusion. Decision, he said curtly. In view of these considerations Russia must be liquidated. Spring 41. Gone was the hesitation of the past few conferences. Again he was the old Führer, the man of destiny. The sooner we smash Russia the better. The operation only makes sense if we smash the state to its core in one blow. Mere conquest of land areas will not suffice. The offensive, he said, must be carried out as a single, unbroken operation. He would not make Napoleon's mistake and be whipped by the Russian winter. We will wait, he said, until May. Five months' time, he said with satisfaction, to prepare. He was carried away by his vision. Object, he said with animation, annihilation of Russia's vital energy. The warlord personified, he rapidly outlined an attack of some 120 divisions, first a drive to Kiev, second, one through the Baltic toward Moscow, finally, a convergence from north and south followed by a special operation against the Baku oil area. The dream was materializing into a reality. 2. Within 24 hours the man of decision was again vacillating. He issued two directives, one calling for quick conquest of Britain and the other expressing doubt of its execution. The first began in confidence, in order to establish the conditions necessary for the final subjugation of England, I intend to intensify the air and naval war against the English homeland. The Luftwaffe was to overpower the RAF as quickly as possible, then stand by in force for Operation Sea Lion. I reserve for myself, he pointed out, the decision on tenor attacks as a means of reprisal. The second order, signed by Key Itel in the name of the Führer, directed preparations for Sea Lion to be completed by mid September, then stated, 8 to 14 days after the launching of the air offensive against Britain scheduled to begin about August 5th, the Führer will decide whether the invasion will take place this year or not, his decision will depend largely on the outcome of the air offensive. Even as Key Eitel sent out this directive he sensed Hitler's ambivalence. Although the Führer appeared to be throwing himself into all the preparations with great enthusiasm and demanded the adoption of every conceivable improvisation to speed the preparations, I could not help gaining the impression that when it came to the question of actually executing the operation, he was in the grip of doubts and inhibitions, he was wide awake to the enormous risk he would be running and to the responsibility he was being called upon to shoulder. Key Eitel also had the feeling that above all Hitler was reluctant to countenance the inevitable loss of his last chance of settling the war with Britain by diplomatic means, something which I am convinced he was at that time hoping to achieve. It never occurred to Key Eitel that this might have been more than an exercise in vacillation, that Hitler might possibly be using the showy preparations for Sea Lion to mask his attack on Russia. Nor did it occur to Hitler that the substance of his two directives on that August 1st had been decoded by Ultra. The messages assured Churchill that he truly possessed the German code and his faith was confirmed beyond doubt when Ultra shortly decoded a signal from Goring designating August 13th as the beginning of Operation Eagle, the all-out air assault on England. The offensive began on schedule, but because of worsening weather only the Third Air Force took part. There were almost 500 bombing sorties but, thanks primarily to radar and secondarily to the ultra warning, damage was slight and German losses were serious, 45 Luftwaffe aircraft against 13 RAF fighters. The next day was equally disappointing to Goring. On the 15th he launched all three of his air fleets. This time Ultra disclosed exactly what forces Goring would use and approximately where each would strike and with this knowledge the RAF was able to assemble its few fighter squadrons at the right place and altitude, parceling them so economically that each German wave met fierce resistance. In the greatest air battle to date, the RAF shot down 75 planes while losing 34. Operation Eagle was turning sour. On the 17th the score was 70 to 27. 
that was the day the slow Stuka dive bomber, which had wreaked such havoc in France, was taken out of the campaign by Goring. It was simply no match for the Spitfires. Bad weather began on the 19th and kept the Luftwaffe grounded four days. During the respite Goring summoned his commanders. The daylight attacks on aircraft factories and other such targets, he said, would have to be replaced by night raids. Goring also took the opportunity to bitterly reproach the single and double engine fighter pilots for their performances. Neither type of fighter is allowed to break off its escort mission because of weather, he ordered. Any pilot who did so would be court martialed. When the weather lifted on August 23, the Luftwaffe came over the channel that night en masse. One flight of a dozen bombers strayed off course and, instead of hitting aircraft factories and oil tanks outside of London, dropped their loads directly on the city. Nine civilians were killed in the RAF, assuming it had been done on purpose, retaliated the next night by bombing Berlin. Little damage was suffered but the Berliners were stunned. They did not think it could happen, Shira wrote in his diary. When this war began Goring assured them it couldn't. They believed him. Their disillusionment today therefore is all the greater. You have to see their faces to measure it. The RAF returned to Berlin three nights later, this time killing ten civilians and wounding twenty-nine others. Hitler was outraged since the German attack on London had been due to a navigational error, yet still refused to let the Luftwaffe bomb the English capital. Berlin was hit twice more. Aroused to action, he finally threatened dire retaliation on the afternoon of September 4, in an unscheduled speech at the Sport Palast. His audience of women social workers and nurses cheered at his promise to surpass Churchill's bombings. When the British Air Force drops two or three or four thousand kilograms of bombs, he said, then we will in one night drop 150, 230, or 400,000 kilograms. The din in the auditorium forced him to pause. When they declare that they will increase the attacks on our cities, then we will raise their cities to the ground. We will stop the handiwork of these air pirates, so help us God. The hour will come when one of us will break, and it will not be National Socialist Germany. The answer was a frenzied, never, never. 3. Two days later Admiral Reda reported to Hitler at the Chancellery. The two discussed Sea Lion cautiously as if neither had much faith in it, the Admiral concluding his comments with a question that should have drawn a hot retort, what, he asked. Are the Führer's political and military directives in the event that Operation Sea Lion does not take place? But Hitler was not at all ruffled, and it was with some satisfaction that Reda reported to his colleagues. Decision of the Führer to land in England is by no means yet firm, since the Führer has the conviction that the submission of England will be achieved even without landing. Landing is, however, now as before, regarded by the Führer as the means by which, According to every prospect, an immediate crushing end can be made of the war. Yet the Führer has no thought of executing the landing if the risk of the operation is too high. It was obvious that Hitler could not tolerate a miscarriage of sea lion since that would decisively redound to the prestige of Great Britain. He wanted a triumphant blitz finale to the end of the war, but one without risks. What particularly disturbed him was Putkamer's eyewitness report of a recent exercise near Boulogne in which landing barges drawn by tugs were thrown into complete disorder by the tide. In Putkamer's opinion, a similar landing operation on the English coast would be equally catastrophic. The success of invasion or capitulation depended on the air assault and Hitler sanctioned mass raids on London the day after his desultory meeting with Reda. Wave after wave of planes took off for England. Late that afternoon the first group of 320 bombers, heavily protected by fighters, passed over the head of Goring, who was watching from the cliffs of Cape Blanknes. The tightly massed planes swarmed over the channel, then flew up the Thames to blast Woolwich Arsenal, power stations and docks. As soon as Goring got the report that the last target was a sea of flames, he hurried to a microphone and began broadcasting that London was being destroyed. His planes, he boasted, were striking right into the enemy's heart. 
The devastating attack continued until dawn and was resumed the following dusk. 842 Londoners died in those two days of terror. Making good his threat to raise their cities to the ground, Hitler authorized another massive raid for September 15. This would be the grand finale, designed not only to punish London but to destroy the RAF. Again ultra warned Churchill and, four days before the raid, he broadcast an exhortation to the nation. There is no doubt that Herr Hitler is using up his fighter force at a very high rate, and that if he goes on for many more weeks he will wear down and ruin the vital part of his air force. At the same time he warned that no one should blind himself to the fact that a heavy full-scale invasion of this island is being prepared with all the usual German thoroughness and method, and that it may be launched now, upon England, upon Scotland, or upon Ireland, or upon all three. It could come in the next few days. Therefore, we must regard the next week or so as a very important period in our history. It ranks with the days when the Spanish Armada was approaching the Channel, and Drake was finishing his game of bowls, or when Nelson stood between us and Napoleon's Grand Army at Boulogne. His words lifted spirits in the fortress island, inspiring civilians to feel that they too were involved in the battle. Although Hitler was putting on a public show of confidence, he revealed considerable concern at a Führer conference on September 14. After praising the Luftwaffe for the terrific effect of Operation Eagle, he admitted that the prerequisites for Sea Lion were not yet on hand. Bad weather had prevented the Luftwaffe from gaining complete air command. But he still refused to call off the invasion. The air attacks were having a devastating effect on English nerves and mass hysteria would break out in 10 or 12 days. Goring's deputy seized on this to advance his scheme of bombing civilians into submission. Redder, who seemed enthusiastic about everything but a sea invasion, gave his hearty approval but Hitler insisted that the Luftwaffe confine itself to vital military targets. Bombing with the object of causing mass panic must be the last resort. All the talk subsided and what had apparently been a decision to launch Sea Lion was only an agreement to make one on September 17. In the meantime the Battle of Britain intensified, with increasingly heavy German losses. On the 15th, for instance, 60 planes were destroyed while the British were losing 26. Consequently Hitler was forced at last to face reality on Tuesday, the 17th. He admitted to himself that bombing would probably never bring the English to their knees, then curtly announced his decision, due to inability to achieve air superiority, Operation Sea Lion was hereby postponed until further notice. Postponement meant cancellation, from that moment on the invasion of England existed only on paper. Ultra and a small band of British pilots, typifying the united spirit of the people, had dealt Adolf Hitler his first military defeat. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, was saved. We have conquered France at the cost of 30,000 men, the Führer told Putkamer once the decision was made. During one night of crossing the Channel we could lose many times that, and success is not certain. He seemed happy, thought his naval adjutant, now that Sea Lion was shelved. That same day Ultra learned that Hitler had authorized the dismantling of airloading equipment at all Dutch airfields. Churchill summoned the chiefs of staff in the evening. It was, F. W. Winterbottom recalled, as if someone cut all the strings of the violins in the middle of a dreary concerto. There were controlled smiles on the faces of these men. Then the chief of the air staff said what everyone privately hoped, in his opinion Hitler had abandoned Sea Lion at least for the year. There was a very broad smile on Churchill's face now as he lit up his massive cigar and suggested that we should all take a little fresh air. 4. Hitler still hoped to bring England to the negotiating table, if not by air or sea assault, by the capture of the most strategic mass of rock in the world, Gibraltar. Its seizure would not only keep the Royal Navy out of the Mediterranean and thus ensure German takeover of North Africa and the Mideast but drastically lengthen the Empire's lifelines to the Far East. How could the British continue a war on such a basis? Reasoned Hitler. 
particularly since he was willing to give them an honorable peace and let them be a silent partner in the crusade against Bolshevism. It so happened that Franco's Minister of the Interior, Ramon Serrano Suna, was then in Berlin to discuss Spain's entry into the war in general and a possible attack on Gibraltar in particular. On the way to the Chancellery on that eventful morning he was in an apprehensive mood. Yesterday's conference with Ribbentrop had left him both disturbed and irritated, for he feared Ribbentrop's arrogant behavior was merely a reflection of his master's irritation with the Franco regime. The Spaniard was pleasantly surprised to be received by Hitler with serene politeness and it was with some confidence that he explained he had been sent as personal agent of Franco as well as a representative of the Spanish government. He was married to the former Zeta Polo, sister of the Generalissimo's wife. He had come, he said, to clarify the conditions under which Spain would join Germany in the war. That would be whenever Spain's supply of foodstuffs and war material was secure. The Führer seemed more interested in politics than war. Europe, he said, must be united into a continental political system by establishing her own Monroe Doctrine, with Africa under her protection. His allusions to Spain's entry into the war, however, were indirect and vague. Only when his guest stressed the need for artillery in the Gibraltar area did Hitler become specific, and then about the superiority of bombs over shells. Rattling off figures, he explained that a long barreled cannon needed repairs after firing about 200 rounds, each containing 75 kilograms of explosives, while a Stuka squadron of 36 machines could indefinitely drop 120 bombs of 1,000 kilograms at a time. How long, argued Hitler, could the enemy resist these dive bombers? At the mere sight of them, the Royal Navy would flee from Gibraltar. Therefore, there was no need for artillery. Besides, he added, the Germans could not possibly supply 38 centimeter guns for the Gibraltar operation. This virtuoso verbal performance, which left his listener speechless with wonder, was followed by an assurance that Germany would do everything in her power to help Spain. Serrano sooner left the Chancellery so relieved that his host had not once used a threatening or even pressing tone that he advised Franco to accept Hitler's suggestion that the two leaders meet at the Spanish frontier in the near future for a more definite discussion. Equally impressed by Serrano sooner, Hitler decided to approach his brother-in-law more forthrightly. Spain's entry into their war on the side of the Axis powers, he wrote Franco the next morning must begin with the expulsion of the English fleet from Gibraltar and immediately thereafter the seizure of the fortified rock. Once Spain came over to the Axis side, he promised with the persuasiveness of a salesman, Germany would supply not only military but economic aid to the greatest extent possible. In other words, quick victory was to be followed by quick profits. In his reply on September 22 Franco seemed to agree with almost everything Hitler proposed but a meeting between Serrano Suna and Ribbentrop two days later foretold difficulties. The Spaniard objected politely but firmly to German claims for several strategic islands off Africa. Even the interpreter thought Serrano Suna was being quite niggardly about these bases after a wholesale offer by Ribbentrop of territory in Africa. This, Schmidt observed brought the first chill to the warm friendship between Franco and Hitler. If Ribbentrop was frustrated at the difficulties of negotiating with Franco's relative, he had cause for celebration later in the month when his brainchild, the tripartite pact with Japan and Italy, was signed in Berlin. In it Japan agreed to recognize the leadership of Germany and Italy in the establishment of a new order in Europe as long as they recognized her new order in Asia. The signatories also promised to assist one another with all political, economic and military means when one of the three contracting parties is attacked by a power at present not involved in the European war or in the Sino-Japanese conflict. To the British and Americans this was further evidence that Japan was no better than Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy, and that the three gangster nations had joined forces to conquer the world. The Soviets were disturbed but Ribbentrop assured Molotov that the treaty was directed exclusively against the warmonger elements in America. Why not make it a quadripartite pact? He urged, and then wrote a long letter to Stalin saying that it was the historical mission of the four powers, 
the Soviet Union, Japan, Italy, and Germany, to adopt a long-range policy and to direct the future development of their peoples into the right channels by delimitation of their interests for the ages. 5. Hitler devoted October to diplomacy. On the 4th he met Mussolini at the Brenner Pass. The war is won. The rest is only a question of time, he said. While admitting that the Luftwaffe had not yet achieved air supremacy, he claimed that British planes were being knocked out of the air at a ratio of 3 to 1. For some reason, however, England continued to hold out even though her military situation was hopeless. Her people were under inhuman strain. Why does she keep on? He complained and answered his own question, hope of American and Russian aid. That, he said, was an illusion. The tripartite pact was already having a dampening effect on the cowardly American leaders and 40 German divisions on the Eastern Front discouraged any Russian intervention. Therefore the time was ripe to strike a new blow at the very roots of the British Empire, to seize Gibraltar. This digressed into a diatribe against the Spaniards, who demanded 400,000 tons of grain and considerable gasoline as their price for entry into the war. And, complained Hitler, when he had brought up the matter of eventual repayment, Franke had the gall to reply that this was a matter of confusing idealism with materialism. Almost beside himself with resentment, Hitler exclaimed that he had been practically represented as if I were a little Jew who was haggling about the most sacred possessions of mankind. After the two dictators parted in a spirit of warmth and trust, the Führer made for Berchtesgaden to think over quietly the new political scheme. He paced the rooms of the Berghof and took long walks by himself on the slopes of the Ober Salzburg. He spoke out some thoughts over the dinner table, some at conferences. The result of these monologues was a decision to sound out the French during his trip to see Franco. Then, and only then, would he speak to the Russians. His special train it bore the curious name America, left Germany on the 22nd, arriving that evening at Montauire in west-central France. Here Laville, deputy premier of Vichy France, came aboard for a brief conference. It dealt primarily with arrangements for a meeting with Marshal Pétain in two days. At this time the Führer planned to extend his program reducing France to complete vassalage. He hoped to do it with the willing help of the victims but was ready to use force and ruthless reprisals if necessary. Beyond subjecting France, as he had other conquered nations, to what Goring blandly called plunder economy, which included the outright theft of everything of value from raw materials and slave labor to national art treasures, he hoped to gain Vichy France as an active ally against England. From a level's attitude, Hitler was assured that this could be done and he was in a confident mood as the train continued its journey through the night for the crucial meeting with Franco. They were to meet next day at a little French border town more suitable for a holiday than a conference of world importance. Hendale lay just below Biarritz in the resort area of southwest France, with beaches and palm trees worthy of a travel poster. The rendezvous was at the edge of town where the French narrow gauge and Spanish wide gauge rails met. The Führer train arrived in good time for the two o'clock meeting but there was no Spanish train on the adjoining platform. It was a sparkling, clear October day, so pleasant that the punctual Germans were not annoyed. After all, what could you expect from those lazy Spaniards with their interminable siestas? Hitler was convinced that once he met Franco face to face he would bring him around just as he had Chamberlain, Lovell and the others. Where would the Generalissimo be without the help of Germany? It was not, as devout Spaniards believed, the intervention of the Mother of God which had won the civil war but the bombs German squadrons had rained from the heavens that decided the issue. While they waited, Hitler and Ribbentrop chatted on the platform. We cannot at the moment. Schmidt overheard the Führer say, give the Spaniards any written promises about transfers of territory from the French colonial possessions. If they get hold of anything in writing on this ticklish question with these talkative Latins, the French are sure to hear something about it sooner or later. Tomorrow he wanted to induce Pétain to start active hostilities against England and so could not give away French territory today. 
Quite apart from that, he continued, if such an agreement with the Spaniards became known, the French colonial empire would probably go over bodily to de Gaulle. At last, an hour late, the Spanish train appeared on the international bridge over the Bidasoa River. The tardiness had been deliberate, not due to any siesta. This is the most important meeting of my life, Franco told one of his officers. I'll have to use every trick I can, and this is one of them. If I make Hitler wait, he will be at a psychological disadvantage from the start. The Cordillo, leader, was short and plump with dark, piercing eyes. In a nation of distinguished looking men, he appeared to be a non entity, a Sancho Panza, who had risen to power by luck and perseverance. His success was hard won. Coming from Galicia, a province noted for its sober pragmatists, he brought to his high rank a grim sense of reality and shrewdness. Although a peasant at heart, Franco was not even a man of the people. He also was too close to the church and the monarchists and, while giving lip service to the Phalangists, a fascist type party, it was obvious he was not one of them. The true Phalangists, such as his brother in law, who had recently been promoted to foreign minister, were much more pro German. Despite his recent unhappy experiences in Berlin, Serrano sooner remained convinced that Germany was invincible and that Spain should go over to the winning side. Franco was skeptical. I tell you that the English will never give in, he told his generals. They'll fight and go on fighting, and if they are driven out of Britain, they'll carry on the fight from Canada, they'll get the Americans to come in with them. Germany has not won the war. At the same time he did not want to exhaust Hitler's patience and subject Spain to the fate of Czechoslovakia and the succeeding line of small countries which had stood in his way. As his train drew alongside of Hitler's, Franco knew the fate of his country rested on his ability to keep it out of the European conflict. The civil war had left Spain's economy in a shambles and with the failure of last year's harvest his people faced starvation. But would Hitler let him remain neutral? If he gave the Führer a flat refusal, what could stop a German invasion? The solution was to give the impression of joining the Axis, yet find some slight point that needed further clarification. His Gallicin heritage was his armor as he stepped onto the platform and started toward Hitler to the accompanying blast of military music. Franco began with a set speech laden with compliments and vocal promises. Spain had always been spiritually united with the German people without any reservation and in complete loyalty, and, in fact, at every moment felt herself united with the Axis. Historically there were only forces of unity between their two nations and, in the present war, Spain would gladly fight at Germany's side. The difficulties of doing so, he added, were well known to the Führer, in particular the food shortage and the difficulties anti-Axis elements were making for his poor country in America and Europe. Therefore, Spain must mark time and often look kindly toward things of which she thoroughly disapproves. He said this with a tone of regret but quickly noted that despite all these problems Spain, mindful of her spiritual alliance with the Axis, was assuming the same attitude toward the war as had Italy in the past autumn. This artful dodge was followed by a promise from Hitler. In return for Spanish cooperation in the war, he said, Germany would let Franke have Gibraltar, it would be seized on the 10th of January, as well as some colonial territories in Africa. Franco sat huddled silently in his chair, face expressionless. Finally he began to talk, slowly and deliberately, offering up excuses while insisting on more concessions. His country, he said, needed several hundred thousand tons of wheat immediately. Fixing Hitler with a slyly watchful expression, he asked if Germany was prepared to deliver it. And what about the large number of heavy guns Spain needed to defend the coast from attacks by the Royal Navy, not to mention anti-aircraft guns? He shifted in seemingly haphazard manner from one subject to another, from recompense for the certain loss of the Canary Islands to the impossibility of accepting Gibraltar as a present from foreign soldiers. That fortress must be taken by Spaniards. Abruptly he pragmatically assessed Hitler's chances of clearing the British out of Africa, to the edge of the desert, perhaps, but no farther. 
as an old African campaigner I am quite clear about that. Similarly, he cast doubt on the Führer's ability to conquer Britain itself. At best England might fall but Churchill's government would flee to Canada and continue the war with America's aid. Franco spoke in a monotonous sing-song that reminded Schmidt of Amuaz in calling the faithful to prayer. It only frustrated Hitler, who finally shot to his feet and blurted out that it was futile to continue. He immediately sat down again, as if regretting his display of nerves, and once more tried to persuade Franco to sign a treaty. Of course, said Franco. What would be more logical? As long as Germany supplied the food and armaments, of course, and as long as Spain was given the option to decide the right moment for war. Having come full circle, the meeting was adjourned. As a disgruntled Hitler departed for his private compartment, the two foreign ministers walked down the platform to Ribbentrop's train for further discussions. After some sparring, Ribbentrop revealed that the Führer had come to Hende to ascertain whether the Spanish claims and the French hopes were compatible with one another. Surely the Cordillo would understand Hitler's dilemma and sign a secret protocol to which Italy would later add her signature. Whereupon Ribbentrop handed over a Spanish translation of the proposal. It stated that Spain would receive territories from French colonial possessions to the extent that France can be indemnified from British colonial possessions. With a show of surprise, Serrano sooner exclaimed that evidently a new course was to be followed in the African question and Germany's attitude toward France apparently had changed. This made Spain's compensation for entering the war very vague. And Franco, he concluded with a little smile, would have to define more exactly the rewards of victory to his people. Ribbentrop was no match for such verbal gymnastics and fought to restrain his anger as the Spaniard made a dramatic but elegantly formal exit. That evening the Germans entertained the Spaniards at a state dinner in the dining car of the Führer's train. Franco was warm and friendly, his brother-in-law charming. Perhaps their ingratiating manner throughout the meal encouraged Hitler to draw Franco aside as the guests were rising to depart. For almost two hours the two men talked in private with the Führer becoming increasingly agitated at his inability to manipulate the imperturbable Cordillo, who stood firm on every important point. He believed, for instance, that the eastern gate of the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, should be closed before the western gate, Gibraltar, nor was he moved by Hitler's protests. Even when his firmness drove Hitler from insistence to an outburst of temper, Franco remained impassive, insisting that if Spain did not get the 10 million quintals of wheat, history, he was referring to the rising against Napoleon, might repeat itself. The Führer left the banquet car in a fume. Franco is a little major. He told Putkama. To Lynch he reduced him in rank, in Germany, that man would never rise higher than sergeant. Another heard him bring down the Cordillo to Corporal, his own World War grade. He was even more annoyed at the cunning tactics of his foreign minister. Soon as Franco in his pocket, he told Keitel and threatened to break off the talks with the Spaniards there and then. In the meantime Ribbentrop was in his train trying to work out an agreement with Suna, but he had become as frustrated as the Führer with the Spaniards' polite but insistent objections. Losing all patience, he dismissed Serrano Suna and his aides as if they were schoolboys instructing them to bring in the completed text by 8 in the morning. Cyrano Suna failed to appear in person on the 24th, entrusting the text instead to his subordinate, a former ambassador to Berlin who spoke German with a Viennese accent. Ribbentrop was so infuriated at the substitution that his rude shouts could be heard outside the train. Unsatisfactory! exclaimed Ribbentrop in his role as schoolmaster after reading Serrano Suna's draft, which described the French zone of Morocco as a territory later to belong to Spain. He demanded that the Spaniards submit a new draft, then drove off with Schmidt to the nearest airport so they could reach Monto Ire in time for the Hitler-Pitain meeting. Spluttering with rage all the way, the foreign minister cursed Suna as a Jesuit and Franco as an ungrateful coward. Secretly the interpreter was delighted by the tactics of the Spaniards. For the first time Hitler had been outwitted before he could play his own tricks.
He had already arrived in Monto and was waiting in his train to meet Marshal Pétain, who had recently elevated himself from Premier to Head of State, a new title disassociating him from the old Republican regime. It would have made the Führer even unhappier with Franco to know that he had already warned Pétain not to assume the burden of leading France out of chaos. Make your age your excuse, he had said. Let those who lost the war sign the peace. You are the hero of Verdun. Don't let your name be mingled with the others who have been defeated. I know, General, Badain had replied, but my country calls me, and I am hers. It may be the last service I can do for her. The aged marshal, smartly uniformed, was greeted at the entrance of the railway station by Guy Itel. Badain returned his salute and walked directly past the German honor guard, eyes front with Ribbentrop and Lovell at his heels. They silently filed through the station to the Führer's train. As Pétain emerged from the ticket hall, Hitler came forward, hand outstretched. The marshal allowed himself to be led into the private coach but sat very straight facing Hitler, listening to Schmidt translate, he was talking rather loudly for the old man's benefit, with calm indolence. He seemed confident rather than servile. Lovell, next to him, was a vivid contrast. He was dying for a cigarette and knew smoking was anathema to both Hitler and Pitain. Lovell's searching eyes darted alternately from Hitler to Ribbentrop as the former pointed out that he was aware the marshal did not belong among those who had favored declaring war on Germany. If this were not the case, he said, this talk could not have taken place. After listing French sins in a moderate tone, the Führer repeated what he had said to Franco, we have already won the war. England is beaten and will sooner or later have to admit it. And, he added meaningfully, it was obvious someone would have to pay for the lost war. That will be either France or England. If England bears the cost, then France can take the place in Europe which is due her, and can fully retain her position as a colonial power. To do this, of course. France would have to protect her colonial empire from attack as well as reconquer the Central African colonies, which had gone over to de Gaulle. At this point he indirectly suggested that France join the war against Britain by asking Pétain what France would do if the English continued to attack her battleships as she had at Mers el Kheber and a few weeks later at Dakar. While admitting that both of these attacks affronted most Frenchmen, Pétain replied that his country was in no position to wage another war. He countered with a request for a final peace treaty so that France may be clear about her fate, and the two million French prisoners of war may return to their families as soon as possible. Hitler glided over this problem and the two Frenchmen, in turn, made no response to another hint that France should enter the war. The two sides were at cross purposes and although Pétain expressed his personal admiration for the Führer and seemed to agree with many of his opinions. He expressed himself so curtly that Schmidt took it as an overt rebuff. The great stake for which Hitler had played, recalled the interpreter, had been lost as a result of the prudent reticence shown by Pétain and Lovell. In his opinion France was not shamed by the actions of their two representatives at Montoya. It was with honor, Pétain told his countrymen a few days later over the radio, that he accepted collaboration with Germany. He did so to maintain French unity. It would also lighten the weight of France's sufferings and better the lot of her prisoners. This collaboration, he warned, must be sincere. It must exclude all idea of aggression. It must carry with it a patient and confident effort. France had numerous obligations to the victor. Hadn't Hitler let France keep her sovereignty? So far, continued Pétain, I have spoken to you as a father. Today I am addressing you as a leader. Follow me. Trust in eternal France. The mood aboard the Führer train was glum. Hitler had failed to get what he wanted at both Hende and Montoya. The third disappointment came before America crossed the border of France with delivery of a letter from Mussolini dated six days earlier. In it he venomously attacked the French. In their hearts, he wrote, they hated the Axis and, Despite the sweet words coming from Vichy, one cannot think of their collaboration. 
anxious lest Il Duce's vengeful attitude toward France endanger his own plan to draw Vichy into the anti-democratic crusade, Hitler instructed Ribbentrop to move up his meeting with Mussolini in Florence to October 28. Ribbentrop's telephone call to Chano a few minutes later caused a minor panic in Rome. This rush of the Führer to Italy so soon after his conference with Bettine, Chano wrote in his diary, is not at all pleasing to me. I hope he will not offer us a cup of hemlock because of our claims against France. This will be a bitter pill for the Italian people, even more so than the Versailles illusion. Rather than return to Berlin as planned, Hitler ordered his train to Munich so he could rest and prepare for the hastily updated trip to Italy. On October 27, just before heading south late that afternoon, word came from the German military attaché in Rome that it was now practically certain that Mussolini would attack Greece early the next morning. According to Schmidt, the Führer was beside himself at this news and that evening at supper Ribbentrop reflected his master's ire. The Italians will never get anywhere against the Greeks in the autumn rains and winter snows, he said. Besides the consequences of war in the Balkans are quite unpredictable. The Führer intends at all costs to hold up this crazy scheme of the Duches, so we are to go to Italy at once, to talk to Mussolini personally. Ribbentrop could not have meant this seriously. He himself had set the meeting two days earlier. Further, he was aware that the Führer had just refused to sign a message to Rome, composed by his own staff, which criticized any such attack in straight language. Ribbentrop, recalled we eyes, Sacker, who had written the message, approved this, but Hitler said he did not want to cross Mussolini. Hitler's silence meant indirectly giving Italy the sign to go ahead with her decisive and dangerous step to the Balkans. The next morning at 10 a.m., as America was passing through Bologna, Hitler learned that the Italians had just marched into Greece. His first outburst of swearing and cursing, recalled Engel, was directed not at Mussolini but at the German liaison staffs and attaches who had spoiled many a recipe for him. Only then did Hitler begin berating the Italians for their duplicity. This is the revenge for Norway and France. He exclaimed, then complained that every second Italian is either a traitor or a spy. His emotions released, he turned to a more sober analysis of the situation. Il Duce, he guessed, had gone into Greece to counter Germany's growing economic influence in the Balkans. I am greatly disturbed, he said. The Italian invasion, he feared, would have grave consequences and give the British a welcome opportunity to set up an air base in the Balkans. An hour later his train pulled into the gaily decorated station of Florence. An exuberant Duce rushed forward to embrace his ally. Führer, he exclaimed, we are on the march. Hitler controlled himself. The damage had been done and it would be useless to complain. His greeting was aloof. A far cry from the usual warm reception he gave Mussolini, but even this coolness was momentary. In moments both dictators, being politicians, were put in good spirits by the ecstatic cries of Führer, Heil Führer. Duce? Duce? From the crowd outside the Palazzo Pitti where the talks would take place. Several times the two dictators had to appear at the balcony to appease the crowd. It was a greeting such as the Romans gave their Caesars, Hitler later told his valet. But they did not deceive me. They are trying to soften me now because of the way they have messed up my plans. During the talk Hitler controlled himself well to Schmidt's surprise, with not the slightest sign of his mental gnashing of teeth. Mussolini was in exceptional good humor. Any guilt he may have felt for doing what Hitler had only given reluctant consent to had been dispelled by his own resentment over Hitler's recent dispatch of troops to Romania days after they both had promised at the Brenner Pass to preserve peace in the Balkans. Hitler always faces me with a fait accompli, he had complained to Cheno. This time I am going to pay him back in his own coin. He will find out from the papers that I have occupied Greece. In this way the equilibrium will be re-established. Apparently he had succeeded, for the Führer never uttered a syllable of complaint about Greece. Instead he devoted most of his time to the problem that had brought him to Florence. 
He told Mussolini of the meeting with Bodain and Laval in which he had been much impressed by the dignity of the former, and had not been at all deceived by the servility of the latter. He described his talks with Franco as an ordeal and rather than go through another he would prefer to have three or four teeth out. The Cordillo, he complained, had been very vague about entering the war, he must have become leader of Spain by an accident. The long meeting ended in brotherliness with Hitler repeating the promise made at the Brenner Pass that he would on no account conclude peace with France if the claims of Italy were not completely satisfied. On his part, Mussolini observed that their two countries were, as always, completely in accord. Once aboard America, however, Hitler began fulminating against Il Duce's new adventure, the outcome of which could only be military catastrophe. Why on earth? he exclaimed, didn't Mussolini attack Malta or Crete? That would still make some sense in the context of their war with England in the Mediterranean. Particularly with the Italian troops in such straits in North Africa that they had just requested a German armored division. The return trip through the snow-covered Alps was a morose one for the Führer. In little more than six months he had conquered more land than even the most optimistic German could have imagined. Norway. Denmark, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland and France were his. He had outstripped Alexander and Napoleon. Yet nothing, it seems, fails like success. This incredible string of victories had been followed by frustration at Hende, Monto Iyer and Florence. The mediocre leader of a second-rate country and the chief of a defeated nation were avoiding being led into the crusade against England and his own dependable ally was stupidly endangering the Axis position in the Mediterranean out of need for personal glory on the battlefield. As if that were not enough, the air campaign designed to bring England to the green table was now an admitted failure, at a frightful cost in planes. Unable to hide his annoyance during the tedious voyage back to the fatherland, he railed at deceiving collaborators and ungrateful, unreliable friends. What other conqueror had ever been faced with such a superfluity of frustrations? Much of his display must have been theatre. Hitler could not have been as disturbed by Pétain's lack of commitment as he pretended and he surely knew he could have prevented the incursion into Greece if he had been willing to put pressure on Mussolini. But his bitterness at Franco's refusal to commit himself was sincere. The Cordilla must be forced into compliance, for he was the key to Gibraltar and seizure of this fortress could checkmate the English, and clear the way for the crusade in the east. One a few days later a press advisor of the Washington Embassy submitted the following memorandum to the German foreign minister after a talk with Fulton Lewis, Jr., political commentator for the Mutual Broadcasting Company, L who travels a good deal, and in connection with the Republican and Democratic conventions met Americans from all classes and parts of the country, stated that people did not want any war, but were rather helpless before Roosevelt's cunning tactics, especially now when by a cornucopia of enormous orders in all the states he had reduced the Congress to a rubber stamp without a will of its own. Chapter 23 the world will hold ITS breath November 12, 1940 June 22, 1941. 1. Although Hitler had given only reluctant support to the tripartite pact with Japan and Italy, he was persuaded by its father, Ribbentrop, to invite the Soviets to make it a four-power agreement. And so, on November 12, 1940, Foreign Commissar Molotov arrived in Berlin to talk of coalition. The meeting began without Hitler at Ribbentrop's new office in the former presidential palace and the host did his utmost to make the Soviet delegation feel at home, bestowing smiles on all sides. Only at long intervals, recalled Schmidt, did Molotov reciprocate, when a frosty smile glided over his intelligent, chess player's face. He listened impassively to Ribbentrop voice loud assurance that the tripartite pact was not aimed against the Soviet Union. In fact, Ribbentrop observed, Japan had already turned her face to the south and would be occupied for centuries in consolidating her territorial gains in Southeast Asia. For her Lebensraum Germany, too, will seek expansion in a southerly direction, that is in Central Africa, in the territories of the former German colonies. Everyone, he said reassuringly, was going south, 
as if talking of the latest fad. He suggested in his heavy-handed manner that the Soviets also head south and named the Persian Gulf and other areas in which Germany was disinterested. It was an obvious reference to India but Molotov just peered without expression through his old-fashioned pince-nez. Disconcerted, Ribbentrop suggested that the Soviet Union join the tripartite pact. But Molotov, whose unerring logic in the presentation of arguments reminded Schmidt of his mathematics teacher, was saving his ammunition for Hitler. That afternoon Molotov listened impassively to the Führer, but when Hitler finally stopped talking complained politely that his statements had been of too general a nature. He wanted details, and began posing a succession of embarrassing questions, does the German-Soviet agreement of 1939 still apply to Finland? What does the new order in Europe and Asia amount to, and what part is the USSR to play in it? What is the position with regard to Bulgaria, Romania and Turkey, and how do matters stand with regard to the safeguarding of Russian interests in the Balkans and on the Black Sea? No foreigner had ever before dared to express himself quite so boldly and Schmidt wondered if Hitler would rush irately out the door as he had two years earlier when Sir Horace Wilson handed him Chamberlain's letter. But he meekly supplied reassuring answers. The tripartite pact, he said, would only regulate conditions in Europe, there would be no settlement without Russian collaboration, not only in Europe but in the Far East. Molotov was skeptical. If we are to be treated as equal partners and not mere dummies, he said, we could, in principle, join the tripartite pact. But first the aim and object of the pact must be closely defined, and I must be more precisely informed about the boundaries of the greater Asia area. Obviously disconcerted at being put on the defensive, Hitler abruptly ended the interrogation with the announcement that they would have to break off their discussion. Otherwise we shall be caught by the air raid warning. He sent the Russians an invitation for luncheon on the 13th even though he disliked eating with foreigners. But the rare concession to cordiality did not moderate his guests' persistence. Molotov opened the second conference with continuing aggression. He brought up Finland, which Hitler was secretly planning to use as a military ally in case of war with Russia. The mere mention of Finland turned the Führer from genial luncheon host to testy litigant. We have no political interest there, he protested. Molotov was not convinced. If good relations are maintained between Russia and Germany, he said with studied calm, the Finnish question can be settled without war. But in that case there must be no German troops in Finland and no demonstrations against the Soviet government there. Hitler controlled himself answering in a quiet but emphatic tone that the only German troops in Finland were in transit to northern Norway. Molotov's suspicions were not allayed and Hitler became so ruffled he began to repeat himself. We must have peace with Finland, because of their nickel and timber. But the next sentence, perhaps unwittingly, exposed his ultimate plan. A conflict in the Baltic would put a severe strain on Russo-German relations with unpredictable consequences. If Molotov did not see that this was a threat, he ignored it, thereby making a grave diplomatic error. It's not a question of the Baltic but of Finland, he replied sharply. 
No war with Finland, said Hitler obstinately. Then you are departing from our agreement of last year, said Molotov with equal abstinence. This was a far grimmer, if less spectacular, contest than the debate with the British and Ribbentrop saw his cherished policy of Russian-German entente in grave danger. He intervened conciliatingly and Hitler took the cue to sound the Ribbentrop theme of Southward Ho. After the conquest of England, he said, the British Empire will be apportioned as a gigantic worldwide estate in bankruptcy of 40 million square kilometers. Like the promoter of a new real estate development, Hitler painted a tempting picture. In this bankrupt estate Russia will get access to the ice-free and really open seas. Thus far, a minority of 45 million Englishmen have ruled 600 million inhabitants of the British Empire. I am about to crush this minority. Germany, he said, wanted no diversion from her struggle against the heart of the empire, the British Isles. This was why he opposed any Baltic war. But this excursion did not mollify Molotov, who resumed his complaints. You had given a guarantee to Romania which displeases us, he said with characteristic brusqueness. This referred to Germany's recent guarantee of Romania's new frontiers from foreign attacks. Is this guarantee also valid against us? In diplomacy it is considered a blunder to pin down an opponent. It applies to anyone who attacks Romania, Hitler said flatly and a few moments later abruptly adjourned the meeting, using the same excuse as yesterday, possible English share aid. Hitler did not attend the banquet at the Russian embassy that evening, an occasion marred by the appearance of British planes just as Molotov was proposing a friendly toast. Ribbentrop escorted the host to his own air shelter in the Wilhelmstrasse and while they took the opportunity to show Molotov a draft of the four-power treaty he so devoutly sought. It called for Germany, Russia, Japan and Italy to respect each other's natural spheres of influence and settle any dispute in an amicable way. It defined the Soviet's territorial aspirations as south in the direction of the Indian Ocean. Molotov was not impressed. Russia, he said was more interested in Europe and the Dardanelles than the Indian Ocean. Consequently, he said, paper agreements will not suffice for the Soviet Union, she would have to insist on effective guarantees of her security. He made an exhaustive list of other Soviet interests, Swedish neutrality, access to the Baltic Sea, and the fate of Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia and Greece. Ribbentrop was so taken aback that, According to the minutes of that meeting, he could only repeat again and again that the decisive question was whether the Soviet Union was prepared and in a position to cooperate with us in the liquidation of the British Empire. Molotov replied with sarcasm, if Germany was waging a life and death struggle against England as Hitler had remarked that afternoon, he could only assume this meant that Germany was fighting for life and England for death. And when Ribbentrop persisted that England was beaten but didn't know it, the Russian replied, if that is so, why are we sitting in this air aid shelter? And whose bombs are those that are falling so close that their explosions are heard even here? Molotov won the argument but lost the case. When Hitler read the report of the air shelter discussion he was galled. Convinced that the Russians were not serious about a four-power pact, he gave up the last scant hope of Entente and resolved to do what he had vowed to do since 1928. At last he irrevocably decided to attack Russia, confiding later to Bormann that Molotov's visit had convinced him that sooner or later Stalin would abandon us and go over to the enemy. He could not submit to Soviet blackmail regarding Finland, Romania, Bulgaria and Turkey. The Third Reich, defender and protector of Europe could not have sacrificed these friendly countries on the altar of communism. Such behavior would have been dishonorable, and we should have been punished for it. From the moral as well as from the strategic point of view it would have been a miserable gambit. War with Russia had become inevitable, whatever we did, and to postpone it only meant that we should later have to fight under conditions far less favorable. I therefore decided, as soon as Molotov departed, that I would settle accounts with Russia as soon as fair weather permitted. One encouragement was the miserable performance of the Red Army against Little Finland. He had also come to regard himself as a man of destiny, 
superior to any other human being, whose genius and willpower would conquer any enemy. Mesmerized by his political and military victories, he explained to one Nazi commander that he was the first and only mortal who had emerged into a superhuman state. His nature was more godlike than human, and therefore as the first of the new race of supermen he was bound by none of the conventions of human morality and stood above the law. 2. Hitler kept his decision to himself, however, leaving his commanders under the impression that England was still the primary target. On the day of Molotov's arrival in Berlin he had issued a directive aimed at bringing England to her knees without having to risk an invasion across the Channel. This plan called for a combination of blows to finish what the Italians had so ineptly started in Egypt and Greece. These attacks, combined with seizure of Gibraltar, the Canaries, Azores, Madeira and parts of Morocco, would assuredly cut off England from the empire and force her to capitulate. It was a chancy of clever plan since it involved cooperation with a dubious collaborator, an unstable ally and a reluctant neutral. No one was more aware of the difficulties of such a complex campaign than the Führer, but despite recent frustrations he was confident of bringing Pétain, Mussolini and Franco to heel. He began with the last. I have decided to attack Gibraltar, he told the Cordillo's envoy, Serrano Suna, on November 18. All that is required is the signal to begin, and a beginning must be made. But Franco's brother in law was as impossible to pin down as ever. He repeated Spain's dire need for grain and renewed her territorial demands. Hitler refused the latter outright pointing out how well paid Spain would be if she joined the victorious side. Cyrano sooner observed that Spain, as Napoleon had found to his dismay, had always been ready to resist any invasion of its territory. This was succeeded by a final observation which somehow managed to combine another threat with the promise of compliance, Spain would have to use the remaining period of neutrality to buy wheat from the West. It was a tantalizing performance that left Hitler irritated and frustrated, and he later told intimates that Serrano Suna was the most evil spirit. There, gravedigger, of modern Spain. Convinced that Franco would eventually join the war, the Führer held the final briefing on the seizure of Gibraltar, Operation Felix, early in December. He told his commanders that he would undoubtedly get Franco's formal consent in the near future and then sent a personal friend of Franco's to bring him to terms. His choice, Canaries, was disastrous. The admiral, working against Hitler since 1938, formally presented Hitler's arguments, then informally advised Franco to stay out of a war that the Axis was bound to lose. One. When Canaries reported that Franco would enter the war only when England was about ready to collapse, Hitler lost his patience, on December 10 he instructed his commanders to abandon Felix as a lost cause. But a few weeks later he made another appeal to Franco. In a long plaintive letter he promised to deliver grain immediately if the Cordillo would only approve an early assault on Gibraltar. He made a pledge never to forsake Franco that was followed by a final plea, I believe. Cordillo, that we three men, the Duce, you and I, are linked to one another by the most implacable force of history, and that we should therefore, in this historic conflict, obey the supreme commandment to realize that in grave times such as these nations can be saved by stout hearts rather than by seemingly prudent caution. Once more Franco appeared to agree with everything Hitler said, yet did nothing. It was by willpower alone that he stalled Felix and saved Gibraltar for England, and by so doing he kept the Mediterranean open to the west while confining Adolf Hitler to the continent of Europe. If the Mediterranean had been closed, it is most likely that all of North Africa and the Middle East would have fallen to the Reich. The entire Arab world would have enthusiastically joined the Axis with all its resources, because of their hatred of the Jews. Apart from Spain's desperate economic situation and his fear of aligning himself with an eventual loser, there was a compelling personal motive for Franco's decision to thwart Hitler. He was part Jewish. Two. Three. Stalin waited almost two weeks before informing the Germans that the Soviets would join Hitler's proposed four power pact on several conditions, such as withdrawal of troops from Finland. 
the demands were not excessive but, to the surprise of the Foreign Office, Hitler did not deign to haggle, or even bother to send Moscow a reply. His mind was set on force of arms and late in the month his field commanders began a series of war games involving the attack on Russia. A day after their conclusion, on December 5, the chiefs of staff of the three army groups involved met with Hitler, Braukic and Halder. While approving Halder's basic plan of attack, the Führer was averse to imitating Napoleon with a main drive on Moscow. Seizure of the capital, he said, was not so very important. Braukic protested that Moscow was of supreme importance not only as the focal point of the Soviet communications network but as an armament center. This brought forth a heated retort. Only completely ossified brains, absorbed in the ideas of past centuries, said Hitler, could see any worthwhile objective in taking the capital. His interest lay in Leningrad and Stalingrad, the Bolshevik breeding grounds. With these two nests destroyed, Bolshevism would be dead. And that was the primary aim of their attack. Braukic's protest that this was the aim of a politician led to a lecture proving that politics and military strategy were interdependent. Hegemony over Europe, said Hitler, will be decided in battle against Russia. The defeat of the Soviet Union, for example, would help bring his secondary enemy, England, to terms. Five days later Hitler began preparing his own people for the coming crusade with a ringing speech in Berlin on the inequitable distribution of the riches of the earth. It was not fair, he said, for Germans to live 360 persons per square mile while other countries were sparsely populated. We must solve these problems, he concluded, and, therefore, we will solve them. At the same time Goebbels was preparing Germany for hard times ahead. The prolonged dual-tide atmosphere, he told his associates, must be confined exclusively to two days. Even then the feast of Christmas itself should be fitted into the framework of present-day happenings. A sloppy Christmas tree atmosphere lasting several weeks is out of tune with the militant mood of the German people. There would also be a raising of Germany's moral tone outside of the big cities. No strip dancers are to perform in rural areas, in small towns, or in front of soldiers. Comedians were also forbidden in the future to make political jibes or lewd erotic jokes. The revised plan of attack was presented to Hitler on December 17. He altered it to delay the drive on Moscow until the Baltic states were cleared and Leningrad captured then changed the name of the operation from Motto to a more meaningful title, Barbarossa, Red Beard, after Frederick I, the Holy Roman Emperor who had marched east in 1190 with his legions to take the Holy Land. The bulk of the Red Army standing on its western frontier, he directed, would be destroyed by daring operations led by deeply penetrating armored spearheads. Those forces still capable of giving battle would be prevented from withdrawing into the depths of the USSR. The final objective of the operation is to erect a barrier against Asiatic Russia on the general line Volga Archangel. The last surviving area of Russia in the Urals can then, if necessary, be eliminated by the Air Force. Holder suspected that Hitler was only bluffing and asked Engel if this was a genuine plan. The adjutant believed that Hitler himself did not yet know. But the die indeed was cast, the crusade set in motion. Hitler had no patience with those who, counseling moderation in triumph, wanted Germany to cease its aggression and enjoy the fruits of conquest. Most of Europe, they argued, was Hitler's and if he bided his time England too would recognize the reality of his hegemony. But to Adolf Hitler such a passive policy was unacceptable. The aim of National Socialism was the destruction of Bolshevism. How could he turn his back on his mission in life? I had always maintained that we ought at all costs to avoid waging war on two fronts, he later told Bormann, and you may rest assured that I pondered long and anxiously over Napoleon, and his experiences in Russia. Why, then, you may ask, this war against Russia, and why at the time that I selected? There was no hope of ending the war by invasion of England and hostilities would have gone on interminably with the Americans playing an increasingly active role. 
the one and only chance of vanquishing the Soviet Union was to take the initiative. Why attack in 1941? Because time was working in Russia's favor and against the Germans. Only when he held the territories of Russia would time be on Germany's side. 4. On the surface relations between the two unnatural allies prospered. Within days after setting Barbarossa into action, on January 10, 1941, Hitler authorized promulgation of two agreements with the Soviets, an economic treaty specifying reciprocal deliveries of commodities, and a secret protocol in which Germany renounced its previous claim to a strip of Lithuanian territory for 7,500,000 gold dollars. Behind the facade of Amity, however, dissension increased between the trade delegations. The flow of raw materials from the Soviet Union was steady and on schedule, while German deliveries were painfully slow and erratic. Whenever, for instance, machine tools were ready for shipment to Russia some inspector from the Air or War Ministry would appear to praise the workmanship, then hijack the tools in the name of national defense. This organized slowdown extended to warships. Hitler himself ordered work stopped on a heavy cruiser promised to Stalin so more submarines could be produced. The Germans did offer to tow the hull to Leningrad and arm it with 380 mm Krupp guns but they wrangled so insistently over price that the ship was still in Wilhelm Schavon. Stalin became involved in the argument over German deliveries but he always restrained his own negotiators. He was determined to maintain good relations with his obstreperous ally for as long as possible. While he was striving for peace, at least until the Red Army was brought up to fighting strength, Hitler continued to prepare his people for war and the new order. He did so in an ominously oblique manner in his annual January 30th address at the Sport Palast. After a rousing introductory speech by Goebbels, he strode rigidly to the platform, raising an arm diffidently in the party salute, amidst wild cheers. He stood silent for a moment and then began speaking. His voice, recalled Shira's replacement at CBS, was first a slow, low rumble. Then, with sudden vehemence, his arms began sweeping in wide gestures. He could have been thinking of Barbarossa and the racial cleansing that would follow when he said, I am convinced that 1941 will be the crucial year of the great new order in Europe, but the enemy he attacked was Britain, leader of the Pluto democracies, which, he charged, were under the control of an international Jewish clique and supported by dissident emigres. These words provided cover for his attack on the Soviet Union while preparing his own people for the final assault on Jewry and, upon hearing Halder's report four days later that German troop strength would be equal to Russia's and far superior in quality, Hitler exclaimed, when Barbarossa commences the world will hold its breath and make no comment. His vision of conquest, in fact, soared beyond the limits of his own continent, on February 17 he ordered preparation of a drive to the heart of Britain's empire, India. This would be accompanied by seizure of the Near East in a pincer movement, on the left from Russia across Iran and on the right from North Africa toward the Suez Canal. While these grandiose plans were primarily designed to force Britain onto the side of Germany, they indicated the extent of Hitler's vaulting aspirations. Russia was as good as one and his restless mind was already seeking new worlds to conquer, new enemies, America and Roosevelt in particular to bring to heel. For a dreamer Hitler could, quite often, be practical. No sooner had he envisaged vast fields of conquest than he began devoting himself to a relatively modest one. The defeat of Italian troops in Albania and Greece had, in his own words, indirectly struck a blow at the belief of our invincibility, that was held by friend and foe alike. Greece, therefore, had to be occupied and order re-established throughout the area before Barbarossa could safely be launched. This was not his sole motivation. Hitler also looked upon Italian failure in the Balkans as a golden opportunity to gain more territory and economic assets. The occupation of Greece, no simple matter, was particularly complicated by geography. Four countries lay between Hitler and his target, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria and Yugoslavia. The first two, virtual German satellites, had been invested by his troops for some months, 
and the third, under considerable pressure, had joined the tripartite pact on the 1st of March. While this gave German troops a clear road to Greece, strategic Yugoslavia remained a military as well as political concern. Its leaders wanted neither German nor Russian intervention in the Balkans and, after veiled threats and vague promises failed to bring them into the Axis, Hitler invited Prince Paul, the Yugoslav regent, to the Berghof so that he could exert his personal influence. Tempted as he was by Hitler's promise to guarantee Yugoslavia territorial integrity, Prince Paul protested that the decision was most difficult for personal reasons, his wife's Greek ancestry, her personal sympathies for England and his own antagonism toward Mussolini. The prince left without giving an answer but three days later, an interminable wait for Hitler, he replied that he was willing to sign the tripartite pact, provided Yugoslavia was not required to lend any military assistance or allow passage of German troops through its territory. This was unsatisfactory but Hitler, controlling his feelings, sent back word that Germany accepted these conditions. This conciliatory offer unexpectedly brought a rebuff. The Yugoslavs could do nothing that might involve them in a war, possibly with America or even Russia. By mid-March it was evident that the Yugoslav government would not yield and the strain on the Führer was visible as he spoke on the 16th at the Memorial Day ceremony in the Berlin War Museum. His face was drawn and haggard, recalled Louis Lochner. His skin was ashy grey, his eyes devoid of their usual luster. Care and worry was stamped on him. But that was not the most striking thing. What amazed me was the matter of fact, uninterested, detached way in which he rattled off his usual platitudes appropriate to such an occasion. He read the brief speech as though it bored him, making no attempt to rouse the millions listening to him over the radio. The next day, the situation in Yugoslavia changed with dramatic suddenness. The Crown Council agreed to sign the Tripartite Pact. This brought a public outcry of indignation and, after three ministers resigned in protest, high-ranking Air Force officers led a revolt. By dawn of March 27 the rebels had overthrown the government and the youthful heir to the throne, Peter, was king. In Berlin that morning, Hitler was congratulating himself on the happy conclusion of the Yugoslav problem. He had just received a message that the local population had been universally most impressed by Yugoslavia's acceptance of the new pact and that the government was entirely master of the situation. Five minutes before noon, as he was preparing himself for an important conference with Japanese Foreign Minister Matsoka, a telegram arrived from Belgrade. When Hitler read that the former members of the Yugoslav government were reportedly under arrest, he first thought it was a joke. Then he was seized with indignation. To be robbed of victory at the last moment was insupportable. This time his rage was genuine. He felt he'd been personally insulted. He shouted an order for military commanders to report at once to the Chancellery, sent an emergency call for Ribbentrop, who was talking with Matt Soker at the Wilhelm Stress, then burst into the conference room where Jodl and Key Eitel were waiting for the daily briefing. Brandishing the telegram, Hitler exclaimed that he was now going to smash Yugoslavia once and for all. Like a lava spurned moments after being accepted, the more he talked the angrier and more excited he became. He vowed he would issue orders for immediate, simultaneous attacks from north and east. Key Eitel protested that such an ambitious operation was impossible. The barbarous deadline could not be postponed since troop movements were already proceeding according to their planned maximum railway capacity program. Furthermore, List's army in Bulgaria was too weak to pit against Yugoslavia and only a fool would rely on help from the Hungarians. That is the very reason why I have called in Braukic and Halder, said Hitler. They would have to find some solution. Now I intend to make a clean sweep of the Balkans, it is time people got to know me better. By ones and twos, Braukic, Halder, Goring, Ribbentrop and their adjutants joined the meeting. All listened in awe as Hitler declared in a harsh and vengeful tone that he was determined to smash Yugoslavia militarily and as a state. To Ribbentrop's protest that they should first confront the Yugoslavs with an ultimatum, Hitler replied acidly, is that how you size up the situation? 
the Yugoslavs would swear black is white. Of course, they say they have no warlike intentions, and when we march into Greece they will stab us in the back. The attack, he exclaimed, must start as soon as possible. Politically it is especially important that the blow against Yugoslavia be carried out with merciless harshness and that the military destruction be done in blitzkrieg style. That would frighten the Turks as well as Greece. Goring's main task was to eliminate the Yugoslav Air Force ground installations before destroying the capital in attacks by waves. Hitler disposed of the hastily summoned Hungarian and Bulgarian ministers with dispatch. In a 15-minute meeting with the former his comment on the revolt in Belgrade was reduced to a quotation, whom the gods would destroy they first make mad. This was followed by a promise, if Hungary helped on this crisis, she would win back the long-coveted Banat area. It was a unique opportunity for Hungary to obtain revisions she might otherwise not get for years. You can believe me that I am not pretending, for I am not saying more than I can be answerable for. The next interview took but five minutes. Hitler told the Bulgarian minister that he was relieved by the events in Yugoslavia. The everlasting uncertainty down there is over, he said and used Macedonia as the bait for continued Bulgarian cooperation with the Axis. The dispensing of our Jess, of other people's property, was abruptly followed by rage. The storm, he exclaimed will burst over Yugoslavia with a rapidity that will dumbfound those gentlemen. With orders for attack issued and two hesitant allies bribed into line, Hitler at last found time that afternoon to see the Japanese envoy. Hitler hoped that America could be kept out of the war and suggested that the best way might be for Japan to seize Singapore. This should be done quickly since another such golden opportunity would not soon occur. And Japan, he added, need have no fear that Russia could counter with an attack in Manchuria in view of the strength of the German army. Matt Soka, a graduate of the University of Oregon, answered slowly and deliberately in English. He was convinced, he said, that the German proposal was the right one, then added, but I can give no firm promise on behalf of Japan at the moment. He hastily assured the visibly disappointed Hitler that he himself was for action. In truth, he was so eager for it that the Japanese army had sent Colonel Yatsugi Nagai along on this trip to see that he made no harsh promises about Singapore. Consequently Matsoka was forced to respond evasively to every mention of the British stronghold. Even when Hermann Goring, after accepting a scroll of Mount Fuji, jokingly promised to come and see the real thing if Japan takes Singapore, the envoy nodded toward the edgy Colonel Nagai and said, you'll have to ask him. Matsoka was not at all reticent about a treaty he hoped to make with Stalin in the near future and was surprised to hear Ribbentrop, who had given him the idea of a grand four-power treaty, say, how can you conclude such a pact at this time? Just remember, the USSR never gives anything for nothing. Nagai took this to be a warning, but Matsoka's enthusiasm could not be damped even when Ambassador Oshima told him in confidence that there was a strong likelihood that Germany and Russia would soon be at war. The meeting with Matsoka was not the end of Hitler's day. He signed Directive No. 25 calling for simultaneous attacks on Yugoslavia and Greece before sitting down at midnight to tell Mussolini about Yugoslavia. Now I do not regard this situation as disastrous, to be sure, he wrote but nevertheless as one which is so difficult that we, for our part, must avoid making any mistakes if we do not want ultimately to imperil our entire position. He had, therefore, taken all necessary measures to meet any developing crisis with the necessary military means. I now urgently request you, Duce, not to carry out any further operations in Albania for the next few days. After this polite reminder not to endanger the situation with another hopeless adventure, he called for absolute secrecy, underlining these words for emphasis. The letter with all its punctilious courtesy emphasized the new relationship between the two men. After the misadventures in Greece and Africa, Mussolini was no longer the senior partner. In the Führer's eyes, he was branded with the unforgivable defect of failure. The list of Hitler's grievances was formidable, 
if debatable, the abortive Grecian campaign had not only encouraged the British to launch a successful offensive in Libya, and discouraged Franco from supporting the Gibraltar operation, but forced Germany to deal with the dissident Yugoslavs at a most inappropriate time. Barbarossa would have to be postponed for at least a month. 5. Although Hitler blamed the delay of Barbarossa on the Yugoslav campaign, the general shortage of equipment for the Wehrmacht, his responsibility, could have been a more determining factor. In any event, he did not regard the postponement as a calamity. Despite annoying dread, I was haunted by the obsession that the Russians might take the offensive. He did not seem perturbed when he summoned his field commanders to the Chancellery to announce a definite date of attack and, more important, deliver a doctrinal lecture on the coming struggle of two opposing ideologies. By 11 a.m. March 30 the senior commanders for Barbarossa, along with their leading staff officers, were gathered in the small cabinet chamber where a speaker's lectern had been set up. More than 200 were seated in long rows according to rank and seniority by the time Hitler entered from the rear. With a shuffling of chairs the assemblage smartly rose, then sat down once Hitler stepped to the rostrum. His mood was grave as he spoke of the military and political situation. The United States could not reach the peak of production and military power for four years. Consequently this was the time to clean up Europe. War with Russia was inevitable he said, and merely to sit back and wait would be disastrous. The attack would begin on June 22nd. It could not be postponed, he said, since no successor would ever again exercise sufficient authority to accept responsibility for unleashing it. He and he alone could stop the Bolshevik steamroller before all Europe succumbed to it. He called for the destruction of the Bolshevik state and the annihilation of the Red Army adding an assurance that victory would be quick and overwhelming. The only problem, he added ominously, was how to deal with the conquered Russians, how to treat prisoners of war and non-combatants. The military sat stiff in their chairs, wondering if they would be called upon to take part in this program. As military professionals most of them had been repelled by Hitler's ruthless measures, after the conquest of Poland, against Polish Jews, intelligentsia clergy and nobility. Their fears were quickened by Hitler's next loud threat, the war against Russia will be such that it cannot be fought in a knightly fashion. This struggle is one of ideologies and racial differences and will have to be conducted with unprecedented, merciless and unrelenting harshness. There was no utterance of protest, any more than there had been in Poland, not even an involuntary gesture of protest. That morning Hitler had put his military leaders to the final humiliating test with his demand that they compromise their honor as warriors. Now they, like so many in Germany who shared his fear and hatred of Jews and Slavs, were reluctant partners in his crusade. Today Lebensraum, which they considered just recompense for the Russian territories won in battle but lost at Versailles, had been relegated to the background and Hitler's real grounds for invasion lay exposed annihilation of Bolshevism, that is, annihilation of the Jews. In the meantime preparations for the Yugoslav Greek invasions were brought to a conclusion. In Belgrade's there were daily patriotic demonstrations, some instigated by local communists carrying out Soviet Balkan policy. Russia, in fact, was so eager to bolster the Yugoslavs against German incursion that she signed a pact with the new government on April 5. This did not daunt Hitler. The following dawn German troops crossed the Yugoslav border in overwhelming force. Bombers began systematically destroying Belgrade in an operation to which Hitler had given a significant code name, punishment. The Soviet leaders, their signature hardly dry on the treaty with Yugoslavia, reacted with striking indifference, relegating the attack on Yugoslavia and Greece to the back pages of Pravda. Mere passing mention was made of the devastating air raids on Belgrade which were continuing around the clock. Hitler warned Goebbels that the entire campaign would take at least two months and this information was passed on to the people. It was based on a gross overestimation of enemy strength. Within a single week German and Hungarian troops marched into a shattered Belgrade which was little more than rubble. In the process of punishment, 17,000 civilians had died. On the 17th the remnants of the Yugoslav army surrendered. 
Ten days later the Grecian campaign was virtually concluded when German tanks rumbled into Athens. Twenty-nine German divisions had been transported into the battle zones over primitive roads and rail systems at an extravagant cost of energy, fuel and time. Of this huge force, only ten divisions saw action for more than six days. A sledgehammer had been used to kill mosquitoes. It was this shocking failure of German intelligence which was more responsible for the delay of Barbarossa than Mussolini. Hitler's dismay at the cost of the Balkan invasion was more than mitigated by a startling development in North Africa. With only three divisions at his disposal, General Erwin Rommel burst across Cyrenaica within a few miles of Egypt. This triumph, which surprised Hitler as much as the enemy, compromised Britain's hold on the entire eastern Mediterranean. It also damaged British prestige and persuaded Stalin to maintain good relations with the Germans despite provocations. Besides shutting his eyes to their aggressions in the Balkans, the Soviet leader persistently ignored the growing rumors that Hitler was planning to invade his own country. Warnings had already come from numerous sources, including the U.S. State Department. Foreign diplomats in Moscow talked openly of an imminent clash, thus, their Jewish wife of the American ambassador Steinhardt, reported a German diplomat to Berlin, remarked that she would like to be out of Moscow before the troops entered it. For months the Soviet intelligence service itself had been predicting the attack. But Stalin did not trust his own informants and his paranoia increased with the volume of reports. Convinced that Hitler would not be stupid enough to attack Russia without first neutralizing England, he imagined these were rumors manufactured by the capitalist West, which hoped to come between him and Hitler. He wrote and read ink on one alarming report from a Czech agent, this information is a British provocation. Find out where it comes from and punish the culprit. Marshal Yeremenko confirmed Stalin's irrational suspicions in his memoirs, that was why he failed to authorize all urgent or decisive defense measures along the frontier, for fear that this would serve the Hitlerites as a pretext to believe the rumors since his own hope was for the capitalists and Nazis to destroy each other. In any event, he wanted to avoid provoking Hitler into an attack before the Red Army was fully armed. He was equally anxious to placate Japan. He treated Foreign Minister Matsoka, fresh from Berlin, as an honored guest, making a public show of his delight when a neutrality pact was signed. At the celebration party in the Kremlin, it came on the day Belgrade fell, Stalin personally brought plates of food to the Japanese envoys, embraced them, kissed them and danced around. The treaty was a coup for his diplomacy, convincing proof that he could disregard rumors of a German attack on Russia. Certainly Hitler would never have permitted Japan to conclude this agreement if he had any such notion. Stalin was in such a good humor that he followed the Japanese delegation to the station platform for a final tipsy goodbye. He kissed General Nagai, then, encompassing the diminutive Matsoka in a bear hug, gave him several affectionate smacks. There is nothing to fear in Europe, he said, now that there is a Japan-Soviet neutrality pact. A few minutes later, as the Japanese train moved off, he threw an arm around German Ambassador von der Schulenberg. We must remain friends, he said, and you must now do everything to that end. He turned to a colonel, checked to make sure he too was a German, and roared out, we shall remain friends with you, in any event. He was probably referring to the numerous flights of German planes over Russian territory. In the past two weeks alone there had been fifty such incursions. Two days after embracing Schulenberg, however, Stalin was spurred to action by the emergency landing of a German plane almost a hundred miles inside the Soviet Union, aboard were found a camera, unexposed rolls of film and a torn topographical map of the districts of the USSR the Soviets lodged a formal complaint with Berlin adding that 80 other violations of Soviet airspace had occurred since the end of March. Still it was a mild protest and Stalin persisted in ignoring a new flood of warnings, the latest from British Ambassador Cripps, who predicted Hitler would attack on June 22.3. While everyone in the German Foreign Office suspected an attack on Russia might be imminent, it was not until now that Hitler told Ribbentrop of Barbarossa.
the unhappy foreign minister wanted to try one more diplomatic approach to Moscow but Hitler refused to allow any further demarker. He forbade Ribbentrop to discuss the matter with anyone, and then assured Ambassador von der Sulenberg in Moscow, I do not intend a war against Russia. Two days later Hitler again confirmed the attack date, the one Crips had mentioned, June 22. There was no doubt that Germany was entering this contest with the most powerful armed force in the world. Yet she had no valid ally. Japan was on the other side of the world, Italy was a liability, Spain was intransigent, and Vichy France was unreliable. Hitler's alliances had been diminished by victory. His easy conquests had made all his friends, including little ones like Yugoslavia, Hungary and Romania, uneasy. His only strength was the way Macht and reliance on force was fatal for any conqueror. Wars are won by politics, not by arms. Napoleon had learned this hard lesson from the British, who had a tradition of losing battles and winning wars. They had lost the battle against Hitler on the continent but had already won the battle for their dominions and the battle for American aid. Hitler's only chance for victory in the East was an alliance with those millions in the Soviet Union who hated Stalin but, unless he followed the advice of the Rosenborg group to treat them liberally, he would not only lose his last chance for a genuine grand alliance but turn potential allies into relentless enemies. 6. Although Hitler's military leaders had first been appalled by the thought of invading Russia, they now almost universally shared his conviction that victory would come quickly. The consensus was that the campaign would be successfully completed within three months and Field Marshal von Braukic had just drastically reduced this estimate. After up to four weeks of major battle, he predicted, the war would degenerate into a mopping up operation against minor resistance. The hard-headed Jodl concurred and curtly silenced Wallimont who questioned the categorical statement that the Russian colossus will be proved to be a pig's bladder, prick it and it will burst. The Führer, according to General Guderian, had succeeded in infecting his immediate military entourage with his own baseless optimism. The OKW and OKH were so serenely confident of victory before winter set in that winter clothing had only been prepared for every fifth man in the army. There were, of course, a few dissidents in high places. From the beginning Ribbentrop and Admiral Redder openly opposed Barbarossa. Key Itel, too, had serious reservations but he had learned to keep any objections to himself. There was also opposition within Hitler's inner circle. Rudolf Hess, second in line after Goring to succeed the Führer, heartily approved the theory of Lebensraum but opposed attacking Russia so long as the war with England continued. The Bolsheviks alone, he confided to Schwerin von Krosik, were profiting by this unfortunate conflict. Determined to resolve the question of how to neutralize Britain, he had met with Professor Karl Hauschofer, the geopolitician, in the Grunewald Forest the previous summer. Until two in the morning they discussed the best means of negotiating a peace. How chauffeur suggested a secret rendezvous with some prominent Englishman in a neutral city. From this modest beginning sprang an adventure that would intrigue the world. Excited by the prospect of a secret mission, Hess took the plan to Hitler, hoping perhaps that this would restore his own waning influence. Despite Hess's lofty rank, Hitler had not taken him seriously for over a year. I hope he never becomes my successor, he reportedly told Hanf Stengel. I wouldn't know whom to be more sorry for, Hess or the party. But his affection for mine Hess ale his second Kubizek, had not diminished and he gave the deputy Führer grudging approval to make inquiries through Albrecht Hauschofer, the professor's elder son, who worked in the foreign office. Young Hauschofer, a member of the resistance for several years diffidently suggested to Hess that the best possibility would be a meeting with his own closest English friend, the Duke of Hamilton, since he had ready access to Churchill and the King. Hess left the meeting with enthusiasm but Albrecht wrote his father that the whole thing is a fool's errand. At the same time he decided to do what he could, as a patriotic German, to make peace with England. He wrote the Duke of Hamilton proposing a meeting with Hess in Lisbon. He signed the message and sent it, via Hess's brother, to a Mrs. V. Roberts in Lisbon. 
She transmitted it to England but the letter was intercepted by the British censor. He turned it over to the Secret Service, which eventually instructed Rough Intelligence to take appropriate action. So much time had passed by then that Hess decided to act on his own without the knowledge of the Haushofers or Hitler. His plan was to embark on the mission himself, doing so in a dramatic manner that would strike the English as a sporting gesture. He would fly over the estate of the Duke of Hamilton, land by parachute and secretly conduct negotiations under a false name. He was an expert flyer, a flight officer in the First World War, the winner in 1934 of the hazardous air race around the Zugspitz, Germany's highest peak, near Garmis. A solo flight over enemy lines to a remote area of Scotland would surely appeal to young Hamilton, the first to fly over Mount Everest. I was confronted by a very hard decision. Hess later told interrogators. I do not think I could have arrived at my final choice unless I had continually kept before my eyes the vision of an endless line of children's coffins with weeping mothers behind them, both English and German, and another line of coffins of mothers with mourning children. Hess was convinced that only by such an original stratagem could the Führer's dream of a coalition between Germany and England be effectuated. If he failed, it would not involve Hitler, if he succeeded he would give the Führer credit for the scheme. Admittedly the chances were slim that he would even reach Scotland alive, perhaps ten to one. But the prize was worth the hazard. Hess was sure that Hitler would welcome a novel peace venture but would never allow him to risk his life in the attempt. Hadn't he already refused to let Hess fly at the front? Therefore secrecy was essential. It was the decision of a naive, not too bright acolyte who, according to Adjutant Weedman, was the Führer's most devoted and dedicated subordinate. A painfully shy man whose greatest ambition was to further his master's career, Hess hid behind tightly stern lips, heavy jowls, fanatic eyes and a fierce pair of eyebrows. But this was no Teutonic Oliver Cromwell. Once he smiled the severity vanished. It was this Parsifal who conjured up the dream of flight to the enemy this man of culture without judgment, this completely devoted servant who convinced himself that he was carrying out the true will of his master. If it was a woolly scheme, it was organized and prepared with exquisite efficiency. He persuaded Willie Messerschmidt, the aeronautical engineer, to let him borrow an ME-110 two-man plane for practice flights, then criticized its limited range. It should, he said have two auxiliary tanks of 700 liters fitted on each wing. After reluctantly making this change, Messerschmitt was talked into adding special radio equipment. Then came training under the excuse of recreation, and after 20 flights Hess felt he had mastered the modified plane. In the meantime, contrary to wartime regulations, he had acquired a new leather flying suit, persuaded Bohr, Hitler's personal pilot, to get him a secret map of forbidden air zones, and installed a new radio in his home on the outskirts of Munich. It was quite possible, he later wrote his wife from prison, that I became not quite normal. The flight and its purpose had taken hold of me with the force of a fixed idea. Anything else, I seemed to see and hear only partly. He lived and moved in those early days of May in a world of instruments, piston pressures, detachable petrol containers, auxiliary air pumps, cooling temperatures and radio bearings. His secretary, Hildegard Fath, noticed that Hess often did not listen to what she was saying. His wife was equally aware of his preoccupation. What surprised her even more was the unusual amount of time he spent with their four-year-old son, who bore Hitler's secret name, Wolf. Surprising too, in view of Hess's reluctance to pose for pictures, was his own recent suggestion that photographs of father and son be taken. Hess rose early on the morning of May 10, a Saturday, and, upon learning that the weather forecast was good, he made arrangements for the flight. Never had he been more gallant to his wife. After tea he kissed her hand and then stood gravely at the door of the nursery with an air of one deep in thought and almost hesitating. She asked him when he was returning and, told it would be Monday at the latest, she bluntly said, I cannot believe it. You will not come back as soon as that. 
She guessed he was bound for a meeting with someone like Batain but he feared that she had guessed the truth. He turned hot and cold in turns and, before she could say anything more, he dashed into the nursery to take a last look at their slumbering son. At 6 p.m., after giving his adjutant a letter for Hitler, Hess took off from the Augsburg airport and headed for the North Sea. Abruptly, contrary to the weather report, the cloud cover vanished and for a moment he thought of turning back. But he kept going and found England covered by a veil of mist. Seeking shelter, he dived down with full throttle, at first unaware that a spitfire was on his tail. Outdistancing the pursuer, he hedge hopped over the dark countryside at more than 450 miles an hour, narrowly skimming trees and houses. Bohr had always claimed Hess was the type of pilot who liked to fly through open hangar doors and it was in this barnstormer's spirit that he aimed at the mountain looming ahead. It was his guidepost and he literally climbed up the steep slope and slid down the other side, always keeping within a few yards of the ground. Just before 11 p.m. he turned east and picked out a railway and small lake which he remembered were just south of the Duke's residence. He climbed to 6,000 feet, a safe height from which to parachute, and switched off the motor. He opened the hatch, then suddenly realized he had overlooked one step in his elaborate training, I had never asked how to jump, I thought it was too simple. As the ME-110 plummeted, he recalled a friend mentioning that a plane should be on its back. After a half roll, he found himself upside down, held inside by centrifugal force. He began to see stars, just before passing out, he thought, soon the crash must come. Regaining consciousness, he saw the speed gauge indicate zero. He flung himself out of the plane, pulled at the parachute ring. Fortunately, while unconscious, he had automatically brought the plane out of its semi-looping curve to finish almost perpendicular on its tail. And so, to his amazement, he found himself safely in midair. He hit the ground, stumbled forward and blacked out a second time. He was found by a farmer, marched off to the home guard and brought to a barracks in Glasgow. Insisting that he was one Oberleutnant and Alfred Horn, he asked to see the Duke of Hamilton. It was not until Sunday morning that his letter was delivered to Hitler at the Berghof. While Engel was making his daily report, Martin Bormann's brother Albert broke in to announce that Hesse's adjutant wanted to see the Führer on a very urgent matter. Albert was driven out with an angry can't you see I'm in the middle of a military report and do not wish to be disturbed. A minute later Albert, face ashen, sidled in again. But this time he would not be put off. Insisting the matter was important and possibly dangerous. He extended the letter from Hess. Hitler put on his glasses and began to read indifferently but as soon as he saw the words my Führer, when you received this letter I shall be in England he dropped into a chair and shouted so loudly he could be heard downstairs, oh, my god, my god. He has flown to England. He hastily read of the technical difficulties of the flight and that Hesse's goal was to further the Führer's own aim of alliance with England but he had kept the flight secret since he knew the Führer would have forbidden it. And if, my Führer, this project, which I admit has but very little chance of success, ends in failure and the fates decide against me, this can have no detrimental results either for you or for Germany, it will always be possible for you to deny all responsibility. Simply say I am crazy. Chalk white, the Führer ordered Engel to get the Reichsmarschall on the phone. As soon as he was located near Nuremberg, Hitler shouted, Goring come here immediately. He yelled at Albert Bormann to fetch his brother and Ribbentrop, placed Hesse's hapless adjutant under arrest, and began pacing the room angrily. When Martin Bormann arrived out of breath, Hitler demanded to know if Hess could possibly reach England in an ME-110. The question was answered by the famous ace of the Great War, Luftwaffe General Eudt. Never, he said, not with its limited range and the Führer muttered, I hope he falls into the sea. As the day wore on, Hitler's anger developed into a rage. Private guests, confined to the upper floor, wondered in fear what had happened, while Hitler agitatedly stalked his study trying to work out a believable explanation for the public. 
Would the Japanese and Italians suspect that Germany was after a separate peace? Would his own soldiers fight less hard? Worst of all, had Hess revealed the plans for Barbarossa? After many drafts a communique was finally drawn up explaining that Hess had commandeered a plane against orders and disappeared. It was assumed he had crashed. Our letter left behind unfortunately showed traces of a mental disturbance which justifies the fear that Hess was a victim of hallucinations. Fräulein Farth heard a broadcast of this announcement while dining. Its tone was so unfriendly that she thought, is this the thanks for his lifetime devotion? She phoned Hess's brother, Alfred, and they mulled over the possibilities. Frau Hess was watching a movie with chauffeurs, servants and adjutants when she was called out by the most junior adjutant. Distraught, he begged her to put on her things. It was such a senseless request that swift dread crossed her mind. But upon learning that it was only a radio broadcast presuming that her husband was dead, she angrily replied, nonsense. She doubted that anything tragic had occurred and put in a priority call to the Berghoff, intending to speak to the Führer. But she got Bormann, who said he had absolutely no information. Knowing her husband's assistant as she did, she did not believe him. She phoned Alfred Hess in Berlin. He too could not believe Rudolf was dead. No announcement had yet come from England even though Hess, admitting his true identify to the Duke of Hamilton, told about his mission of peace and how he and all Brecht how chauffeur had tried to arrange a meeting in Lisbon. Hamilton rushed off to see Churchill, who said, well, Hess or no Hess, I am going to see the Marx Brothers. Only after the film ended did the Prime Minister interrogate Hamilton thoroughly. A few hours following the German announcement that Hess was missing, the British finally revealed that he had arrived in England. No details were released. German newspapers were already putting out a reprint of the radio broadcast but the news from London made it necessary to concoct a fuller official version. This one, published on Tuesday the 13th, acknowledged the landing of the deputy Führer in Britain before enlarging on his mental state. As is well known in party circles, Hess had undergone severe physical suffering for some years. Recently he had sought relief to an increasing extent in various methods practiced by mesmerists and astrologers, etc. An attempt is also being made to determine to what extent these persons are responsible for bringing about the condition of mental distraction which led him to take this step. Such an admission caused confusion in Germany that extended to the highest levels. Goebbels told his staff, our job is for the moment to keep a stiff upper lip, not to react, not to explain anything, not to enter into polemics. The affair will be fully cleared up in the course of the afternoon and I shall issue detailed instructions from the Ober Salzburg this afternoon. He tried to assure his people that the Hess flight, admittedly embarrassing at the moment, would be seen in the future as a mere dramatic episode. However, there are no grounds for letting our wings droop in any way or for thinking that we shall never live this down. From this meeting Goebbels flew to Berchtesgaden to attend an emergency convocation of Gauletters and Reichsliters. After Bormann had read aloud the Hess letter, the Führer appeared. Hans Frank had not seen him for some time and was shocked at his disturbed appearance. At first he spoke about Hess very softly, hesitatingly and with a deep sense of melancholy, but soon his tone changed to one of anger. The flight, he said, was sheer insanity. Hess is first of all a deserter and if I ever catch him, he will pay for this as any ordinary traitor. Furthermore, it seems to me that this step was strongly influenced by astrological cliques which Hess kept around him. It is time, therefore, to put an end to all these stargazers. For because of this insanity our position is made much more difficult though not shaken, particularly my belief that the victory in this Jewish war against National Socialism belongs to our unblemished flag. His listeners had already heard stories of Hess's pet lion, as well as his interest in homeopathic medicine and astrology, and were prepared to believe he was mentally disturbed. Yet they wondered, as ordinary citizens did, why then had Hitler retained him in high office? It was significant that the few mentioned not a word to his party leaders about the coming invasion of Russia and his fear that Hess might have revealed it to the English. 
he need not have worried. Under the interrogation of Hamilton and Sir Ivone Kirkpatrick, Hess insisted there was no foundation for the rumors now being spread that Hitler is contemplating an early attack on Russia. What he wanted to talk about was peace with England. He had come without Hitler's permission, he said, to convince responsible persons that since England could not win the war, the wisest course was to make peace now. As soon as Albrecht Hauschofer learned of the flight he hurried to his father's study. And with such fools we make politics. He exclaimed. The English would never deal with such a man under such ridiculous circumstances. His father sadly agreed it was a terrible sacrifice all in vain. Young Hauschofer was ordered to Ober Salzburg, placed under guard and given pen and paper to write a report for the Führer, who refused to see him. Entitled English Connections and the Possibility of Utilizing Them, it revealed as much of the truth as possible without implicating friends in the resistance. Albrecht told of his friendship with the Duke of Hamilton and of the letter he had written at Hesse's behest, adding that he himself would be indispensable in case of future negotiations with the English because of his many connections. This report persuaded Hitler not to act hastily. He ordered Hauschofer transported to the Gestapo prison in Berlin on the Prince Albrechtsterus for further interrogation. His father was spared but drew Hitler's special rage. The Jewish tainted Professor His Hess on his conscience. He said and reproached himself for not taking steps earlier to tear apart that whole Munich breed and silence them. Others connected with Hess were arrested, his brother Alfred, adjutants, orderlies, secretaries and chauffeurs. Ilse Hess was not imprisoned but Martin Bormann did his utmost to humiliate her. He also put as much distance as possible between himself and his former chief. He changed the prenomena of his two children, Rudolf and Ilse, named after the Hesses, and appointed more appropriate godparents. Selected as Hess's successor, he eliminated everything that reminded him of his former employer. All photographs of Hess, books and official literature bearing his picture were destroyed. He even attempted to confiscate the Hess home but this was too much even for Hitler. He refused to sign the eviction notice. The guests at the Berghof were released from the top floor but no one dared speak of the flight to England, not after someone innocently asked why Hess's adjutant was not at the table and Bormann replied that he was in prison, and he will not come out again. Typically, commented Engel in his diary, the only one who walks around this beehive expectantly is Bormann, we all agree that he considers this his hour. In England the government had decided not to make public the interrogations of Hess, it would be best to keep the Nazis guessing. Hess was transported secretly to the Tower of London during the night of May 16th to become the world's most famous prisoner of war. A few days later A.P. Herbert summarized in verse the Englishman's view of Hess. He is insane. He is a dove of peace. He is Messiah. He is Hitler's niece. He is the one clean honest man they've got. He is the worst assassin of the lot. He has a mission to preserve mankind. He's non-alcoholic. He was a blind. He has been dotty since the age of ten. But all the time was top of Hitler's men. Stalin was far more perturbed by the Hess flight than Mussolini who, according to his son-in-law, was glad of it because this will have the effect of bringing down German stock, even with the Italians. Those in the Kremlin, particularly in light of the invasion rumors, suspected the British were really intriguing with Hitler. New regulations were imposed. Travel outside of Moscow by foreigners was forbidden except in rare cases. Irate as he was, Hitler confided to several intimates that he respected Hess for his willingness to sacrifice himself on such a dangerous mission. On reflection he realized that his deputy had made the hazardous flight for him. Hitler did not believe that Hess was mad, only foolish not to have seen what a disastrous political mistake he was making. This more sober judgment was corroborated some months later when Hitler consoled Frau Bruckmann on the death of her husband. We all have our graves and grow more and more lonely, but we have to overcome and go on living, my dear gracious lady. I, too, am now deprived of the only two human beings among all those around me to whom I have been truly and inwardly attached. 
Dr. Tot, builder of the West Wall and Autobahn, is dead and Hess has flown away from me. That is what you say now and to me, reportedly replied Frau Bruckmann, who had a reputation for frankness, but what does your official press say? Year after year we all go to Bayreuth and are deeply moved, but who understands the real meaning? When our unhappy age at last produces a man who, like the Valkyrie, fulfills the deeper meaning of Wotan's command, seeks to carry out your most sacred wish with heroism and self-sacrifice, then he is described as insane. She expected the Führer would retort sharply but he remained quiet and thoughtful. Is it not enough, what I have said to you, and to you alone, about my real feeling? He finally said. Is that not enough for you? As for Hess, it was enough that he had done his utmost. He was glad, he wrote his wife from the Tower of London, that he had been impelled to fly to England, an urge which he described as the obstinate dragon that would not let him go. True, I achieved nothing. I was not able to stop the madness of the war and could not prevent what I saw coming. I could not save the people but it makes me happy to think that I tried to do it. 5. 7. The day after learning about Hess, Hitler issued two repressive decrees. One declared that Russian civilians taking arms against the Wehrmacht in the coming invasion should be considered outlaws and shot without trial. The other empowered him to carry out special tasks which result from the struggle which has to be carried out between two opposing political systems. He was to act independently of the Wehrmacht under his own responsibility. There would be no interference from any source and the highest personalities of the government and party were to be forbidden entrance into the occupied Russian areas which would be cleansed of Jews and other troublemakers by special SS units of assassins known as Einsatzgruppen, special action groups. Both directives troubled Alfred Rosenberg, who had recently been appointed commissioner for the central control of questions connected with the East European region. Abate himself. He believed the Soviet people should be treated as anti-Stalinists rather than as enemies of the Reich. He assured Hitler that they would welcome the Germans as liberators from Bolshevik Stalinist tyranny and could be trusted with a certain amount of self-rule. Each state would have to be treated differently. The Ukraine, for instance, would be an independent state in alliance with Germany but Caucasia must be ruled by a German plenipotentiary. Convinced that a heavy-handed policy in the East would destroy the spirit of Lebensraum, Rosenberg submitted a memorandum to Hitler objecting to the two directives. How could one possibly build a civil administration in the occupied areas without using the Soviet civil commissars and officials now administering them? He recommended that only senior and very senior officials should be liquidated. Hitler gave no definite answer. Characteristically, he was content to take no active part in the power struggle between Himmler and Rosenberg that would surely begin once the Wehrmacht advanced into the Soviet Union. Bormann, the rising star in the National Socialist hierarchy, would be a decisive factor in this contest. He had already joined forces with Himmler. In the meantime, final preparations for Barbarossa continued. Admiral Reder informed Hitler on May 22 that he would cease delivering important materials to Russia. Comparatively few shipments had, in fact, been sent to the Soviet Union, while many had come from the East. In addition to almost 1,500,000 tons of grain, the Soviets had delivered 100,000 tons of cotton, 2 million tons of petroleum products, 1,500,000 tons of timber. 140,000 tons of manganese and 25,000 tons of chromium. Despite suspicions over the Hess flight, Stalin was still so eager to appease Hitler that he authorized further shipments by express trains from the Far East of other important raw materials, such as copper. On the same day a meeting with Molotov reinforced Ambassador von der Schulenberg's earlier conjecture that the recent consolidation of power by Stalin merely meant that the foreign policy of the Soviet Union was completely in his hands. In hopes of staving off Barbarossa, Schulenberg reported that the Soviet attitude toward Germany had improved markedly in the past few weeks. But Hitler was not to be dissuaded by his diplomats any more than he was by his naval chief. On May 30, 
three days after German paratroopers wrested the strategic island of Crete from the British, Admiral Reder attempted to turn Hitler's attention from the east by urging him to mount a substantial offensive against Egypt and Suez. Now, he urged, was the time to strike. With reinforcements General Rommel could score a decisive victory. This stroke, he said, would be more deadly to the British Empire than the capture of London. Hitler was beyond such advice. Barbarossa was in motion and nothing short of catastrophe could postpone it. His greatest concern was security. Haunted by the mishap in Belgium a year earlier, he still had not informed Mussolini of the invasion. When he met his senior ally at the Brenner Pass on June 2nd, he talked at length of his determination to force British capitulation, this time by U-boats, of Hesse, and of the situation in the Balkans. Not a word did he utter about Barbarossa, not only for the sake of secrecy but because Il Duce had already cautioned him in explicit terms not to attack Russia, which had become a running sore to Germany. The roads and rail lines leading east were dense with traffic as the final phase of preparations for Barbarossa began. On June 6 Hitler summoned Japanese ambassador Oshima to Berchtesgaden and revealed that large numbers of troops were being sent east because of Soviet border violations. Under such circumstances, he concluded with a confidence that impressed his listener, war might be unavoidable between us. To Oshima this was tantamount to a declaration of war and he immediately warned Tokyo that an invasion of Russia was imminent. It was a significant day for the Fuhrer. He legalized his threat to wage ruthless ideological warfare by instructing Field Marshal von Braukic to issue a directive to liquidate captured Soviet commissars as bearers of an ideology diametrically opposed to National Socialism. His commander-in-chief objected violently until Hitler curtly said, I cannot demand that my generals should understand my orders. But I do demand that they follow them. The terms of this directive could not be misinterpreted. These commissars are the originators of barbarous, Asiatic methods of warfare, and they must therefore be treated with all possible severity and dispatch. Whether captured during battle or while offering resistance, they must be shot at once. This ideologically motivated order was to be executed by the Wehrmacht together with Himmler's Einsatzgruppen and its issuance by OKW was more than another victory for Hitler over the military. It bound them to his political program and made them unwilling accomplices, along with the SS, in his grand plan of the future. To achieve this goal he must first conquer the Red Army and to do this he needed the help of those states bordering the Soviet Union that could be trusted, and that, sharing his own fear and hatred of Bolshevism, had accounts of their own to settle with Stalin. The Finns, forced to accept harsh terms to end their brief, bloody war with Russia, needed little urging to join the crusade, and on June 8 the first elements of a German infantry division landed in Finland. Two days later Field Marshal Mannerheim ordered a partial mobilization. Hitler also trusted Romania and on June 11 he intimated to General Ian Antonsku that he had decided to attack Russia. He was by no means asking Antonsku for assistance in such a war, he said, and merely expected of Romania that in her own interest she do everything to facilitate a successful conclusion of this conflict. Stirred by visions of spoils and military glory, the Romanian dictator hastily declared that he wanted to be in on the fight from the first day. 8. On June 14 Soviet secret agent Sorge dispatched a definite warning from Tokyo, war begins June 22. But Stalin still chose not to credit this or similar alarms. He had reassured himself, despite qualms, that the war could not possibly start until 1942 and that very day ordered publication of a task communique ridiculing the numerous rumors of war. All this is nothing but clumsy propaganda by forces hostile to the USSR and Germany and interested in an extension of the war. This statement was so reassuring that there was an easing of tension in the forward positions of the Red Army. In Berlin selected combat officers were arriving at the Chancellery for a special briefing and luncheon. By now each one had digested his own orders and become reconciled, if grudgingly to the inhumane methods Hitler had imposed on the enemy. At 2 p.m. there was a break for lunch and this, unlike so many other meals at the Chancellery, 
was mellow and relaxed. Nor was the atmosphere of camaraderie dispelled when Hitler ascended to the podium and began a persuasive lecture on the need to launch Barbarossa. The collapse of Russia, he said, would lead to England's surrender. A final signal went out on June 17 confirming 3 a.m., Sunday, June 22, as zero hour. That day a German sergeant, who had struck an officer and feared execution, crossed into Soviet lines to surrender. He revealed that the German attack would begin before dawn on the 22nd. Frontline officers who learned of the report were disturbed but their commanding general's reaction was, no use beating an alarm. As zero hour approached, Hitler appeared calm and confident. On Friday the 20th he sent for Frank, formerly his personal lawyer and now Governor General of German-occupied Poland. We are facing a war with the Soviet Union, he said and, when the other reacted with consternation, added, calm yourself. He promised that the German attack units would soon pass through Frank's area and then waved off his attempt to make another objection. I understand your problem very well. But I must insist that you come to an understanding with Himmler. He was referring to their conflicting concepts of treating the occupied areas. I can tolerate no more differences, you two must come to an understanding. That evening Hitler's proclamation to the troops was secretly distributed and, under cover of darkness, assault units began moving forward. By dawn of the 21st more than 3 million men were in attack position. In London Crips, home for consultations, was sounding another warning that Hitler was about to invade Russia. Well, he told Soviet Ambassador Maisky, we have reliable information that this attack will take place tomorrow, the 22nd of June, or at the very latest the 29th of June. You know that Hitler always attacks on Sundays. Maisky sent an urgent cipher message to Moscow. At last Stalin sanctioned an alert for the armed forces. He also instructed his ambassador in Berlin to present a verbal note to Ribbentrop vigorously objecting to the 180 German overflights since April, which assumed a systematic and intentional character. There was tension at the Bendelustras as the clock neared 1.30 pm, the final moment the attack could be called off. No word came from the Chancellery. Barbarossa was on. At the Chancellery Hitler was trying to explain to Mussolini why he was launching Barbarossa, Duce. He wrote. I am writing this letter to you at a moment when months of anxious deliberations and continuous nerve-wracking waiting are ending in the hardest decision of my life. The concentration of Soviet forces at the Rye border, he said, was tremendous, and time was on the side of the enemy. I have therefore, after constantly racking my brains, finally reached the decision to cut the noose before it can be drawn tight. He made no criticism of Italy's disastrous ventures in Greece and Africa nor hinted at other grievances. He maintained a tone of respect, approaching supplication, throughout and ended the letter almost as if he were in the confessional, the partnership with the Soviet Union, in spite of the complete sincerity of the efforts to bring about a final conciliation, was nevertheless soft and very irksome to me for in some way or other it seemed to me to be a break with my whole origin, my concepts, and my former obligations. I am happy now to be relieved of these mental agonies. In Moscow Molotov had just summoned Ambassador von der Sielenberg. The foreign commissar wanted to add weight to the note verbale which his ambassador in Berlin had not yet been able to deliver to Ribbentrop. There are a number of indications, he told Sielenberg that the German government is dissatisfied with the Soviet government. Rumors are even current that a war is impending between Germany and the Soviet Union. It was an embarrassing situation and all Sulenberg could do was promise to transmit the question to Berlin. He returned to his office as ignorant as Molotov that an attack was coming in a few hours. One of the Eastern Front commanders was reading out Hitler's exhortation to the troops. Weighed down for many months by grave anxieties, compelled to keep silent, I can at last speak openly to you, my soldiers. He told of the Russian build-up on the German frontier, of the numerous border violations. That was why they had been brought up to the greatest front in world history along with allies from Finland and Romania. German soldiers. 
you are about to join battle, a hard and crucial battle. The destiny of Europe, and future of the German Reich, the existence of our nation now lie in your hands alone. All along the tortuous 930 mile front, from the Baltic to the Black Sea, three million men listened and believed. With fear and expectation they huddled in their positions. It was the shortest night of the year, the summer solstice, but it seemed endless to those waiting in the pale light for the command to attack. Just before midnight the Moscow-Berlin Express rumbled over the frontier bridge into German territory. It was followed by a long freight train filled with grain. The last delivery Stalin would make to his ally, Adolf Hitler. In Berlin that evening there was an air of expectation. The international journalists were gathered at the foreign press club in the face and stress, hoping to get some information from a group of foreign office officials, but as midnight approached with no official announcement the newsmen began to leave for home. At the chancellery there was such unusual activity that even those like Hitler's press chief, Dietrich, who knew nothing of Barbarossa, felt sure that some tremendous action against Russia was in progress. Hitler was the personification of confidence. In three months at the latest, he told one adjutant, there will be a collapse on the part of the Russians such as the world has never before seen. But this was only a sham. He could not close his eyes that night any more than he could on the eve of the invasion of the West. At 3 a.m., June 22, exactly a year after the surrender of France at Kampkn, German infantrymen moved forward. Fifteen minutes later flame and smoke burst out all along the eastern front. The pale night sky was turned to day by the flash of guns. Barbarossa, long a dream, was reality. But its creator was already nagged by concern. The five-week delay caused by the Yugoslav venture loomed more ominously. Being of historic bent, perhaps Hitler recalled that on that same day in June 129 years before Napoleon had crossed the Neman River on his way to Moscow. Fifteen minutes before zero hour Ambassador von Bismarck delivered Hitler's long letter to Cheno, who immediately telephoned Il Duce. Mussolini was incensed as much by the ungodly hour as by having been kept uninformed. Not even I disturb my servants at night, he grumbled to his son-in-law, but the Germans make me jump out of bed at any hour without the least consideration. In Moscow Schulenberg was en route to the Kremlin with an accusation that the Soviet Union was about to fall on Germany's back. Consequently the Führer had ordered the Wehrmacht to oppose this threat with all the means at its disposal. Molotov listened silently to a solemn reading of the statement, then said bitterly, it is war. Your aircraft have just bombarded some ten open villages. Do you believe that we deserve that? At the Wilhelmstrasse Ribbentrop finally sent word that he would see the Russian ambassador at 4 a.m. Never before had Schmidt seen his chief so excited. Pacing up and down the room like a caged animal, Ribbentrop kept repeating, the Führer is absolutely right to attack Russia now. It seemed, thought Schmidt, as if he were trying to reassure himself. The Russians would certainly themselves attack us, if we did not do so now. At exactly 4 a.m. Soviet Ambassador Dikinozov entered, right hand innocently extended. Ribbentrop interrupted his attempt to relay the Soviet grievances. That is not the question now he said and announced that the Soviet government's hostility had compelled the right to take military countermeasures. I regret that I can say nothing further, he said, especially as I myself have come to the conclusion that, in spite of serious endeavors, I have not succeeded in establishing reasonable relations between our two countries. Quickly regaining his composure, Dikonosov expressed his own regret at the course of events laying the entire blame on the non-cooperative attitude of the Germans. He rose, bowed perfunctorily, and left the room without offering Ribbentrop another handshake. Correspondents all over Berlin were being wakened for a 6 a.m. press conference at the Foreign Office. Several heard the news en route to the Wilhelmstrasse from outdoor loudspeakers as a message from the Führer was broadcast, People of Germany. National Socialists the hour has come. Oppressed by grave cares, doomed to months of silence, I can at last speak frankly. 
He told of the machinations of Russia and England to crush the Axis with the aid of American supplies. I therefore decided to day to lay the fate and future of the German Reich in the hands of our soldiers. May God help us above all in this fight. One after the war the Marquis de Valdiglesias, in the presence of Franco, asked General Vigon, a close friend of Canaries, if it was true that the Admiral had worked against Spanish interests. Franco lunged from his chair. No, no, he exclaimed, Canaries was an excellent friend of Spain. Perhaps, observed the Marquis, he was a closer friend of Spain than his own country. At this point, recalled Valdiglesias, the Cordillo's extreme excitement confirmed my impression that this was true. To this was known by the British ambassador to Spain, Sir Samuel Hoare, and others in the diplomatic community but it is extremely doubtful that Hitler, who had recently complained that Franca treated him like a little haggling Jew, had been informed of this by his own diplomats, who had also hidden from him the fact that Molotov's wife was Jewish. 3. For some time members of the Ultra Team had been attempting to relay vital information to the Soviets without revealing the source. For this purpose, recalled Hutrever Roper, we had a special liaison officer in Moscow. But such was the Russian distrust that he was never able to make contact with his Russian opposite number. I remember that he once told me that the nearest he had got to him was when the Russian, a general, waved to him in the opera. We were luckier with the Russians in London, said Asher Lee, and gave them the guts but not the teeth of Ultra. Lee dealt with a mixed bag, an officer in the NKVD, an air attaché a test pilot and a member of the Supreme Soviet with the rank of colonel. But they too were suspicious and, according to Lee, virtually ignored Ultra material, at any rate for the pre-Stalingrad period for there were wholesale arrests of astrologers and occultists suspected of knowing Hess. Performances involving demonstrations of an occult, spiritualist, clairvoyant, telepathic or astrological nature were outlawed. 5. As a reward Hess, described by Weidmann as the straightest character among the Nazi leaders, has already served more than 30 years of solitary confinement. He remains the last allied prisoner at Spandau prison. In all those years he has been separated from visitors by a wide table. Never has he been allowed to embrace or kiss a loved one. Chapter 24 A door into a dark, unseen room June the 22nd to December the 19th, 1941. 1. By early morning of June 22nd single-sheet extra editions of Berlin newspapers were on the streets. Although confused by the abrupt attack on an ally, the public felt a sense of relief since few had been able to understand why a treaty had been made with the Reds in the first place. Hitler set Goebbels the task of explanation and that morning the propaganda chief began laying down the guidelines to his subordinates, now that the Führer has unmasked the treachery of the Bolshevik rulers, National Socialism, and hence the German people, are reverting to the principles which impelled them, the struggle against plutocracy and Bolshevism. The Führer, he added, had assured him the Russian campaign would end within four months. But I tell you it will take only eight weeks. That afternoon he was repeating his prophecy to guests at a party. Turning to film star Olga Chkoa, the niece of Chekhov, he said, we have a Russian expert here. Will we be in Moscow by Christmas? Irritated by both his manner and the question, her answer was terse, you know Russia, the endless land. Even Napoleon had to retreat. For once Goebbels was at a loss for words and could only say, so. But within ten minutes his adjutant was telling the actress, I imagine, madam, you are ready to leave. The car is outside. The Soviet Union was in disarray. Within hours the Red Air Force had admittedly lost 1,200 aircraft, and infantry resistance was uncoordinated. Refusing to believe in the gravity of first report, Stalin ordered the Red Army to keep out of German territory and the Red Air Force to restrict trades to within 90 miles of the frontier. He was so convinced that the Nazi invasion was a mistake and he could halt the war by diplomatic means that he kept open radio communications with the Wilhelmstrasse while requesting Japan to mediate any political and economic differences between Germany and the Soviet Union. 
his ambassador in England was under no such illusion. Maisky called upon Foreign Secretary Eden and asked directly whether the British government was going to reduce its war effort somewhat and perhaps now listen to Hitler's peace offensive. Eden firmly replied in the negative, and that evening Churchill, who had recently remarked, if Hitler invaded hell, I would make at least a favorable reference to the devil in the House of Commons, made it official in a stirring broadcast to the nation. We are resolved to destroy Hitler and every vestige of the Nazi regime. From this nothing will turn us, nothing. We will never parley, we will never negotiate with Hitler or any of his gang. He pledged to give the utmost help to the Russians. We shall appeal to all our friends and allies in every part of the world to take the same course and pursue it, as we shall faithfully and steadfastly to the end. George Kennan, assigned to the American Embassy in Berlin, had reservations which he passed on in a personal note to a friend in the State Department, it seems to me that to welcome Russia as an associate in the defense of democracy would invite misunderstanding of our own position and would lend to the German war effort a gratuitous and sorely needed aura of morality. In following such a course I do not see how we could help but identify ourselves with the Russian destruction of the Baltic states, with the attack against Finnish independence with the partitioning of Poland and Romania, with the crushing of religion throughout Eastern Europe, and with the domestic policy of a regime which is widely feared and detested throughout this part of the world and the methods of which are far from democratic. At the same time this should not prohibit the extension of material aid whenever called for by our own self-interest. It would, however, preclude anything which might identify us politically or ideologically with the Russian war effort. Roosevelt was equally aware of Stalin's dictatorial policies, his secretiveness and greed for territory. But he feared Hitler far more and promptly approved a State Department declaration that giving assistance to communism would benefit American security. He told reporters, of course we are going to give all the aid we possibly can to Russia but failed to add when or how this could be done. The Pope's attitude was not at all vague. While taking no definite stand on the German invasion, he made it clear that he backed the Nazi fight against Bolshevism, describing it as high-minded gallantry in defense of the foundations of Christian culture. A number of German bishops, predictably, openly supported the attack. One called it a European crusade, a mission similar to that of the Teutonic Knights. He exhorted all Catholics to fight for a victory that will allow Europe to breathe freely again and will promise all nations a new future. Within 24 hours German public interest began to slacken. After the first rush for the newspapers, which contained only general reports from the front, the citizens returned to their normal life as if it were only another of Hitler's exploits. At 12.30 p.m. on June 23 he and his entourage left the capital in the Führer train, destination Wolfschanz, Wolf's Lair, the new headquarters in a forest several miles from Rassenburg, East Prussia. Confidence in a quick victory ran high among the staff as they settled into the wooden huts and concrete bunkers but the Führer had mixed feelings. We have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down, he told Jodl yet shortly remarked to an aide, at the beginning of each campaign one pushes a door into a dark, unseen room. One can never know what is hiding inside. The early victories seemed to justify the highest hopes. Within two days hordes of prisoners were taken and bridges seized intact. There seemed to be no organized enemy resistance as German tanks burst through Soviet lines and roamed at will. For a week no details were given to the German public, then on Sunday, the 29th, ten special communiques, personally prepared by Hitler, were announced over the radio at hourly intervals. Goebbels had objected to this abrupt flood of information but Hitler thought it a brilliant idea. As the day wore on, however, he received complaints that a spectacle was being made of the war and when Otto Dietrich reported that Sunday radio listeners were extremely annoyed at having to keep to their apartments on such a fine day he retorted that he knew the mentality and emotion of the masses better than Dietrich and all the other intellectuals put together. There were such piercing advances, such mass surrenders, almost half a million to date, that Holder wrote in his diary on July 3, 
it is no exaggeration to say that the campaign against Russia has been won in 14 days. The Führer also told his entourage that to all intents and purposes the Russians have lost the war. How fortunate it was, he exulted, that we smashed the Russian armor and air force right at the beginning. Never, he said, could the Russians replace them. Many Western military experts shared this estimate and talk in the Pentagon was that the Red Army would fold up in a month or so. 2. Following in the wake of the advancing troops were four SS Einsatzgruppen of 3,000 men each, whose mission was to ensure security of the operational zone, that is, prevent resistance by civilians. These were police of a very special nature, given an additional task by their chief, Reinhard Heydrich. They were to round up and liquidate not only Bolshevik leaders but all Jews, as well as gypsies, Asiatic inferiors and useless eaters, such as the deranged and incurably sick. To supervise this mass killing, Heydrich and Himmler had been inspired to select officers who, for the most part, were professional men. They included a Protestant pastor, a physician, a professional opera singer and numerous lawyers. The majority were intellectuals in their early thirties and it might be supposed such men were unsuited for this work. On the contrary, they brought to the brutal task their considerable skills and training and became, despite qualms, efficient executioners. The majority of the victims were Jews. They had no idea of Hitler's racial cleansing program since few German anti-Semitic atrocities were reported in the Soviet press. Consequently, Many Jews welcomed the Germans as liberators and were easily trapped by the special units. Contrary to the opinion of the National Socialists that the Jews were a highly organized group, testified Obergruppenfuhrer von dem Bach Zelensky, the senior SS and police commander for Central Russia, the appalling fact was that they were taken completely by surprise. It gave the light to the old anti-Semitic myth that the Jews were conspiring to dominate the world and were thus highly organized. Never before has a people gone as unsuspectingly to its disaster. Nothing was prepared. Absolutely nothing. The exterminations proceeded with cool calculation. It was a tidy, business-like operation, and the reports were couched in the arid language of bureaucracy as if the executioners were dealing with cabbages, not human beings. The methodical work of the killing units was rarely marred by resistance. Strange is the calmness with which the delinquents allow themselves to be shot, reported one commander, and that goes for non-Jews as well as Jews. Their fear of death appears to have been blunted by a kind of indifference which has been created in the course of twenty years of Soviet rule. Heydrich's most awkward problem was coping with the psychological effects of the exterminators. Some enlisted men had nervous breakdowns or took to drinking and a number of the officers suffered from serious stomach and intestinal ailments. Others took to their task with excess enthusiasm and sadistically beat the prisoners in violation of Himmler's orders to exterminate as humanely as possible. He himself was witness to the demoralizing effect of daily murder. On a visit to Minsk that summer he asked the commander of Einsatzgruppe B to shoot a hundred prisoners so he could observe the actual liquidation. As the firing squad raised rifles, he noticed one young man was blonde and blue-eyed, the hallmark of the true Teuton, and did not belong in this group. Himmler asked if he was a Jew. He was. Both parents? Yes. Did he have any antecedents who were not Jewish? No. Himmler stamped his foot. Then I cannot help you. The squad fired but Himmler, who had come to see, stared into the ground. He shuffled nervously. Then came a second volley. Again he promptly averted his eyes. Glancing up, he saw that two women still writhed. Don't torture those women. He shouted. Get on with it, shoot quickly. This was the opportunity Bark Zaleski was hoping for. He asked him to note how deeply shaken the firing squad was. They are finished for the rest of their lives. The SS man said. What kind of followers are we creating by these things? Either neurotics or brutes. Himmler impulsively ordered everyone to gather around so he could make a speech. Theirs was a disgusting task, he said, but as good Germans they should not enjoy doing it. 
their conscience, however, should be in no way affected because they were soldiers who had to carry out every order without question. He alone, before God and the Fuhrer, bore the terrible responsibility for what had to be done. Surely they had noticed that this bloody work was as odious to him and moved him to the depths of his soul. But he too was obeying the highest law by doing his duty. Rumors of these atrocities distressed Rosenberg, ordered by Hitler to draw up a blueprint for occupation of the conquered eastern territories. He had envisaged a far different program with a degree of self-rule. Since the Führer had earlier agreed to establish weak socialist states in the conquered lands of Russia, Rosenberg optimistically assumed that Hitler approved his own plan in principle and that it would be accepted at a special conference on the subject to be held at the Wolfschanz on July 16. It is essential, said Hitler, according to Bormann's notes of the meeting, that we do not proclaim our views before the whole world. There is no need for that but the main thing is that we ourselves know what we want. If this did not reveal to Rosenberg that Hitler had changed his mind about establishing weak socialist states, what followed surely did. This need not prevent our taking all necessary measures, shooting, resettlement, etc., and we shall take them. In principle we must now face the task of cutting up the giant cake according to our needs in order to be able, first, to dominate it, second, to administer it, third, to exploit it. The Russians have now given an order for partisan warfare behind our front. This guerrilla activity again has some advantage for us, it enables us to exterminate everyone who opposes us. Although Rosenberg left the meeting with the title of Prime Minister of the East, it was a hollow one, for he realized his own dream of the East now had little chance to materialize. What a tragedy, he thought, that Hitler still maintained the false conception of Slavs, born during his youthful days in Vienna out of inflammatory pamphlets which described the Slavs as lazy primitives, a hopelessly second-class race. Equally disastrous was Hitler's complete misunderstanding of the structure of the Soviet Union. The Ukrainians and other tribes under the yoke of the Great Russians were potential allies of the Third Reich and could be a bulwark of defense against Bolshevism if treated properly and given a measure of self-rule. But the Führer had been persuaded by Bormann and Göring that they were enemies to be controlled by the whip. The struggle to turn Hitler from this path seemed hopeless but Rosenberg resolved to keep trying. It was a diluted resolve, for no one knew better than he that. Once the Führer looked into his eyes, he would, as usual, be too frightened to speak out. 3. Oh what can ail thee, knight at arms? Alone and palely loitering question mark Keats. During these early summer days of 1941 Hitler became sick. To begin with there were recurrent stomach pains which may have been of hysterical nature. His system was already undermined by an overdose of drugs. 120 to 150 anti gas pills a week, as well as 10 injections of ultraseptil, a strong sulfonamide. Then he was struck down by dysentery, a common malady in the swampy surroundings of the wolf's chans. A victim of diarrhea, nausea, and aching limbs, he would shiver one moment, sweat the next. A more serious threat to his health came to light during a hot argument with Ribbentrop late in July. The foreign minister, opposed to Barbarossa from the beginning, lost his temper and began to shout his disapproval. Hitler paled at the extraordinary attack. He tried to defend himself but halted in mid-sentence, clutched his heart and sank into a chair. There was a frightening moment of silence. I thought I was going to have a heart attack, Hitler finally said. You must never again oppose me in this manner. Dr. Murrell was so perturbed he sent an electrocardiogram of the Führer's heart to Professor Dr. Karl Weber, director of the Heart Institute at Bad Norheim and a leading authority on heart disease. He had no idea that the patient was Hitler, only that he was a very busy diplomat. His diagnosis was, a rapidly progressive coronary sclerosis, a virtually incurable heart disease. Morrell probably did not pass this information on to Hitler at least once announcing in his presence that the Führer's heart was in good shape. Morrell did add a number of other medicines to his patient's growing list of prescriptions, a heart tonic, cardiazole, 
a quite harmless solution for circulatory weakness, fainting and exhaustion, and Sympothal 3, 1% as efficacious as adrenaline. Hitler's illness came at the height of a bitter conflict with his commanders on the conduct of the campaign in the East. He had already ordered the direct attack on Moscow halted, he stripped Army Group Center of its most powerful armored units, one being sent north to facilitate the capture of Leningrad, the other south to bolster the drive into the Ukraine. Both these areas, in Hitler's opinion, superseded Moscow in importance, the first because it was a key industrial center, and was named after Lenin, and the second because of its economic importance. Not only was the Ukraine vital for its industry and grain but the Crimea itself was a potential Soviet aircraft carrier for the bombing of the Ploesti oil fields in Romania. Further, once the Crimea was occupied, the Wehrmacht would have easy access to the Caucasus. Hitler's sixth spell gave Braukic and Halder the chance to sabotage the Führer's strategy. Quietly they began trying to put their own plan into operation, with Halder exerting his personal influence on Jodl to gain his support. It was not until Hitler was on the road to recovery in mid-August that he fully realized what had been going on behind his back, neither his own strategy nor that of Halder had been put into effect but a compromise of both. To clarify the situation, Hitler composed an order on August 21 that could not possibly be misunderstood. The most important objective to be reached by winter is not Moscow, but the Crimea. The attack on Moscow could not begin until Leningrad had been isolated and the Russian 5th Army in the south destroyed. This order was followed a few hours later by a lengthy memorandum, dictated in anger and read with indignation. Little better than a stern lecture on how to wage a campaign, it charged that unnamed commanders were driven by selfish desires and despotic dispositions, then characterized the army high command as a gathering of minds fossilized in out-of-date theories. A black day for the army, Engel wrote in his diary. Unbearable. Scrawled Halder in his. Unheard of. The limit. He spent hours on the 22nd with Braukic complaining about the Führer's inadmissible interference with army affairs, ending with the suggestion that the two of them resign. But the dispirited, ailing marshal refused on the grounds that it wouldn't be practical and would change nothing. He even did his utmost to quell rebellion in his own staff by assuring them that the Führer had personally promised that, once victory was certain in the Ukraine all available forces would be thrown into the attack on Moscow. The rebellion, if it could be dignified as such, died out in a diminishing chorus of grumbles. 4. This minor crisis was soon overshadowed by the highly publicized visit of Mussolini to the front. He was coming to persuade Hitler to enlarge the Italian expeditionary force on the Russian front and so share some of the glory of crushing communism. But as his special train approached Wolf's chance Il Duce was in poor condition to match wits with his ally, he was still pale and grieving over the recent loss of his son Bruno in an air crash. Hitler met Mussolini at the little railroad station near the Wolf's chance and for the rest of the day scarcely gave him a chance to open his mouth. The Führer talked incessantly of the forthcoming victory in the East the stupidity of France and the evil machinations of the Jewish clique that surrounded Roosevelt. When his guest finally managed to make his offer of more troops Hitler changed the subject. His almost incessant monologue continued for the next few days until Mussolini became so tired of hearing of German glory and exploits that he began a long discourse on the triumphs of ancient Roman general and Trajan, who had fought in the region they were inspecting, in particular. Later in the day, at a man in the Ukraine, they inspected an Italian division under Sbersaglieri with waving feathers in their steel helmets roared past on motorcycles shouting Duce. Mussolini's face glowed. But Hitler soon regained the limelight once they entered the still smoking ruins of a man and he was cheered by his soldiers. After lunch he left Mussolini behind and walked informally among his troops. Il Duce felt insulted but got his revenge on the return flight. He went forward to talk with Bohr, Hitler's pilot, who was delighted at his enthusiasm and particularly Mussolini's request to take over the controls. Caught off guard, 
Hitler gave his consent but immediately regretted it, constantly fidgeting while his erstwhile idol maneuvered the craft with boyish elan. It was only a passing triumph. On the long rail trip back home Mussolini was dejected. He had not only failed to get approval for a large Italian contingent but had gained the uneasy feeling that the war in the East would be a lengthy and bloody one. His depression changed to rage upon learning that Ribbentrop was not going to publish the agreed joint communique of the visit, the foreign minister's name, it seemed, had been mentioned after key Eitel's. This time Hitler bowed to Mussolini and asked Ribbentrop to get into line. His honor avenged, Il Duce's spirit rose. He summoned Dino Alfieri, his ambassador to Berlin and gave him directives for a report on their visit to the front. Don't forget to mention, he said, that for a considerable part of the way I piloted the Führer's four-engine plane myself. At the Wolf's chance Hitler changed his mind and decided it was now time to launch the attack on Moscow. During tea in the casino with his secretaries and aides, he stared fixedly at a large map on the wall. In several weeks we will be in Moscow, he said in a deep, rough voice. There is no doubt of it. I will raise that damned city and I will construct in its place an artificial lake with central lighting. The name of Moscow will disappear forever. And so on the afternoon of September 5th he told Holder, get started on the central front within 8 to 10 days. His mood at supper that night was light, almost frolicsome. His comments were noted down by Werner Koppen. Rosenberg's liaison man at Führer headquarters. Since early July that year, at Rosenberg's behest, he had been circumspectly recording the Führer's table conversations. Köppen assumed Hitler knew what he was doing and would furtively jot down notes on his paper napkin, then immediately after the meal write out only those parts of the conversation he could distinctly remember. An original and one copy of his records were forwarded to Berlin by courier. Unbeknown to Copen, there was a second Boswell at the main table. Shortly after their arrival at Wolf's Chans, Bormann had suggested almost offhandedly to Heinrich Heim, his adjutant, that he surreptitiously note down what the chief said. So Hitler wouldn't know he was being put on record, Bormann instructed his adjutant to rely on his memory. But Heim wanted more accurate results and on his own initiative he began making copious notes on index cards which he hid on his lap. Bormann was taken aback but he gave Heim tacit approval to continue taking notes. One so the matter went on, Heim recalled, without Bormann giving me any instructions, expressing any wishes or anything else except to silently show his happiness that in this way much would be preserved and not forgotten. Heim was constantly faced with two problems, to select the most meaningful reflections, sometimes what he was writing down was superseded in importance by Hitler's next words, and to keep the Führer from seeing what he was doing. At the noon meal and the evening supper he was able to mask his activities but during the late night tea sessions, which took place in the bunker, he had to rely on memory alone, except for an occasional scribbled word or two. Heimchen as the gentle soul was affectionately called, was so unobtrusive, as was Köppen, that Hitler continued to speak freely, spontaneously on a limitless variety of subjects in an oral stream of consciousness. The records of Heim and Köppen gave rare insight into the momentous events unfolding each day on the Eastern Front. On September 17, for instance, Hitler expounded on the spirit of decision, which consisted, he said, in not hesitating when an inner conviction commands you to act. Last year one needed great spiritual strength to take the decision to attack Bolshevism. I had to foresee that Stalin might pass over to the attack in 1941. It was therefore necessary to get started without delay, in order not to be forestalled, and that wasn't possible before June. Even to make war, one must have luck on one's side. When I think of it, what luck we did have. The tremendous military operation presently in progress, he said, had been widely criticized as impracticable. I had to throw all my authority into the scales to force it through. I note in passing that a great part of our successes have originated in mistakes we've had the audacity to commit. 
he assured his fascinated listeners that the hegemony of the world would be decided by the seizure of Russian space. Thus Europe will be an impregnable fortress, safe from all threat of blockade. All this opens up economic vistas which, one might think, will incline the most liberal of the Western Democrats toward the new order. The essential thing, for the moment, is to conquer. After that everything will be simply a question of organization. The Slavs, he said, were born slaves who felt the need of a master and Germany's role in Russia would be analogous to that of England in India. Like the English, we shall rule this empire with a handful of men. He talked at length of his plans to make the Ukraine the granary for all Europe and to keep its conquered people happy with scarves and glass beads, then ended in a confession, while everyone else was dreaming of a world peace conference, he preferred to wage war for another ten years rather than be cheated of the spoils of victory. The capture of Kiev, three days later, caused elation at Wolf's chance. It meant, predicted Hitler, the early conquest of the entire Ukraine and justified his insistence on giving priority to the southern offensive. At dinner on September 21 Hitler glowed with satisfaction as he told of the capture of 145,000 prisoners in the valley near Kiev. This battle of encirclement, he claimed, was the most confused in the entire history of warfare. The Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse. At the noon meal on September 25 he revealed his fear of the subhuman farther east, Europe would be endangered until these Asians had been driven back behind the Urals. They are brutes, and neither Bolshevism nor Tsarism makes any difference, they are brutes in a state of nature. Late that evening he extolled the virtues of battle by comparing a soldier's first battle to a woman's first sexual encounter, as if he regarded each as an act of aggression. In a few days a youth becomes a man. If I weren't myself hardened by this experience, I would have been incapable of undertaking this cyclopean task which the building of an empire means for a single man. It was with feelings of pure idealism that he had set out for the front in 1914. Then I saw men falling around me in thousands. Thus I learned that life is a struggle and has no other object but the preservation of the species. The table talk was almost exclusively of the battle in the east, since there was little action on the only other active war front, North Africa. The British effort to throw back Rommel had failed miserably, and by the beginning of autumn there was a standoff in the desert with neither side prepared to mount another offensive. Hitler's energy and the might of the Wehrmacht were being concentrated for an all-out assault on Moscow but Field Marshal von Bock warned that it was too late in the season. Why not spend the winter in fortified positions? Hitler replied with an allegory of sorts, before I became Chancellor, I used to think the general staff was like a mastiff which had to be held tight by the collar to keep it from attacking anyone in sight. But it had turned out to be anything but ferocious. It had opposed rearmament, the occupation of the Rhineland, the invasion of Austria and Czechoslovakia, and even the war in Poland. It is I who have always had to go on this mastiff. He insisted upon attacking the capital in force and the operation, codenamed Typhoon, was launched on the last day of September by Bock. 
His mission was to destroy the Central Soviet forces with a fearsome aggregation of 69 divisions before advancing on the capital. His basic strategy was a drive aimed at Moscow with a double tank envelopment. The pincers meeting 80 miles behind the Red Army. The Soviet High Command, unable to conceive of a major offensive started so late in the year, was caught so completely by surprise that Guderian's 2nd Panzer Group raced 50 miles in the first 24 hours through the Red Army ranks. German infantrymen rushed into the vacuum to mop up disintegrating pockets of resistance. By October 2 Hitler was confident enough of victory to set off for Berlin in his special train. He had not spoken to the people for months and the next afternoon he strode into the Sport Palast purportedly to make an appeal in support of the wartime winter assistance program. But he had come to issue a major proclamation. On the morning of June 22, he said, his words booming over loudspeakers throughout the Reich, the greatest battle in the history of the world began. Everything had gone according to plan, he said and then announced that the enemy was already beaten and would never rise again. The audience broke into wild acclaim. He began listing the statistics of victory, 2,500,000 prisoners, 22,000 destroyed or captured artillery pieces, 18,000 destroyed or captured tanks, more than 14,500 destroyed planes. The figures rolled on. German soldiers had advanced up to 1,000 kilometers, this is as the crow flies, over 25,000 kilometers of Russian railway were again in operation with most of this already converted to the German narrow gauge. For a man who had just professed that Russia was beaten and would never rise again, he entertained deep concerns. The war in the East, he admitted, was one of ideologies, therefore all the best elements in Germany must now be welded into one indissoluble community. Only when the entire German people becomes a single community of sacrifice can we hope and expect that providence will stand by us in the future. Almighty God never helped a lazy man. Nor does he help a coward. It was a remarkable speech, one boasting of victory while calling for further sacrifice to ward off destruction. By evening the people's thoughts were diverted solely to triumph with the news that Orel had been seized so rapidly by Guderian's tankers that passengers in streetcars waved, assuming they were Russians, and vital factory equipment destined for evacuation to the Urals was seized intact. The following day Hitler was back at Wolfschanz and Copen noted that at supper he was in a particularly good mood. The noonday meal on October 6 was devoted to Czechoslovakia where there was considerable underground activity. His solution, deport all Jews far to the east. This reminded him that, since Jews were the source through which all enemy information is spread, they should also think of deporting Jews from Berlin and Vienna to the same destination. During the day Bryansk was taken as Guderian completed the encirclement of three entire Soviet armies. At supper Hitler was in a light-hearted mood and there was no talk of politics. Instead he made a lame joke, Major Engel had just been bitten by a dog and that explained the epidemic of madness ravaging Führer headquarters. Victory continued and within two days reports from the front indicated that the Red Army could essentially be considered defeated. With conquest of Moscow in sight, Hitler ordered that not a single German soldier should enter the capital. The city, he said will be destroyed and completely wiped from the earth. As Hitler emerged from the military conference on October 9 he called out to Otto Dietrich that the public could now be informed of the latest operations. Half an hour later, as he paced his study in the bunker with vigorous strides, Hitler dictated word for word the victory statement Dietrich was to submit to the press. Dietrich did so the next day in Berlin, then raised his fist high in the air. And on that, gentlemen, he shouted, I stake my whole journalistic reputation. Axis and Balkan correspondents applauded and cheered, recalled Howard K. Smith of the New York Times, then stood and raised their arms in salute to Diedrich. That morning German newspapers told of a great victory, two Soviet army groups had been encircled. The public reaction was electric. Faces previously won and drawn were now beaming. In beer restaurants, 
people stood and saluted when the radio played Horst Vessel and Deutschland über Alls. Rumors spread throughout the capital that Moscow had fallen. Significantly, on that same day Field Marshal von Reichenau, the first general to espouse National Socialism, issued an order to the Sixth Army for sterner treatment of partisans. This was no ordinary war, he said, but a struggle to the death between German culture and the Jewish Bolshevist system. Therefore, the soldier must have full understanding of the necessity for harsh but just measures of atonement against Jewish subhumanity. Similar orders came from Rundstedt, Manstein and other senior commanders. Hitler's declaration that the Soviets were defeated in total victory assured was not merely propaganda to raise morale at home. He believed what he said. But he had not quite convinced his pragmatic propaganda chief. Joseph Goebbels started the briefing to his subordinates on the 14th with the optimism of a Dietrich, militarily this war has already been decided. All that remains to be done is of predominantly political character both at home and abroad. Then he contradicted himself by warning that the German people must reconcile themselves to continued fighting in the East for another ten years. Therefore it was the task of the German press to help strengthen the people's staying power and when that was done the rest will follow of its own accord, so that, within a very short space of time, no one will notice that no peace has been concluded at all. If Hitler had similar reservations they were dispelled upon learning that the Soviet diplomatic corps had fled Moscow on October 15 for Kuibyshev, 600 miles to the east. Panic was truly sweeping the city and at the Kremlin Stalin reputedly had lost his nerve. A report that two German tanks had reached a suburb caused stampedes at railway stations. High-ranking party officials and secret police joined the Belmel flight in cars causing the first traffic jam in Soviet history. Pedestrians stormed the stalled cars, robbing and blackmailing the occupants, particularly those thought to be Jews. Other bands of deserters and workers were plundering stores since no police were on hand to stop them. One rumor circulated that Lenin's body had been removed from Red Square for safekeeping, another that Stalin himself had taken to his heels. A grim minority was building barricades and preparing to die rather than let a single Nazi pass, but most Moscovites were demoralized, awaiting the Germans with a strange mixture of expectancy and apathy. Many of them bought German-Russian dictionaries so they could greet the conquerors in their own language. In Berlin there was talk in the halls of the Wilhelmstrasse that Stalin had made an offer of peace through King Boris of Bulgaria. Fritz Hess asked Ribbentrop whether it was true and was told in strict secrecy that Hitler had rejected the offer clearly because he was convinced he could stand the immediate test and emerge victorious in the end. Most of Hitler's commanders shared his confidence. Jodl, for instance, had no doubt that the Soviets had used up their last reserves. At supper on the 17th Hitler's talk was mostly of the bright future. As far as he was concerned Lebensraum was a fact. Two days after Hitler's euphoric monologue, the man he admired and derided had regained his aplomb. Reappearing in the Kremlin, Stalin asked the chairman of the Moscow Soviet, should we defend Moscow? And without waiting for an answer proclaimed a state of siege. Breaches of law and order were to be dealt with promptly, all spies, diversionists and agents provocateurs were to be shot without trial. With firm direction from the top, morale throughout the city began to lift. Before Moscow, the Soviet troops stiffened and the German spearheads which had driven to within 40 miles of the capital were slowed. Then came a break in the weather. The fall rains began and while the powerful German Markivs became mired in the muddy roads, the more maneuverable Soviet T-34 tanks rolled free. Hitler's victories of the past two years had come through the superior mobility and firepower brought about by massed panzer attacks closely supported by tactical air forces. But the seas of mud below founded the armor and the low visibility above grounded the Luftwaffe, which had already gained air supremacy. With mobility went firepower, and Blitzkrieg, upon which Hitler based his hopes. To say that Typhoon was stemmed by the mud and freezing rain and the Red Army was only partially true. The principal reason for failure, so asserted most of his commanders, 
was Hitler's refusal to launch it a month earlier. If he had followed their advice Moscow would have been a mass of rubble and the Soviet government and its forces defeated. But Captain von Puttkamer, for one, was convinced that it was the fault of Braukic and Halder for sabotaging the Führer's basic plan during his illness. In late October the sleet turned into snow and the mud froze. Conditions for the troops were almost unbearable. There were few advances along the entire line and these were modest ones. By the end of the month the situation was so desperate that Giesler, the architect, was ordered to stop work on the reconstruction of German cities. All workers, engineers, building materials and machinery were to be transported at once to the east to construct highways, repair railroad tracks and construct stations and locomotive sheds. At meals Hitler appeared as confident as ever. On the eve of his departure for the annual celebration of the Munich Putsch he enlivened supper with jokes and reminiscences. In Moscow his admired enemy was making a speech at the annual eve of Revolution Day meeting in the huge hall of the Mayakovsky subway station. It was an odd mixture of dejection and confidence. First Stalin admitted that the building of socialism had been greatly impeded by the war and that casualties on the battlefield already were almost 1,700,000. But the Nazi claim that the Soviet regime was collapsing had no basis in fact. Instead, he said, the Soviet rear is today more solid than ever. It is probable that any other country, having lost as much territory as we have, would have collapsed. Admittedly Russia faced a tremendous task since the Germans were fighting with numerous allies, Finns, Romanians, Italians and Hungarians, while not a single English or American soldier was yet in position to help the Soviet Union. He made an impassioned appeal to Russian national pride in the name of Pelekhanov and Lenin, Belinsky and Chernyshevsky, Pushkin and Tolstoy, Gorky and Chekhov, Glinka and Tchaikovsky, Sekhenov and Pavlov. Suvorov and Kutuzov. The German invaders want a war of extermination against the peoples of the Soviet Union. Very well then. If they want a war of extermination, they shall have it. Stalin was back in command and the next morning, November 7, he spoke with equal force to troops gathered in Red Square. In the distance guns boomed and overhead came the snarl of patrolling Soviet fighter planes as he compared their position with that of 23 years ago. How could anyone doubt that they could and must defeat the German invaders? Again he shrewdly used names of the past, the conquerors of the Teutonic Knights, the Tatars, the Poles and Napoleon, as a rallying cry. May you be inspired by the heroic figures of our great ancestors, Alexander Nevsky. Dmitry Donskoy, Minin and Pozarsky, Alexander Suvorov, Michael Kutuzov. Hitler arrived in Munich the following afternoon. He made an impassioned appeal to a convocation of Reichsliters and Gauliters and later delivered a speech at the Lone Brau Keller which included a warning to President Roosevelt that if an American ship shot at a German vessel it will do so at its own risk. His threatening words did not have Stalin's forceful ring. In fact, he was depressed by the stalemate on the Eastern Front and the next day reminded his staff what had befallen Napoleon's army in Russia. The recognition that neither force is capable of annihilating the other, he predicted, will lead to a compromise peace. But Marshal von Bock argued against such pessimism. He urged that their offensive be continued. So did Braukic and Halder. On November 12 the latter was the picture of optimism as he announced that in his opinion the Russians were on the verge of collapse. Hitler was impressed and three days later the push for Moscow resumed. At first the weather was good but soon ice, mud and snow began taking control of the battlefield. When General Oshima appeared at Wolfschanz on one of his periodic visits Hitler explained winter had come much earlier than his weatherman had predicted. Then. In the strictest confidence, he admitted that it was doubtful if they could take Moscow that year. Gone was the season of good humor. There were no jokes at mealtime and the request for seats at his table diminished. The cold intensified, provoking bitter denunciation of Hitler's earlier edict prohibiting the preparation of winter clothing. On November 21st Guderian phoned Halder to say that his troops had reached the end of their endurance. 
he was going to visit Bok and request that the orders he had just received be changed since he could see no way of carrying them out. But the marshal, under direct pressure from the Führer, would not listen to Guderian's pleas and ordered the attack on Moscow resumed. After short, spasmodic advances the drive once more faltered. Taking over personal direction from an advanced command post, Bok called for another assault on November 24 despite a brewing storm. The attack was halted by snow, ice and fanatic Soviet resistance. Frustration in the center was compounded five days later by a crisis in the south. Field Marshal von Rundstedt was forced to evacuate Rostov, the gate to the Caucasus, captured only a week previously. Angered by this 30-mile retreat, Hitler telegraphed Rundstedt to remain where he was. The Marshal immediately wired back. IT is madness to attempt to hold. First the troops cannot do IT and second if they do not retreat they will be destroyed. I repeat that this order must be rescinded or that you find someone else. The message was drafted by a subordinate, except for the last sentence, which Rundstedt added in his own hand. It was these final words that infuriated Hitler and, without consulting the commander-in-chief of the army, he replied that same night. I am acceding to your request. Please give up your command. After replacing Rundstedt with Field Marshal von Reichenau, one of the few who dared speak openly to him, the Führer flew to Mariupol for first-hand information. He sought out an old comrade, Sepp Diedrich, commander of the SS Lbstandarte, but to his chagrin learned that the officers of this elite division agreed with Rundstedt that they would have been wiped out if they had not fallen back. After giving Reichenau orders to do what he had fired his predecessor for doing, Hitler summoned Rundstedt. He was packing to go home and thought the Führer might make some sort of apology. But their personal discussion turned into a threat, Hitler said that in the future he would not tolerate any more applications to resign. I myself, for instance, am not in a position to go to my superior, God Almighty, and say to him, I am not going on with it because I don't want to take the responsibility. Announcement of the fall of Rostov caused gloom in Berlin in both the propaganda ministry and the foreign office. But this defeat soon paled before a looming disaster on the central front. The all-out offensive against Moscow was foundering. Although an infantry reconnaissance reached the edge of Moscow early in December and sighted the Kremlin's spires, it was dispersed by several Red Army tanks and an emergency force of factory workers. Field Marshal von Bock, suffering from severe stomach cramps, admitted to Braukich on the phone that the entire attack had no depth and the troops were physically exhausted. On December 3 Bock phoned Halder. This call was even more pessimistic and when Bock suggested going over to the defense of the chief of the general staff tried to inspirit him with the kind of admonition that comes from those far from the front line, he said that the best defense was to stick to the attack. The following day Guderian reported that the thermometer was down to 31 degrees below zero. It took fires under the tank engines to get them started and the cold made telescopic sights useless. Worse, there were still no winter overcoats and long woolen stockings and the men suffered intensely. On the fifth it was five degrees colder. Guderian not only broke off his attack but began to withdraw his foremost units into defensive positions. That same night the new Soviet commander of the Central Front, General Georgi Zhukov, launched a massive counter-offensive. 100 divisions, on a 200-mile front this combined infantry tank air assault caught the Germans off guard and Hitler had not only lost Moscow but seemed destined to suffer Napoleon's fate in the winter snows of Russia. Despair and consternation swept the German Supreme Command. Commander-in-chief of the army von Braukich, sick and discouraged, wanted to resign. Hitler himself was confused. In the Great War the Russian infantrymen had fought poorly, now they were tigers. Why? Despondent, he admitted on December 6 to Jodl that victory could no longer be achieved. 5. For the past two years Hitler had been sedulously avoiding confrontation with the United States. Convinced that the entire nation was in the clutches of the Jewish clique, which not only dominated Washington but controlled the press, 
radio and cinema, he exercised the utmost restraint in the face of Roosevelt's increasing aid to Britain. Although he despised Americans as fighters, he did acknowledge their industrial strength and was set upon keeping them neutral, until he was prepared to deal with them properly. Despite the steady flow of war material to the British Isles, Hitler was so eager to avoid incidents that he had forbidden attacks on United States naval or merchant ships. Weapons, he ordered, are to be used only if U.S. ships fire the first shot. But Roosevelt's quick reaction to Barbarus threatened to end Hitler's patience. On the day after the attack the president authorized acting Secretary of State Sumner Wells to release a statement that Hitler must be stopped even if it meant giving aid to another totalitarian country. Although Roosevelt was vague as to how this was to be done, he soon made it clear, first by releasing some $40 million in frozen Soviet assets, and then by announcing that the provisions of the Neutrality Act did not apply to the Soviet Union, thus leaving the port of Vladivostok open to American shipping. Two weeks later, July 7, German claims that Roosevelt was intervening in the European war were reinforced. It was revealed that American forces had arrived in Iceland to eventually replace British forces then occupying that strategic island. The German charged Affane Washington, Hans Thompson, Cable the Wilhelmstrasse that this was a further attempt on FDR's part to provoke Hitler into attacking America through some naval incident so she could declare war on Germany. Disturbed by these reports, Hitler made a proposition to Ambassador Hiroshima in mid-July that was a reversal of his former determination to limit Japan to the task of holding off England and keeping America neutral. The United States and England will always be our enemies, he said. This realization must be the basis of our foreign policy. It was a sacred conviction reached after lengthy deliberations. America and England will always turn against whomever, in their eyes, is isolated. Today there are only two states whose interests cannot conflict with one another, and these are Germany and Japan. Wasn't it obvious that America under Roosevelt, bent on a new imperialism, was exerting pressure alternately on the European and Asiatic Lebensraum? Therefore, he concluded, I am of the opinion that we must jointly destroy them. As bait, he suggested Japan help liquidate the assets of the defeated Soviet Union and occupy its Far Eastern territories. The proposition was received in Tokyo with polite reserve. The Japanese had already decided not to attack Russia from the east but instead move south to Indochina. They did so and its peaceful seizure brought a quick response from Roosevelt on the night of July 26. Taking the advice of those like Harold Dix who had long been urging him to act forcefully against all aggressors. The president ordered Japanese assets in America frozen, an act which deprived Japan of her major source of oil. To the New York Times it was the most drastic blow short of war. To Japan's leaders it was the last step in the encirclement of the empire by the ABCD, American, British, Chinese, Dutch, powers, denying Nippon her rightful place as leader of Asia a challenge to her existence. In any case, it was a giant step toward war in the Far East and, to some observers, Roosevelt's backdoor entrance to war against Hitler. A month later the president went further when he met Churchill at sea off Newfoundland and signed the Atlantic Charter, a joint declaration of British and American war aims. Its terms not only left no doubt that Roosevelt was Hitler's implacable enemy but, ironically, disillusioned the Führer's enemies inside Germany, for no difference was made between a Nazi and an anti-Nazi. Those in the resistance regarded the Charter as Roosevelt's unofficial declaration of war against all Germans. They particularly resented Point 8, which stipulated that Germans must be disarmed after the war, a demand which, Hassel wrote in his journal, destroys every reasonable chance for peace. Roosevelt's determination to smash Hitler was opposed to the sentiments of millions of Americans. In addition to the right-wing America firsters of Charles Lindbergh and the German-American Bund, there was the traditional isolationist Midwest which, though sympathetic to Britain and China, wanted no part of a shooting war. Other Americans hated communism so intensely that they resented any aid going to the Soviet Union. 
Roosevelt was undeterred by violent press and radio attacks. From now on, he announced in a radio broadcast on September 11, if German or Italian vessels of war enter these waters, that is, Iceland and similar areas under United States protection, they do so at their peril. Although this was a ready excuse for Hitler to remove the last restrictions on U-boat warfare, he could not be provoked into a misstep. He ordered Admiral Redder to avoid any incidents in the war on merchant shipping before the middle of October. By then, he explained, the Russian campaign would be as good as over. Hitler's help of avoiding a major incident vanished on the last day of October when the United States destroyer Reuben James, escorting a convoy 600 miles west of Iceland, was torpedoed. It sank with 101 Americans aboard. Roosevelt withheld comment but his Secretary of the Navy told an audience of Marines that the French line in Normandy would be expropriated, loaded with 400 airplanes and sent to Murmansk. The San Francisco Chronicle demanded that the Neutrality Act be repealed immediately and the Cleveland Plain Dealer called for immediate action. But isolationist Senator Nye urged restraint, you can't walk into a barroom brawl and hope to stay out of the fight. And another senator, who was not isolationist, advised, let us keep cool. The storm of anti-German sentiment couldn't have come at a more propitious time for Roosevelt. A week later the Office of Lend-Lease Administration was directed to do everything in its power to supply military and economic aid to the Soviet Union. One billion dollars was immediately allocated to that end. The following day, November 8, Hitler made his belligerent speech at Munich, which was, in fact, an excuse for the sinking of the Aruban James. President Roosevelt has ordered his ships to shoot the moment they sight German ships. He shouted. I have ordered German ships not to shoot when they sight American vessels but to defend themselves as soon as attacked. I will have any German officer court-martialed who fails to defend himself. Despite the show of anger this merely indicated that the Führer still wanted to avoid war. Say what he would. He feared Franklin Roosevelt and the industrial power of America. He revealed as much in spite of himself in an interview early that autumn at Wolf's Chans. I will outlast your President Roosevelt, he explained to Pierre Huss of INS. I can afford to wait and take my time to win this war in my own way. They were outdoors and Hitler, wearing his long greatcoat of rubberized field grey, stood with hands folded behind his back staring vacantly, lost in thought. Suddenly he said, I am Führer of Reich that will last for a thousand years to come. He slapped a glove into his left palm. No power can shake the German right now. Divine providence has willed it that I carry the fulfillment of a Germanic task. Although he talked of his own destiny, he was obsessed by resentment of Churchill and Roosevelt, whom he disparaged as minor characters on the world stage. They are sitting over there in their plutocratic little world, surrounded and enslaved by everything proved obsolete in the last decade. The money bags and Jews run the show behind the scenes, a parliamentary circus tramples on what is left in rights and privileges of their people. I have my people behind me and they have faith in me, their Führer. As the two men continued their walk, followed by a small group of guards and subordinates, Hitler resumed his complaint about the madman who had driven him to war. I had plans and work for my people for fifty years to come and didn't need a war to stay in office like the Daladiers and Chamberlains. And, for that matter, Herr Roosevelt of America. Huss noted his brow pucker into a slight frown at the mention of the president. It struck me suddenly, with unmistakable clarity, recalled Huss, that I had stumbled on a secret locked within the Führer's breast, a secret he would never let out and which he may never admit having. Hitler by instinct feared Franklin D. Roosevelt. Herr Roosevelt, and his Jews! exclaimed Hitler. He wants to run the world and rob us all of a place in the sun. He says he wants to save England but he means he wants to be ruler and heir of the British Empire. Hitler's hardening attitude toward America was reflected by Ribbentrop. On the evening of November 28 he summoned General Oshima and urged Japan to declare war against both the United States and Britain. Oshima was surprised. 
is your excellency indicating that a state of actual war is to be established between Germany and the United States? Ribbentrop had not meant to go that far. Roosevelt is a fanatic, he explained, so it is impossible to tell what he would do. He promised that if Japan should fight the United States, Germany would join her ally. There is absolutely no possibility of Germany's entering into a separate peace with the United States under such circumstances. The Führer is determined on this point. This information was a great relief to the Japanese high command. A carrier task force was already en route to Pearl Harbor. On the last day of November Oshima was ordered to inform Hitler and Ribbentrop immediately that the English and Americans were planning to move military forces into East Asia and this must be countered. Dot say very secretly to them that there is extreme danger that war may suddenly break out between Japan and the Anglo-Saxon nations through some clash of ARMS and ADD that the time of the breaking out of that war may come quicker than anyone dreams. These instructions were quickly followed by orders to obtain specific pledges from the Germans, yet when Oshima approached Ribbentrop late on the evening of December 1st the foreign minister was surprisingly evasive. He excused himself on the grounds that he would first have to consult with the Führer, who was still at the Wolf's Chance. Both men knew that Hitler had little time to devote to the drama brewing on the other side of the world and so Oshima was not surprised that he did not receive a draft treaty until 3 a.m. on the 5th. In it Germany promised to join Japan in any war against the United States and not to conclude a separate peace. The first to learn of Pearl Harbor at the Wolf's Chans was Otto Dietrich. Late in the afternoon of December 7 he hurried to Hitler's bunker with word that he was bearing an extremely important message. Hitler had just received depressing reports from the Russian front and feared Dietrich was bringing more bad news, but as his press chief hastily read the message his look of surprise was unmistakable. He brightened. Extremely excited, he asked, is this report correct? Dietrich said that he had received a telephone confirmation from his office. Hitler snatched the paper and, without putting on coat or hat, strode to the military bunker. Key Eitel and Jodl were amazed to see him, telegram in hand, a stunned look on his face. It seemed to Key Eitel as if the war between Japan and America had suddenly relieved Hitler of a nightmare burden. With Huell, the Führer could barely conceal the elation in his voice. We cannot lose the war!" he exclaimed. Now we have a partner who has not been defeated in three thousand years. 6. The desperate reports streaming in from the Russian front on Pearl Harbor Day forced Hitler to draft a new directive which he issued twenty-four hours later. The severe winter weather, it began, which has come surprisingly early in the East, and the consequent difficulties in bringing up supplies compel us to abandon immediately all major offensive operations and to go over to the defensive. He set down the general principles for defense while turning over to Halder the task of issuing subsequent instructions. Then he set off for Berlin to take personal charge of the crisis raised by Pearl Harbor. By this time his initial relief of the Japanese attack had been replaced by concern. In one stroke, Pearl Harbor had freed Stalin from worry over attack from the east. He could now transfer almost all his strength in Asia against Germany. This war against America is a tragedy, Hitler later admitted to Bormann. It is illogical and devoid of any foundation of reality. It is one of those queer twists of history that just as I was assuming power in Germany, Roosevelt, the elect of the Jews, was taking command in the United States. Without the Jews and without this lackey of theirs, things could have been quite different. From every point of view Germany and the United States should have been able, if not to understand each other and sympathize with each other, then at least to support each other without undue strain on either of them. One of Hitler's first visitors in Berlin on the morning of the 9th was Ribbentrop with the unwelcome information that General Oshima was requesting an immediate declaration of war against America. But the foreign minister didn't think Germany was obligated to do so since, according to the tripartite pact, she was bound to assist her ally only in case of a direct attack upon Japan. Hitler could not accept this loophole. If we don't stand on the side of Japan, the pact is politically dead, he said. 
but that is not the main reason. The chief reason is that the United States already is shooting at our ships. They have been a forceful factor in this war and through their actions have already created a situation of war. His decision to declare war on America was not lightly taken, nor was its motivation simple. Beyond upholding the spirit of the tripartite pact there were far weightier arguments. The assistance received from Japan would considerably offset the disadvantages caused by America's entry into the war, from a propaganda point of view the acquisition of a new, powerful ally would have a tremendously heartening effect after the recent setbacks in Russia. Further, an outright declaration of war was in line with his ideological world view. Why not make 1941 the year in which he declared total war upon the two major enemies of human survival, international Marxism, Russia, and international finance capitalism, America, both the creatures of international jewelry. His foreign office regarded the decision as a colossal mistake. In addition to the obvious reasons it neatly solved another of Roosevelt's domestic problems. The president would not have to declare war on Germany and risk opposition from a substantial segment of the citizenry. American national unity, so unexpectedly won by the surprise attack at Pearl Harbor, would remain intact. On December 11 Hitler convoked the Reichstag. We will always strike first. He said. Roosevelt was as mad as Woodrow Wilson. First he incites war, then falsifies the causes then odiously wraps himself in a cloak of Christian hypocrisy and slowly but surely leads mankind to war, not without calling God to witness the honesty of his attack. After equating international jury with Bolshevik Russia and Roosevelt's regime, Hitler made his declaration of hostilities. I have therefore arranged for passports to be handed to the American charged affair today and the following. His words were drowned in a bedlam of cheers and it was some time before he could announce that Germany was at war with the United States, as from today. The chief of operations of OKW listened to this speech with more concern than enthusiasm and as soon as Jod left the Kroll Opera House he telephoned his deputy, General Wallamont, in Wolf's Chans. You have heard that the Führer has just declared war on America? Wallamont had just been discussing the matter with staff officers and said they couldn't be more surprised. The staff, said Jodl, must now examine where the United States is most likely to employ the bulk of her forces initially, the Far East or Europe. We cannot take further decisions until that has been clarified. Agreed, this examination is obviously necessary but so far we have never even considered a war against the United States and so have no data on which to base this examination, we can hardly undertake this job just like that. See what you can do, said Jodl. When I get back tomorrow we will talk about this in more detail. Anxiety over America was soon overridden by new reverses in the East. The German retreat on the Central Front threatened to degenerate into panic flight. The area west of Moscow and the Tulan area was a snow covered graveyard of abandoned guns, trucks, and tanks. German despondency was accompanied by rising Russian confidence. On December 13, the Soviets publicly announced the failure of Hitler's attempt to surround Moscow, and two days later, the Politburo ordered the principal organs of government to return to the capital. The exhausted Braukic wanted to continue the withdrawal but Hitler overruled him and sent out a general order that spread despair among the military hierarchy, stand fast, not one step back. Marshal von Bock, commander of the Central Front, already suffering from a stomach ailment, reported himself physically unfit for duty. He was replaced by Kludge. The next day, the 19th, Braukic, just recovering from a heart attack, summoned up nerve enough to face Hitler. For two hours they argued in private. Braukic left the Führer, ashen and shaken. I am going home. He told Guy I tell. He has sacked me. I can't go on any longer. What is going to happen now, then? Asked Guy I tell. I don't know, ask him yourself. A few hours later Guy I tell was summoned. The Führer read out a brief order of the day he had composed. He was assuming personal command of the army, inextricably binding the fate of Germany with his own. 
The news was to be kept secret for the moment but he felt Holder should be informed at once. Hitler did so, minimizing the difficulties of the post. This little affair of operational command is something anybody can do, he said. The commander-in-chief's job is to train the army in the National Socialist idea and I know of no general who could do that as I want it done. For that reason I have taken over command of the army myself. Previously he had been de facto commander of the army, keeping himself in the background and allowing the military to take blame for all setbacks. Now he was the official commander-in-chief and would have to accept praise or blame for whatever happened. Once some of these notes were later published in various editions in England, France and Germany, the last under the title Hitler's Tisztsprach, by Henry Picker, who deputized for Heim as court reporter from March through July 1942. Heim was never consulted by any of the publishers or given the opportunity of commenting on the notes and correcting misconceptions on their history. While the published portion of his notes sounds quite accurate, he misses many important passages. Only about one-sixth of his original notes, for instance, appear in the Picker edition. Heim is positive that Hitler never knew his table talk was being recorded. After the war he was assured of this by Hitler's personal adjutant, Schaub. Heim presently lives in Munich within blocks of Köppen but was unaware until recently that the other was also making notes. Their two accounts complement each other. Heim purposely omitted all military matters for security, Köppen did not. The latter's notes, moreover, are valuable as corroboration of Heim's far more detailed and personalized minutes. Part 8 the fourth horseman. And I looked, and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Revelation 6 to 8. Chapter 25. And hell followed with him 1941 to 1943. 1. Two days after the invasion of the Soviet Union the man responsible for the deportation of Jews, Reinhard Heydrich, complained in writing that this was no answer to the Jewish problem. Deporting these misfits to the French island of Madagascar, for instance, would have to be dropped in favor of a more practical solution. It was fitting, therefore, that on the last day of July Heydrich received a cryptic order, signed by Goring upon instructions from the Führer, instructing him to make all necessary preparations regarding organizations and financial matters to bring about a complete solution of the Jewish question in the German sphere of influence in Europe. 1. Behind the innocuous bureaucratic language lay sweeping authority for the SS to organize the extermination of European Jewry. As a preliminary step, Himmler, still shaken by his experience in Minsk, asked the chief physician of the SS what was the best method of mass extermination. The answer was, gas chambers. The next step was to summon Rudolf Hoss, the commandant of the largest concentration camp in Poland, and give him secret oral instructions. He told me, testified Hoss, something to the effect, I do not remember the exact words, that the Führer had given the order for a final solution of the Jewish question. We the SS, must carry out that order. If it is not carried out now the Jews will later on destroy the German people. Himmler said he had chosen Hoss's camp since Auschwitz, strategically located near the border of Germany, afforded space for measures requiring isolation. Hoss was warned that this operation was to be treated as a secret right matter. He was forbidden to discuss the matter with his immediate superior. And so Hoss returned to Poland and, behind the back of the inspector of concentration camps, quietly began to expand his grounds with intent to turn them into the greatest killing center in man's history. He did not even tell his wife what he was doing. Hitler's concept of concentration camps as well as the practicality of genocide owed much, so he claimed, to his studies of English and United States history. He admired the camps for Boer prisoners in South Africa and for the Indians in the Wild West, and often praised to his inner circle the efficiency of America's extermination, by starvation and uneven combat, of the red savages who could not be tamed by captivity. 
until now he had scrupulously integrated his own general policy with that of Germany, since both led in the same general direction. The resurgence of German honor and military might, the seizure of lost Germanic territories, and even Lebensraum in the east were approved heartily by most of his countrymen. But at last had come the crossroads where Hitler must take his personal detour and solve, once and for all, the Jewish question. While many Germans were willing to join this racist crusade, the great majority merely wanted a continuation of the limited Jewish persecution which had already received the tacit approval of millions of Westerners. It was Hitler's intent to start eliminating the Jews secretly before leaking out the truth a little at a time to his own people. Eventually the time would be ripe for revelations that would tie all Germans to his own fate, his destiny would become Germany's. Complicity in his crusade to cleanse Europe of Jewry would make it a national mission and rouse the people to great efforts and sacrifices. It would also burn all bridges behind the hesitant and weak-hearted. Until now all this was kept secret from Hitler's innermost circle, the secretaries, adjutants, servants and personal staff. But in the autumn of 1941 the Führer began making overt remarks during his table conversations, perhaps as an experiment in revelation. In mid-October, after lecturing on the necessity of bringing decency into civil life, he said, but the first thing, above all, is to get rid of the Jews. Without that, it will be useless to clean the organ stables. Two days later he was more explicit. From the rostrum of the Reichstag, I prophesied to Jewry that, in the event of wars proving inevitable, the Jew would disappear from Europe. That race of criminals has on its conscience the two million dead of the First World War, and now already hundreds and thousands more. Let nobody tell me that all the same we can't park them in the marshy parts of Russia. Who's worrying about our troops? It's not a bad idea, by the way that public rumor attributes to us a plan to exterminate the Jews. Terror is a salutary thing. He predicted that the attempt to create a Jewish state would be a failure. I have numerous accounts to settle, about which I cannot think today. But that doesn't mean I forget them. I write them down. The time will come to bring out the big book. Even with regard to the Jews, I found myself remaining inactive there's no sense in adding uselessly to the difficulties of the moment. One acts shrewdly when one bides one's time. One reason Hitler had delayed implementing the final solution was hope that his implied threat to exterminate the Jews would keep Roosevelt out of the war. But Pearl Harbor ended this faint expectation and Hitler's hope turned into bitterness, with extermination becoming a form of international reprisal. The decision taken the Führer made it known to those entrusted with the final solution that the killings should be done as humanely as possible. This was in line with his conviction that he was observing God's injunction to cleanse the world of vermin. Still a member in good standing of the Church of Rome despite detestation of its hierarchy, I am now as before a Catholic and will always remain so, he carried within him its teaching that the Jew was the killer of God. The extermination, therefore, could be done without a twinge of conscience since he was merely acting as the avenging hand of God, so long as it was done impersonally, without cruelty. Himmler was pleased to murder with mercy. He ordered technical experts to devise gas chambers which would eliminate masses of Jews efficiently and humanely, then crowded the victims into boxcars and sent them east to stay in ghettos until the killing centers in Poland were completed. The time had come to establish the bureaucracy of liquidation and the man in charge, Heydrich, sent out invitations to a number of state secretaries and chiefs of the SS main offices for a final solution conference, to take place on December 10, 1941. The recipients of his invitation, aware only that Jews were being deported to the East, had little idea of the meaning of final solution and awaited the conference with expectation and keen interest. Their curiosity was whetted by a six-week postponement. Frank, head of the general government, German-occupied Poland, became so impatient that he sent Philip Buller, his deputy, to Heydrich for more details, then convened a conference of his own at Krakow in mid-December. I want to say to you quite openly, said Hitler's former lawyer, that we shall have to finish the juice, one way or another. 
he told about the important conference soon to take place in Berlin which Boulay would attend for the general government. Certainly the major migration is about to start. But what is to happen to the Jews? Do you think they will actually be settled in eastern villages? We were told in Berlin, why all this fuss? We can't use them in the Ostlan either, let the dead bury their dead. He urged his listeners to arm themselves against all feelings of sympathy. We have to annihilate the Jews wherever we find them and wherever it is at all possible. It was a gigantic task and could not be carried out by legal methods. Judges and courts could not take the heavy responsibility for such an extreme policy. He estimated, and it was a gross overestimate, that there were 3,500,000 Jews in the general government alone. We can't shoot these 3,500,000 Jews, we can't poison them, but we can take steps which, one way or another, will lead to an annihilation success, and I am referring to the measures under discussion in the Reich. The general government will have to become just as free of Jews as the Reich itself. Where and how this is going to happen is the task for the agencies which we will have to create and establish here, and I am going to tell you how they will work when the time comes. When Bilor arrived in Berlin on January 20, 1942, for the Heydrich conference he was far better prepared than most of the conferees to understand the generalities uttered. At about 11 a.m. 15 men gathered in a room at the Rye Security Main Office at number 56 to 58 Grossen 1C. There were representatives from Rosenberg's East Ministry, Goring's four-year plan agency, the Interior Ministry, the Justice Ministry, the Foreign Office and the Party Chancellery. Once they had seated themselves informally at tables, Chairman Heydrich began to speak. He had been given, he said, the responsibility for working out the final solution of the Jewish problem regardless of geographical boundaries. This euphemism was followed by a veiled and puzzling remark which involved Hitler himself. Instead of emigration, he said, there is now a further possible solution to which the Führer has already signified his consent, namely deportation to the East. At this point Heydrich exhibited a chart indicating which Jewish communities were to be evacuated, and gave a hint as to their fate. Those fit to work would be formed into labor gangs but even those who survived the rigors would not be allowed to go free and so form a new germ cell from which the Jewish race would again arise. History teaches us that. Georg Gilbrandt, of Rosenberg's office, was at a loss. Martin Luther of the Foreign Office was also confused. He protested that mass Jewish evacuations would create grave difficulties in such countries as Denmark and Norway. Why not confine the deportations to the Balkans and Western Europe? The conferees left Berlin with a variety of impressions. Bullen knew exactly what Heydrich was talking about but Luther assured Fritz Hess that there were no plans at all to kill the Jews. Brandt and his superior, Alfred Meyer, gave a similar report to Rosenberg. Not a word, they agreed, had been said of extermination. Thirty copies of the conference record were distributed to the ministries and SS main offices and the term final solution became known throughout the Reich bureaucracy yet the true meaning of what Heydrich had said was fathomed only by those privy to the killing operations, and many of this select group, curiously, were convinced that Adolf Hitler himself was not totally aware that mass murder was being plotted. SS Lieutenant Colonel Adolf Eichmann in charge of the Gestapo's Jewish evacuation office, for one knew this was a myth. After the 1C conference he sat cosily around a fireplace with Gestapo chief Muller and Heydrich, drinking and singing songs. After a while we climbed onto the chairs and drank a toast, then onto the table and traipsed round and round, on the chairs and on the table again. Eichmann joined in this celebration with no qualms. At that moment, he later testified, I sensed a kind of Pontius Pilate feeling, for I was free of all guilt. Who was I to judge? Who was I to have my own thoughts in this matter? He, Muller and Heydrich, were only carrying out the laws of the land as prescribed by the Führer himself. A few days later Hitler confirmed in spite of himself, that he was indeed the architect of the final solution. One must act radically, he said at lunch on January 23 in the presence of Himmler. 
when one pulls out a tooth, one does it with a single tug, and the pain quickly goes away. The Jew must clear out of Europe. It's the Jew who prevents everything. When I think about it, I realize that I'm extraordinarily humane. At the time of the rules of the popes the Jews were mistreated in Rome. Until 1830, eight Jews mounted on donkeys were led once a year through the streets of Rome. For my part, I restrict myself to telling them they must go away. If they break their pipes on the journey, I can't do anything about it. But if they refuse to go voluntarily I see no other solution but extermination. Never before had he talked so openly to his inner circle and he was so absorbed by the subject that on the 27th he again demanded the disappearance of all Jews from Europe. His obsession with Jews was publicly expressed a few days later in a speech at the Sport Palast on the ninth anniversary of National Socialism's rise to power. I do not even want to speak of the Jews, he said, and proceeded to do so at length. They are simply our old enemies. Their plans have suffered shipwreck through us, and they rightly hate us, just as we hate them. We realize that this war can only end either in the wiping out of the Germanic nations, or by the disappearance of Jewry from Europe. He reminded the audience, which included some forty high-ranking military officers, of his 1939 prophecy that the Jews would be destroyed. For the first time, it will not be the others who will bleed to death but for the first time the genuine ancient Jewish law, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is being applied. The more this struggle spreads, the more anti-Semitism will spread, and world Jewry may rely on this. It will find nourishment in every prison camp, it will find nourishment in every family which is being enlightened as to why it is being called upon to make such sacrifices and the hour will come when the worst enemy in the world will have finished his part for at least a thousand years to come. To those presently engaged in designing gas chambers, to those constructing the killing centers in Poland, and particularly to those who were being prepared to administer the mechanics of the final solution, this statement was a clarion call for genocide. But to foreign observers, such as Arvid Fredborg, Hitler's words and appearance that afternoon seemed to foreshadow a German disaster. His face, wrote the Swedish journalist, now seemed ravaged and his manner uncertain. 2. To the Führer the extermination of Jews and Slavs was as important as Lebensraum. He had turned the invasion into ideological warfare and his military decisions, therefore, could only be understood in this context. What appeared irrational to his generals was no sudden mental lapse but the fruit of decisions made in 1928. Ironically, never had he shown more military acumen than after the shocking defeats at the gates of Moscow. Surrounded by demoralized military leaders pleading for general retreat, Hitler did not lose his nerve. He refused to grant any requests to withdraw. He was not swayed by the most successful tank commander, Guderian who argued that taking up positional warfare in such unsuitable terrain would lead to the useless sacrifice of the best part of the army. He accused Guderian of being too deeply impressed by the suffering of the soldiers. You feel too much pity for them. You should stand back more. Believe me, things appear clearer when examined at longer range. Enforcing his order ruthlessly, Hitler managed to rally the army and stem the Russian advance. The cost was great but a number of his generals, including Jodl, were forced to agree that he had personally saved his troops from the fate of Napoleon's army. I intervened ruthlessly, he told Milchen Speer, and explained that his top commanders were willing to retreat all the way to the German border to save their troops. I could only tell these gentlemen, mein Herren, return personally to Germany as soon as possible but leave the army to my leadership. All was well on the other war fronts. In France the resistance, still hopelessly splintered, was of little concern, and in the Mediterranean, U-boats, Italian human torpedoes and mines had recently sunk or crippled a carrier, three battleships and two cruisers, thus eliminating Great Britain's eastern battle fleet as a fighting force. Moreover, Rommel was almost ready to launch another major offensive in North Africa and Germany's Japanese allies were continuing their unbroken series of victories in the Pacific.
At the same time Hitler knew the crisis in the East was by no means over and so ordered a general mobilization of the industry and economy of the Reich. The present effort, he said, was insufficient and the Blitzkrieg strategy must be abandoned. Although he couched this call for a long war in hopeful terms, he privately retained the nagging fear, so recently confided to Jodl, that victory could no longer be achieved. Such dark doubts were never revealed in his table conversations. He continued to chat about the evils of smoking, the joys of motoring, dogs, the origin of Tristan and Isolde, the beauty of Frau Hanfstenl and Jews. Of the grim struggle at the front he spoke little and then with optimism. At the height of the winter crisis, for instance, he declared that no cause was helpless provided the leadership stood firm. As long as there is one stout-hearted man to hold up the banner, nothing has been lost. Faith moves mountains. In this respect, I am ice cold, if the German people are not prepared to give everything for the sake of their self-preservation, very well. Then let them disappear. Such imperturbable performances at mealtime were belied by his appearance. He is not the man he was, Huell told a friend. He has grown gloomy and obdurate. He will shrink from no sacrifice and show no mercy or forgiveness. You would not recognize him if you saw him. His morale received a crushing blow on February 8 when Fritz Tott, builder of the West Wall and the Autobahn system, died in a plane crash. At the breakfast table there was speculation on who would take over Tott's position as Minister of Armaments and Munitions, one of the most crucial posts in the Reich. Everyone agreed that Tott was irreplaceable and Albert Speer, who had spent most of the night talking to Hitler about the Berlin and Nuremberg building projects, was thunderstruck when the Führer appointed him next morning. The architect's protest that he knew nothing about such matters was cut short. I have confidence in you. I know you will manage it. Besides I have no one else. At the funeral of Tot in the Mosaic Hall of the Reich Chancellery, Hitler was so shaken that during his eulogy he could hardly continue and, once the ceremony ended, he took refuge in his apartment. Somehow he managed to recover his composure enough in the next few days to address 10,000 newly appointed Wehrmacht and Waffen SS lieutenants at the Sport Palast. Grim faced, he told of the disaster in Russia, sparing no details. You young officers, he said are going east to save Germany and Western civilization from the Reds. It was such a stirring speech that many in the audience wept. Standing at his side, Richard Schulz, recently promoted to personal adjutant, was so moved he wanted to join in the fight. I felt ashamed to stay home at such a time. The new lieutenants had been ordered not to applaud but when Hitler started down the aisle they could not restrain themselves. They cheered wildly many jumping onto their chairs. This spontaneous outburst was a tonic to Hitler but by the time he returned to the wolf's chance he was again depressed. He looked exhausted and sallow. The blanket of snow covering the area deepened his despondency. I've always detested snow, he confided to his shadow. Bormann, you know I've always hated it. Now I know why. It was a presentiment. Hitler despaired upon reading the report of casualties in Russia up to February 20, 199,448 dead, 708,351 wounded, 44,342 missing, 112,627 cases of frostbite. Yet he soon rebounded. Confidence abruptly regained. He began to talk at the dinner table of the terrible winter as an ordeal successfully, miraculously endured. He announced to the company with a sigh of relief that Sunday would be the first of March. Boys, you can't imagine what that means to me, how much the last three months have worn out my strength, tested my nervous resistance. He revealed that during the first two weeks of December alone a thousand tanks had been lost and two thousand locomotives put out of operation. But the worst of winter was at last over. Now that January and February are past, our enemies can give up the hope of our suffering the fate of Napoleon. Now we're about to switch over to squaring the account. What a relief!
his high spirits were no longer spurious and he began to boast. I've noticed, on the occasion of such events, that when everybody loses his nerve, I'm the only one who keeps calm. It was the same thing at the time of the struggle for power. In the meantime preparations for the final solution were maturing and Himmler's Einsatzgruppen had begun another deadly sweep. While this second roundup of Jews, commissars and partisans was carried out in a coordinated manner in the military areas, progress in civilian territories proceeded less smoothly. Even so the death toll was massive and Rosenberg's staff begged him once more to urge Hitler to treat the peoples of the occupied areas as allies, not enemies. Rosenberg's aides warmly supported his relatively liberal concept of setting up separate states with varying degrees of self-government, but his turn toward liberalism had not been accompanied by a strengthening of character and he still trembled at the thought of antagonizing his Führer. A stronger man might have proved as ineffective, to approach the Führer it was necessary to go through Bormann, who had solidly aligned himself with Himmler and Heydrich. Rosenberg's liaison man at Wolfschanz, Köppen, was finding it increasingly difficult to convey to Hitler the true story of what was going on in the East. Before the Hess flight, he had simply passed on memoranda directly to Hitler but now Bormann insisted on acting as go-between with the excuse that the Führer was too busy with military matters. And so, concluded Köppen, Hitler only saw the problem of the occupied East through the eyes of his right-hand man. Therein lay the fateful development which, in my opinion, cost us victory in the East. While it was true that Hitler had little time for internal matters, it was more likely that Bormann always followed his personal instructions, and there was no doubt that Hitler always took time to oversee the final solution. In this matter he neither needed nor took advice. He made this clear in his message on the anniversary of the promulgation of the party program in late February. My prophecy, he said, shall be fulfilled that this war will not destroy Aryan humanity but it will exterminate the Jew. Whatever the battle may bring in its course or however long it may last, that will be its final course. The elimination of Jewry overrode victory itself. Despite such open hints, few had yet been initiated into the secret. Goebbels himself still did not realize the enormity of the measures being prepared. One of his employees, Hans Fritzsch, did learn about the Einsatzgruppen killings from a letter sent by an SS man in the Ukraine. The writer complained that he had suffered nervous breakdown after receiving an order to kill Jews and Ukrainian intelligentsia. He could not protest through official channels and asked for help. Fritzsch immediately went to Heydrich and asked point blank, is the SS the for the purpose of committing mass murders? Heydrich indignantly denied the charge, promising to start an investigation at once. He reported back the next day that the culprit was Gorlitz Koch, who had acted without the Führer's knowledge, then vowed that the killings would cease. Believe me, Herr Fritzsch, said Heydrich, anyone who has the reputation of being cruel does not have to be cruel, he can act humanely. Only that March did Goebbels himself learn the exact meaning of final solution. Then Hitler told him flatly that Europe must be cleansed of all Jews, if necessary by applying the most brutal methods. The Führer was so explicit that Goebbels could now write in his diary. A judgment has been visited upon the Jews that, while barbaric, is fully deserved. One must not be sentimental in these matters. If we did not fight the Jew, they would destroy us. It's a life and death struggle between the Aryan race and the Jewish bacillus. No other government and no other regime would have the strength for such a global solution of this question. By spring six killing centers had been set up in Poland. There were four in Frank's general government, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belzec and Lublin, two in the incorporated territories, Kulmhof and Auschwitz. The first four gassed the Jews by engine exhaust fumes but Rudolf Hoss, commandant of the huge complex near Auschwitz, thought this too inefficient and introduced to his camp a more lethal gas, hydrogen cyanide, marketed commercially under the name of Zyklon B. Spring revitalized the Führer. His health improved, his spirits rose. 
the Soviet winter counteroffensive had ground to a complete halt and a lull set in all along the front. This gave him more time to think of future policies and on April 24 he telephoned Goebbels that he wanted to deliver a major speech before the Reichstag. The following Sunday at 3 p.m. he denounced Bolshevism as the dictatorship of Jews and labeled the Jew a parasitic germ who had to be dealt with ruthlessly. But the thrust of his speech was a vocal reaffirmation of renewed faith in eventual triumph. At the same time he made no effort to conceal how close the army had come to disaster. He exaggerated the situation to make his personal role more effective. Deputies, he exclaimed dramatically, a world struggle was decided during the winter. He compared himself with Napoleon. We have mastered destiny which broke another man a hundred and thirty years ago. To prevent a similar crisis he went on to demand passage of a law granting him plenary powers. Its terms were sweeping. Every German was henceforth obliged to follow his personal orders, or suffer dire punishment. He was now officially above the law with the power of life and death. He had, in essence, appointed himself God's deputy and could do the Lord's work, wipe out the vermin and create a race of supermen. The members of the Reichstag, stirred to the roots by his manner and words, unanimously approved the measure enthusiastically and noisily. To foreign observers there seemed little reason for such a law. Hitler already had grasped more de facto power than Stalin or Mussolini, more, in fact, than neither Caesar or Napoleon had enjoyed. He had done so, he claimed, to end war profiteering and the black market and to prune the overgrown staffs of bureaucracy for additional manpower in the battle of production. He ignored the fact that the bleeding of the German economy had been caused not only by the conservatism in the civil service and the judiciary, but by corruption within the party itself. The plundering by such men as Goring, along with the widespread venality and inefficiency on every level of national socialism, had been draining the strength of the Reich for almost a decade. Three days later the Führer met Mussolini at the Barocklesheim castle near Salzburg. The Italians, unlike the enrapt audience at the Sport Palast, had been depressed by Hitler's oratory and they entered the first conference with some foreboding. The Führer talked interminably but said little of interest, glossing over the misfortunes of the Eastern Front. The German army this winter wrote the finest pages of its history. He declared that America was a big bluff and again favorably compared himself to Napoleon. He also expounded on India, Japan and practically every country in Europe, with categorical pronouncements in each case. On the second day, after lunch, although everything had been said, Hitler continued talking uninterrupted for another hour and forty minutes, as Mussolini kept checking his wristwatch. Hitler's own commanders were bored. General Jodl, recalled Chen o after an epic struggle, finally went to sleep on the divan. 3. Within the SD it was no secret that Himmler distrusted Heydrich, who had monumental files on everyone in the party, including the Führer, and was despised in return. One day Heydrich showed a subordinate, Gunter Syrup, a picture of Himmler. Covering the upper part of his face, he said, the top half is the teacher but the lower half is a sadist but Hitler had great plans for Heydrich. He was even considering him as a successor now that Goring had fallen from favor after the disappointing performance of his Luftwaffe, and made him acting protector of Moravia and Bohemia in addition to his other high offices. After initiating a wave of terror in Czechoslovakia that quickly crushed the resistance movement, Heydrich adopted the guise of benefactor, particularly to workers and peasants. He raised the fat ration for industrial laborers, improved the social security system and requisitioned luxury hotels for the working class. He plays cat and mouse with the Czechs, observed his fellow intellectual, Goebbels, and they swallow everything he places before them. He has carried out a number of extremely popular measures, particularly the almost complete conquest of the black market. The Reich protector's achievements in Czechoslovakia roused the Czech government in exile to action. Since it appeared that the population might passively accept domination by the Third Reich under such a benevolent despot, they decided to assassinate Heydrich. Two noncoms, Jan Kubais and Joseph Gabsik, 
trained at a school for sabotage in Scotland, were parachuted into the protectorate from a British plane. On the morning of May 27 the assassins, accompanied by two compatriots, hid at a curve on the road between Heydrich's country villa and Radskin Castle in Prague. As the protector's green open Mercedes was approaching, Gabsik jumped to the road and pressed the trigger of his stin. Nothing happened. He cocked the gun. Again it jammed. Behind him, Cubis lobbed a grenade at the car, which was slowing to a halt. Heydrich shouted, Step on it, man. But the driver, a last minute substitute, kept slamming on the brakes. The grenade exploded, wrecking the rear of the car. Apparently unwounded, Heydrich leapt to the road, revolver in hand, shooting and yelling as if he were the central figure in a scene out of any western. Cubis escaped on a bicycle, Gabsik, still unhurt, stood momentarily immobilized when his weapon jammed, then escaped. Suddenly Heydrich dropped his revolver, grasped his right hip and staggered. Fragments of leather and steel springs from the Mercedes upholstery had penetrated his ribs and stomach. He was taken to a nearby hospital but his wound did not seem serious and he refused to be attended by any but a German doctor. One was finally found who announced that an operation was necessary since grenade fragments were lodged in the membrane between the ribs and lungs as well as the spleen. Himmler, at temporary headquarters near Wolfschanz, wept upon learning that his right-hand man was dying, but some SS men were convinced these were crocodile deers since he resented Heydrich's rise to favor with Hitler. As Heydrich lay dying in Prague he whispered a warning to his subordinate Syrup to beware of Himmler. Later, while surveying the death mask of Heydrich, Himmler remarked to Walter Selmberg, chief of the SS Foreign Intelligence Service, yes, as the Führer said at the funeral, he was indeed a man with an iron heart. And at the height of his power fate purposefully took him away. His voice was somber but Selmberg could never forget the nod of Buddha-like approval that accompanied these words, while the small cold eyes behind the pince were suddenly lit with sparkle like the eyes of a basilisk. The two assassins, along with five other members of the Czech resistance, were finally trapped in a Budapest church by the SS and executed. But this was only the beginning of the reprisal. A reign of terror which made Heydrich's actions seem benevolent descended on Bohemia and Moravia. More than 1,300 Czechs were executed out of hand, including all the male inhabitants of Lidis on the fake charge that these villagers had harbored the assassins. Lidis itself was burned, the ruins dynamited and the ground leveled. The eradication of this obscure village not only aroused the disgust and indignation of the Western world but rekindled the spirit of resistance within Czechoslovakia. Too. It was the Jews who suffered most by the assassination. On the day Heydrich died 152 were executed in Berlin. 3,000 others were removed from the concentration camp of Thracianstadt and shipped to Poland where the killing centers were already receiving a steady flow of victims. Perhaps the most diabolical innovation of the final solution was the establishment of Jewish councils to administer their own deportation and destruction. This organization, comprising those leaders of the community who believed that cooperation with the Germans was the best policy, discouraged resistance. I will not be afraid to sacrifice 50,000 of our community, reasoned a typical leader, Moses Merrin, in order to save the other 50,000. By early summer the mass exterminations began under the authority of a written order from Himmler. Eichmann showed this authorization to one of his assistants, Dieter Wislyseni, with the explanation that final solution meant the biological extermination of the Jewish race. May God forbid, exclaimed the appalled Wislyseni, that our enemies should ever do anything similar to the German people. Don't be sentimental, said Eichmann. This is a Führer order. This was corroborated by Himmler in a letter to the chief of the SS main office at the end of July, the occupied eastern territories will be cleared of Jews. The implementation of this very hard order has been placed on my shoulders by the Führer. No one can release me from this responsibility in any case. So I forbid all interference. What Kurt Gerstein learned, as head of the technical disinfection service of the Waffen-SS 
had already driven him to despair. He was so appalled by the satanic practices of the Nazis, recalled a friend, that their eventual victory did not seem to him impossible. During a till at summer of the four extermination camps in the general government, Gerstein saw with his own eyes what he had read about. At the first camp he and two companions, Eichmann's deputy and a professor of hygiene named Fannen Steele, were informed that Hitler and Himmler had just ordered all action speeded up. At Belzec, two days later, Gerstein saw these words translated into reality. There are not ten people alive, he was told by the man in charge, criminal commissar Christian Wirth, who have seen or will see as much as you. Gerstein witnessed the entire procedure from the arrival of 6,000 Jews in boxcars, 1,450 of whom were already dead. As the survivors were driven out of the cars with whips, they were ordered over a loudspeaker to remove all clothing, artificial limbs, and spectacles and turn in all valuables and money. Women and young girls were to have their hair cut off. That's to make something special for you boat crews, explained an SS man, nice slippers. Revolted, Gerstein watched the march to the death chambers. Men, women, children, all stark naked, filed past in ghastly parade as a burly SS man promised in a loud, priest-like voice that nothing terrible was going to happen to them. All you have to do is breathe in deeply. That strengthens the lungs. Inhaling is a means of preventing infectious diseases. It's a good method of disinfection. To those who timorously asked what their fate would be, the SS man gave more reassurance, the men would build roads and houses, the women would do housework or help in the kitchen. But the odor from the death chambers was telltale and those at the head of the column had to be shoved by those behind. Most were silent, but one woman, eyes flashing, cursed her murderers. She was spurred on by whiplashes from Vith, a former chief of criminal police in Stuttgart. Some prayed, others asked, who will give us water to wash the dead? Gerstein prayed with them. By now the chambers were jammed with humanity. But the driver of the diesel truck, whose exhaust gases would exterminate the Jews, could not start the engine. Incensed at the delay, Wirth began lashing at the driver with his whip. Two hours and forty-nine minutes later the engine started. After another interminable twenty-five minutes Gerstein peered into one chamber. Most of the occupants were already dead. At the end of thirty-two minutes all were lifeless. They were standing erect, recalled Gerstein, like pillars of basalt, since there had not been an inch of space for them to fall in or even lean. Families could still be seen holding hands, even in death. The horror continued as one group of workers began tearing open the mouths of the dead with iron hooks, while others searched anuses and genital organs for jewelry. Wirth was in his element. See for yourself, he said, pointing to a large can filled with teeth. Just look at the amount of gold there is. And we have collected as much only yesterday and the day before. You can't imagine what we find every day, dollars, diamonds, gold you'll see. Gerstein forced himself to watch the final process. The bodies were flung into trenches, each some hundred yards long, conveniently located near the gas chambers. He was told that the bodies would swell from gas after a few days, raising the mound as much as six to ten feet. Once the swelling subsided, the bodies would be piled on railway ties covered with diesel oil and burned to cinders. The following day the Gerstein party was driven to Treblinka near Warsaw where they saw almost identical installations but on a larger scale, eight gas chambers and veritable mountains of clothing and underwear, 115 to 130 feet high. In honor of their visit, a banquet was held for employees. When one sees the bodies of these Jews, Professor Fannin Steele told them, one understands the greatness of the work you are doing. After dinner the guests were offered butter, meat and alcohol as going away presents. Gerstein lied that he was adequately supplied from his own farm and so Fan and Steel took the former's share as well as his own. Upon arrival in Warsaw, Gerstein set off immediately for Berlin, resolved to tell those who would listen of the ghastly sights he had witnessed.
a modern ancient mariner, he began spreading the truth to incredulous colleagues. As a rock thrown into a pond creates ever widening ripples, so did the tale of Kurt Gerstein. 4. The coming of spring 1942 saw almost no change in Germany's military situation. The Eastern Front remained stagnant and Rommel was still not quite ready for his new desert offensive. There was little of cheer to report except continuing Japanese victories and Hitler's enthusiasm over these was dampened by his allies' polite but stubborn refusal to conduct the war as he saw it. Ribbentrop persistently pressed the Japanese, through Ambassador Oshima, to turn their major attack toward India, but to no avail. Nor was Hitler any more successful when he invited Oshima to Wolf's chance and repeated the request. The way Macht, he said was about to invade the Caucasus and once that oil region was seized the road to Persia would be open. Then the Germans and Japanese could catch all the British Far East forces in a giant pincers movement. It was tempting but the Japanese declined the opportunity. They were already contemplating negotiations with the West. Prime Minister Tojo had been summoned to the palace and instructed by the Emperor not to miss any opportunity to terminate the war. Tojo summoned the German ambassador, General Eugenet, and suggested that their two nations secretly approach the Allies, he would fly to Berlin as a personal representative of the Emperor if Hitler would send a long-range bomber. The Führer's reply was polite but lukewarm, he could not take the risk of Tojo crashing in a German plane. Determined to defeat Russia even without the aid of Japan, Hitler proceeded as planned with his contemplated drive into the Caucasus. He stressed the importance of the area in words that alarmed his field commanders. If they didn't seize the oil fields at Mayakop and Grozny, he said, I shall have to liquidate the war. The ambitious operation, codenamed Blor, was slowed for weeks by heavy spring rains and it was not launched by Marshal von Bock until June 28. Six Hungarian and 17 German divisions drove toward Busk. Forty-eight hours later the powerful Sixth Army, consisting of eighteen divisions, struck just to the south. The Russians made the mistake of committing their tanks piecemeal and within forty-eight hours the two German forces met, encircling large number of prisoners. Just ahead lay the Don and the strategic city of Voronezh, but Bock was reluctant to press the attack. He finally took the city on July 6 but by this time Hitler was so disgusted with his dilatory tactics that he relieved him permanently. As Bock headed west into retirement, complaining of mistreatment, Hitler moved his headquarters deep into the Ukraine, occupying a camp in the woods a few miles northeast of Vinitsa. Christened Werewolf by himself, it was an uncamouflaged collection of wooden huts located in a dreary area. There were no hills no trees, simply an endless expanse of nothingness. Under the cloudless July sky, the heat was stifling and this in turn markedly affected Hitler, contributing to the arguments and explosions which would reach unprecedented heights in the weeks to come. Perhaps the heat also contributed to a crucial mistake. Hitler quixotically decided to mount a major attack on Stalingrad, an industrial city on the Volga while continuing the drive to the Caucasus. Halder, for one, complained openly that it was impossible to take both Stalingrad and the Caucasus simultaneously and urged that they concentrate on the former alone. But Hitler remained convinced that the Russians were finished. There was deep concern within the Soviet high command itself. Stalin replaced the commander of the Stalingrad front and ordered the city to be readied for a siege. As at Moscow and Leningrad, thousands of workers began constructing three lines of defense works around the city. Home Guard and worker battalions were sent west to back up retreating Red Army forces. The arguments at Werewolf intensified. After one stormy session Hitler told his personal adjutant, if I listen to Halder much longer, I'll become a pacifist. Debate became outright rancor on July 30 at the Daily Führer conference when Jodl solemnly stated that the fate of the Caucasus would be decided at Stalingrad, and that the 4th Panzer Army, earlier diverted to the former, must be returned to the latter. Hitler exploded, and then agreed to do so. If this tank army had never been shifted to the south, 
Stalingrad would probably already have been in German hands, but by now the Soviets had gathered enough strength in front of the Volga to slow if not stem the new assault. On such apparently minor decisions do great issues often depend. With Stalingrad invested by midsummer, the entire Soviet defense system might have been irrevocably split by winter. It was another revealing example of Hitler's dangerous dispersion of forces. First had come his insistence on striking simultaneously at both Leningrad and the Ukraine, before belatedly pressing on to Moscow. All this was accompanied by a further diffusion of energy through waging political and ideological warfare while pursuing his personal goal of exterminating Jews. Similarly in the present dilemma Stalingrad or the Caucasus question mark he was insisting on taking both, at the risk of taking neither. The ancient Greeks would have called it hubris, the overweening pride that eventually overtakes all conquerors. If Hitler had qualms over the jeopardy in which his overleaping ambition had placed the way macked, they were not apparent. A week later he was blandly assuring an Italian visitor that Stalingrad and the Caucasus would both be taken. His optimism seemed to be well founded. The overall military situation was auspicious. Rommel had won an unexpected victory in North Africa by taking Torbuk, the linchpin to the British defences, and then pushing on to El Alam, only 65 miles from Alexandria. This triumph was followed by announcement of an even greater one at Midway. Hitler had believed the Japanese, whose communiques had been much more accurate than those of the Americans. But this time it turned out to be his ally who grossly exaggerated, Nippon had not only lost four carriers and the cream of her naval aviators but the tide of battle in the Pacific had swung. The extent of defeat was confirmed by the news that the Americans had just landed in force on Guadalcanal, a strategic island deep inside Japan's defense perimeter. It was a colossal setback and so unexpected that it was no wonder the arguments at Werewolf grew even more intense. A violent one erupted on August 24 following Holder's request that a unit presently under heavy Soviet attack be permitted to withdraw to a shorter line. Hitler shouted that his army chief of staff always came with the same proposal, withdrawal. I expect my commanders to be as tough as the fighting troops. Ordinarily, Holder could restrain his resentment but today he retorted that brave Germans were falling in thousands simply because their commanders were not allowed to make reasonable decisions. Hitler recoiled. He stared fixedly, then said hoarsely, Colonel General Holder, how dare you use language like that in front of me? Do you think you can teach me what the man at the front is thinking? What do you know about what goes on at the front? Where were you in the First World War? And you try to pretend to me that I don't understand what it's like at the front. I won't stand that. It's outrageous. The other military men sidled out of the conference room, heads bowed. It was obvious that Holder's days at Führer headquarters were numbered. By late August fighting began in the northern outskirts of Stalingrad. Already set afire by heavy bombings, the city was temporarily cut off when the Red Army communication networks broke down. But apparent victory did not mellow Hitler. He felt he had been lied to by commanders in the field and deceived by those at his own headquarters. His suspicion of both groups was growing pathological and he rarely listened to advice, never to criticism. Oppressed by the summer torpor, he began making hasty decisions in the grip of anger and recrimination. He was particularly incensed with box replacement, Marshal List, and when he left the conference of August 31st Hitler began to insult and revile him. List's days too were numbered. 5. Hitler's conviction that he was surrounded by traitors was confirmed by the discovery late in August of aspiring, the Rote Kapelle, Red Orchestra, which was comprised of prominent Germans. This group had succeeded in informing Moscow about the attack on Mayakop, the fuel situation in Germany, the location of chemical warfare materials in the Reich, and Hitler's insistence on taking Stalingrad. After wholesale arrests, 46 members of the Ring, including Mildred Harnack, an American citizen, were executed. But secret information continued to flow to Moscow from another German spy, Rudolf Rossler, 
a publisher of leftist Catholic books in Lucerne. Rossler, whose code name was Lucy, had informants inside Germany, including General Fritz Thell, the number two man in the OKW signal organizations, and his reports consequently were far more important than those of the Rote Kapelle, he could provide the Red Army with the German daily order of battle. Hitler suspected there was a spy at Führer headquarters since all his moves seemed to be anticipated. Suspicion bred irritability and his military leaders took the brunt of it. The argument on September 7 was the most tempestuous of all. That morning Hitler sent Jodl, one of the few staff officers still in his good graces, to the Caucasus to find out why List was making such slow progress in the mountain passes leading out to the Black Sea. After a long interview with List and the commander of the Mountain Corps, Jodl concluded that the situation was hopeless. He flew back to Vinitzel and reported that List was adhering strictly to the instructions he had received. The Fuhrer jumped to his feet. That's a lie. He shouted and accused Jodl of having colluded with List. He was only supposed to transmit orders. Never had Jodl seen such an outburst of rage from a human being. Stung? he struck back. If Hitler had wanted a mere messenger, he said, why hadn't he sent a young lieutenant? Infuriated that Jodl had wounded him in the presence of others, Hitler stalked out of the room, casting glares at everyone. More convinced than ever that he was the victim of lies, Hitler shut himself up in his bunker. The briefing conferences now took place in his hut. He pointedly refused to shake hands with any staff officer. The atmosphere of the meetings was glacial, with stenographers recording every word of the Führer's instructions. He was determined that never again would his orders be disputed. It was also the end of the camaraderie at mealtimes that he cherished. From now on the Führer ate alone in his room, attended only by Blondie, the Alsatian bitch which Bormann had recently given him to take his mind off escalating problems.3 the military community at Vinitz awaited in anxious silence. No one felt secure. On September 9 Hitler summarily removed List and took personal command of Army Group A. Then came rumors that Halder, Jodl and Kiitel were soon to be released. Although the latter had never been on intimate terms with General Wallemont, he now sought out his advice. Was it possible, he forced himself to ask, to keep his position and retain his self-respect? Only you can answer that, replied Wallemont in embarrassment. He recalled how petrified Key Eitel had become the time Hitler angrily threw a file on the table. As it tumbled to the floor the chief of staff, forgetting his exalted position, had stood petrified as if he were a junior officer. It was a typical case, thought Wallemont, of a man given a position for which he was unqualified. Poor Key Eitel had overreached himself. It was tragic since he had never wanted the job. At conferences Hitler continued to display dogged confidence. When General von Weichs of Army Group B and General Friedrich Paulus, the field commander whose task it was to take Stalingrad, warned of the extremely long and lightly held Don front on the northern flank, the Führer made light of their concern. He assured them that the Russians were at the end of their resources and the resistance at Stalingrad was a purely local affair. Since the Russians were no longer capable of launching a major counter-offensive, there was no real danger on the Don flank. The vital thing, he said, was to concentrate every available man and capture as quickly as possible the whole of Stalingrad itself and the banks of the Volga. That was why he proposed to reinforce Paulus' Sixth Army with three more divisions. This time there were some grounds for Hitler's optimism. Disorder was rampant among Soviet troops in the Stalingrad area. Numerous units between the Don and the Volga had already disintegrated as officers and troops deserted or fled to the rear. Columns of refugees, taking cattle and farm equipment with them, cluttered all roads to the east. One recently assigned commander found that his armor had vanished without orders and that leading artillery, anti-tank and engineer commanders, some holding the rank of general, had decamped. By September 14 disaster seemed imminent. Luftwaffe planes were already mining the Volga behind Stalingrad as German infantrymen ranged through the center of the city, 
seizing the main railroad station and driving as far as the waterfront. Abruptly the Soviet defense stiffened. Reinforcements, ferried across the river, began challenging the Germans. On the 15th the main railroad station changed hands several times and Paulus felt obliged to narrow his attack. The fighting became listless and this had a marked effect on Hitler, so Wallemont noted upon his return to the briefing sessions after an absence of two weeks. As the Führer fixed him with their long, malevolent stare, Wallemont thought, the man's confidence is gone with realization that the Soviets cannot be beaten, that was why he could no longer abide those generals who had witnessed his faults, his errors, his illusions and his daydreams. He trusts none of the generals wrote Engel in his diary. He would promote a major to a general and make him chief of staff, if he only knew such a man. Nothing seems to suit him and he curses himself for having gone to war with such poor generals. Hitler decided to rid himself of Halder, who had annoyed him above all others as a prophet of doom, but whom he tolerated for his competence. The end came on September 24. You and I have been suffering from nerves, said Hitler. Half of my exhaustion is due to you. It is not worthwhile going on. We need national socialist ardor now, not professional ability. I cannot expect this of an officer of the old school such as you. Tears welled in Holder's eyes, a sign of weakness to Hitler, further grounds for dismissal. Holder said not a word in his own behalf. He rose when Hitler finished his tirade. I am leaving, he said simply and walked out of the room with dignity. He was convinced that Hitler was dominated by feminine characteristics. The intuition which mastered him instead of pure logic, he later wrote, was only one of the many proofs of this fact. As a replacement, Hitler wanted the antithesis of Holder, and chose Kurt Zietzler. A newly appointed major general, he had none of the advantages of seniority and authority enjoyed by Holder and it seemed doubtful he could have much influence with OKW and the army group commanders. But Zietzler's relative youth and inexperience made him all the more attractive to the Führer. He promoted Zietzler two grades to Colonel General. In appearance he did not fit the role. An extremely short, heavy man, he seemed to be constructed of three balls. But in his first meeting with Hitler in the presence of some twenty officers Zietzler did not fawn. He listened stolidly as the Führer excoriated the general staff for doubts and fears. Once the scorching attack, aimed at almost everyone in the room, ended, Zietzler said, Mein Führer, if you have any further objections to the general staff, please tell them to me under four eyes but not in the presence of so many other officers. Otherwise, you must seek a new chief of the general staff. He saluted and marched out of the room. The other officers waited for the expected explosion but Hitler was impressed. A, eh, he said with a little grin, he will be back. Those expecting a new spirit of defiance at Führer headquarters were quickly disillusioned. In his inaugural address to the officers of OKH, Zietzler said, I require the following from every staff officer, he must believe in the Führer and in his method of command. He must on every occasion radiate this confidence to his subordinates and those around him. I have no use for anybody on the general staff who cannot meet these requirements. Reassured that he had at last found the right army chief of staff, Hitler set out for Berlin to make another speech. It came on the last day of September at the Sportpalast rally for winter relief. Eagerly awaited by a hand-picked audience which had no idea what their Führer would say, it was a short, uninspired speech delivered without the usual sparkle. It struck many foreign listeners as pure bombast of no import, but they missed the implications of the anti-Semitic remarks that accompanied Hitler's pledge to take Stalingrad. Perhaps it was because his words about the Jews had been so oft repeated. For the third time that year he reiterated his prediction that if the Jews instigated an international war to exterminate the Aryan peoples it would not be the Aryan peoples that would be annihilated but Jewry itself. The motivation for this repetition was obscure except to those privy to the secret of the final solution. Each mention was a public acknowledgement of his program of extermination, each gave reassurance and authority to the elite charged with the task of mass murder.
Noteworthy too was his repetition of the false date of the original prophecy. It was made on January 30, 1939, not, as he kept saying, on the 1st of September. This could not have been a slip of the tongue since Hitler repeated it three times. By changing the date to that of the attack on Poland, the beginning of the Second World War, he linked his racial program to the war. He was preparing the people for the hard truth they must eventually face, the extermination of the Jews was an integral part of the war from the very first day of combat. He was also announcing, if obscurely, that his twin program, the Final Solution and Lebensraum, was progressing as planned. His listeners left the auditorium with a generally uneasy impression. They themselves had contributed the only lift to the meeting, the unison rendition of the Song of the Eastern Campaign, whose melody even foreign correspondents found extremely moving. We have been standing guard for Germany. Keeping the eternal watch. Now at last the sun is rising in the east. Calling millions into battle. Their spirit was not shared by a number of officials, shocked by the repressive measures in the East. The most forceful rebukes came from Rosenberg's ministry for the East territories, and these despite its chief's reluctance to do battle with the formidable combine of Himmler, Bormann and Derek Koch, the Reich Commissar for the Ukraine. The last, a former railroad conductor, had delusions of grandeur and rode around in a horse-drawn carriage like a little emperor. Cowed by the ruthless measures of this trio, Rosenberg had recently made them a peace offering, he fired Georg Gilbrandt, symbol of his own more liberal principles for governing occupied areas. But remaining subordinates continued to increase pressure on Rosenberg to bypass Bormann and go directly to the Führer, they kept submitting new suggestions and reports. The most damning indictment of the bormann himmler koch policy was a 13-page memorandum from Motto Brau-Utigam, who had spent seven years in the Soviet Union. The Germans, he said, had been greeted as liberators but the occupied people soon discovered that the slogan liberation from Bolshevism was merely a blind for enslavement. Instead of gaining allies against Stalinism, the Germans were creating bitter enemies. Our policy, charged Brau-Utigam, has forced both Bolsheviks and Russian nationalists into a common front against us. The Russian fights today with exceptional bravery and self-sacrifice for nothing more or less than recognition of his human dignity. There was only one solution, concluded Brau-Utigam, the Russian people must be told something concrete about their future. If Hitler ever read this memorandum, he never followed its advice. He was determined to win or lose on his own terms. 6. November proved to be a month of disaster for Germany with the enemy scoring victories in both East and West. Since conquest of Egypt was low among Hitler's priorities, he had made defeat in North Africa inevitable by failing to send Rommel sufficient supplies and reinforcements. With the pyramids practically in sight, the Desert Fox was forced into defensive warfare. When his southern section, held by Italians, was pierced by British General Montgomery, Rommel radioed for permission to retreat. On the evening of November 2 the Führer sent his reply, do not fall back one inch. The troops must triumph or die. Just before receiving this message Rommel radioed that he had been forced to withdraw, in fact a retreat had been underway for five hours. This information reached OKW at 3 a.m. and since the operations staff duty officer knew nothing of Hitler's original message, he did not think it important enough to pass on to the Führer. Hitler, of course, was angry that he had not been awakened. He summoned Wallemont but as the deputy operations chief started down the path toward his office Kiitel shouted from a distance in a highly unmilitary manner, You, Wallemont, come here. Hitler doesn't want to ever see you again. He was informed that he was relieved of his post. Rommel's retreat, an augury of total defeat in the desert, was closely followed on November 7 by a disturbing report, a huge armada of Allied ships had entered the Mediterranean and was approaching the north coast of Africa. Although these ships had been sighted outside Gibraltar for several days Hitler and OKW had assumed they were bound for Sardinia or Sicily. The main reason for German surprise, explained Jodl, 
probably was that we did not expect such a political false play after the upright, one can properly say, noble treatment which France had received, from Germany, since the collapse in the forest of Compton. For this landing was only possible in agreement with the French and not against the will of France. Hitler neither bothered to make excuses nor reflected the alarm of his military commanders. He cut short the midday briefing conference and, accompanied by most of the high ranking population of Wolfschanz, boarded his special train. Their destination was Munich, the occasion, the 19th anniversary of the Putsch. While the Führer slept, the first American and British troops landed on the beaches of Morocco and Algeria. Early reports indicated the French were repelling the landings and Hitler chided his advisers for their initial panic. To their dismay he ordered reinforcements sent to Crete at the other end of the Mediterranean. Outwardly, at least, he was more concerned about the address he was to make to old comrades at the Lone Bra Ukelair at 6 p.m. It was a fighting speech. Defending himself against the charge that his insistence on taking the city, which happens to bear the name of Stalin, was as costly to the German army as Verdun. He warned that he was no Wilhelm II, a weakling who had surrendered the Reich's vast eastern conquests because of a few traitors' sudden desire for an accommodation with the West. All our enemies may rest assured that while the Germany of that time laid down its arms at a quarter of twelve, I on principle have never finished before five minutes past twelve. By evening the reports from Africa were too grim for Hitler to ignore. He ordered Ribbentrop to summon Mussolini for an immediate conference. Roused from bed for the second time within 24 hours, Chen O was persuaded to waken Mussolini. But Il Duce refused to make the trip to Bavaria. Already ill, he did not relish facing the Fuhrer under the shadow of defeat. By the time his substitute, Chen O, arrived in Munich, Hitler had accepted the significance of the Africa landings. It was clear to him that the god of war had now turned from Germany and gone over to the other camp. At the same time he reacted violently to Ribbentrop's suggestion that Stalin be approached through Madame Kolontai, the Soviet ambassador in Stockholm. A proposal that most of the conquered territories in the east be given up, if need be, brought the Führer to his feet. All I want to discuss, he said with a violence that terrorized Ribbentrop, is Africa, nothing else. He also rejected another Japanese attempt to secure a peace with Russia, as well as a formal request for the Germans to go over to the defensive in the east and shift the bulk of their forces to the west. I understand Japanese reasoning, Hitler told Ambassador Oshima. It was a good idea but impossible to execute. In such cold country it was extremely difficult to dig defensive positions. But this was merely rhetoric, designed to make refusal palatable to an ally. Any accommodation with Stalin was impossible for a man whose program stood or fell on victory over Bolshevism. And if he could not have victory in the East, Hitler was condemned by his mission to hold back the Red Army until he could rid Europe of Jews. There were increasing rumors in Berlin that Hitler had gone mad. At one large gathering the wife of Reichsminister Funk reportedly told the wife of Reichsminister Frick, the Führer is leading us headlong into disaster. Yes replied Frau Frick. The man is insane. This opinion was echoed by Dr. Ferdinand Say Airbrush, the noted surgeon. He told friends that during a recent visit to the Führer he had heard an old and broken Hitler muttering such disjointed phrases as, I must go to India, or for one German who is killed ten of the enemy must die. 7. Hitler faced another defeat at Stalingrad. For weeks the 6th Army of Paulus had made little progress. Advances were measured in yards and the cost of each yard was exorbitant. Both Paulus and Lieutenant Colonel Reinhard Jalen, chief of intelligence in the East, warned of dangerous enemy concentrations to the North. While it is not possible to make any overall assessments of the enemy situation with the picture as uncertain as it is at present, reported Jalen on November 12th, we must expect an early attack on the Romanian Third Army, with the interruption of our railroad to Stalingrad as its objective so as to endanger all German forces further to the east and to compel our forces in Stalingrad to withdraw. Hitler was at the Berghof and did not read this ominous report. 
but he too was concerned about the Romanians and specifically asked if something was brewing in their area. The answer was no, repeatedly no, recalled Putkama, who attended every military conference that week. Since bad news notoriously travels slowly, the Führer was not informed of the gravity of the situation. There was still some doubt as to the strength of the Soviet build-up and the high command, stung by a recent Hitler criticism that it repeatedly overestimated the enemy, was reluctant to repeat their timorous miscalculations in Poland and France. At dawn November 1940 Soviet divisions attacked the Romanians. The defenders fought ably and with gallantry but were crushed by overwhelming numbers. The Army Group B commander reacted quickly. First he ordered Paulus to cease attacking Stalingrad and prepare units to meet the threat to his left flank, then once it became obvious that the Romanians would collapse, he suggested immediate withdrawal of the 6th Army. Hitler peremptorily vetoed this. Convinced by earlier reports that the Soviets had been bled to the point of death and this counter-offensive was only a last gasp, he ordered the men at Stalingrad to stand firm. Help was on the way. The reassuring words did not reflect the state of disarray within Hitler's headquarters itself. Major Engel recorded in his diary that there was complete confusion. Führer himself completely unsure what is to be done. During these trying hours he incessantly paced the Great Hall of the Berghof, inveighing against his commanders for repeating the same old mistakes. The tanks he had sent so reluctantly into the battle had already been thrown back and by November 21st the Romanians, half of whose tanks had been disabled by mice which had gnawed through wires, were cut off. Absolute dismay, hastily scrawled one Romanian officer in his diary. What sins have we or our forebears committed? Why must we suffer so? Only that day did Paulus and his chief of staff, Major General Arthur Schmidt, realize their own peril. The appearance of Soviet tanks a few miles from their battle headquarters confirmed that vital links in 6th Army lines of communication had been captured. After hastily transferring his own headquarters, Paulus asked permission to withdraw. His superior approved the proposal and passed it on to OKW. At the evening's conference in the Berghof, Jodl proposed a general evacuation of the 6th Army but again the Führer said no. No matter what happens we must hold the area around Stalingrad. The next morning, the 22nd, the two arms of a tremendous Soviet pincer movement met, encircling the entire 6th Army. More than 200,000 of Germany's finest troops along with 100 tanks, 1,800 big guns and more than 10,000 vehicles were caught in a giant Kessel, cauldron. At a 6th Army conference that morning someone suggested they break out to the southwest. We can't, said Chief of Staff Schmidt, because we haven't got the necessary fuel. And if we tried we should end up with a catastrophe like that of Napoleon. 6th Army he added, would have to go into a hedgehog defense. By afternoon the situation had worsened so much that Schmidt began to question his own argument, 